Columbia Network takes pleasure in presenting Orson Welles and the Mercury Theatre on the air in the second of a unique new summer series of nine dramatic productions. The first time in its history that radio has brought to the country an entire theatrical institution. Columbia is proud to welcome Orson Welles to its roster of stars and to give him the opportunity of bringing to the air those same qualities of vitality and imagination that have made him the most talked of theatrical director in America today. Good evening. This is Orson Welles speaking. If there's anything bloodthirstier than a werewolf, it's a pirate. And the Mercury Theater is playing safe. Now, if vampires and their ilk leave you as uncannily cold as old Dracula himself, who was staked down firmly and it is to be hoped permanently in his own family plot last week, then there are figures to prove that you are susceptible to buried treasure. We calculate that no decent law-abiding citizen is immune to pirates. There are cowboys and Indians, there are gangsters and G-men, but these delights are inconstant like the short skirt. I don't care how young you are. Nothing charms, nothing ingratiates, nothing wins like a one-legged, double-barreled buccaneer with earrings, a handkerchief on his head, and a knife in his teeth. What could be more appropriate on the starboard rail of your four-masted brigantine? If you haven't a four-masted brigantine, you have Treasure Island. It's in your library because it's a great English classic, and this evening, because it's a great story... It's on your radio. That's what I mean by playing safe. Once there was a small boy who asked his stepfather, who had written a number of books, please, to write something interesting. The stepfather, seeing his point, immediately contributed a serial to something repugnant called Young Folks, a periodical circulated among that section of the English nation known as Tiny Tots, who were very prevalent in the 80s. The name of the serial was The Sea Cook by Captain George North, and if the tiny tots didn't think it was interesting, they should have been boiled in oil. The story was begun, the stepfather says, on a chill September morning by the cheek of a brisk fire and the rain drumming on the window. The small boy himself helped a lot, even though Captain North got the credit, and so did a third and equally incurable small boy, the author's father. They drew a map first, the chart of an island showing very queer and wonderful attractions, Spyglass Shoulder, for instance, and Skeleton Island, and the North Cache with a bar silver. And then, on that chill September morning by that brisk fire of theirs, the three plotters buried their plunder, doubloons and louis d'or, gold and silver and rich jewels and pieces of eight. That's why the story was finally called Treasure Island. It's foolish to guess who's tuned in on this broadcast, but if in some way, where well, we were retelling this story, hope devoutly that he, who the Samoans laid to rest in the hills of their own faraway treasure island and who is still known out there only as the great teller of tales, would not wish tonight as he did so unaccountably at first to suppress the real name of Captain George North. The small boy, of course, should have been decorated. It's a better world because he asked for something interesting then he was lucky. There are millions and millions of small boys. But only one of us had Robert Louis Stevenson for a stepfather. Treasure Island by Robert Louis Stevenson with Orson Welles as Long John Silver and as Jim Hawkins who tells the story. Treasure Island. Squire Trelawney, Dr. Livesey, and the rest of the gentlemen having asked me to write down the whole particulars about Treasure Island from the beginning to the end, keeping nothing back but the bearings of the island and that only because there is treasure not yet lifted. I take up my pen in the year of grace, 1783, and go back to that time 19 years ago when my father kept the Admiral Benbow Inn and the brown old seaman with a saber cut first took up his lodging under our roof. I was 14... But I remember him as if it were yesterday. Mother called to me from upstairs. Jim? Yes, Mother? Jim, there's a man coming up the road. Go out and see what he wants. He came plodding to the inn door, his sea chest following behind him on a hand barrow. A tall, strong, heavy, nut-brown man, his tarry pigtail falling over the shoulders of his soiled blue coat 
his hands ragged and scarred with black broken nails, and the saber cut across one cheek, a dirty livid white, singing that old sea song that he sang so often afterwards. In, boy. Yes, sir. What do you call this place? The Admiral Benbow Inn, sir. Admiral Benbow, eh? Nice, lonely-looking, pleasant-situated grog shop. Folks don't come here much, do they, boy? Not much company? No, sir. More's pity. No? Well, then it's the birth for me. I'm a plain man, rum and bacon, eggs, all I want, and that head up there for to watch ships off. I have a mind to stay here a bit. Here, you matey. You were the wheelbarrow. Bring up alongside. Help up my chest. You two boys, heavy. Yes, sir. Call me Captain, boy. Captain. Yes, Captain. Just one thing more. Yes, Captain. You ain't seen him, have you? No, sir. Who do you mean? Along the road, maybe. You might have seen him somewhere, as you can't tell. Let me know if you do, boy. A seafaring man. Yes, sir. With one leg. Yes, sir. Captain! Yes, Captain. Bring me a noggin of rum, boy. And so he came to live under our roof. We never knew his name. We called him the Captain. He was a very silent man by custom all day. He hung around the cove or upon the cliffs with a brass telescope staring out to sea. All evening he sat in a corner of the parlor next to the fire and drank rum and water very strong. And every day when he came back from his stroll, he would ask the same question. Jim? Yes, Captain? Any seafaring men go by today along the road? No, Captain. And Jim? Yes, sir? You're a good boy, Jim. You wouldn't lie to me ever, would you, Jim? No, sir. You haven't seen him, have you, Jim? Jim, there's a silver popney for you on the first of every month. If you'll keep your weather eye open for a seafaring man with one leg... Let me know the moment you see him, won't you, Jim? A seafaring man with one leg. How that personage haunted my dreams. On stormy nights when the wind shook the four corners of the house and the surf roared along the cove and up the cliffs, I could see him in a thousand forms. Now the leg would be cut off at the knee, now at the hip. Now he was a monstrous kind of a creature who had never had but one leg, and that in the middle of his body. You'll keep your weather eye open, won't you, Jim? For a seafaring man with one leg. A seafaring man with one leg. Months went by. The captain bade fair to ruin us. We kept on staying week after week, month after month. And never a penny of money, Jim. Not a penny as he paid us since the day he came here. And me, a poor widow woman. Mother, why don't you ask him for some? Well, I'll tell you the truth, Jim. I'm afraid to ask him. I'm afraid of the man. Now, if your father was... In all that time, none of us ever saw him open the great sea chest that was in his room. There were nights when he took a deal more rum and water than his head could carry. Often I heard the house shaking and all the neighbors joining in for dear life. Drink and the devil has done. Quiet of his ships! Quiet! But he would force them all to listen to his stories. Dreadful stories they were about hanging and walking the plank and storms at sea and the dry tortugas and wild deeds and places on the Spanish main. By his own account, he must have lived his life among some of the wickedest men that God ever allowed upon the sea. The captain had been living with us almost a year when there occurred the first of the mysterious events that rid us at last of his presence. It was one January morning, very early, a pinching, frosty morning. The captain had risen earlier than usual and set down the beach with his telescope under his arm. My mother was upstairs and I was lying the breakfast table against the captain's return when the parlor door opened and a stranger stepped in. Sonny, come here, Sonny. 
Is this table for my mate, Bill? I don't know your mate, Bill. I'm laying this for a man who stays in the house. We call him the captain. Well, my mate Bill would be called the captain, like as not. Now, we'll put it for argument, like, that your captain's got a cut on one cheek. And we'll put it, if you like, that that cheek's the right one, eh? Well, God save me, there he is now. There's my mate Bill. That's him with a spyglass under his arm. Bless his old heart, to be sure. You and me'll just get back behind the door, Sonny. And we'll give Bill a little surprise, we will. Bless his heart, I says again. Hello, Bill. Come, Bill. You knows me. You knows an old shipmate, Bill, surely. Black dog. Black dog as ever was. <laughs> Bill, Bill. We've seen a sight of times, us two. So you run me down. Here I am, we'll speak up. What is it? That's you, Bill. You're in the right of it, Billy. I'll have a glass of rum from this dear child here, what I've took such a liking to. And we'll sit down, if you please, and talk square like old shipmates. Sit down, Bill. And you, Sonny, get out. Yes, sir. And none of your keels on me, do you hear? For a while, I could hear nothing but a low gabbing. Suddenly, the voices began to grow higher. No, no, no! And an end on it! If it comes to swinging, swing all, say I! I saw Black Dog streaming blood run off down the road. Presently, the captain returned, alone. Give me, give me some rum. Captain, are you hurt? I, I must get away from here. Get away, that's what. I must get away from here. What's happened, Jim? What's happened? It's the captain, Mother. The captain? Oh! Oh, dear, dearie me, what a disgrace. I've been afraid of something like this ever since he came into the house with that old chest of his. I got the rum and tried to put it down his throat, but his teeth were tightly shut and his jaws were as strong as iron. An hour later... Our friend, Dr. Livesey, came. Doctor, what shall we do? Where is he wounded, Doctor? Wounded? A fiddlestick's end. No more wounded than you or I. The men's had a stroke. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, where's, where's Black Dog? Black Dog? There is no Black Dog except what you have in your own back. You've been drinking rum, man, and you've had a stroke. Now, listen to me. One glass of rum a day won't kill you. But if you take one, you'll take another and another. And then you'll die die and go to your own place like the man in the Bible, and the world will be rid of a very dirty scoundrel. Do you understand that? The name of rum for you is death. About noon the next day, I stopped at the captain's door with some medicine. Who is it? It's me, Jim. Come in, Jim. Come in. He was lying very much as we'd left him. Jim, you're, you're the only one here that's worth anything. You know, I've always been good to you. Never a month, but I've given you a silver fopenny for yourself. Now you see, mate, I, I'm pretty low and deserted by all. Jim, you'll bring me a, a noggin of rum, won't you, matey? But the doctor... Doctors, it's all swabs! But don't have a drain of rum, Jim. I'll have the horrors. I, I've seen some of them already seen old Flint in the corner there behind you as plain as Prince. I've seen him. Jim, I'll give you a golden guinea for a knocking. When I brought it to him, he seized it greedily uh, and drank it out. Uh, that's some better, sure enough. Now, Mitty, did that doctor say how long I was to lie here in this old berth? Why, a week at least. Oh, uh, thunder, a week! I can't do that. They'll have the black spot on me by then. The lovers is going about getting the wind of me this blessed moment. Lovers just couldn't keep what they got and want to nail what's another's. It's, it's in my old sea chest, Jim. The thing they're after. They'll tip me the black spot. I know it. I was first mate, I was. Old Flint's first mate. And I'm the only one as knows the place he buried it. He gave it me at Savannah when he lay a dying. What's the black spot, Captain? 
A summons from old Flint's crew. A summons. And them as gets it, Jim, is lucky when they're dead. So, a week went by, and then, about three o'clock of a bitter, foggy, frosty afternoon, I saw someone drawing slowly near along the road. He was plainly blind, for he tapped before him with a stick, and he wore a great green shade over his eyes and nose, and he was hunched as if with age or weakness and wore a huge old tattered sea cloak with a hood. My Christian friends, take pity on a poor blind mariner as has lost the precious sight of his eyes in the greatest defense of his native country, England, and God bless King George. Where or in what part of this country he may now be? You were at the Admiral Benbow Inn, sailor. Eh? Black Hill Cove. I hear a voice. A young voice. It's here where I miss me deadlights. Will you give me your hand, my kind young friend, and lead me into the captain? I held out my hand, and the horrible, soft-spoken, eyeless creature gripped it in a moment like a vice. <gasps> no, boy... Take me into the captain. Sir, upon my word, I dare not. You been... heard me. Take me in straight. Oh. Will you take me into the captain? Yes, sir. Good. And when I'm in view, say to him, he's a friend for you, Bill Bones. If you don't, I'll twist your arm right out of your body. Do you hear? Yes, sir. I... Stash, you passer, damn you. Now, forward march. Here's a friend for you, Bill Bones. Now, Bill, sit where you are. Business is business. Hold out your left hand, Bill. Boy, take his left hand by the wrist and bring it near to my right. Here's a little bit of paper for you, Bill Bones. <laughs> Now that's done, I'll be going. Goodbye, Bill. Goodbye. Jim? Yes, Captain? What time is it, Jim? Ten o'clock. Ten o'clock. Ten o'clock, six hours. We'll deadle them yet, Pew and Black Dog and Long John Silver. The whole crew of them will. Captain. 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 The captain was dead. And there we were, my mother and I, a woman and a boy of 14, alone at night in the house, with the dead captain's body on a parlor floor. You know this money he does. A whole year, never a penny from him. And me, a poor widow. But, Mother, if Black Dog comes back, or the blind oh, man... Black Dog, fiddlesticks. There's something in that old chest of his upstairs that's rightfully mine. And we'll have that chest open if we die for it. Mother. Close the blinds, Jim. We don't want anybody watching us from the outside. We have to get the key off. <laughs> Look, Mother. Look. On the floor... Close to the dead man's hand, there was a little round of paper, blackened on one side. The black spot. I took it up and found... You have till ten tonight. Four hours. Now, Jim, find that key. I felt in his pockets one after another. Perhaps it's round his neck. Get open his shirt. There, sure enough, hanging on a bit of tarry string, we found the key. Then my mother got a candle in the bar, and holding each other's hands, we went upstairs to his room. 
Give me the key, Jim. Now then. Oh, nothing in here. Not a thing of value. Not a penny. Brother, look. There, before us, lay the last things in the chest. A bundle tied up in oilcloth looking like papers and a canvas bag that gave forth at a touch the jingle of gold. You see, Jim, I knew we'd find it. But I'll show these rogues that I'm an honest woman. I'll have me do and not a farthing over. Here, here, Jim, hold this bag. The coins were of all countries and sizes. Doubloons and Louis d'Or and guineas and pieces of eight. Mother. What is it, Jim? Mother, listen. Come, Mother. Mother, take the hole and let's be gone. No, I'll have me do, Jim, and no more. But, Mother, you heard him. That was the blind man. I know what I'm doing. I know the right. But, Mother, you don't know. Oh, dear. I'll take what I have. And I'll take this. These papers. Quick, Mother, quick. Take my hand. Next moment, we had opened the door and were in full retreat toward look, the village. Look, Jim. Over the hill. There they come. Run, Mother, run. Oh, Jim. Jim, I'm going to faint. Oh, Jim. Take the money and go on. Mother. Oh. Mother. She had fainted. I managed somehow to drag her down the bank into the shadow of the ditch. A moment later, the house was surrounded. Bones! Bones! Bill Bones! Will you answer me? Down with the door, then! Aye, aye. In, in, you lovers! Loot the house and find it! It was a good thing my mother had fainted or she would have had to watch with me while our poor house was pulled apart and smashed. Whatever it was they were after, they did not find it. Well, is it there? The money's there! Jim, what is it, Jim? What are they after? The map, Mother. Flint's map. Thank you. That's the signal. Tell him that. Hold on, you sneaks. It's in the house. You know it is. Shiver my soul if I had my eyes. The signal, too. The signal. You dogs. You had your hand on hundreds, on thousands. Are you giving up now? You'd be as rich as kings if you can find it. And you know it's there and you stand there skulking. There wasn't one of you dead by his bill, and I did it. A blind man, and I'm to lose my chance for you. I'm to be a poor, crawling beggar, spongy for rum, when I might be rolling in a coach. If you had the pluck of a weevil in a sea biscuit among the lot of you. That's the last signal. Get him! Get him in Dark. Black dog! Johnny! Dirk! You won't leave old Pew, mate! Not old Pew! Johnny! Black dog! Don't leave old Pew! Not old Pew! Not old dog! Pew, mate! Help me, mate! Help me! When they picked him up where he lay on the road on his side, Pew was stone dead. The horsemen, as it turned out, were revenue officers who had some news of a strange lugger in Kit's Hole, and it set forth that night in our direction. They took my mother to a neighbor's house. Well, Hawkins, they got the money, you say. Well, what in fortune were they after? More money, I suppose. No, Sergeant, not money, I think. In fact, sir, I believe I have the thing in my breast pocket. And to 
tell you the truth, I should like to put it in safety. To be sure, boy, quite right. Uh, I'll take it. I thought perhaps Dr. Livesey... Uh, what, oh, yes, Dr. Livesey. Perfectly right, perfectly right. A gentleman and a magistrate. Dogger! Yes, sir. You have a good horse. Take this light up behind you. Yes, sir. We rode hard all the way till we came to Dr. Livesey's door. The doctor's stopping tonight at the squire. Squire? So there we go, boys! We'd arrived at the squire's. He rose to meet us very stately and condescending. Come in, gentlemen. Good evening, squire. Good evening, Dr. Livesey. Good evening to you, Fenjin. Uh, what good wind brings you here? Then the officer stood up straight and stiff and told his story. Sergeant, you're a very noble fellow. And this lad Hawkins is a trump, I perceive. Hawkins, ring that bell. Sergeant must have the mail. And so, Jim, you have the thing that they were after, have you? Here it is, sir. Hmm. Uh, you've heard of this Captain Flint, I suppose, Squire? Heard of him? Heard of him, you say? He was the bloodthirstiest buccaneer that sailed. Blackbeard was a child, a friend. The Spaniards were so prodigiously afraid of him that I tell you, sir, I was sometimes proud he was an Englishman. What interests me is, had he money? Money! One of those villains after but money! That we shall soon know. What I want to know is this. Suppose I have here in my pocket some clue to where Flint buried his treasure. Will that treasure amount to much? Amount, sir? It will amount to this. If we have the clue you talk about, I fit out a ship in Bristol Dock and take you and Hawkins here along, and I'll have that treasure if I search a year, sir. Very well. Now, if Jim is agreeable, we'll open the packet. Hmm. A map of an island with latitude and longitude and writing. Tall tree, spyglass shoulder, bearing a point to the north of northeast. Skeleton island, southeast by east, ten feet. The bar silver is in the north cap. And say, you'll give up this wicked practice at once. Tomorrow, I start for Bristol. In three weeks' time, three weeks, two weeks, ten days, we'll have the best ship, sir, and the choicest crew in England. Hawkins shall come as cabin boy. You live here, ship's doctor. I am Admiral. I'll go with you, Squire. So will Jim. And uh, be a credit to the undertaking. There is only one man I'm afraid of. Who's that? Name the dog, sir. You, sir. For you cannot hold your tongue. <laughs> In a few moments, we shall be bound for Treasure Island with Dr. Livesey, Squire Trelawney, and Jim Hawkins. We pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. WABC, New York. Tonight, the Columbia Network is bringing you Orson Welles and the Mercury Theater on the air in Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. As Jim Hawkins was telling us, we are eager to leave the Benbow Inn behind and set out for the docks in Bristol. It was longer than the squire imagined ere we were ready for the sea. Weeks passed on then. One fine day there came a letter from the squire, from Bristol. Dear Livesey, the ship is off and fitted. It lies at anchor ready for sea. It was the crew that delayed me till the most remarkable stroke of fortune brought me the very man that I required. I was standing on the dock when by the merest accident I fell in talk with him. He had hobbled down there that morning with a parrot on his shoulder to get a smell of salt, he said. Out of pure pity, I engaged him on the spot to be ship's cook. Long John Silver, he is called, and has lost the leg. Well, sir, I thought I'd only found a cook, but it was a crew I'd discovered. Between Silver and myself, we got together in a few days a company of the toughest old salts imaginable. I declare we could fight the frigate. See what ho! Hang the treasure! It's the glory of the sea that has turned my head! On the 16th of April, the schooner Hispaniola set sail from Bristol Harbor. It was more than 19 years ago, but I can remember it as if it were yesterday. Me and my new blue cabin boys. Clerk, Nineteen years ago. Leaning over the rail, waving goodbye to my mother. And doing my best not to cry. 
for at the last moment, it sort of hurt to leave her, and it was the first time I had been away from home. Then, a little before noon, Captain Smollett gave an order. The bosun sounded his pipe, and the crew began to man the capstan bar. Soon, the anchor was short up. Soon, it was hanging dripping at the bars. Soon, the sail began to draw, and the land and shipping to flit by on either side. The Hispaniola had begun her voyage to the Isle of Treasure. On the second day out, I made the acquaintance of our one-legged ship cook, Long John Silver. Hey there, boy. Come in. Come on in to Long John's galley. To tell you the truth, at the very first mention of Long John Silver in the squire's letter, I had taken a fear in my mind that this might be the very one-legged sailor that I had watched for all those months at the Benbow Inn. But one look at him was enough. I had seen Captain Bones and Black Dog and Blind Pew, and I knew what a buccaneer looked like. Very different from this clean and pleasant-looking sea cook. His left leg was cut off close to the hip, and under the left shoulder he carried a crutch, which he managed wonderfully. Hopping about on it like a bird. Ah, pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! Are you Mr. Silver, sir? Yes, me lad, such is me name to be sure. And you're Hawkins, eh? Nobody more welcome than yourself, me lad, in old John's galley. <laughs> Sit down, hear the news. Your first trip to see Hawkins? Yes, sir. Well, well. Yeah, there's a lot of things you're going to learn before this here voyage is over. What do you think, Hawkins? And if there's anything you want to know, Hawkins, you just come to old John Silver and ask him, see? He'll tell you. His galley was as clean as a new pin. The dishes hanging up burnished, and his parrot in a cage in one corner. Yes, Captain Flint. I call my parrot Captain Flint. Yeah, the parrot, that's the famous buccaneer. Yes, Captain Flint, predicting success to our voyage. Wasn't you, Captain? Uh, <laughs> yeah, she's a powerful old bird, is Captain Flint. Two hundred years old, she's a day, and if anybody's seen more wickedness, it must be the devil himself. She sailed with England, the great Captain England, the pirate, and on the old walrus. Flint's old ship. As I've seen a muck with the red blood and fit to sink with gold. He's been at Madagascar and at Malibar and Suriname and Providence and Portobello. To look at her, you'd think she was a baby, Hawkins, but you smell powder, haven't you, Captain? Yeah, stand by to go by. And blood, eh, Captain? Put her midship. <laughs> Animal hands. And oh. pieces of eight, eh, Captain? Pieces of eight. Pieces of eight. Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! Pieces of eight! At the end of the third week, we left Madeira behind us. The ship proved to be a good ship. The crew seemed to be capable seamen. There was only one man aboard who was not satisfied, and that was the ship's master, Captain Smollett. I'll speak plain. I don't like it. I don't like this cruise. I don't like the men. I don't like me officers. That's short and sweet. But nobody paid much attention to him. Every man on board seemed well content. Double grog was served on the least excuse. There was duff on odd days, and always a barrel of apples standing broached in the waist for anyone to help himself that had a fancy. Never knew good come of it yet. Spoil folks' lands, make devils. That's my belief. We're not home again yet. But good did come of that apple barrel. It was about the last day of our outward voyage. Sometime that night or at latest before noon of the morrow, we should sight the treasure island. Just after sundown, when all my work was over, I thought I should like an apple. I ran on deck. The watch was all all forward looking out for the island. I got into the apple barrel. Suddenly, I heard voices on deck. Look here, barbecue. How long are we going to stand off and on like a blessed bumboat? Why, son, did I want to go into that cabin, I do? I want their pickles and wine and that. How long? By the power of the last moment I can manage, and that's how long. How many tall ships, think you, have I seen laid aboard? And how many brisk lads drying in the sun at execution dock? And all for this same hurry, and hurry, and hurry. He's a first-rate seaman, Captain Smollett. Say of the blessed ship for us. We're all seamen aboard here, I should think. All folks of lands, you mean. I know the sort you are. You're never happy till you're drunk. It's your long job. I don't know where this treasure is, do I? No more to use as you. And here's this squire and doctor with a map and such. Well, 
Then I mean this squire and doctor shall find the treasure for us and help us to get it aboard by the powers. After that... After that. What do we do with them, John Silver, after that? Well, what would you think we does with them? Put them ashore like maroons? Or cut them down like that much pork? Duty is duty, mates. Wait. Wait is what I says. When the time comes, why... Let her rip. Grandpa! What's that? What's that? Grandpa! Away to the southwest of us, we saw it. Treasure Island. Ten minutes later, we were gathered in the cabin. The squire, Dr. Livesey, the captain, and myself. Now, Hawkins, you have something to say. Speak up. I did as I was bid. I told them the whole story of Silver's conversation. When that was done, all three, one after another, and each with a bow, drank my good health. Then the squire rose. Captain Smollett, you were right and I was wrong. I own myself an ass. I await your orders, sir. Silver is a remarkable man. Here's the way I see it. We must go on because we can't turn back. And what I propose is that we don't wait for them to surprise us, but that we come to blows at our own time and when they least expect it. There must be some faithful ends left. Well, we must find out who they are. Jim Shear can help us more than anyone. The men are not shy with him, and Jim is a noticing lad. Hawkins, I put prodigious faith in you. In the meantime, talk as we please. There were only seven out of 26 on whom we knew we could rely. And of these seven, I was a boy. So that the grown men on our side were six to their 19. Next morning, there was not a breath of air moving, nor a sound, but that of the surf booming half a mile away along the beaches. A peculiar stagnant smell hung over the anchorage. The heat was sweltering, and the men grumbled fiercely over their work. Mutiny, it was plain, hung over us like a thundercloud. Around noon, Captain Smollett came up on deck. Hey, lad! We're not damn, we're all trying not a sort. Quick to the shore alert nobody. So you can take the gig. And as many as please may go ashore for the afternoon. Hey! Oh! Silver suspected a prick. He hopped around the deck on his one leg. Soon the party was organized. Six fellows were to stay on board, and 13, including Silver, began to embark. Suddenly, I had a mad notion to go ashore too. In a jiffy, I had slipped over the side and curled up in the foresheets of the nearest boat. No one took notice of me. The crews raced for the beach. No sooner had we touched shore than I leaped out and plunged into the nearest thicket. Behind me, I could hear John Silver's voice. Hey, Jim! Jim, my boy! Hey, Jim! 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 John Silver was quick at his work. Two faithful members of the crew were murdered on the island that afternoon. Only an hour after we landed... The second killing I saw with my own eyes. From where I lay hidden among the trees. Will you tell me you let yourself be led away with that kind of a mess of swabs? As sure as God sees me, I'd sooner lose uh, me hand than turn to give me due. Mate, it's because I think gold dust of you. Gold dust. John Silver, you're mate of mine no more. If I die like a dog, I'll die in me duty. You've killed Alan, have you? Kill me too if you can. But I defy you. He started to walk away. Try this then. Long John whipped the crutch out of his armpit and sent it hurtling through the air. It struck him in the back and killed him. Then, Silver brought out a whistle. I didn't wait. I ran. I ran as I never ran before. Daddy I 
looked up the side of a hill. Far above me, I saw something leap behind the trunk of a tree. It seemed dark and shaggy. I turned and began to run. Suddenly, the thing appeared in front of me, and running forward, threw itself on its knees before me, and held out its clasped hands in supplication. Oh! Shipwrecked? No, no, mate. Maroon. Three years lived on goats since then and berries and oysters. Mate, my heart is sore for Christian diet. You mightn't happen to have a piece of cheese about you now. No? Well, many's a night I've dreamed of cheese, toasted mostly, and woke up again and here I was. What'd you call yourself, mate? Jim. Jim? Jim, Jim. Well, now, Jim, you wouldn't think. You wouldn't think I was rich to look at me, would you now? I know not in particular. Oh, well, but I am, Jim. I'm rich, rich, powerful rich. Oh, Jim, you'll bless your stars, you will. You were the first that found me. Suddenly his eye fell on the Hispaniola lying far below us. Between it and the land was the jolly boat with five men moving towards shore. But I could not tell if they were our men or the mutineers. Jim, tell me true. That ain't Flint ship. It's not Flint ship and Flint is dead. There are some of Flint's hands aboard, worse luck for the rest of us. Not a man with one leg. Silver? Woo! If you were sent by Long John... Woo! I'm as good as pork, I know it. I was in Flint's ship with John Silver when old Flint buried the treasure. He and six along, six strong seamen. They was ashore nigh on a week. And then one day, here come Flint by himself in a little boat, and the six all dead. Dead and buried along with the treasure. How he done it, not a man of us could make out. I told him the purpose of our voyage and the predicament in which we now found ourselves. Oh, that long John, he's a bad un. And you're all in a clove hitch, ain't you? Well, you just put your trust in Ben Gunn. Ben Gunn's the man to help you. You tell that to your squire, Jim. Ben Gunn's the man, that's what you say. And Ben Gunn says you has ideas of his own. Ah! Look at that. Far below us, we saw a Union Jack fluttering in the air above the woods. There's your friend, sure enough. More likely it's a mutineer. No, mate, Silver Fly, the Jolly Roger. That's your friend, sure enough, ashore in the old stockade made years and years ago by Flint. Woo! What's that? That's the ship's cannon. They're shooting at the stockade. Come on. Wait a minute, Jim. Wait. Ben Gunn is fly. Rum wouldn't bring me down there. But remember, Jim, Ben Gunn's the man to help you. And when Ben Gunn is wanted, he knows where to find him. Just where you found him today. I started to run towards the flag. Hey, Jim! Jim! Yes, sir? <laughs> you won't forget that piece of cheese, will you, mate? <laughs> less than a mile to the stockade. It was heavy running through the woods. The shooting was getting louder. Suddenly before me, I saw a clear a smoke of muskets fired nearby. Hey there! Who goes there? Hey, don't shoot, it's me. Who's me? Me, Jim Hawkins. It's it, 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 it. A moment later, I was over the stockade among my friends. And soon afterwards, the firing ceased. The mutineers were saving their powder. The stockade was a good place, with a paling six feet high all around it. We could have held it against the regiment. And here, Captain Smollett decided to stay and await our enemy's next move. I told Dr. Livesey and the squire about Ben Gunn. Hey! Flag a truce! Flag a truce! Who's that? It's Silver. Keep indoors, man. Tell the one this is a trick. Who goes? Stand no we fire. Flag and truce. Doctors, watch on the lookout. Dr. Livesey, take the north side, if you please. Yes. Jim, the east. Gray, west. The watch below, all hands to load muskets. Lively men and careful. What do you want with your flag and truce? Captain Silver, sir, come to my terms. Captain Silver? Why, you black-hearted scoundrel? Silence, I'm... sir. Silence. If you wish to talk to me, you can come. And that's all. If there's any treachery, it'll be on your side... And the Lord help you. That's enough, Captain. A word from you is enough. I know a gentleman, and you may lay to that. You'd better sit down. Uh, you ain't gonna let me inside, Captain? It's a main cold morning, to be sure, sir, to sit outside upon the sand. Oh, there's Jim. Top of the morning, dear Jim. 
Well, there you're all together like a happy family in a manner speaking. If you've anything to say, my man, better say it. Right you were, Captain Smollett. Duty is duty, to be sure. Well, here it is. We want that treasure. We'll have it. That's our point. You just soon save your lives, I reckon, and that's yours. You have a chart, haven't you? That's as may be. Oh, well, you have. I know that. What I mean is, we want your chart. You give us the chart to get the treasure by, and I'll give you my affy Davy upon my word of honor to clap you somewhere safe for sure. Is that all you have to say? Every last word by thunder. Refuse that, and you've seen the last of me but musket balls. Very good. Now you lay on me. If you'll come up one by one, unarmed, I'll engage to clap you all in irons and take you home to a fair trial in England. If you won't, as my name's Alexander Smollett, I've thrown Miss Sovereign's colors and I'll see you all to Davy Jones. You can't find the treasure. You can't sail the ship. And you can't fight us. I stand here and tell you so. And they're the last good words you'll get from me. Now, trump me, lad. Laugh. Laugh, my thunder, laugh. For an hour's out, you'll laugh on the other side. And then the die will be the lucky ones. Ten minutes later, nothing remained of the attacking party but the five who had fallen. Four on the inside and one on the outside of the palisade. The mutineers did not come back that night. They had got their rations, as the captain put it. The next day was stifling hot. After dinner, Dr. Livesey sent for me. Uh, Jim, was it cheese you said Ben Gunn had a fancy for? Yes, sir, cheese. Well, Jim, uh, just see the good that comes of being dainty in your food. You've seen my snuff box, haven't you? And you never saw me take snuff. The reason being that in my snuff box I carry a piece of Parmesan cheese. A cheese made in Italy. Very nutritious. Well, that's for Ben Gunn. Well, goodbye, my lad. Then he took up his hat and pistols, girt on his cutlass, put the chart in his pocket, and set off briskly through the trees. That afternoon, the blockhouse being stifling hot, and the little patch of sand inside the palisade ablaze with midday sun, and so much blood about me, and so many poor dead bodies lying around. A new idea came into my head. This was to swim out under cover of the night, cut the Hispaniola adrift, and let her go ashore where she fancied. The mutineers, after their repulse of the morning, had nothing nearer their hearts than to up anchor and away to sea. This, I thought, would be a fine thing to prevent. It was evening when I reached the east coast of the island. I could see the Hispaniola lying at anchor offshore. And there was the Jolly Roger, the black flag of piracy, flying from her peak. As the last rays of daylight dwindled and disappeared, absolute darkness settled down on Treasure Island. The next night, I was back on land. I was proud of myself, and with good reason. I had grounded the Hispaniola, beached her up tidily in the north inlet with no harm done, safe from the mutineers. I had no trouble finding the stockade. Coming in from the shore, keeping close in shadow where the darkness was thickest, I crept into the blockhouse. I could see nothing. The doctor and the squire must have worried about me. I should lie down in my own place, I thought, and enjoy their faces when they found me in the morning. I felt for a place to lie down. Reese of the bay! Reese of the bay! Don't go! Reese of the bay! Don't go! Bring a torch, Dick! Well... Well, shiver my timbers. Jim Hawkins. Dropped in like, eh? Quite a pleasant surprise for poor old John. I've always liked you, I have, Jim, for a lad of spirit. I picked it my own self when I was young and handsome. I always wanted you to join my camp and take your share and die a gentleman. And now, my cock, you've got to. You can't go back to your own lot. Where are they? Now, where do you think, my son? Have you killed them? What do you think? Well, I'm not such a fool, but I know pretty well what I have to look for. But there's a thing or two I have to tell you. And the first is this. Here you are in a bad way. Ship lost, treasure lost, men lost. And if you want to know who did it, it was I. Oh, sure. I was in the apple barrel the night we sighted land. And I heard you, John, and you, Dick Johnson, and Hans was now at the bottom of the sea. 
and told every word you said before the hour was out. And as for the schooner, it was I who cut her cable. And it was I who brought her where you'll never see her more, not one of you. I no more fear you than I fear a fly. I'll put one to that and here goes, you sneaking son of a scrub. Who are you? Come on, sir! Who are you, Tom Morgan? Maybe you thought you was captains here, perhaps. I'm going to kill the boy. Did any of you gentlemen want to have it out with me? Him that wants it shall get it. You won't fight, then by thunder you'll obey. You may lie to it. I like that boy now. Never seen a better boy than that. He's more a man than any pair of ratty in this here house. What I say is this, let me see him that'll lay a hand on him, that's what I say. And you may lie to it. Hmm. Seems to have a lot to say. Pipe up and let me hear it, a lie to. Yeah. What? We, we got something for you, John. Step up, I won't bite you. Hand it over, lubber. The black spot. I thought so. What's on it? Deposed. Deposed, that's it, is it? Uh, yeah. Very pretty wrote, to be sure. Like print, I swear. But it ain't one bit prettier wrote than this. What's that? And what does it look like, lads? A chart, that's what it is. A chart! A chart of this island, old friend's chart. Now, what do you say to that? Yes, that's Flint, sure enough. That's it. Show you and a clovage to it. So we done ever. Silver's the man. Silver. John Silver, thou captain lad. Barbecue forever. Barbecue for captain. John Silver, the captain. Hey! That was the end of the night's business. Only much later, I woke up suddenly and felt someone beside me. Jim. Jim, my boy. Yes, Long John? I saved your life here tonight, Jim. Now, you and me stick close, Jim, back to back like in case of trouble. And talking of trouble, Jim, why did those friends of yours leave that chart behind when they cleared out of here? They did, though. I, I came in here this morning and found the place empty and the chart lying there on the table or I couldn't miss it. And there's something under that. Something under that. Good or bad. The next morning, we set out after the treasure. Tall tree, spyglass shoulder, bearing a point to the north and northeast. Skeleton Island, east, southeast, and by east, ten east. Hey, over there! Come quick! foot of a pine, half covered with green creeper, a human skeleton lay on the ground. A skeleton, they got. It lay perfectly straight, the feet pointing in one direction, the hands raised above its head like a diver's, pointing directly in the opposite. It ain't natural. It ain't natural, but you know, lads, I've a notion in my old numb skull. Now, here's the compass. There's the tip-top point of skeleton island sticking out like a tooth. Just take a bearing, will you, along the line of them bones? East. Southeast and by east. I thought so. There's a pointer. Right up there's our line for the pole star and the jolly dollars. This is one of Flint's jokes, and no mistake. Him and these six was alone here. Alone. He killed them. Every man. And this one yawled up here and laid down by the compass. Yes. Six they were. And six we are. And bones is what they are now. I saw him dead, old Flint. There he laid with penny pieces on his eyes. Dead, I sure enough, he's dead. But if ever spirit walked, it'd be Flint's. Dear heart, but he died bad, did Flint. Oh, I bet he did. Uh, may not it were. And the wind he was open, and I hear that old song of his coming out clear as hell. And the death all on man already. Listen. Oh, Lord, have mercy on me. Shipmates, 
shipmates. A 750,000 ton, not a quarter of a mile from here. When did a gentleman of fortune show his star to that much dollars for a boozy old seaman with a blue mug? And him dead, too. Hello there, John. Don't you cross his spirit. Spirit? Well, maybe. You know... You know whose voice that was? It was... Like a somebody else's. It was... Like a... <laughs> By the powers! Ben Gunn! Aye? Aye. Aye. So it were. Ben Gunn it were. Why, nobody minds Ben Gunn. Dead or alive, nobody minds him. <laughs> My glass shoulder, bearing a point to the north of East Kennington Island, south east and by east, ten feet. Hey, mate, here's a tall tree! The crest of the tall trees was reached, and by bearing proved the wrong one. So did the second. So the third. Here it is! Hey! Long John! Mary! Here it is! Before us was a great excavation. In this was the shaft of a pick broken in two, and the boards of several packing cases strewn around, all branded with the name Walrus, the name of Flint's ship. The treasure had been found and rifled. The 700,000 pounds were gone. <laughs> we turned and saw above us on the edge of the pit Ben Gunn, Dr. Livesey, Gray, and the squire, all with muskets. The doctor's plan had worked. The pirates had fallen into his trap. <laughs> Silver, you're a prodigious villain and an imposter, sir. But you saved this boy's life and I'll not prosecute you. But the dead men, sir, hang about your neck like millstones. Thank you kindly, sir. I dare you to thank me. It's a gross dereliction of my duty. Stand back! It took us three days to move the treasure from Ben Gunn's cave on board ship. On the 8th day of December, the Hispaniola reached Bristol. Five men only of those who had sailed returned with her. Well, that was 19 years ago. All of us had an ample share of the treasure and used it wisely or foolishly according to our natures. Captain Smollett is now retired from the sea. As for Ben Gunn, he got a thousand pounds which he spent or lost in 19 days, for he was back begging on the 20th. Silver vanished on the voyage one night off the coast of Mexico, and we heard no more of him. The bar silver and the arms still lie for all I know where Flint buried them. And certainly they shall lie there for all of me. Oxen and wain ropes would not bring me back again to that accursed island. The worst dreams that ever I have are when I hear the surf booming about its coast to start upright in bed with the sharp voice of Captain Flint still ringing in my ears. Ah, pieces of eight! 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 You have been listening to Treasure Island, starring Orson Welles as Long John Silver in his own radio version of Stevenson's Great Adventure Story. This is the second in a series of nine special broadcasts presented by the Mercury Theatre. And here is Orson Welles himself, writer, director, and star of these programs, to tell you about next week's production. Orson Welles. First of all, I'd like you to meet Jim Hawkins, Jr. Our leading man is 14 years old. Last season, he made a really startling contribution to the stage history of Shakespeare's plays. This was during the course of some experiments with the Mercury Theatre sprinkler system. As a consequence of what must certainly have been extensive research in that field, he caused it to rain, actually to rain, and copiously to rain, where in more than 300 years it has never rained in Julius Caesar before. It rained on Brutus. It rained all over Brutus in the Forum. I was Brutus, and I ought to know. Now, as dramatic criticism, I found this telling and even final. There's a surprise item in the funeral scene. I can assure you that the unexpected appearance on the stage of so many gallons of real water created in us all an impression that was almost overwhelming. Our popular leading man says that he did it all with a match. I don't dare think what he'll do. 
He's old enough to run for president, but meanwhile, no matter what happens to the plumbing, he can always work for the mercury, as you've probably discovered he's something more than a very gifted performer, and as I told you, he's something less than 15. His name shall not be withheld. I refer to that fine old actor, Arthur Anderson. Mr. Anderson is not new to the microphone nor the mercury. He was prominent in Shoemaker's Holiday and in Julius Caesar as Brutus's boy Jeeves, the sleepy-eyed, silver-throated Lucius in Brass Buttons. He was at least unforgettable. As to our celebrated Mark Antony, George Colurus, who has always somehow cleverly escaped Rainmaker Anderson, he played Captain Smollett tonight. Eustace Wyatt, late housebreaker of Heartbreak House, was the squire. Ray Collins is responsible for Ben Gunn, among other things. And that was Alfred Shirley as Blind Pew. Then you heard Stephen Fox and Agnes guess what she played, Moorhead, and a Mercury Roundup, William Allen and Richard Wilson inclusive. Jim Hawkins Sr. will bear no comment. Next week... We offer you the ominous and authentic click of the world's most famous knitting needles, Madame Lafarge's needles and Madame herself, Dr. Manette, Sidney Carton, and the entire French Revolution, same time, same station. It is a far, far better thing that I do than I've ever done. Charles Dickens, that is correct. That is absolutely correct. Charles Dickens' Tale of Two Cities. There is at this moment a disturbance in the sub-control room, and if it isn't a tumbrel, it's Arthur Anderson. It's a good thing the program's over. Good night, everybody. Thanks. Please write me. The stories you'd like to hear, and goodbye till next week. Remember, 9 o'clock Eastern Daylight Saving Time next Monday night for the Mercury Theater on the Air with The Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens. On tonight's production, Bernard Herman composed the original music and conducted, and Davidson Taylor supervised for the Columbia Network. Dan Seymour speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, California, the Lux Radio Theater presents Clark Gable in The Buccaneer with Olamp Radna, Akeem Tamirov, and Gertrude Michael. Lux presents Hollywood. In The Buccaneer, we bring you the romance, the thrilling drama of Jean Lafitte, hero and rogue of old Louisiana. Tonight's special guest is the distinguished author and historian, Mr. Rupert Hughes. Louis Silvers conducts our music. We want you to know how much we appreciate your loyalty. Your daily use of Lux Flakes makes it possible for us to bring you this program. Did you ever think of this? You can save steps and make your work go faster if you keep Lux handy in these two places where you can use it most. In the bathroom for stockings and other things, and in the kitchen to help guard your hands from dishpan roughness. So it's a good idea to get two or more boxes of Lux Flakes at a time. And here's another tip I'd like to pass on to you. You'll save money if you buy Lux in the large size package. We hear now from the producer of the Lux Radio Theater. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. Behind the making of The Buccaneer was my hope that this picture would be something more than entertainment, that it would revive the memory of a hero whom history has all but forgotten. Springing out of the swamps of Louisiana, out of the mire of infamy, this fabulous figure scattered one of the blackest nights in American history with the bright flame of victory. He was Jean Lafitte, the ruthless lord of Barataria, a pirate island only 90 miles from New Orleans. He was Jean Lafitte, the pirate patriot, who, with Andrew Jackson, saved New Orleans in the War of 1812, and of whom Byron wrote, he left a corsair's name to other times, linked with one virtue and a thousand crimes. 
and without whom all America west of the Mississippi might now belong to England. No one knows where Lafitte came from or where he's buried. As for his soul, it might be in paradise or purgatory. He earned a place in either. But tonight, Lafitte roars out of oblivion, brought to us by one of the most celebrated personalities the screen has ever known, Clark Gable. Mr. Gable is a Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer star, currently appearing in Too Hot to Handle. His next picture is Idiot Delight. Olamp Bradner, Paramount's lovely Parisienne, makes our Lux debut in the role of Gretchen. As Dominic Yu, we give you that priceless performer, Akeem Tamirov. In the part of Annette, Gertrude Michael makes her initial bow on this stage, and Clara Blandick is heard as Aunt Charlotte. On to Louisiana. It's curtain time and star time, as the Lux Radio Theater presents Clark Gable in The Buccaneer with Olymp Bradner, Akeem Tamirov, and Gertrude Michael. <laughs> In 1814, the citizens of New Orleans often saw a printed notice brazenly displayed in public places. It read, Sale of rare and notable goods this day at the temple. It was signed Jean Lafitte. The temple, scene of this thieves' bazaar, was a clearing in the cypress swamps. There, beneath tendrils of dripping moss, Jean Lafitte and his pirate crew insolently hawked their wares. Through the crowd strolled pirate musicians, their faces lean and scarred, their music gay. The good people of New Orleans came to look and stayed to buy. No one asking where the goods came from. No one dared to ask. Now, what do you mean it ain't the best? Uh, that's the best Manila neck weed. Or the best Manila rope. Oh, silver? Did you say silver, mister? Look at this. Hand, hand, hand. Only one Spanish dollar. One dollar. Perfume sweet like Arabi. Monsieur, you want to buy some little perfume? Thank you, no. I'm looking for Jean Lafitte. Ah, Lafitte? <laughs> what for? <laughs> Do I look like a soldier? You? <laughs> no. And you can tell me. This is business. Oh, business. Well, now look. You see that man standing by himself over there? That is Jean Lafitte. Perfume sweet like Arabi. Very popular, Mr. Lafitte. I'm sorry, but I don't know what you're talking about. I was thinking of that placard that I've seen posted about. Oh, uh, there, there's one on that tree. Reward. $500 for the capture of Jean Lafitte, dead or alive. Signed by the governor, William C.C. C. Claiborne. $500 reward for me shows that Governor Claiborne has a sense of humor. <laughs> My name is Crawford. Senator Crawford of the Louisiana legislature. Oh, you weren't thinking of collecting that reward, were you, Senator? Hardly. But the British have a sense of humor, too. The British? And they make rather good friends. I'm sure the British think you're worth far more than $500. You think so? Try some of this wine, Senator. Thank you. Does my offer interest you? Very much. But it could stand a little more explanation. These are war times, Mr. Lafitte. You and your men could constitute a power in these waters. A power for the British? I thought you said you were a senator from Louisiana. That, I'm sure, needs no explanation. I see. Try to be back from your voyage in a fortnight. You will have British callers at Barataria. This is excellent wine. How much for the cask? Ten pieces of eight, ten Napoleons... Or $500 American paper. <laughs> you don't think much of American paper, do you, Mr. Lafitte? I'm a businessman, Senator, and I don't think much of America's chances. Neither do I. I'll have the wine delivered to you. If you'll give me your... Will you excuse me? I have some important business. Of course. Uh, wasn't that Miss Annette de Remy's carriage that just passed? I thought I recognized Miss Annette and her Aunt Charlotte. It uh, was their carriage. You'll excuse me, Senator. But we're not exchanging confidences yet. A thieves' market. I can't understand why the authorities permit it. Oh, Aunt Charlotte, you always say that, but you always come. Don't be impertinent, Annette. One Spanish dollar. Perfume sweet like Arabi. Madame, madame, only one Spanish dollar. My man, did you come by these things honestly? Huh? 
Do, do I uh, do I not look like an honest man? You certainly do not. Hmm. Oh, Aunt Charlotte, please. He looks as if he'd cut anybody's throat for a picayune. Who, oh, me? <laughs> me, Dominique you, the cannoneer of Napoleon. Mademoiselle, Napoleon and me. Oh, never mind the details. How much is this perfume? Oh, uh, that one. Three Spanish dollars. But, madame, these... Ah, oh, sweet like the breath of angels. Huh. It smells more like liniment. Oh, madame, madame, impossible. Behold, I drink it. So, mm. madame, you are right, it is liniment. Come along, Annette, I've seen enough of it. Annette, where did she go? Annette, where are you? Annette, Annette. Annette, you're more beautiful every time I see you. Thank you, Mr. Lafitte. You were late today, Annette. I couldn't help it. My sister sailed for France. She's going to be... to be married on the boat. There was such a crowd at the boat to see her off, I thought I'd never get away. I was in terror that I wouldn't see you. And in terror that I would. Oh, Jean. What are we going to do? Marry me. We could sail to France, too, like your sister. Mm, marry you. And I suppose you'd print the wedding invitation on the back of Governor Claiborne's reward for you. Dead or alive. My sweet, you can have the governor's ears for a wedding present. <laughs> oh, darling. Won't you ever be serious? You're in danger every hour. Every minute that I'm near you. Oh, Jean, we can't hide behind bushes and trees all our lives. Dearest, I want you to be able to come to my house like other men who... Who would... are more respectable? Who are more honored. Oh, can't you understand? I want to be proud of my love. Well, there's nothing in your life I can share. I have wealth. I have baritaria. Bariteur is the word for cheap. It's a kingdom with a thousand men and sa ships that sail the Caribbean and the Gulf. I can give you anything you... Yes, anything but self-respect. Yes, you're right, Annette. I can't give you that. Oh, Jean. Listen. What's this? Trouble. You better go. Hey, boss. Boss. Dominic, what's wrong? The governor. The governor is coming. He's bringing soldiers. We show him. No. Eh? No steal, Dominic. Tell the men to carry the boats to the bayou. Load them with every piece of merchandise we have and shove off. Let the people stay, but the men and goods go. Hurry up. Now. Aye, aye, boss. <laughs> Clever of you, Lafitte. An hour ago, you were very busy here selling your stolen goods. And now, nothing. Very clever indeed. Thank you, Governor Claiborne. Praise from you is high honor. <laughs> Only fear of injury to some of New Orleans citizens prevents me from bringing you to justice now. But they shall hear the judgment we have passed on you. Mr. Collector? Yes, Governor. Read the placard there, on that tree. Read it aloud. Yes, Governor. For making himself a general nuisance, I offer $10,000 reward for Governor Claiborne's ears. Signed, Jean Lafitte. <laughs> you take this as a joke, do you, Lafitte? You'll find nothing to laugh at when General Andrew Jackson arrives in New Orleans. I respect General Jackson. He said, there's no room under the American flag for such bandits as you and your men. Do you laugh at that, sir? No. But you have bigger and more respectable bandits who laugh at your flag, making fortunes by selling sugar and cotton to the British. We all have faults, Governor. But I have respected the American flag, and we've never attacked a ship that flies it. scare us out of the temple? Where are we now? No place. Three days at sea and not a hall yet. Shut up, Fischer. Mm. Well, Dominic, come in. Uh, what do you want? It is Brown Boss on the Vulcan. He just scuttled a merchantman. She's burning. Does she look like a good haul? Well, boss, she... She's American. An American boat? Where? Two points off the starboard bow and she's up in flames. Well, this is pretty bad news. Get on deck. Lay her into the wind. Stay by to lower the longboats as soon as she loses way. Light no lights. Aye, aye, boy. Mm, she's burning pretty fast, boy. Can you see her name yet? Name, not yet. 
Her boat. There's the Vulcan. Brown is standing by. I'll attend to Mr. Brown later. Hey, 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 what is that? We yours. <laughs> Never before have I heard a barking fish. <laughs> there it is. Get that dogfish up. Hey, there's more than a dog here, boss. There's a girl, too. Get her in the boat. <laughs> a girl, eh? Well, well. Oh, a little pink mackerel, eh? <coughs> Lay her down over there. You all right? Yes. What boat is that? Speak up. Corinthian. Out of where? <coughs> New Orleans. They, they attack us. They make me jump over. They... Uh, boss, uh, ask her, is there anybody left on board? We'll let Captain Brown tell us that. Pull over to the Vulcan. And all those other people on that ship. Did you put them off in boats, Mr. Brown? How many boats did you put them in? None. You remember my order, Mr. Brown? That all hands on a captured ship should have a chance for their lives. We're through taking orders from you, Lafitte. You are, Mr. Brown? My orders forbid boarding any ship flying the American flag. That's the flag I'm under, up there in the masthead. The black flag, eh? We're men without a country, Mr. Brown. Men cast up by the sea. Perhaps we'll be Americans someday. But not you, Mr. Brown, because I'm going to hang you now. You ain't going to hang nobody, Lafitte. You're just a blubber-smelling pirate like the rest of us. And you've given your last command. Oh! Any more complaints? Anybody like to follow Captain Brown? And stir yourselves. All hands to the braces. Spare away the yard. Set your course for Barataria. Boss, hey, boss. What about that uh, pink mackerel, the girl? She comes with us until she's well enough to leave. Well, she's all that is left of the Corinthian, boss. She make a pretty bad witness. I obey my own orders. She sailed under the American flag and she's safe from us. I say, I And everything from the Corinthian is to be kept out of sight. Nothing taken from that boat must be sold. You understand, Dominique? Oh, well, I know. You have your breakfast now, boss? Put it down there. Yes, sir. Good morning, Mr. Captain. Oh, good morning. How do you like Barataria? Well, I don't know yet. Your men say that I give them hemp fever. <laughs> <laughs> Did you hear that, Dominique? <laughs> a gentleman does not laugh at a lady. <laughs> Dominique, she says that you're not a gentleman. No, I say it to you. What makes you think that I'm not a gentleman? Your rings tell me. And what do you know about rings? One ring, it is a gentleman. Two rings, it is a vain and foolish man. Now that you have enlightened me as to my multiple defects, go back where you belong. Dominique, eh? keep this magpie out of my sight. Hey, come along, my uh, little cabbage. But you did not tell me why give the men hemp fever. Hemp is a rope, and men sometimes die of a rope. Oh, yes. As a matter of fact, the men are right. You're a walking death warrant for all of us. Me? Come here to me. What's the matter with your shoes? They squeak. I know that, but why? Because they're in the ocean. Well, take them out of the ocean. You're in a gentleman's home. A gentleman's home? No wonder the fine people of New Orleans, they laugh at you. They laugh at... How do you know? Were you ever inside their homes? Yes, I worked there. You worked there? Yes. You scrubbed their floors, but you've got nerve enough to stand there and tell me I'm no... All right. Since you're such a monument of judgment, you can stay here and make yourself useful. What can you do? I can cook, but I won't. You certainly won't. What else? I can sew, but I won't. Do you eat? Yes, thank you. But you won't. Oh! Before you eat, you'll learn to make yourself useful. Scipio, give her the keys to this closet. She's going to learn to scrub floors. Yes, sir. Here they are. Boss! Boss coming in! Mm. Give me that telescope. Yeah, I'm going to cover it here. Can you see? Who is she, boss? 
British man of war, Sophia. Oh, we'll let them hell with it. No, no, she's sending a boat under a flag of truce. Oh. Lock up that mackerel of yours while these Englishmen are here. Aye, aye, boss. Come along, my uh, little toadstool. We'll what lock have, you up. What have I done? Huh? Nothing, nothing yet. That is why we lock you up. You lock me up because you're afraid of me. Uh, you are afraid that I'll tell those British Janus that you burned a Corinthian. Mm. And I will, I will if you lock uh, me up. No, you no, no, my go. pink Ooh. rosebud. You will, will you not if I lock you up. Go, go on, oh. in the closet. <laughs> Join us in our attack against the Americans, Mr. Lafitte. Every condition of those letters will be fulfilled. It's a generous offer, Captain Lockyer. Generous. The rank of captain in the British Navy and $30,000 in gold. Will the Americans match that? No. They've only offered five hundred dollars for my head. While we offer a full pardon to all of you, we will guarantee that... You lock me up? Ha-ha, <laughs> but you forget. I have a key. Uh, who is this young lady? <clears throat> Come in, Gretchen. These gentlemen are officers of the British Navy. They command big warships. They are interested in who you are. You're certainly not American. Are you Dutch? Tell them just who you are. I, uh... I am the friend of Mr. Lafitte. <clears throat> then suppose, uh, just a friendly gesture, you leave us alone. Please? Yes, sir. Well, Mr. Lafitte, will you fight for the British? I must have a week for my reply. Does it take a week to make up your mind? On matters as important as this, my men have as much to say as I have. We are a republic and must put it to a vote. I say no. Well, I say yes. I say we fight for the British, and why not? Aye, that's it, Granby. Give it to him. Give it to him. England will shake America like a dog shakes a rat. Here, here, aye. And what do you get from Claiborne? Nothing but the cramp iron, the cat and the yard arm. But England offers gold and a clean pardon. Who's for England? Yes! Shut your grab traps. The boss ain't had his say yet. Chuck your love. What do you say, I boss? What do you say, You for England, yeah? You scum of the world. You sewer-bred rats. Every country in the world has spewed you out. There's no land you can call your own. You, Jacques, you like it here, hmm? The air is sweet, hmm? Different from the stench of the sewers where you hid after you murdered your father. And you, Hans, the spoiler of the dead, the slinking grave robber of Hamburg. Miguel the petty pickpocket of Madrid. And you, Dominique. Boss, please, I... Uh, mm. The pet cannoneer of Napoleon. Oh, well... <laughs> and Mouse, you deserter. What hole will you hide in to escape the lash in the yard arm? And the brave Gramby. Shall I tell the story of Pensacola, of the nun who prayed for your soul with your knife in her throat? And I'm the rottenness of you all, because I'm your boss. All of us, the yellow-livered spawn of the world, thrown up here by a sea that's too decent to hold us. We land on the only shore that has let us stay, Louisiana. Louisiana, with long moss that hangs from the trees like the gray hair of a mother. And what do we do to her? We rob and kill but still, she lets us stay. And now, for the first time, this mother needs help. A powerful enemy is landing on her shores. You've heard her call, you white-livered squids. And what do you propose to do? Turn tail and run whining to the British to lick the hand that you're afraid to bite. But Louisiana will never show the white feather. Neither will America. It's a young nation unprepared with few weapons and few defenders. And it's getting licked. But I'm going to give it all I have. Who fights with me for America? Me, Dominique, you! Me, Gretchen van der Liepel! That was the first act of The Buccaneer. 
starring Clark Gable with the Lamp Bradner, Akim Demiroff, and Gertrude Michael. In just a moment, the curtain goes up on Act Two. But during our intermission, let's drop in on the Brownings. It's after dinner, and the family is gathered round the fire. As the scene opens, the two girls, Dot and Midge, are talking about Miss Enright, the director of their high school club. She's going to be married, and the club is giving her a shower, but... Uh... Gosh, Midge, what can we get for her? I'm just stony broke. Me too, Dot. Let's ask Dad. Shh. Not while he's doing bills. Uh, watch out, girls. I hear you. But I just can't give you anything for presents right now. Uh, perhaps your mother can help you. Oh, so I'm to solve the problem. Well, here's a suggestion, girls. How about a serving spoon, like the one we got the other day? Oh, there were two pieces, Mother. A cheese server, too. Oh, uh, you mean the ones you saved me money on? <laughs> yes. <laughs> we certainly fooled you, Dad. Two lovely pieces for only a quarter. And the box top from the large Lux package, Mother. Don't forget that. Gee, I bet Miss Enright would love one of those sets. <laughs> Enright with oh, Enright. Dad. <laughs> but it's a swell idea. A great big sparkling idea. Well, it'll certainly help us out. Don't let me forget. I'll order some more Lux tomorrow morning, and you girls can have all the box tops. Oh, swell. Then we could get extra sets for Christmas presents, too. Why wait till tomorrow? Let's go see what's in the house right now. Come on, Midge. Dibs on the bathroom box, Dad. The kitchen box is mine. So the race is on to collect the tops from the large boxes of Lux Flakes. In fact, people everywhere are eager to get these two beautiful pieces of original Rogers silver plate, a stunning serving spoon, and a handy cheese server. Don't fail to get yours. Just send the top from a large box of Lux Flakes and 25 cents in coin with your name and address to Lux, Meriden. M-E-R-I-D-E-N, Meriden, Connecticut. Mr. DeMille. We continue with The Buccaneer, starring Clark Gable, with Olamp Bradner, Hakeem Timiroff, and Gertrude Michael. <laughs> with the cheers of his men still ringing in his ears, Jean Lafitte sailed alone to New Orleans to place his army of pirates at the disposal of the government. The governor has accepted his offer... And now, before returning to Barataria, Lafitte brings the news to Annette. Jean, you shouldn't have come here. <laughs> shouldn't I? No. But I'm glad you did. Oh, Jean. No, no, no. Wait, wait. Look at me. Carefully. What do you see? A man who is very dear to me. What else? A man who shouldn't be here. Nothing more. You don't notice a, a difference in me? No. <laughs> what is it? I'm respectable. <laughs> you... Yes, my good woman, respectable, at last. Oh, you precious fool. Whatever you're talking about. It's very simple. Governor Claiborne and I are friends. They've accepted my offer to save New Orleans. No, Jean. Oh, please be careful. That is true, Lafitte, Claiborne, Jackson. Those names will live in history. Well, Jean, tell I'm me. I'm on my way to the tailors now. If I give them 200 men, it'll be a captain's uniform. 500, I'm a colonel. One thousand, it's a general's epaulets. The governor thanked me for my loyalty. Why, we're thicker than thieves. Well, closer than peas in a pod. Come here to me. Oh, dear. You know, it's really not a bad feeling. What? Respectability. And how could you judge of that, Mr. Lafitte? And Charlotte. Good evening, madame. And that you'd better see if any of the silverware is missing. Madame. I found something a lot more precious than silverware. I'll take this miniature of your niece. <gasps> Do you mind? Mr. Lafitte! You have caught me red-handed. But I'll make my escape. Goodbye, madame. I go to an ex-Louisiana to Barataria. I'm very much afraid, Governor Claiborne, that you've been taken in. Would you mind being more explicit, Senator Crawford? There can be no doubt of it, Governor. And every man on this defense council will back me up. Look at the papers that Jean Lafitte showed you. No British insignia, no seal attached to any of them. Now, these letters are forgery. I think Senator Crawford is right. They seem scarcely credible. A commission in the Royal Navy? <laughs> this is probably a scheme to lure Jackson to New Orleans so the British can land at Mobile. Well, that sounds like common sense to me. What shall we answer him? I know the exact answer, Governor. Dead pirates make the best pirates. I send them the executive. Very well. We'll send our ships to storm Barataria. And I'll make this one 
while you were gone. <laughs> Thank you. That's very nice, Gretchen. You see that, Dominic? Yeah. <laughs> That's our flag now. Yeah, that is pretty, eh? Huh? <laughs> but do you know for why it has 15 stars and 15 stripes? Why, yes. It's because, uh, 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 uh Dominic, huh? Do you know why it has 15 stars and 15 stripes? Oh, certainly I know. It is because, uh, well, because, uh, you, oh, well, because the boss president like it better that way. You are both very bad Americans. Every star and stripe is a state. Sort them together, and they are the United States. Oh, well, of course. And I'll certainly. make it for you, Mr. Boss, a present. Mm. Well, thanks, funny one. Don't make us think of you when you're home in, uh, uh, What's the name of that place? Don't speak, I'm Zydeze. Fine, fine. But don't speak, I'm Zydeze is not my home anymore. Oh, yes, it is. You certainly can't stay here. I certainly will stay here. What? Pack your things. You're leaving today. I will go with you. Well, we're going into battle. Women don't know anything about fighting. Ha! Huh. You don't know anything about women. Does any man. Uh, why don't you want to go home? Oh, because... Well, that's not a good enough excuse. Mr. Boss, who is that girl? The one in the picture you bring back. Oh, that... A lovely lady who lives in New Orleans. Oh. Is that why you want me to go home? You're a little fool, aren't you? Yes. I know that before you say it. Her hair is very pretty, too. And her eyes, they... I will go, boss. Boss, boss, American ships are putting in. Aha, there you are, Dominique. <laughs> American boats, they come to join us. Come on, give them a welcome. Hey, ring the bell. Ring the bell. All right, you men, get into the longboats. Pilot them to the landing. Viva los Americanos! Viva! Hey, boss. What are they doing? Firing on us. My friend, you got your feet. Let's give them a taste of the long No, hold your fire. Get back, I tell you. Don't fire. Dominic. Yes, boss. Dominic, get everybody out of here. Back to the bayous. Tell them to hide in the swamp. Hey, boy. Back to the bayous. Follow you. Into the boats. Hey, get your families out. Get back to the swamp. We let them come as friends, and they shut us down like dogs. Boss, boss, you pushed the boat all day to the swamps. Maybe you sleep a little now. The stars are out. Not for those men lying in the sand back there. Can't you forget your thought just for one moment? No. They'll hang every man they caught today. A one day's trial in New Orleans and four feet of rope. Maybe, boss. But what those ships did to your men is only what you have done to other people. That's not true. I saw it. On the Corinthians. Those were never my orders. But you were the boss. Yes, that's right. I am the boss. And I'm to blame for every man dead at Barataria. And somebody's going to pay for it. Now you want to kill some more. Oh, you're a funny man, boss. All you think of is fighting and killing. Don't you know there's such a thing in the world as love? Yes. Now that's gone, too. Now you cannot marry that lady of the picture. Don't bother me with your silly question. But love is not a silly question. What do you know about it? A great deal. I'm in love. Yes? With whom? With you. I don't know whether to bow to you or use this paddle on you. It does not matter which. I love you. When you're a little more grown up, you'll find some fine young... I'm more grown up now than you will ever be. You spend your life fighting. And fighting is for little boys, not for men. And you're a very bad little boy. But I love you. Oh, it's too late for all that. Too late for me and too early for you. No. Never it is too late and never it is too early to love. Oh, boss. Boss, you don't even know what it is to be happy. I know a life you never even dreamed could be. You laugh when I say, don't speak, I'm Zyder Z. But there, there's an old little house on a little river where the tulips, they are... I'd turn your river to poison. No, boss. And every day we say hello to an old stork who makes his nest on the roof. That is good luck. And all day the windmill sings, ka-ching, 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 ka-ching. <sighs> yes, it's a sweet dream, little Gretchen. And I thank you for it. Oh, don't thank me. Take me there. And leave my men rotting in cells or hiding like snakes in these swamps? Nothing will make you forget. No. The blood of my men is my own blood. We've got to get out of here. We've got to get on to New Orleans. 
I'll get those men out of jail if... If you have to kill more to do it. General Jackson must have known all about this. Jackson must be in New Orleans now. I'll see him there. You're a funny man, boss. <laughs> There he is, General Jackson. General Jackson. Where the Arkansas? General Jackson, ma'am. Why, he's just coming through the door. Oh, yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies, gentlemen, I'm honored by this gracious welcome to New Orleans. What can we do, General? How can we aid you? We need powder, food, and we need flints for our rifles. But above everything, we need men. Men to fight beside us for America. And now, I must beg you to excuse me. Time for your bill, Andy. Uh, what? Oh, no, no, not now, Mr. Peavy. Uh, where's the defense counsel? Uh, waiting inside. Uh, I'll show you, Andy. It's none you to carry a musket, General, but we have a right to know what'll happen to New Orleans. Before I'll surrender this city, gentlemen... I'll burn it to the ground. New Orleans will not be sacrificed to your madness. No, I begin to know America's friends from our enemies, Senator Crawford. The legislature will meet at once to discuss surrender. I believe, Senator, your sympathies are with the enemy. Better to be in the hands of the enemy than in the hands of a maniac. Uh, Mr. Peavy. Uh, what's bothering you, Andy? Show these gentlemen out. All right. Skedaddle now, skedaddle. Come on, come on. And uh, shut the door, Mr. Peavy. I want to be alone for a while. Stay as you are, General Jackson, and don't call your guard. I have you covered. I'll call my guard when I'm ready. You seem to be looking for an easy way out of life. Where'd you come from? I've been standing outside that window. I want to speak to you. Who are you? My name is Lafitte. The pirate? The privateer. With a price on his head. I'll have no truck with men of your breed, Lafitte. At this moment, you're not in a position to be exclusive. You're an impudent devil and... What do you want? The lives of my men. Why should I give a horseshoe in Hades for their lives? Among other things... To save your own. Then I refuse. Your men are pirates. A scum following this city in its hour of need. And I don't relish threat. And I don't relish talk. You'll sign the order for their release. Now. Uh, don't shoot, uh, Mr. Peavy. That's an old trick, General. I'll keep my eyes on you. As you please. Mr. Peavy, this is Mr. Lafitte, the pirate. Evening, Mr. Lafitte. Shall I pull the trigger now, Andy? Mr. Peavy stands outside of windows, too. Have you anything to say, Lafitte, before I answer Mr. Peavy's question? Well, <clears throat> I have some personal property to dispose of. A matter of 8,000 flints. Flints? And... Musket flints? Where? Where the powder is. How much powder? 30 kegs, enough to work our cannon for a week. Put your gun on the table, Mr. Lafitte. Thank you. Get out, Mr. Peavy. Andy, can you tie him up for you yes, first? No, no, thank you. Go on. Are you lying about those flints? No, and I'm not lying about my men. The flints, are they in the city? When the last one of my men is released, I'll tell you. How many men have you? Enough to win this battle for you. Where are they? In the swamps and in jail. Well, by the They're men who live by fighting, deserters from every nation under the sun. I'm a cannoneer of Napoleon, the blackest rogue unhung, and the best shot, all fighters. And all with bloody hands, eh? Like a soldier's. A soldier fights for his country. That's what we asked to do, and we're answered by bullets. You didn't ask me. I do now. General Jackson. What is it? What do you mean Monsieur by... Monsieur Villeray, he must see you. This fellow here, Andy, I guess he wants to see you, all right. Monsieur le General, c'est incroyable, mais c'est vrai. Les Anglais ont apparu sur Speak English, man. Dans la maison même, moi je vais échapper seulement. Speak English. General, this man says the British have appeared at his plantation. Where is that? Eight miles from the city, on the Bayou Cattle. Are they in force? The whole army. We'll hold the line of the Rodriguez Canal. Mr. Peavy, call the officer of the guard. Have the bugler sound assembly. Colonel Butler, we are march at once by the Salmet Road. The Salmet Road, General. Major Hans. Get your Mississippi dragoons into their saddles. Take the advance. Yes, General. Get General Coffee here. Assemble all commands at Chalmette. Get every man and musket into the ranks. Rouse the town. Body of death, I need men. What's your price, Lafitte? Full pardon for my men. And for yourself? One hour's start when the battle's over. It's a bargain. I'll sign the release. Make it a carte blanche on the jail. All right. Now get your devils out of the swamp and the jail and bring them to Chalmette. Crawford hasn't surrendered the city. Body of death. If he gets that legislature to surrender... It won't. If Crawford isn't there... Then by the seven plagues of Egypt, he shouldn't be there. 
if someone has to run him through. Thanks. I knew I'd like you, General. We pause for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. That was Act Two of The Buccaneer, starring Clark Gable with Olamp Bradner, Akim Tamiroff, and Gertrude Markle, whom we hear in the third act following this short intermission. But before Mr. DeMille brings you, as his intermission guest, one of America's most famous authors, let me just give the ladies in our audience this reminder. It's thrifty to buy several big boxes of Lux Flakes at a time, so you'll have it handy always in bathroom, kitchen, and laundry. Sweaters, blouses, and dresses, as well as undies and stockings, stay new-looking longer when you give them regular Lux care. That's why so many women find Lux Flakes the finest clothes economy known. And let me remind you to have pencil and paper ready at the end of this program to jot down full details of the Rogers Silver Plate offer. And now, here's our producer ready to introduce our famous guest of the evening. One of the luckiest moves I ever made occurred many years ago when I bought a novel for the screen from Rupert Hughes. That started a friendship with one of the most talented men I've ever known. Rupert Hughes has written some 35 novels, hundreds of brilliant articles and short stories, a celebrated biography of George Washington, an encyclopedia of American music, contributed to a monumental history of the world, and is a real authority on early American pirates. He's been a director, writer, and producer for the screen, discovered Lawrence Tibbet, is a recognized sculptor, and is the uncle of Howard Hughes, the aviator. He sleeps four hours a day, smokes 20 cigars, drinks 30 cups of coffee, and is one of the few famous men in Hollywood whose telephone number you can find by simply looking it up in the book. But how did I get in here? I was looking for my lost dog. He had me on a leash, but I got away. Oh, I know you. You're Dr. DeMille, aren't you? Doctor? I read that a college gave you the honorary degree of Doctor of Letters. Why? (laughs) Probably because I have to do so much doctoring on the scripts you writers turn out. Ouch. (laughs) As for that, didn't your own college make you a Doctor of Letters, too? Yes, but what good does it do me? I can't even write a prescription. Well, that doubtless saves quite a few lives. Speaking of saving lives, Cecil, I had an idea. I stole it from that glorious speech of Lafitte's, which Clark Gable delivers so powerfully. It shows how a vicious pirate offers to help turn a black danger into a golden victory. It's happened before, it can happen again. It ought to happen all the time. Pirates were people whom circumstances turned into criminals. Our country contains so much crime because, while a large percentage of lawbreakers are of low mental caliber, we still find men and women of tremendous courage, often of immense cleverness, devoting their gifts to evil instead of good. Almost all boys want to be pirates, fight Indians, or be policemen. The main thing is they want to fight somebody, anybody. Thousands of them go wrong. We try to check them with prison cells and hard labor. But nothing seems to do any good. Why? Because we try to repress them. We make no use of all that courage and restlessness. There's our crime against our criminals. It seems to me that what we ought to do, what we've got to do, is this. When we find a boy or a girl with a wild streak of adventure, a ferocious resentment of the dull life, we must offer that fiery soul an opportunity to use its energy for the benefit of itself and of everybody. We couldn't save them all, but we could save hundreds. We ought to learn a lesson from the feet. Realizing there's no taming criminals, the thing for us to do is to find some way of using them for their own happiness and ours. Have you a suggestion? I'm only a doctor of letters, not of souls or bodies. Hmm. Then shall we get on with the program? By all means, but before I go, would you tell me one thing? Does either of those two nice girls get Clark Gable, or do they divide him up? (laughs) Wait and see. Pity he's not the Gable twins, the Gable sex tuplets. Uh, Rupert, please go quietly. I can take a hint. But first, thank you, Cecil, for bringing us these splendid stars and plays week after week. This theater, I think, occupies a definite place in American social life. and I'm flattered to have been asked here. Goodbye. Hmm. The key's under the mat for you, Rupert. Any time. Goodbye.
The Buccaneer, starring Clark Gable with Olamp Bradner, Akeem Tamirov, and Gertrude Michael. <laughs> With the British on the march to New Orleans, a swift series of events crowded each other in the race for defense. Lafitte, with the order for release in his pocket, opens the jail doors for his men. Yeah, we are free! They both, they got us free! Yeah! In a fair fight with the traitor Crawford, the buccaneer pirate made certain that the legislature would not surrender the city. I... I'll fight you tomorrow at the dueling hooks. Oh, no, Mr. Crawford. You didn't give my men at Barataria a formal invitation to be killed, but here's yours. <laughs> With Crawford dead, the city sprang to arms. Out went the call to Lafitte's men hiding in the swamps. Through the bayous they came, paddling madly toward New Orleans, the woods echoing to their battle cry. Into the city they poured, up to the line of defense, to fight side by side with the regulars, repulsing every advance made by the British, driving them back inch by inch, until at last came the welcome cry. Victory! (laughs) My little sparrow, it was wonderful, eh? Everywhere you hear now, Lafitte, the great Lafitte, the brave Lafitte, Lafitte, Lafitte. <laughs> His pirates, they saved the city. And I was there too, was I not, Dominique? Yeah. I helped the boss too when I carried the powder. <laughs> oh, certainly. <laughs> oh, my little cockroach, it is so good. <laughs> no more they hang us, eh? You know... Tonight they give a victory ball, the great victory ball. And for who? Eh? <laughs> for Lafitte. <laughs> oh, well, of course, Jack's son, he will be there too. But the victory ball, it is yes. for Lafitte. And she will be there. Huh? In a lovely dress, and he will be a hero. Mm-hmm. And perhaps he will kiss her. Uh, what is this? And then she will marry him. Oh, well... <laughs> That, that is how it is, eh? Oh, I cannot help that I love him. He says my shoes squeak, but he makes my heart squeak, too. Oh. Well, what is it that you want? I want to go to the victory ball. I want to wear a more beautiful dress than hers. <laughs> I want to sparkle more beautiful jewels than she has. <laughs> I want my hair so lovely, her always look like hay. <laughs> I want to be so grand and shiny, he won't even look at her when I walk by. <laughs> I want to make him love me. Oh, Dominic! <laughs> Oh, by Jiminy the Aval. And who can do this for my little mackerel? Eh? Me. Me, Dominic, you. I have more jewels than anybody else. I have the beautiful dresses, too. I have all you want. <laughs> look, look in that chest. Huh? Dominic. Uh, oh, how wonderful. Uh, and all for you, my little shrimp. But where did you get these things from? Huh? Where? Oh, I don't remember. I think, uh, I think off the floor. His Excellency, the Governor of Louisiana, Mr. Daniel Carroll, Captain... Don Lafitte! Captain in Lafitte, General Jackson. I have the honor to inform you, sir, that I have dispatched letters to the president commending you and your men for service to the country. Thank you, sir. Your example was expiring to a follow. Oh, General Jackson. Oh, yes. Your officers are brilliant as well as brave. Oh, uh, Mr. Remy, may I present uh, Captain Lafitte, who has won the respect of the whole army? Of the entire city. Captain Lafitte. Your respect, mademoiselle, means everything. May I have this dance? Certainly. Captain. This way, mademoiselle. Let's get out of here. Now. Oh, you. I'm so happy I could cry. Let's laugh instead. Out on the balcony where we can be alone. Oh, Jean. It's all true. It it is true, isn't it? <laughs> You mean, uh, am I respectable? <laughs> I hope so. And then? Yes. What, you? I... 
I've been trying to think of something nice to say. Something sentimental. Uh, I can feel the words. Uh, they get right up to here, and then... Oh, don't bother. I know what they are. I'm thinking them, too. Darling. Good evening. Oh, good evening. They told me Captain Lafitte was here. Yes, mademoiselle. Oh, Captain. Captain, how nice to find you. Do you remember me? We met one time on the sea. You do appear in strange places, mademoiselle. Oh, uh, this is Miss DeRibi, Miss, uh... Oh, uh, how do you do? How do you do? <laughs> the captain is really a delightful, uh, wicked man. Don't you think so? I found him both. Mm -hmm. But mostly wicked. <laughs> you flatter me, mademoiselle. <laughs> Shall we dance in that? But you haven't admired my new coiffure. Yes, 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 it's very nice. My but... dress? Does it not excite you? <laughs> not as much as your presence, mademoiselle. Oh. Now you tease me. Oh, it is a beautiful dress, mademoiselle. And I know where you had it made. Oh, yes? In Gay Paris. Oh, no. In Gay New Orleans. Your dressmaker made one just like it for my sister, Mary. Your sister? Yes. This has the same, uh, same tucks and everything. She could, took it with her when she sailed the Corinthian. The Corinthian? Oh, excuse me. <laughs> what a strange little creature. I've seen her before somewhere. Annette, your sister was... was on the Corinthian? Yes, why? Jean, why do you look like that? Have you heard anything about Mary? No. No, nothing. Oh. Now I remember that girl. She was on the dock with Mary. She was selling on the Corinthian, too. I'm going to ask her. Annette, please. Please don't ask her, Annette. But why, Jean, what is it? Annette, believe me, trust me. Oh, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm going to find that girl. Wait, mademoiselle, please. I, I want to speak to but you. But I, I must go. I. Uh... You, you were on the Corinthian, weren't you? No. No, you make a mistake. But I remember you well. Anything I wrong, Miss Remy? This girl, she was on the Corinthian. The Corinthian? Why, it's never been reported from Havana. Where did you leave the Corinthian, miss? I... I don't remember. You didn't fall overboard, did you? Yes. Yes, I fall overboard. The big splash and I swim. Well, good night. You didn't swim all the way back, did you? Oh, he picked me up. That man over there. Please, I, I must go now. Oh, he picked you up. One of Lafitte's men picked you up. Yeah, me, Dominique, you. I pulled this little mackerel out. Oh, what is all this? Where is the Corinthian? Where did you leave my sister? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. But how... Why, you're wearing her minute, too. No. no. No, no, that's mine. It's the one I gave her. No. It's my mother's picture. How did you get it? I, I found it. I found it. Please. Oh, no, you didn't. And you didn't find that dress. Aunt Charlotte. Aunt Charlotte! She's wearing Marie's dress. She's from the Corinthian. The beast man brought her. Where's Lafitte? Ask him. There's evidence for you. The Corinthian was attacked by Lafitte, wasn't it? Speak up, girl. Oh, no, he couldn't have. He couldn't. Speak up. You hear her. Let this girl go. Why? She was a witness. So am I. I was there when the Corinthian burned. He, he admits it. No, Jean, I don't believe it. You, you couldn't have. Now, you wouldn't believe the truth if you heard it, Governor. Tell me. I'll believe Tell it. Tell us all. Gentlemen, the Corinthian was sunk... And every soul on board but one was lost. Not by you, Jean. Not by you. What difference does it make now, Annette? I was their boss. My son. My son was on that ship. Oh, oh, women on that boat. Every passenger lost. He can't get away now. Get a rope. One moment, please. This city is under martial law. He's outside the law. He sank the Corinthian. They killed all hands. This is no affair of yours, General Jackson. I'm in command here. Lafitte. Are you responsible for sinking the Corinthian? I am responsible. That's enough. Hang him. Come on, take your pilot out. Just a minute. General, surely you're not going to defend this man? No, sir. But I made a deal with him. He joined our forces and he fought well. And for that service, I promised him a pardon for his men and one hour's start for himself. And by the eternal, that one hour start he shall have. Thank you, General. Annette, I'm not as guilty in this as you think. I knew nothing of your sister. For your belief in me, I'm grateful. But unworthy. 
Gentlemen, I leave you. An American, New Orleans. Well, uh, I think we make it, boss. They never catch this boat now. <clears throat> what flag we break out, boss? We have no flag. Huh? Well, what course we steer? Where we go? Straight to... Straight out to sea. My eye, boss. Bien, mon capitaine. All hands to the tops! Square away the yard! Mr. Boss. Gretchen, you shouldn't have come here. I go where my boss go. We're going out to sea. This deck under our feet is our only country. Well, it's a good deck. And our home port, sooner or later, will be the bottom of the sea. I'll be there, too, with you, boss. John Lafitte has sailed back into the past. In his place stands Clark Gable. Our evening would be only half complete without a word from Mr. Gable. Well, I'll make it brief, Mr. DeBell. Those who saw your picture know without my telling them what a fine performance Frederick Marsh turned in as Jean Lafitte. I'm very grateful to you for giving me the chance to step into Lafitte's boots on the air. If I measured up to the standards set by Mr. Marsh, I'll be still happier. I'd like to thank everyone in the cast. But better yet, Mr. DeBell, I really think that Miss Bradner, Mr. Tamirov, and Miss Michael should come up here and take their own bows. Uh, let the ladies talk first. I'm a very polite fellow. <laughs> Thank you, Akim. Oh, I don't know how I sounded, Mr. DeMille, playing a Dutch girl with my French accent in an American play. <laughs> However, though, I'm a very loyal listener. This was my first time on a Lux Radio Theater, and if it's as nice as this all the time, I surely hope you let me come back. <laughs> <laughs> very, very nice, Alain. And uh, now, Miss Michael. Well, you seem to be running the show, Akim, but it's all right. Fire away. <laughs> it's all quite understandable, Mr. DeMille. With Mr. Tamaroff playing a big part in your nude picture, Union Pacific. I think he's entitled to get at the microphone as soon as he can. Goodness knows he's trying to. Shh, Gertel, Gertel, please. <laughs> it's all yours, our Kim. Thank you, Mr. Tamil, for a grand evening. Good night, Gertrude. Now, Mr. Tamaroff, go ahead with your latest barrage. Well, I just want to tell you, Mr. Demille, I have all my homework done for my part in Union Pacific. You make me a bullwhacker, so I practice for three months, and now I can use the bullwhip like nobody's business. I can snap a cigarette out of your mouth. You know, like that. You want me to try it? No, I've temporarily stopped smoking. Uh, too bad. But let me tell you, uh, making pictures is the best education in the world. Why, once I played a deaf mute, so now I can speak the sign language. Another time I was a fiddle player, so I studied and became a beautiful violinist. Well, sometime I'd like to play a man who makes a million dollars. <laughs> Good night, Mr. DeMille. Hey, Good night, Bullfighter. In a few moments, Mr. DeMille will bring us exciting news of next week's play in stars. Meanwhile, I want to tell you more about that original Roger Silverplate offer that many people, including the Brownings, are taking advantage of right now. You see, the makers of Lux Flakes are giving us a serving spoon and cheese server for only 25 cents and the top from a large box of Lux. Both pieces are original Roger silver plate in the graceful allure design that matches the teaspoon so many of you ordered from us in the spring. You know, with Christmas only six weeks away, this is a swell chance to get some lovely gifts for your friends. Give them this twin set, the handsome serving spoon and handy little cheese server. It's an exclusive pattern, one they can't buy at any store. The only way to get it is through this offer. Why, I'll bet they'll be tickled pink to own such fine tableware. And so will you. It's so rich looking and gives such splendid wear. In fact... You get a certificate from the International Silver Company, the world's largest silversmiths, which guarantees satisfaction in regular use. Quite a bargain, isn't it? Why, here you are getting beauty and quality and guaranteed service for only 25 cents on a Lux box top. Just cut the top from a large box of Lux Flakes. Write your name and address plainly on a piece of paper. Wrap it around 25 cents in coin. Please don't use stamps. And mail it with the box top, large size, to Lux, Meriden, M-E-R-I-D-E-N, Meriden, Connecticut. This offer is good only in the United States. I'll repeat that. To get your Rogers Silver Plate serving spoon and cheese server, 
Send 25 cents in coin and your name and address with the top of a large box of Lux Flakes to Lux, Meriden, M-E-R-I-D-E-N, Meriden, Connecticut. And now, Mr. DeMille. A young girl, flattered by the attentions of a handsome and celebrated pianist, accompanies him to a nightclub. Suddenly, a woman walks over to their table. The pianist tries to leave. He's shot. And the girl finds herself the principal witness at a sensational murder trial. The facts that come out in the courtroom mount into one of the most dramatic and unusual plays we've ever offered you, Confession. And appearing in Confession next Monday night, you'll hear four famous Hollywood artists, Miriam Hopkins, Claude Rains, Richard Green, and Anne Shirley. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Miriam Hopkins in Confession with Claude Rains, Richard Green, and Anne Shirley. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. Tonight we want to add our word of praise to the great work being done by the American Red Cross. All of us may have a part in the work of this great institution. Those who support the Red Cross form the backbone of a worldwide organization which gives its assistance generously and wholeheartedly to the victims of floods, hurricanes, fires, and other disasters which occur somewhere every year. Today, by your contribution to the Red Cross, you are helping to rebuild devastated areas, to care for the injured, and to provide for the helpless widows and orphans. Tomorrow, this great organization may be doing the same for you and yours. Give your support to the Red Cross now. Join your local chapter tomorrow. Olamp Bradner and Akim Tamirov appeared through courtesy of Paramount Studio. Miss Bradner's new film is called Say It in French, Mr. Tamirov's Ride a Crooked Mile. Frederick March will appear on the screen next in the Walter Wanger production, Trade Winds. Louis Silvers is from 20th Century Fox Studio. He directed music for their new picture, Submarine Patrol. Your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Family Theater presents Marta Torrin and Terry Kilburn. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, brings you Terry Kilburn in Robert Louis Stevenson's Treasure Island. To introduce the drama, your hostess, Marta Torrin. Thank you, Charles Arlington. Family theater's only purpose is to bring to your attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family theater urges you to pray... Pray together as a family. All of us spend many happy hours living in the shadow of our memories. One of my first recollections was hearing my father read to me the wonderful stories of childhood by Robert Louis Stevenson. So, tonight on Family Theater, it's like calling on an old friend when I introduce Robert Louis Stevenson's well-remembered classic, Treasure Island. Now, as Jim Hawkins, Terry Kilburn will tell you the story of adventure, pirates, and the treasure. I remember it all as if it were yesterday. And often at night, I awake in a sweat, 
my ears ringing with the angry boom of the surf. Off Treasure Island. The whole fantastic adventure began back in England, late on a bitter, foggy, frosty day after my poor father's funeral. I was down in the parlor of the Admiral Benbow Inn with our only guest, Captain Billy Bones, a mysterious seafaring man with a livid saber cut across one cheek. Matey! Matey, more rum! But, Captain, the doctor said that... as weak as a woman. If the doctor hadn't bled me after my stroke, I'd be able to travel. To get away from here. Get away where they'd never find me again. Who do you mean, there? Well, all that's left of the crew that sailed with old Flint. Not... Not Flint, the famous pirate. Yes, the same. I was old Flint's first mate, I was. And I, I'm the only one that knows the place. The place? Hey, he gave it to me at Savannah when he lay dying. Gave you what? Uh, whatever they're after. And, and the seafaring man with one leg, the one you've had me keep an eye out for all this time, is he one of them? Uh, he's the worst of all. Uh, matey, matey, I, I've got to have a run. Well, I, I, I'll give you a gold guinea for another noggin. I, I'd give... Uh... What's that? It was a cane. A cane tapping on the road outside. The captain sat paralyzed with fear as I went out to look. Slowly approaching the inn was a blind man, wearing a big green shade over his eyes and nose, and an old tattered sea cloak over his bent shoulders. He addressed the air in front of him as he walked toward me. Any kind friend can form a poor blind man who has lost the precious sight of his eyes in the gracious defense of his native land where or in what part of this country he may now be. Why, sir, you are at the Admiral Benbow Inn. Uh, oh, I hear a voice, a young voice. Will you give me your hand, my kind young friend, and lead me in? I gladly, my good... Oh, 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 you're hurting me. I'll break your arm, boy, unless you take me in straight to the captain. Now, much? Yes, sir. Now then, boy, when we come in view of him, cry out. Here's a friend for you, Bill. Yes, sir. Here, here's a friend for you, Bill. Two. Sit where you are, Billy Bones. If I can't see, I can hear a finger stir. <laughs> business is business, Billy Bones. Hold out your left hand, <laughs> boy. Take his left hand by the wrist and bring it near to my right. Like, like this? No. There. Now, that's done. Oh, he, he's gone now, Captain. Uh, Captain, what are you staring at? Uh, What's that he put in the palm of your hand? The, the black spot. It's, it's done now. I've got the black spot. But what does it mean? It means... I wait... Wait, the time. Uh, the time will be written on the other side of the black spot. Uh, ten o'clock. They'll be here for me at ten o'clock. Uh, I'll do them yet. I'll be so far away from here by ten o'clock. Oh, Captain. Captain, it's your heart, Captain. I, I lie. I am. Uh, I'm done for. Here. Here. Here, I take this. Take it. And, and keep, keep it. Oh. oh, Mother. Mother, come quickly. The captain is dead. Mother and I ran to the village for help. But after hearing my story, no one would come back with us to the inn. They were all afraid of the pirates. Afraid of what would happen at ten o'clock. So we returned to the inn alone. But as we approached, we saw men. Pirates battering at the door of the inn. Hiding in the hedgerow by the side of the road, we watched them break the door and storm inside. But soon they emerged again. It's gone! It's that boy who took it! I wish I'd put his eyes out! Back to the ship lads, before the revenue has come! (laughs) 
I waited only long enough to make sure that the pirates were really gone and that my mother was all right. Then set off to hunt for Dr. Livesey, who was the one friend on earth we could always count on. I found him at last at the home of Squire Smollett. What puzzles me, Squire, is why old Pew thought that Jim had what they were after. Aye, aye. How about that, lad? Well, old Pew must have meant this. Hmm? Oh, a small oilskin packet. Where did you get it, Jim? Well, the captain gave it to me just before he died. He told me to keep it. Hear that, Doctor? Hear that? Let's see it, Jim. Oh, sewn together very securely. We'll soon discover why. But you see, Billy Bones, uh, that was the captain's name, said Flint had given him something that the rest of Flint's old crew was after. This might be it. By gad, if it is, if it is Flint's treasure map. Treasure map? Look, the map of an island. And down in the corner, the initials J.F. That could only mean Flint. And, and you think there's really buried treasure? Read for yourself, lad. Read what it says under this little cross in red ink. It says... Bulk of treasure here. Jim, this man Flint was the most bloodthirsty buccaneer that ever sailed. He buried a fabulous amount of treasure. And it'll be ours, or I'm the son of a rum puncheon. Our squire? Yes. Dr. Livesey, at dawn I start for Bristol, there to fit out a ship. Within three weeks, no, no, make it ten days, we'll be ready to sail. The three of us? Of course. Livesey, you shall be ship's doctor. And Jim Hawkins here. Hawkins shall be cabin boy on our voyage to Treasure Island. Actually, it was a month before we set sail aboard the schooner Hispaniola, with a company of the toughest old salts imaginable. Because it had been some years since the squire was at sea, most of the crew had been hand-picked by our ship's cook, Long John Silver. The first time I saw Long John Silver, my heart was in my throat. For wasn't he a one-legged man? And hadn't Billy Bones put me on the lookout for such a person? <laughs> but then... Long John was such an honest, hearty soul, everyone liked him. Moreover, the voyage went smoothly enough, despite the fact that everyone seemed to have learned somehow that we were on a treasure hunt. It was on the night before we were due to sight Treasure Island that I fell asleep inside the apple barrel on deck. When I awoke, it was to the murmur of voices. Peeking out, I saw Long John and a seaman named Dick sitting alongside the barrel. I was about to crawl out and join them when I heard something that made my heart jump. Uh, well, but I... Hi, Dick. You're young, you are, but you'll smelt as paint. And I'll talk to you like a man. And I'll listen like one. I'm ready to join in with you if you can give me reason why. Reason? Why, Dick, when this voyage is done, you'll be that rich you'll never have to tread a deck again. You... You really think Flint's treasure is on that island? Think, lad. John Silver knows it. Wasn't I old Flint's quartermaster when he took it ashore? <laughs> I'm with you, Long John, and there's my hand on it. <laughs> Didn't I say that, George Mary? That dick, I said, he'll join in with us, too. Everything shipshape, Long John. Aye. And we've got all the men we'll need. So what I want to know now is, when do we take over? When? By the powers, George Mary, I'll tell you when. After we have the treasure aboard. But why? Why, you say? I'll tell you why. Here's this squire and doctor with a map in sight. I don't know where it is, do I? Well, then, I mean for them to find the stuff and help us get it aboard. Then, I'll finish with them. But uh, what will we do with them, anyhow? Well, we could put them ashore like maroons or cut them down like so much, Paul. Cut them down, I say. Dead men don't bite, I say. Yes, that's my vote, too. When I'm in Parliament and riding in my coach, I don't want none of them coming home unlooked for. When the time comes, I say, let her rip. <laughs> Long John, you're a man. You'll say so, all of you, when the time comes. <laughs> oh, jump up like a sweet lad, Dick, and get me an apple. Huh? Do you hear that? Aye. We've sighted Treasure Island. In the general excitement that followed, I escaped from the apple barrel and sought out Dr. Livesey and the squire. Grim indeed were their faces when they heard my story. Well, Captain, what do we do now? It's for you to say. And I say this, Doctor. It's plain that we're vastly outnumbered. Our only hope lies in the fact that they'll let us be until the treasure is found. Well, then, we'll come to blows with them some fine day when they least expect it. <laughs> Next
next morning, the ship was anchored as though nothing were wrong. Then, in the heat of the day, as mutiny seemed about to boil to the surface, the men were told they could have the afternoon ashore. Without reckoning the consequences, I slipped into the nearest gig and went with them. Long John's look frightened me, though. So the instant we touched land, I ran for dear life into the woods. There I wandered aimlessly, until I suddenly realized that I was being followed. It was the strangest apparition of a man I had ever seen. A shaggy, sun-blackened figure, dressed in tatters. As he fitted behind a tree, I hastily drew my pistol. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, don't shoot, I say. Don't shoot, mate. Then come out, whoever you are. Come out or I will shoot. Hey, I'm poor Ben Gunn, I am. I'm Ben Gunn. And I haven't spoke with a Christian in three years. Three years? Were you shipwrecked? Nay, hey, mate, marooned. Marooned three years ago and lived on goats and, say, and berries and oysters. Wherever a man is, says I, a man can do for himself. But, mate, my heart is sore for Christian diet. You, uh, you mightn't happen to have a, a piece of cheese about you now. No, I, I'm afraid not. Cheese. <gasps> oh, many's a long night I've dreamed of cheese. Toasted, mostly, and woke up again, and here I was. Uh, mate, uh, who do you call yourself? Jim. Jim, Jim, Jim. Jim. I'm rich. Well, well, that's nice. Rich, rich, I says. And I'll tell you what. Jim, I'll make a man of you. Oh, you'll bless your stars that you was the first that found me. Jim, you listen to Ben Gunn. I were in Flint's ship when he buried the treasure. He and six along with him, six strong seamen. But only Flint came back to the ship. The others he left behind, dead and buried. You mean he murdered them all? Aye. Murdered them so as they could never tell where the spot was? Aye. And now, now here's where poor Ben Gunn went afoul. Years ago, I were on another ship that sighted this island. I told him about the treasure, but we searched and found nothing. So they turned on me. And left me behind with just a musket, a spade, and a pickaxe. You can stay here and find Flint's money for yourself, they said. Oh, I, I don't think I could stand that. Now, just you say to your captain, Jim, Gunn is a good man, you say. And much of the three years he'd think upon a prayer, you say. But the most part of Gunn's time, this is what you say, the most part of his time was took up with another matter. And then you'll give him a nip, like this. And another, like this. Hey, stop, stop pinching me. Ah, it's clear to you, Jim, what Ben Gunn's been saying? No, no, not a bit of it. Oh, but that's neither here nor there. For how am I to get on board? Well, there's a boat. A boat? Made with my two hands. Keep it under the white rock. The big white rock on the shore, not far. Huh? What's that? A cannon shot. But well, they've begun to fight. Fight, is it? And look, Pat. Look over there in the distance. Pat. The Union Jack is flying. It is a Union Jack, flying over the stockade that old Captain Flint once built. Oh, mate, your friends has landed. No, no, it must be the pirates in the stockade. Jim, well, and what would they be doing with the Union Jack? It's a Jolly Roger they'd be flying. Well, that's the case. I but... wait till nightfall and join them. And uh, when you want to see Ben Gunn again... <laughs> well, Jim, you'll know where to find him. When night came and the noise of battle died out, I made my way to the stockade where the Union Jack still flew. It was risky business trying to convince the lookouts that I was indeed Jim Hawkins, but finally they let me in. Count for yourself, Hawkins. I'm in command, whether at sea or ashore. And man or boy, all must abide by my discipline. I demand now to know why you up and left. But I'm sorry, truly I am, sir. And you can't imagine how surprised and relieved I was when I saw our flag flying over the stockade. Doctor, how did you happen upon this place? Well, Jim, I ventured ashore and came upon it by accident. We then decided we could fight them off better here. Enough of that, Doctor. I'm still waiting for Hawkins to account for himself. Jim, the captain's right. You've got to learn discipline. And I... Well, perhaps even the captain will forgive me when I tell you about Ben Gunn. About who? Yes, who is Ben Gunn? 
A man who hates Long John Silver as much as we. He was once a member of Flint's crew, and then three years ago, another ship marooned him here. He, uh, he hinted at a lot of things. Oh, he did, eh? Well, Jim, it may turn out that we can make good use of this Ben Gunn. Ahoy there! Quick, that? quick, every man to his post. Captain Silver, sir, waiting to come on board in my turn. Captain Silver, you say? Who's he? It's me, sir, Long John Silver. The poor lads have chosen me as their captain. So here I be to offer terms. Terms, is it? Say what you have to say and be quick about it. You ain't going to let me inside, Captain Smollett. It's a chill night out. Come to the point, Silver. Well, at least let me stick my head in through the musket port. Now, where's the army in there? Be quick, then. I thank you, Captain. Well, there's Jim. And Doctor is Miss Harris. Point, Silver? Our point, Captain, is this. We want that treasure and we'll have it. Your point, I reckon, is that you just as soon save your lives. Which brings me to this. You have a chart, haven't you? That's as may be. Well, you have, I know that. Now, you give us the chart to get the treasure by and stop shooting poor seamen. And we'll give you a choice. What choice, Silver? Either you come aboard along with us once the treasure is shipped, and then I'll give you me affid Davy to clap you somewhere safe ashore. Or if that ain't your fancy, then you can stay here, you can. We'll divide stores with you, man. Man for man we'll divide. And I'll give you me affid Davy to send the first ship I sight to pick you up. Now, answer my terms, you couldn't hope Is to that fight. All? Every last word by thunder. Refuse that, and you've seen the last of me, but musket balls. Very good. Now you'll hear me. If you'll come up one by one, unarmed, I'll engage to clap you all in irons and take you home to a fair trial in England. If you won't, I've flown my sovereign's colors, and I'll see you all to Davy Jones. Well, you now! Look. Before another day is out, I'll stove in your old blockhouse like a rum punching. Well, let me tell you this, Captain Smollett. Only them that die will be the lucky ones. At dawn came the murderous attack. But though vastly outnumbered, we finally forced the mutineers to withdraw, leaving behind many dead. There was little elation for us, however, for our position was still desperate, what with Captain Smollett grievously wounded and our supplies running low. All day I brooded over this, till at last I hit upon a plan, a plan which I dared not confide to the others, knowing they would forbid it. That night I stole away, located Ben Gunn's boat under the white rock, and rowing out to the Hispaniola, cut her adrift. I was finally able to strand the vessel in a sheltered anchorage on the other side of the island. Then, under cover of night again, I stole back into the slumbering blockhouse, only to find myself a prisoner of the pirates. Aha! Uh -huh. So you want to know what happened, do you, Jim Oakley? Well, yesterday morning in the dog watch, down came the doctor with a flag of truce. Says he, Captain Silver, you're sold out. The ship's gone. The ship gone? We looked out the sea and by thunder it was. That changed everything. So the doctor and me bargained. And here we are. Stores, brandy, blockhouse, and in a manner of speaking, the old blessed business. And your friends, they've tramped. Why are you telling him all this, Long John? It's some kind of trick he's been here. They themselves sent him. Not likely, George Mary. Didn't I hear the doctor call Hawkins a most ungrateful scamp for running off again? Dr. Lipsy said that? Aye. They're finished with you. So shiver me, Sarge Jim, there's nothing left for you to do but join Captain Sewer. Will, what have you got to say? Just this. I'm not such a fool, but that I know what I'm in for. But you're in a bad way, too. Ship lost, treasure lost, most of your men lost. Your whole plan gone to wreck. And if you want to know who did it, well, I did. What's this, sir? You? I was in the apple barrel the night we sighted land. 
and I overheard the whole plot. As for the schooner, it was I who cut her cable. So you see, the laugh's on my side. The laugh? This is how you feel, George Mary. Now then, go on, boy. One thing I'll say and no more. If you spare me, bygones are bygones. And when you're all in court for piracy, I'll save those I can. Kill me, and you kill a witness who might save you from the gallows. I'll slit your throat off there. I'm Captain here, and I like the boy. Lay hand on him, and my cutlass will soon see the color of your inside. Well, uh, what's to be done with him? Shiver me timbers, the boy's a hostage. Kill that boy? Not me, mates. He's as important to us as this. The map of my heart. Now what do you think of Captain Silver? He's got you the treasure map. My last hope died when I saw that it was in truth the treasure map. As for me, I was truly a hostage. And Long John never let me out of his sight. Next day, he even took me along under close guard as he set out to locate the buried treasure. Forty and five. Forty and six. Forty and seven. Forty and eight. Forty and... No. Look! What? It's gone! I... Nothing but a hole in the ground. That's our treasure. A hole in the ground. But you knew it all the time, didn't you? It's root on your face. This time, Long John, you and that boy die. That surely would have been the end of me. Except that the next moment we were surrounded by musket fire. It was my friends come to the rescue. Soon the fight was over, and those of the pirates who had resisted capture were dead. Jim, Jim Hawkins, my boy. Oh, Dr. Livesey. Thank God you've come through it all safely, Jim. Oh, but there's something I must tell you, Doctor. The treasure, it's gone. All we found was an empty hole in the ground. Oh, oh, don't let that worry you, Jim. I'd never have given Long John Silver the map if we didn't already have the treasure. What? Oh, then it, it's really ours. Thanks to you. To me? It was you who overheard the mutiny of brewing, and it was you who discovered Ben Gunn. Ah, oh, here he comes. <laughs> I'm poor Ben Gunn, I am. <laughs> I do Jim Hawkins pretty well, I think, yes, is you. Jim, after you told us about Ben, I hunted him out and learned that he transferred all the gold to a cave, and it's safe for us there at this very moment. Hey, safe in Ben Gunn's cave. And now Ben Gunn gets him a passage home. Well, right now we're all marooned. We have no ship. Oh, but we do have a ship, Dr. Livesey. She lies in the North Inlet where I stranded her. What? It, it, it won't be any trick at all to get her afloat. <laughs> Bless you, Jim Hawkins. You've saved us again. By tomorrow, we'll have that treasure stowed aboard and be away from this island. Away from this island? Away from this island. Yes. I remember it all as if it were yesterday. And my ears ring with the angry boom of the surf off Treasure Island. you know, Family Theatre is dedicated to the homes of our nation and of the world. And its sole purpose is to remind everyone that the practice of daily family prayer will help build those virtues which are the foundation of a strong, enduring home. We try not to preach about it. For most people, a reminder should be enough, especially if it is accompanied by a story which shows dramatically that the only way for free men and free families to live is the way of faith and goodness, of love of God and of neighbor. Sometimes we do it through serious drama, sometimes through a comedy, a musical, or even a western. We feel we are successful 
If you enjoy our family theater stories and are inspired by them, and if you remember and act upon the thought we bring you each week, the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you Terry Kilburn in Treasure Island with Marta Torren as your hostess. Others in our cast were Jane Novello, Edgar Barrier, Bill Boucher, Howard McNear, Dan O'Herlihy, and Junius Matthews. Robert Louis Stevenson's classic was adapted by Maurice Zim, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman, and was directed for Family Theater by Jaime Del Valle. This series of Family Theater broadcast is made possible by the thousands of you who felt the need for this type of program by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who have so unselfishly given of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Charles Arlington expressing the wish of family theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home, and inviting you to be with us next week at this time when Family Theater will present Gene Raymond and Mary Anderson in The Prisoner of Zenda. Join us, won't you? <laughs> Family Theater originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network, the Mutual Broadcasting System. Speaking for Lever Brothers, makers of Swan, the new white floating soap. Well, it's Tuesday night again. Time for another pleasant visit with George Burns and Gracie Allen. Their guests, Akim Tamirov, Jimmy Cash, and Paul Whiteman and his music. And now here are the six hits and a miss, singing Santa Claus is Coming to Town. <laughs> George and Gracie. Well, it's only two more nights till Christmas, and Gracie has already started to trim her tree. But as she hangs the ornaments, there's a worried look on her face. Her little duck, Herman, hasn't come home yet. Oh, George, I wish you'd go out and hunt for the poor baby. It's way past his dinner time. Oh, calm down, Gracie. Even with a meat shortage, nobody would want that darn duck. <laughs> But he's never been out this late before, except that time he flew up on the Morton's clothesline and crawled into the seat of Mr. Morton's union suit. Mm. Fine place for that kid to fall asleep. Uh, we mightn't have found him at all if Mr. Morton hadn't been ticklish. Gracie, will you stop worrying about that silly duck? Come on, let's finish trimming the tree. Oh, all right, dear. Hand me that big silver star and some of those little tinsel... Oh, 
Uncle George, I hear him on the porch. Open the door. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Come to Mama, darling. Why, you're frightened to death. And some of your tail feathers are missing. How did you lose them? He did not lose them. They're here in my hand. Oh, my goodness. Who are you? I am Akim Tamirov. with Herman's tail feathers. Ah, it was a mistake. I was reaching for his neck. <laughs> what? That's awful. My husband will take care of you. George, throw him out. But, Gracie, it's Christmas and... This broken down excuse for a man is your husband? What? Don't you say that. I happen to love this broken down excuse for a man. <laughs> well, thanks. Now, look. I'm sneering at your husband. Hey, you can't do that. You can't come into my house and sneer at me. <laughs> I'm in the house, no? Well, yes. And I'm sneering, no? Well, yes. And you're going to stop me, yes? Well, no. Ah, uh, that's telling him, dear. Hmm? Mr. Tamirov, I demand to know why you were chasing Herman. Because in my yard, I have a pond which used to be full of little goldfishes. Now you have a duck which is full of little goldfishes. <laughs> well, I don't believe it. Herman wouldn't do such a thing. He's a sweet, innocent little angel, aren't you, baby? Ah. Uh. <laughs> and he didn't eat any of your goldfish, did you, baby? Uh-uh. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Mr. Tamirov, you should be ashamed of yourself feeding goldfish to a delicate little baby duck. They might gild his little tummy. Hmm. I hope so. <laughs> Madame, I, I'll give you a word of warning. In the future, my yard is Stalingrad and that duck is Hitler. <laughs> oh. Is that so? It is so. If I ever catch him, we shall see if a duck can swim in sour cream. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you're just a mean man, and I hope you fall in your goldfish pond and catch cold and drown. Gracie, it's Christmas. Oh, yeah. And Merry Christmas. <laughs> oh, fine. Now, just remember, if that bird comes near my house again, я эту паршивую утку схвачу за горло и задушу своими руками. Well, George, what did he say? Well, I don't know. He's a Russian. I suppose that's what a Russian says when he's mad. Oh, no, it isn't. When a Russian's mad, he says, how do you do? <laughs> Eating the neighbor's goldfish. Why don't we trade that silly duck in for a pound of pork chops? <laughs> go on, go on, go on. <laughs> you finish the tree yourself. I'm going into the den where I won't have to look at that web footed goldfish bowl. <laughs> now, baby, baby, don't mind your daddy. He's this way every year. Just before Christmas, he tries to pick a fight with everyone on his gift list. Here, climb up on Mama's lap, Herman, and I'll tell you a little story. That's a good boy. Now, would you like to hear about Santa Claus? Santa Claus. He's the man who brings toys to all the children. The night before Christmas, Santa Claus comes down the chimney and leaves lots of things in your stocking. <laughs> this year, Mom would be happy if he just leaves some stockings. <laughs> <laughs> oh, just think, Herman. Right now, Santa is getting his presents ready to deliver to all the good little boys and girls. <gasps> Wouldn't it be wonderful if you could see Santa's workshop way up in the North Pole? <laughs> oh, oh, the poor baby has fallen asleep. Oh, no wonder. He's had a hard day. Oh, dear. I think I'll take a little nap myself. So nice in front of the fire. Oh, oh um, when I wake up, I'll tell him more about Santa Claus. And the North Pole. And the toys. And Santa Claus. There to the North Pole. Well, we'll fly up on Herman's back. On Herman's back? Oh, sure, he's already. I just put four gallons of goldfish in his tank. 
Well, good. I'll call him. Oh, hi, man. Herman Burns. Ah, <laughs> uh, there you are. Is who daddy's precious little itty-bitty ducky-wucky Herman? Ah. Uh. <laughs> well, you're a sweet little ducky-wucky, and your daddy loves you. Well, gee, I must be dreaming. Well, come on, Gracie. On the duck's back. All right. Boop. I'm on. Well, where am I going to sit? <laughs> you have to sit on his rumble seat. <laughs> Gee, am I going to get that pot again for Christmas? <laughs> All right, I'm ready. Okay, Herman, take off. <laughs> Gee, he can't make it. <laughs> oh, no wonder he can't take off. His rudder is dragging. <laughs> She can't hear you. I'm sure she can. Look who's with me, Mama. George. Of course you know him, Mama. It's George. You know, the man I married anyhow. Uh, dear old mother. She's a sweet, sweet girl. Say, we're really making time. Look, we're over Canada already. Oh, yes. And here comes Alaska. Yeah, and there's... Oh, poop. Oh, George, that wasn't nice. Gracie, we were over Kiska. Oh, we must be nearly there now, George. Yeah, there's Santa's place right down there. Okay, come in for a landing, Herman. Okay. Well, that was perfect, Herman. We're right in front of Santa's workshop. Now we'll all go in and see good old Chris Kringle himself, huh? Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> oh, you love Herman, love him, Herman. He's so gay and so jolly. <laughs> Why, Santa Claus? Greetings, little whitey. Uh... <laughs> oh. Now, buck up, Chris, old man. Oh. What's the trouble? Oh, Wes, in a whack, my Christmas is ruined. This year it will be a complete flop over. <laughs> oh, please, please don't cry anymore, Santa Claus. The tears are running down on your pretty red suit. And if your suit fades, you'll lose your job in the May Company window. All right, I'll stop. Ah! <laughs> but I have no toys for the winter ones this Christmas. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Santa Claus, huh? why haven't you got any toys for the kids? Because the wicked pirates stole them. The wicked pirates? Well, don't worry. My husband will get those toys back. He'll take that mean old pirate and smack him down, won't you, George? But, dear, it's Christmas and... Well, <laughs> smack him under the mistletoe. Well, I'll, I'll try. We'll weave right away. I'll tell my assistant to take care of things while I'm gone. We're going out to look for the wicked pirate. You look after things. Okay, Chris, I sure will. Well, that's Bill Goodwin. Bill, don't you know me? Gracie! Why, no, I, I don't believe we've met before, madam. But you're Bill Goodwin. Oh, no, not me. I'm one of the Kringle boys, Irving Kringle. How do? <laughs> Irving Kringle? Yes. Are you sure you're oh, not... Oh, Gracie, Gracie, let him alone. Don't you see he's busy working? What's all the black stuff you're washing? Oh, that? Oh, that's snow. But it's black. Well, sure it's black. That's the way it comes out of the mine. You see, it's white when we deliver it because I wash every flake. <laughs> Didn't you know snow is really black? Why, no. Southerner. <laughs> I mean, Irving. Well, sit down at the piano, Santa Claus, and let's tell him about oh, it. Oh, I... Beat it out on the old 88, Santa. Why, Santa, you got a cannon in your left hand. I'm in a groove tonight. <laughs> you solid are, Santa. Now everybody wants a white Christmas this year. So I'm a-washing all the snow so pretty and clear. With Swan, the new white floating soap, I wash it with zeal. Cause Swan is even purer than the finest cast steel. Rubbly of dub. Swan is the grandest soap, a rubbly of dub. Squab me with Swan. Because Swan soap is purer than the finest cast steel, it's kind to your hands and gives them extra appeal. 
is great for washing dishes, washing hankies or hose, or any other soap and water job you propose. Rub the up dub. Swan is the grandest soap. Whoop the up dub. Squab me with Swan. <laughs> Now, Swan has got a feature that you cannot resist. You break a bar in two with just a twist of the wrist. Use one half in the bathroom for your shower or tub. The other in the kitchen and you won't have to scrub. Rub, dub, dub. Swan is the grandest soap. Whoop, dub, dub. Scrub me with Swan. Rub, the up, dub. Swan is the grandest soap. Scrub me, mama, with a bar of Swan soap. catch him. He's probably planned his escape pretty carefully. Oh, don't worry about that, Santa. You know what I always say? The best planned men are oft times nice and lay after glee, gang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that? Mm. Well, I better call my Wayne dear and then off we'll go in this way. <whistles> hey, transportation, we port. Whoa, whoa, boy. Oh, George, look at Santa's reindeer. There's Dancer and Prancer and MacArthur and Doolittle and Comet and Wait Chippen. a minute, wait a minute. MacArthur and Doolittle? You mean Dunder and Blitzen? Not this year. Oh, it's a bad year, yeah, yeah. In this way, everybody, we're ready to weave. Well, Herman, you sit up front, and if you see the pirate's boat, you yell, Mama! Mama! That's right. Well, we're off. Giddy up, gang! <laughs> But, Santa Claus, aren't we going too fast? Oh, no, we're only going 32,000 miles an hour. Oh, well, just so we stay under 35. <laughs> oh, I, I guess so, yes. Where, where? Oh, Herman, that's not a pirate ship, that's a stork. What kind of a stork is that? It's carrying a T-bone steak. Well, of course, George. Today, that's a real bundle from heaven. <laughs> you know... I, uh, I, uh, I kind of knew steak was high, but I didn't, I didn't think it was up here. <laughs> now, Herman, don't say mama until you see the pirate ship. Okay. So, just keep a good watch, and then... Oh, what was that? It's the pirate ship. They're firing rockets at us. Yeah, and we're right over it. Look out! Look out! Here comes another one. Oh, they almost got us that time. We say it, we say it. <laughs> They can't frighten us. We'll go down and get them with my machine gun. Oh, they got us. We're falling. Oh, Gracie. 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 Landed right in the middle of the pirate ship. <laughs> Come on, you swabs. Up on your feet. Oh, George, look who the wicked pirate is. It's Mr. Tamirov. Yes, better known as Tamirov the Terrible. They call me that because I am. Listen, listen to me, Wolf the Terrible. I'm Santa Claus, and I want my toy. <laughs> such, a, such a funny fat man. Hey, Spanish job. Sure, then, what would you be on after you now? Timber off the terrible, sir. <laughs> now, is that skinny prisoner? Is that skinny prisoner still complaining because his cell is too small? Fast, and that he is, that he is. Well, take him out and shoot him. And put the fat man in. Oh, please. Oh, a plump little bird. Put him in a cell with the fat man, Spanish jaw. Ah, oh, tonight I will have breast duck. <laughs> Gee. You're, you're mean, aren't you? Well, my friend, I do not like to boast, but I'm the meanest, the nastiest, the dirtiest, the most low-down man who ever lived. Oh, oh you just say that. Oh, no, no, it, it's the truth. Never, even in the mill picture, was there such a wicked pirate. Oh, what about Captain Kidd? Oh, a cream puff. What about Blackbeard? Who? <laughs> Shoe salesman. Now, do you know why I stole the toys from Santa Claus? Huh? 
to sell them? No, I just took them because I'm mean. <laughs> I hate people. You do? Yeah, I hate everybody. Look. <laughs> Ouch. Right. Mm. You stepped on your own toe. Yeah, I even hate myself. <laughs> oh, you're not so mean. In fact, you pirates are a bunch of sissies. What's that? Well, you're all wearing earrings and bloomers. My lady. <laughs> lady, you don't appreciate what a mess I am. Walking the plank and cutting off the ears is for junior pirates. When I take prisoners... I tear up their ration books. <laughs> Pretty mean, eh? <laughs> Say, what are you going to do with us? Don't forget, it's Christmas. You, my friend, I shall have beaten to a pulp and then throw your body into the sea for the sharks to finish. But, uh... Uh, but the little lady here is uh, too pretty for such a fate. Oh, flatterer. <laughs> now, look, you're not going to uh, take... Quiet, Wickling. I think I will have a little fun with you. I will show you how a man kisses. <laughs> George, don't you let him kiss you. <laughs> Gracie, he means you. Oh. Yes. Now I shall make love to your wife, and you shall have the pleasure of watching. Boy, am I a healer. Huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> George, are you just going to stand there? Say something to this man. You bet I will. Listen, pirate. Yes? Hmm. What you're doing is not nice. Oh, that's telling him, dear. Ah, enough of this talk. Come, come, my little chicken. Put your lips close to mine. Oh, no, I won't. How do I know you wouldn't try to kiss me? Yeah. Sure, you can't be trusted. Maybe we need music, hmm? To create a romantic mood. Yeah, very well. Your husband shall serenade us with a love song. Me? You heard me. Sing. Oh, sure, sure. <clears throat> Lovely lady, I'm falling madly in love with you. Now, stop it, now. Now, I... stop it, stop it. When stop I'm... that. That's romantic? <laughs> you sound like you're gargling with hot borscht. <laughs> well, what you said is not nice. Now, wait, wait. I will cast a magic spell. Now, wait a minute. Hocus, pocus, abracadabra. There, now sing. Okay. <clears throat> Lovely lady, I'm falling madly in love. Gee, that's wonderful. I sound just like Jimmy Cash. Now go ahead, go ahead. Go sing some more. Play, pirates. Lovely lady, I'm falling madly in love. Would you care for another number? Oh, Thank you. what a ham. Now, don't forget it was my magic spell that gave you that voice. What? That was my natural singing voice. Oh, is it? <laughs> All right. Hocus, pocus, abracadabra. Now, let's hear you now. Okay. <clears throat> hey, what... What happened? Oh, George, I'm so happy. Now you sound like yourself again. Huh? <laughs> well, are you ready to make love now? Come, come, my pigeon. Don't you touch that little girl. You're the meanest and lowest skunk I ever met. Yes. Why, you're nothing but a low-down, miserable rat. Yes. Why, even Gracie's sister Bessie wouldn't make love to you. Oh, now, wait a minute, George. That's going too far. <laughs> well, I guess it is. Ah, I had enough of this. Hey! Only the sweet. 
Yes, boss, here I is. Now open the hatch and throw this riffraff down the hole. Show sure enough, boss. Yuck, 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 yuck. <laughs> down with them! George, we landed on a big bass drum. Please, get off my stomach. <laughs> Why, it's Santa Claus. Oh, pardon us for dropping in on you like this. Well, that's all right, widow lady. I was just looking into all my toys. This is where that snake in the glass pie would put them. Well, just look at all these wonderful toys. Scooters and sleds and dolls. And look, here's a bubble pipe. And the card says, from Mama and Papa to Willie. That's probably for your brother. Oh, George, don't be ridiculous. My brother Willie's 37 years old. He stopped blowing bubbles two years ago. <laughs> well, good for Willie. Well, here's my pride and joy right here. It's a talking doll. All you do is wind him up and he talks. Oh, really? Oh, let's try it. I'll wind it up and see what it says. <laughs> mama. Mama. Oh, it's a mama doll. Mama. Hey, Mama, get me some swan, the new white floating soap that's kind to your hand. <laughs> that's some, some doll. You women have long considered Castile soaps the standard of purity, Mama. But swan is even purer than the finest Castiles. Money can't buy a purer soap. That's why swan is so good for bathing. Oh, oh it ran down. Well, good, good. Oh, I want to wind it up again. He's so cute. Oh, Gracie, don't wind him up again. That's why swan is so good for bathing the baby. After all, if Swan is purer than the finest Castiles, well, it's bound to be kind to even a baby's tender skin. And if it's the soap for baby... Uh, I took the key. Oh. Well, here's a cute little gift. Look, George, a toy telephone. Oh, that's a dandy present. You can dial with it and everything. Well, I want to try it. Hello? Hello. As I was saying, if Swan is swell for baby, then it must be swell for your hands and face, your tub or shower. Gracie, Gracie, hang up. Santa Claus, did your assistant, Irving Kringle, have anything to do with these toys? He made them. I thought so, I thought so. Uh, leave them alone, Gracie. Oh, but George, I want to see how this little toy dog works. Well, I guess a dog is safe. Arf, arf! Use arf in the kitchen and arf in the bath. Oh, no! Arf, arf. <laughs> All these beautiful toys And it looks like the little kitties will never get them Roller skates, tin soldiers, bicycles, electric twains Wait a minute That old pirate can't have these What's that you're saying? Who can't have what? Well, you can't have these toys Santa Claus has to deliver them right away Why, those, those skates are needed in North Africa and Those scooters go to New Guinea And those toy trains have to go to Guadalcanal What's that? Marines play choo-choo? Oh, no. They won't go as skates and scooters and toy trains. But the metal in them will go as guns and tanks and planes for our boys to fight with. But won't the widow children miss the toys? Oh, well, give them toys, Santa Claus, but not toys made of metal and rubber. And I'll tell you something else all the boys and girls want for Christmas this year. They want war stamps. So, Santa, you load up your bag with all the war stamps you can carry. Because when the children get war stamps, they know they're helping their fathers and brothers and cousins and uncles and friends in the service to do the fighting job that has to be done. Take the toys. Take, take the toys. I give them all back to you. Oh, thank you, Mr. Pirate. Santa George, isn't that wonderful? That's terrific. Oh, swell. <laughs> I'm so disgusted with myself. <laughs> oh, well, don't cry, Mr. Pirate. You're not a mean man at all. You've got a heart of gold. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Isn't that disgusting? <laughs> Gracie. Oh, Gracie. Gracie, wake up. Oh, what? Oh, oh, George, we're home. Well, of course we're home. Oh, well, then I must have been dreaming. You and I were up at the North Pole, and we were captured by a pirate, and this pirate made pi love to me, and... A pirate? Uh-huh. Who was he, Tyrone Power? No, it was... Say, that's an idea. Good night, George. I'm going back to... The oh, place. fine. <laughs> Fine, 
George and Gracie will be right back, so I'm just going to remind you that many women would have beautiful hands if it weren't for dishwashing. So when you're washing dishes, help safeguard your hands. Wash those dishes with Swan. Swan is purer than the finest Castile soaps. So naturally, with Swan in the dishpan, you help keep your hands lovely. And say, since Swan suds faster than other white floating soaps, you'll find it makes dishwashing a faster, more pleasant job. So what say? Why wash dishes the hard way? Why not try Swan? Well, here they are, George and Gracie. Yes? Oh, it's you, Mr. Tamiro. Where's that duck? Oh, don't you dare touch one feather on my little duck's head. Lady, that duck left only one goldfish in my pond. Well? Well, <clears throat> it's Christmas, so I, uh, I brought it over for the little fella. Oh. Oh, thank you, and a Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas to you. Oh, and ladies and gentlemen... A Merry Christmas to you all. That goes for me, too. Merry Christmas, everybody. The makers of Swan, the new white floating soap, join George and Gracie in inviting you to tune in again next week, same time, when their special guest will be one of your favorite movie stars, the glamorous Rita Hayworth. So remember, Swan also brings you another of radio's top shows, Tommy Riggs and Betty Lou over another network. Now till next week, this is Bill Goodwin saying, well, I, Swan, how about you? Good night. Merry Christmas. Try Spry. You'll find the baking you turn out fluffy and light. Try Spry. You're sure to hear your family shout. What a delight. For cakes, pies, donuts, the things you fry. Try Spry. What's that you say you're going to try today? Why, sure. Try Spry. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. Tired of the everyday routine? Ever dream of a life of romantic adventure? Want to get away from it all? We offer you... Escape! Escape, designed to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight, we escape to a lonely lighthouse off the steaming jungle coast of French Guiana and a nightmare world of terror and violence as we bring you again in response to hundreds of requests three skeleton key Starring Vincent Price. Picture this place. A gray tapering cylinder welded by iron rods and concrete to the key itself. A bare black rock, 150 feet long, maybe 40 wide. That's at low tide. At high tide, just the lighthouse rising 110 feet straight up out of the ocean. And all about it, the churning water, gray-green scum dappled, warm as soup, and swarming with gigantic bat-like devilfish, great violet schools of Portuguese man-o-war, and yes, sharks, the big ones, the 15-footers. And as if this weren't enough, there was a hot, dank, rotten-smelling wind that came at us day and night off the jungle swamps of the mainland. A wind that smelled like death. A wind that had smelled the slow and frightful death that came one night to this bare black rock. Set in the base of the light was a watertight bronze door. And in you went. And up. Yes, up and up and round and round, past the tanks of oil and the coils of rope, casks of wicks, racks of lanterns, sacks of spuds and cartons and cans, and up, and up and up, round and round. Over the light storeroom was the food storeroom, and over the food storeroom was the bunk room where the three of us slept. And over the bunk room was the living and cooking room, and over the living and cooking room was the light. She was a beauty, big steel and bronze baby with the sun gleaming through the glass walls all about, bouncing blinding little beams off the big shining reflectors, 
glittering and refracting through her lenses, the whole gigantic bulk of her balanced like a ballerina on the glistening steel axle of her rotary mechanism, she was a sweetheart of a light. And at night, she'd lie there on the stone deck of the gallery with her revolving smoothly and quietly over your head, easing her bright white eye 360 degrees around the horizon. You'd lie there watching to see that the feeders kept working, that everything ran right. And it wouldn't be bad, the other two fellows snoring in their sacks two levels down. You'd smoke your pipe to kill the stink of the wind, and it wouldn't be bad. About those other two, Louis and Auguste. What a pair. Louis, he was head man, was a big fellow from the Basque country. Black beard, little hard black eyes, and a pair of arms that I tell you those arms were as big around as my legs. Yes, head man he was, and what word he let go was law. A silent fellow, and although I spent my first two weeks trying to strike up a real conversation... The most I could ever get out of him was... Jean, I took up this profession because I don't like people. They want to talk too much. It's quiet work, light tending. Let's keep it that way. You, you're getting to be as bad as August. I thought maybe for once they'd send me somebody... Who that was Louis. And when he accused me of becoming like August, I quieted down because August was the talkingest man I'd ever met. The talkingest and the ugliest. He was hunchbacked, stood four feet high, had red hair and big blue eyes. It seems he'd been an actor in yes, Paris. Yes, indeed. Played in over 200 different productions, dear boy, at the Grand Guignol. Oh, but it was monstrous horrible, the way we used to scare the audiences. I, I was hated. Yes, yes, they used to throw things and hiss and bare their teeth at me. Finally, it got too bad. I couldn't stand it any longer. I gave up the theater. My nerves, you understand, yes? Gave it up completely. I really did. Couldn't stand it any longer. It all started one morning at 2.30. I was on watch, lying on the cool stone deck, pulling on my pipe, staring out at the blackness, the phosphorescent combers, and the big yellow stars, when out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something show up for a second, something the light had touched far off. I waited for her to come around again, and when she did, there it was. Three master, a big one, about a half mile off and coming down out of the north-northwest, coming straight for us. You must understand, our light was where it was for a very good reason. Dangerous submerged reefs surrounded us and ships kept clear. But this one, this sailing vessel, was coming straight on. I went over to the gallery door and yelled, Louis! Louis! Couldn't understand it. I waited for the light to come around again. Why is that? Ship headed for the reefs. Coming right up. I had the glasses out now. I couldn't read her name, but I could see her quite plainly. All sails set, the foam creaming away under her bow, her beautiful lines. A Dutch ship, I guessed her. But why didn't she turn? Every time it passed, our light hit her with the glare of day. Ship? Where? North, northwest. The light will touch her in a moment. Can't they see? Look at her. She just keeps coming on. Yeah, the square head. What is it? What is it? Watch north, northwest. I know. I know what it is. Huh? What? The Dutchman, the flying Dutchman. We did a play about her once. Oh, what a performance. You ghastly galleon, hag-ridden, cursed ribbon. Must on. Shut and up, on. will you? She's laughing. Yes. Sloppy way to come about. She's derelict, that's it. Derelict? Abandoned. The crew left her for some reason or other. But instead of sinking, she's gone on, running before every wind. She'll not run long. Not with these reefs to break her up. A beautiful ship. Now, why would men leave a beautiful ship like that? She didn't ram us, although we all expected it. But as we waited for the crash, she luffed again, caught some odd gust, and went about. 
We watched her the rest of those black hours, healing and rocking, pushed and pulled by every stray wind, every freak current. Watched her until the dawn came, till the sea turned from black to a pearly gray. And on she came again, heading for us. We all had our glasses trained on her now. August, you can kill the light. Right, Chief? She doesn't look so good by daylight. Think she'll ground this time? What? I say, do you think she'll ground this time? Huh? This is impossible. Absolutely impossible. What? Here, take my glasses. They're better than yours. All right. What is it you... I had to focus, and then my breath froze in my throat. The decks were swarming with a dark brown carpet that looked like a gigantic fungus, but undulating. And on the masts and yards, the guys and all were hundreds, no thousands, no mi I don't know, an endless number of enormous rats. See them? Yes, I see them. Now we know why she's derelict. Yes, now we know. What are you two doing? Here, give me a look. Yes, give him the glasses. Take a good look. Chatterbox, give you something to talk about. She's still heading for us. Yes. Uh, she's going to turn. She'd better turn soon. Suppose she doesn't. You mean suppose she piles up on the key? It's low tide. Yes. Yes, it is. Where's all the conversation, August? Huh? Here, want the glasses again? No. Want another look? No. No! She's still coming on. Go away! Go away! Turn! Will you turn? I say, I pray you turn! She's cracking up. The rats! Look! On the water! Like a carpet! They're swimming. Sure, they're swimming. Those are ship's rats. But they're swimming for the rocks. The door below! It's open! Come on! Down we went, racing down the stone stairs, taking them three and four at a time. Scared? You bet we were scared. August, you get the windows. Maybe they can climb. We don't know. Right, Chief. But hurry, hurry! Look. See them? No. Oh, yes, I do. Up at the other end of the rock. Look at the millions. They smell us. Here they come. Uh. Close the door. I can't, I can't. It's stuck. Here, let you, me. Oh, move, you move. He made it. Holy. That was close. One guy in. Look, there. Get him. Watch him. He's kicking. He was as big as a tomcat. Bigger. And his eyes were wild and red, his teeth long and sharp and yellow. He went for us, starving, ravenous, and we fought him, fought that one rat all over the room. It was, oh, believe me, I do not exaggerate, it was like fighting a panther. Got him. We better get aloft. As we ran up the winding staircase, we passed the tiny windows of the various levels. And at every one was a thick, wriggling, screaming curtain of brown fur. I was ahead of Louie, and I dreaded each successive level. Suppose they had found a way in. Look at them! Will you look at them? It's a nightmare. Will you look at them? The air of the gallery was thick and fetid with the stink of them. The light was dim, brown, filtered through the crawling mass that swarmed over the glass all about us. We could not see the sky, nothing, nothing but them. Their red eyes, their claws, their wriggling, hairy snouts, and their teeth, the rats. They screamed and howled and threw themselves against the glass. They were starving. And we three, we stood very quietly, oh, very, very quietly in the center of the classroom under our beautiful light, and we waited. What can we do? What can we do to you? Take it easy, old man. Take it easy. I can't. I it, just can't. It won't do any... It won't do any good to stand here and shake. Uh, that's right. Anybody want a cigarette? Yes. Yes, I have one. Thank you. Good boy. We've got to keep calm about this thing. Here's a light. <laughs> yeah, they don't like the fire, do they? Guess not. <laughs> Give me another match. Uh, uh, 
You don't like that much, do you, I say? Don't rile them, August. <laughs> Give me some more matches. I'll strike them and strike them and strike them until they get scared and go away. They won't <laughs> go away. Not until... Let me see, Chief. Not until what? Not until they've been... fed... can take just so much horror and then you get used to it. And they were interesting to watch, you know. They couldn't understand the glass. They could see us and they could rush at us, but that thin, invisible barrier held them off, stopped them. From time to time, we caught a glimpse of the rocks below. More rats down there, swarming brown velvet in the bright tropical sunlight. And then the tide began to rise. If only it had drowned some of them. Ships rats don't drown. <laughs> no, sir, you cannot drown one of them. They're all climbing up the tower. This bunch around us is getting thicker. Yeah. Say, what's the time? Quarter six. Uh, you've got first watch, John. Right. Uh, wake me at ten. I will. Come along, August. It was getting dark. One side of the room was lit a soft, filtered red. Sunset through the rats. Oh, very pretty. I set the wicks, checked my fuel, and then lit the lamps. It caught them. Lit them in their gigantic wriggling web of pale, hairless bellies, twitching red tails, bright eyes. Then I started the rotary motor. Light drove them mad as she swung slowly and smoothly about. She blinded them in the fierce stabbing bar of light, moving continually about, ever turning, ever touching, ever moving around and around. And they twitching and shuddering, eyes flaming when they were struck by the light. The bright light moving and behind on the dark side of the room, so close, so close, I dared not turn my back, but you cannot help turning your back when you're in a room made of glass. On the dark side of the room, you could not see them, but only their eyes. Thousands of points of blank red light, blinking and twinkling like the stars of hell. Louis relieved me at ten, but I didn't get much sleep that night, and when I came up into the gallery early next morning... There stood August, his back to me. He was bowing to the rats, waving dear, his arms dear, and dear making a speech. I am going to play once again that magnificent role which made me the toast of the Paris theater. Pray, Lotte, the evil genius of the medieval underworld. I am he who did guide the dark soul of the Marechal into the nether parts. <laughs> Do not be frightened, little children. I will he not hurt turning. you. I much. stood staring at him hard. Horror struck, but he didn't notice me. The man had gone mad. He kept turning, telling his stories to all the rats, leaving no one out. August! August! Ah, another one. A late comer. Take a seat on the aisle, dear patron. August! Move stop over it, there. Stop it. Let the gentleman be but seated. He didn't come, stop. Come, he went come on, bowing and scraping to the rats, his big blue eyes rolling and winking, his wild red hair waving about him. I grabbed him by the arms and slapped his face. He looked at me like a child. And then his face screwed up. He looked as though he were about to cry. Go below, go on. Oh, very well then. Later, my dear audience, later. Matinee today. Sure, he was crazy. But I guess we all were. A few hours later, he came back up and caught Louie and me teasing the rats. Yes, sounds horrible. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> We could get right up against the glass and make faces at them. It drove them crazy. They would scratch away trying to get at our eyes. Louis was even cuter about it. He'd pull a piece of bread out of his pocket and press it against the glass. The rats would scramble into a solid ball, biting each other, clustering like grapes. 
From time to time, a whole knot of them would slip and fall 110 feet to the surf below. Look! <laughs> Look at the sharks! They're eating them. <laughs> yeah, the sharks are our friends. Yeah, yeah. I'll get another bunch together. <laughs> yeah, my beauties. That's it. Pile of kill each other. <laughs> there they go! Auguste joined in, too. Oh, very ingenious, Auguste. He learned that if he spread-eagled himself against the glass, they'd bunch and bundle against his figure. Then he'd leap back. Look! My portrait in rats! It went on all day. And then... I was lying in bed. It was about midnight. I was very tired, and I was just beginning to fall off to sleep when I became conscious of a new sound. Couldn't figure it at first. I got up, lit the lamp, and went to the window. Even as I looked at it, I saw one of the panes begin to sag in. They had eaten the wood away. Louis, Louis, come uh, quick. What? Well, what is it? They found a way in. I held the glass with my hand. Now they were all going crazy, and assured of the success of this maneuver, were all nibbling away at the wood. Louis ran below and then returned with a large sheet of tin. We spread it against the window and hammered it into place. Even as we did so, we felt the heavy body studding against the other side as the window gave way. That ought to hold. If it doesn't, we're done for. Rats can't eat tin. No, they can't. So what was that? I don't know. It came from below. The storeroom window. Oh. They're in. They're swarming up the stairs. Drop the trap. Right. Two of them got in. Let's go after them. We didn't have to go after them. They came at us. I leaped to one side and grabbed a marlin spike, swung and smashed one in midair. No! I whirled to see oh. Louie with the other. It had ripped his hand open and the blood was pouring all over the place. He held his hand aloft and kicked at the snarling rat. I stepped and swung and got him. My hand! He got my hand! That's both of them, Louie. I'll, I'll get you something to tie that up. Blood! Look at it! My, my blood! I'm bleeding! Now, don't worry about it, Louie. Here, look. I'll, I'll wind this kerchief around it. It'll be okay. Blood! There, now. It's not bad. Just the flesh. And then I became conscious of another new sound. They were gnawing their way through the wooden trap door. I watched the wood fascinated. Even as I did, it began to give way, and a bristling, whiskery nose showed through. Louis, Louis, we've got to go up. Next level was the living quarters in the kitchen. I slammed the trap door there, too, but it, too, was wood. Uh, my blood. What are we going to do? I don't know. We'll be through this one in a moment. The gallery. The trap door in the gallery is metal. Good. Come on. We made it. We lay across the trap door exhausted. While below us, the rats took over the entire tower. I could hear them howling and fighting over our food supply, our water, our leather. And all about us, the others screamed and glared in at us swayed in a tangled mass, hypnotized by the ever-turning light. By morning, the air in the little room was horrible. Until now, we'd been getting air from the tower below. Now that was sealed off, and so was all our food and water. We lay exhausted, panting, waiting, waiting, and the hours crawled on. I was almost dozing from fatigue when I saw a sight that brought me too fast. <laughs> Would you like to come in, my beauties? Would you? I hold the powers of life and death, and I can let you in, you know. August was standing by the glass, and in one hand he held a wrench. He was tapping the glass gently, not quite hard enough to break it. I eased myself to my feet and slowly, very slowly, tiptoed toward him. All I have to do is tap just a little harder. Huh? And, uh, uh, I 
found a coil of wire in the tool kit, and I trussed him up, fastened him to a stanchion in the center of the room. Louis was of no help. He lay on his side, looking at his bloody hand, weak and sick as a baby. So there I was, a lunatic and a coward for company, and all about watching our little drama, The Rats. The day dragged by. The supply boat wasn't due for another 12 days. I don't know what they could have done if they had come. We had only one way of summoning them, and that was to shoot off distress rockets, but the rockets were four floors below. And even if they'd been right there in the gallery, I couldn't have opened a window to fire them. That night, I tended the light, but its flame was devouring our oxygen. The following day, we lay, thirst-tormented, starving, waiting, waiting, and the following night, I again tended the light, but the small supply of spare wicking we kept in the gallery had become exhausted, and quite suddenly, about midnight, the light went out. There's nothing I could do. Wicks were stored three levels below. Nothing I could do. Nothing... From time to time, I'd strike a match to see the clock. When I did, it lit up the million red eyes about us. All of us. Watching. Waiting. Below, it had grown quiet. They'd cleaned us out, and now they, too, were waiting. All waiting. And then, the rats, quite suddenly, were silent. And then I heard it. And then I saw the sky and the stars. The rats were gone. I went to the glass. Out there on the water, a small freighter, a banana boat, showing a few lights, came softly and innocently at us. The light was out. They didn't know. I wanted to open the windows to call out to them, to warn them somehow, but I was afraid. What if, what if the rats were hiding from me, tricking me? So I waited. She grounded very softly on a reef not 200 yards from the quay, grounded so gently that the man playing the cornet, was he a passenger or crewman off watch didn't even stop playing. They tried washing her back off. I could have told them to save their fuel. The tide was rising, would have floated her free. And I waited. That's all. That's the story. The sun came up and there wasn't a rat on the whole key. Every last one of that terrible army had left us, gone back to sea on their new ship. August, insane asylum, he never recovered. And Louis, they took him into Cayenne where he died of blood poisoning from his bite. Uh. Oh, yes. Well, that's the whole of it. And if you'll excuse me now, I must go set my traps. No, no mouse traps. No rats in this lighthouse, I should say not. Life in the lights isn't bad. But sometimes when I see a strange vessel approaching, I get a little nervous, sure. Somewhere on the seas, there's a little banana boat without a crew. That is, without a human crew. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson. Tonight we have presented Three Skeleton Key by George Tadeus, adapted for radio by James Poe and starring Vincent Price as Jean. 
Supporting Mr. Price were Harry Bartell as August and Jeff Corey as Louis. Sound effects on Three Skeleton Key, created by Cliff Thorsness and executed today by Mr. Thorsness, Gus Bays, and Jack Sixsmith, have been awarded the best of the year by Radio and Television Life magazine. Harry Essman was at the control panel and special music was arranged and conducted by Del Castillo. Next week... You are swimming for your life in the dangerous waters off the Florida Gulf Coast, about to be smashed by a launch carrying a vicious criminal who must kill you or die himself. And on shore 500 yards away, the police are waiting to arrest you for murder. And there can be no escape. Next week, we escape with an exciting tale of temptation and death on the Gulf Coast of Florida, as John and Gwen Bagney tell it in Danger at Matagumba. Goodbye, then, until the same time next week when once again we offer you Escape! A patch of weeds, a boxer's biography, and a mild, lukewarm bath. They're all clues that lead the police of Jackson, Michigan, to a killer in the gangbuster story on CBS this Saturday night. It's the case of the double push to be heard on most of these same CBS stations this Saturday night. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. We present the BBC Drama Repertory Company in The U-Boat That Lost Its Nerve, a play for radio by James Follett, with Nigel Lambert as Bernard Bant. The U-Boat That Lost Its Nerve. U-boat first officer, Lieutenant Bernard Barrett, you will please stand. This Council of Honour has been convened under powers delegated to us by the Naval High Command with the approval of the Fuhrer. We have been instructed to hear all evidence and to recommend sentence should you be found guilty. Have you appointed an officer to conduct your defence? Yes, sir. Major Shulker. Have you agreed to this, Major Shulker? Yes, sir. Lieutenant Bent, the charge against you is that you displayed cowardice in the face of the enemy, and as a consequence of your treacherous behaviour, the submarine U-570, entrusted to you by our Führer and the German people, was allowed to pass intact into the enemy's hands. How do you plead? How do you plead? Guilty or not guilty? The accused wishes to enter I the... want to hear him say it. Not guilty. Should the charges against you be proved, this council will have no alternative but to recommend that you be sentenced to death by hanging. I say this because I want everyone here to realize that our present circumstances in no way detract from the authority of this council or the seriousness of the crimes for which you stand accused. Captain Lehman, will you please proceed? Thank you, Mr. President. On the 27th of August, 1941, the submarine U-570, under the command of the accused... Mr. Was President, it has not been established that Lieutenant Bant was in command of the U-boat at the time of her surrender. He was in command at the time of its capture. It amounts to the same thing. Please continue, Captain Lehman. On the 27th of August, 1941, U-570 was some 200 kilometres south of Iceland and proceeding on the surface to a rendezvous in the North Atlantic where she was to join other boats in her flotilla in night actions against enemy convoys. You will hear 
how she failed to maintain a proper lookout, but at this point we should consider the attitude of the accused to his responsibilities and to the war in general. Now, this list details certain unauthorized stores which the accused had placed aboard 570 before she sailed. 40 kilos of Dutch Edam cheese, 20 kilos of camembert, several hundred kilos of ham, 100 kilos of Normandy butter, Riesling, brandy, whiskey, sherry, and an unspecified quantity of beer. <laughs> Lieutenant Bernard Berndt saw no reason to change his way of life merely because of his responsibilities as an officer. The war for him was going to be one glorious non-stop party. <laughs> Gentlemen, I give a toast to U-570. May this patrol be the most successful of any U-boat. U-570. <laughs> Bernd has made a stencil of a sinking ship. Oh, yes. As we have 15 torpedoes, let's hope we sail into Lorient with 15 sinking ship painted on our bridge. Here we are, sir. Show them, Bert. There. <laughs> Only one thing wrong. What's that, Chief? Well, that stencil looks like a 2,000 tonner. If we want to beat Kretschmer's best patrol, every ship we sink will have to be at least 4,000 tonners. <laughs> it's only meant to be a symbol. Make a bigger one, Bert. We must be precise. Yeah. This one took me two hours, sir. <laughs> well, maybe for every 4,000 tonner we sink, we could put up two of Lieutenant Bernd's 2,000 tonners. <laughs> well, that wouldn't be honest. The trouble with you, Bernd, is that you take everything too seriously. Someone has to. I aim to sink 100,000 tonnes, Bert. Is that serious enough for you? If you say so, sir. I say we have another drink. Yeah. Yeah. Back to business. <clears throat> this is superb brandy, you scrounge, Bernd. We'll drink to you. To Lieutenant Bernd. May he have the strength to bear the Knight's Cross Admiral Dernitz will be hanging around his neck. <laughs> <laughs> Lieutenant Bernd. <laughs> hey, where's our torpedo officer? I specifically asked him to be present. Well, Lieutenant Stein is examining the torpedo, sir. He's been at it since we left port. Oh, has he? Doesn't he know that messing about with the torpedoes is forbidden? Pass the word for him. Yes, sir. Who do we drink to now? The Fuhrer. Ah, yes. The Fuhrer. The Fuhrer. The Fuhrer. What's the matter, Bent? I'm sorry, but uh, I've already had rather a lot to drink. Oh. <laughs> Give him some coffee, someone. <laughs> there you are, Stein, you wretched fella. I hear you've been messing about with our torpedoes. If you can make them go off with a bigger bang, I won't enter it into the log. Can I have a word with you, please, sir? Have as many as you like, but first a drink. No, I must speak to you first, please, sir. In private. No, oh, weren't you warned about those French girls? Yeah. Torpedoing enemy personnel should only be done at sea. <laughs> I won't be any use to you. You need the sick berth attendant. <laughs> You know, you're getting as bad as Bent. No sense of humour. Oh, all right. We'll go up on the bridge and relieve the lookouts. Excuse us, gentlemen. <sighs> Nothing like the sea for clearing one's head. Now, what's all this about? I've been looking at the torpedoes. You've dismantled them? Yep, and I've also dismantled the depth control chambers. You know that's forbidden. How can we sink ships if you've taken the torpedoes to bits? We won't be sinking any ships, not with those torpedoes. Of course we won't if you've taken the things apart. I'll reassemble them, and in any case, I've only looked at eight. Why look at them in the first place? What do you mean about us not sinking ships? Of course we'll sink ships. This first patrol of U-570 is going to make naval history. Well, not after this patrol. All our torpedoes are useless. Don't be absurd. They're all G-7As. There was a whole batch of them which have been sorted out for sending back to the torpedo research establishment at Kiel. They've been kicking around some time waiting for shipment, and somehow or other, we've ended up with them. You're responsible for striking down torpedoes. You should have supervised their loading. Oh, it's no good blaming me. I was only transferred to this boat at the last minute. Yesterday was the first chance I've had to examine them. What do you know about torpedoes? All you have to do is load and fire them. Now, come below and look at them if you don't believe me. You'll have to repair them. They need new firing pistols. I don't want your excuses, Stein. You fix those torpedoes. They have to go back to Kiel. And we might as well return to base. We can't go back. Not My family have moved to Lorient. I've promised them so much. Oh, you'll never achieve great successes in this boat. You will go below and repair those torpedoes. After that, you can consider yourself under arrest. Well, why can't you face up to reality? Those torpedoes are useless. 
I might as well radio base and request permission to return. I'll be damned if I'm going to let a miserable, jumped-up, working-class tyke with a chip on his shoulder dictate uh, to me. Aircraft! It went into that cloud! This far out, it must be a Fokker Wolf 200. Diving stations, aircraft! How dare you give orders! You're under arrest. Ben, uh, cancel that order. It's an FW 200. Oh, for God's sake, dive! But it had two engines. What the hell am I supposed to do? It's coming in for a bomb run. Get down, get down! Stop engines. But we must die. Bert, what damage? Matt, we still got control. I'm sending up a gun. No, no, Bert, no. Okay, help me off with my jacket. Come on, hurry. You're mad. Look, before, they, before it turns back, please. Now my shirt. I'm coming up. Stay there, Bert. That's it. Help me hold it out so they can see it. No, you're not going to. You can't. Stop it. Just... Thank God. Thank God. You bastard! You traitorous bastard! What's happening? I thought there was... Ramlow surrender! I had to. I have to think of my crew. Gun crew standing by, sir. Tell them to stand down. You're not taking orders from him, Get below, you? Stein. Bent. Sir, you have the sleeves out so they can see it. That's it. They'll destroy us. I think they got your message, sir. I ordered you below! Thank you, sir. I have no wish to be involved. No, I have Coastal command. They nearly killed us. The bomb came within ten meters. What do we do now? It's well, it's up to them, isn't it? May I use your glasses, sir? Yeah. Must be a reconnaissance aircraft. No, it's not a turret. A little bit brown yet. And bombs. Was it a bomb or a depth charge? I don't know. What does it matter? I don't think the RAF have an airborne depth charge yet. They're signalling. It's in English. F U. Surrender. Tell them yes. Have you considered that you might still have a chance of shooting it down, sir? Our anti aircraft. They could be on top of us with another bomb before we could bring the guns to bear. Uh, what's she saying now? Aircraft to U boat remain on surface or we will bomb you. Do you understand? Tell them we do, Bent. And throw them red. I'm ordering the destruction of all charts, code books, identification books, and the law. Stein, they may not like it. They'll be ejected through a tube. But, but if they see the caps are open... They're we... flooding the forward tank to put the vines down slightly. They won't see anything. Bent, go below and place Stein under arrest. He's right about getting rid of the boat's go papers, Go below sir. and arrest him. If anything goes wrong, the whole crew will be lost. I'm resisting arrest, Bent. And there's nothing you can do about it. The entire company's with me. Also, as first officer, it's your duty to arrest Ramlow and countermand the surrender. I, I can't do that. You have the full support of the crew. But yes, but it would amount to, well, mutiny. So? But I, I don't have the authority. You do, if he's no longer fit to command. Why isn't he? He's only thinking of the crew. There's an aircraft circling, threatening to drop another bomb. Another bomb? Were you in the Narvik campaign? No. And I was. Shall I tell you the armament of that Hudson? One anti-submarine bomb. One. And even that's useless unless it scores a direct hit, as we've just seen. No, if it was over a year ago. The RAF may have improved their armament since then. But Ramlow may know more than us. He doesn't. But you don't know. You're only going on your experiences of over a year ago. Even if it has got another bomb, we could still shoot it down before it has a chance to drop it. But how? Haven't you got any imagination? We could string up some washing or something and load a belt into the 20 centimetre while the Hudson is unsighted. We could even crowd men around the gun. We could load it, bring it to bear and open fire before the Hudson realised that anything was wrong. If I was in that aircraft, I'd be watching us like hawks. The first sign of anything suspicious. No, you're worse than Ram, though. I don't suppose it's occurred to you that he might be acting in the interests of us all. Our interests are irrelevant. All that matters is that this U-boat must not be cravenly handed over to the enemy without a shot being fired. I shouldn't have thought you'd be worried about honour. I'm not talking about honour. I'm talking about the cowardly behaviour of this submarine in allowing itself to fall into enemy hands who could then use it against our fellow sailors. And if you can't see the difference between that and your blasted sacred honour, then you're as bad as Ramlow. Chief? Yes, sir? Everyone signed? Everyone, sir. Without exception. Yes. Thanks. Here's my Luger, then. Take it. Take it. That's it. It's loaded. Now, Chief, read that paper. We, the undersigned crew members of U-570, deplore the action of Lieutenant Commander Ramlow in surrendering our U-boat. And we fully support Lieutenant Bernard Bent in doing whatever is necessary to relieve Lieutenant Commander Ramlow of command. 
We also swear to obey Lieutenant Bernd and pledge him our complete loyalty. And it's followed by the signatures of every member of the company. Thank you. You have a choice, Bernd. You can either go up on the bridge, arrest Ramlow, and take over command, or you can side with Ramlow by placing me under arrest. But if you do, I shall see to it that after the war, you and Ramlow hang. Bernd. Sir? Have you arrested Stein? Well? No, sir. I suppose he talked you out of it. Eh? Odd sort of fellow. Got a chip on his shoulder about his background. A bit of the red in his makeup. I, I don't know, sir. I'm going to break one of the first rules in dueling. Real dueling, I mean. Not all this modern stuff with face masks. What's that, sir? Never turn your back on an armed man. Wonder how much longer his fuel will hold out. Can't be much left. 200 kilometers south of Iceland, you'll need some to get back. Do you agree with Stein? Do you think I'm a coward? I, I, I don't know. I always I... thought cowardice was something so definite, like murder, that there would be no doubt in my mind when I was actually committing it. And yet when I waved my shirt at that Hudson, it never occurred to me that it was a cowardly act. Wherever we're in harbour and the crew are lined up on deck, it always frightens me to see how many men's lives depend on me. The horrible thing is, I, I don't know if I surrendered to save my own skin or the lives of the crew. I suppose if I said I wanted to save their lives, it would sound very grand and noble. But the truth is, I don't know. What would you have done? No, don't answer. You don't know. Nobody knows how they will react to a given situation, but it's always possible to guess how others might behave. People like Stein are predictable. They're the ones who die and get covered in glory. There are a lot of Steins in Germany. They never die alone and always take a lot of poor bastards with them as insurance so they'll be remembered. What are you going to do? I, I, I don't know. That's all you've been able to say, I don't know. It's about time you started making a few decisions for yourself instead of letting other people push you around all the time. I was sent up to arrest you, sir. You were sent up here to do your duty according to what you think is right. Stein is not your senior officer. If you think I should be arrested, go ahead, but don't try to cover up your conscience by pretending that you're acting out of duty instilled into you by Stein. I don't even care if you shoot me, but I do care if you shoot me out of a sense of fear. I'd rather die as a victim of your principles than Stein's. Sir, I don't understand. I'll myself. Give me the gun. I'll what? shoot myself so you can say you did it. They'll listen to you, then. Here, give it to me. No. Come. No. Set up your fool, sir. You bloody fool. You could have been killed. <coughs> the destroyer's arrived. Look, look. And tell him you've done it. Don't speak to me with the voice, Captain. Yes? You've killed him? Say yes. Yes. Good. I'm coming up. Tell him to stay. Stay where you are, Stein. My dear Bernd, I have a gun crew ready for action. You can come up when I give the order and not before. Good for you, Bernd. Light signals from the destroyer, sir. In English. Uh, stand by to receive armed boarding party. They'll be lucky in this weather. There goes the Hudson. Wonder how they feel having to hand their prize over to the Navy. Sir, now the aircraft has gone. If we were to set up torpedo to run at the shallowest setting, maybe we'd we could... never sink a destroyer, Bent. Not with their shallow draft. You should know that. Well, I thought it would be worth a try, sir. Well, what are we going to do now? Wait for the boarding party, I suppose. They won't try that in this sea. Would we'll take us in tow? Not with us on board. Here, here. What are they saying now? Uh... Do you have a dinghy? Uh, Captain, to join me immediately. Allow no one else on bridge. Do you understand? Why should they risk their necks with a boarding party when they can get me to risk mine? Signal message understood. Why won't they allow anyone else on the bridge? So you won't be tempted to scuttle. Do you want help with the dinghy, sir? No, I'll manage. Bernd, 
I saw the Hudson leave on the sky periscope. I insist you allow me on the bridge. What can you see on the attack periscope? It's down. Now we have company. A destroyer and an armed trawler. Our orders are no one else on the bridge. We have to allow everyone up if we're to scuttle. We are not scuttling, Stein, and that's an order. We are not handing this boat over to the enemy. Chief? Sir? Will you ask the Lieutenant Stein to stay away from the voice pipe? Sir? Are you managing, sir? Blasted thing. The wind keeps catching it. Here, you'd better have this back. Stein's gun, isn't it? Yes, sir. I'm ready now. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, sir. Just be sorry there's a war and thankful you're now out of it. Will you scuttle? I don't see how I can. No. Well, goodbye, Bent. Look after the crew. Goodbye, sir. And good luck. See you in prison. Oh, God. Shulker, Conrad Shulker, Major, Army Reconnaissance. You boat? Uh, yes. Oh, never catch me going down in one of those things. Death traps. I'm sorry, just trying to make conversation. You can tell me to shut up if you wish. No, I'm sorry. Lieutenant Bernard Bent. What happened to you? Oh, it's all right. These gun villas don't speak German. Oh, we were bombed by an aircraft. Bad luck. Any casualties? Every member of the crew was saved. How long were you interrogated for? Two days. Oh, I had a week. In London? Yes, Kensington Palace Gardens. I used to work in London in the 20s. Didn't tell them, of course, and they soon found out. I didn't even tell them I could speak English. I gave myself away when this officer walked in and said, We've decided to shoot you, Major. <laughs> and he laughed at my expression. <laughs> Where are they taking us? Houston Station? Well, must be somewhere in the north. And Houston's being moved at night. Why? Plenty of useful information to be picked up just by looking out of the window. The state the crops are in, how many people working on the land. It's all very useful when you're trying to build up an overall picture. Still, of course, you have to escape first. Well, is it worth the risk with the war supposed to last only a few more months? It's always worth the risk. It's your duty to do so. Wake up. It's daylight. Ooh. Oh, I'm stiff. Oh, I'm still on the move. Taking us further north than I thought. Did the train keep going all through the night? Apart from two stations. How long did we stop for? About 15 minutes at the first one and 10 minutes at the other. What was it called? Bovril, I think. <laughs> What's so funny? You'll learn that. You'll learn. <laughs> Beautiful countryside. We keep crossing rivers and streams. Do you suppose we're in Scotland? It's now eight hours. Average speed, what, about 70 kilometres an hour? No, not in Scotland. I'd say we're in Cumberland, somewhere near the Lake District. Ah, now that's either another station coming up or journey's end. Uh-oh. Journey's end. Let's hope they feed us soon. I'm starving. Welcome to Grysdale Hall, gentlemen. Right in the heart of the British Lake District, but I'm afraid the British won't allow us to go sailing. My name is Lieutenant Commander Otto Kruger. My job is to make you feel at home. I'm the senior officer. Commander. It's a great honour to meet you, sir. It's good to have another U-boat officer. Or perhaps I should say not good. I was beginning to think this camp was being taken over by the Luftwaffe. How is the Admiral? I'm afraid I've never met him. And uh, your Major Conrad Schulker. Yes, sir. Number one reconnaissance unit, Bremen. I hope you didn't tell the British that. No, sir. They told me. <laughs> I take it the British CO has already interviewed you? Yes, sir. You will find Major Veet firm, but fair. All matters for his attention are channeled through this office. He and I have an understanding. And most difficulties can usually be smoothed out between us. 
Is there an escape organization? Ah, I was coming to that. As you must have seen from the truck which brought you from the station, the surrounding countryside is wild and desolate. It looks very beautiful now, but in the winter it is deadly. That is why we have an escape committee under my chairmanship, which carefully vets all escape proposals. We don't wish to deter initiative or daring. Our job is to prevent officers getting themselves killed because of some harebrained scheme that has no hope in hell of succeeding. Has anyone ever escaped? Several times, but no one has ever got hurt. The first to try was Baron von Vera. The fighter pilot? Yes. He remained free for several days, but only because he knew the district from camping trips before the war and could speak English without a trace of accent. Hmm. This place looks as if it was once a country mansion. It was, but you won't find any suits of armor now. What you will find is plenty of barbed wire around the grounds and watchtowers. Now, that's all for now. I'll expect it will take you a couple of days to find your feet and get used to the routine. If you report to Paul Falk, third door on the left down the corridor, he'll arrange for you to have a medical and tell you what dormitory you're in. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, Lieutenant Ben. Sir? I'd like a word with you before you go. Third door on the left, Shawker. Thank you, sir. Take seat. Thank you, sir. Lieutenant Bernard Bernd, First Officer U-570. Bombed by RAF Coastal Command, 27th of August, 90 miles south of Iceland. No casualties. Hmm. The British don't tell us more than they can help. Is that correct? Yes, sir. No casualties? Yes. You were extremely lucky. What became of your commanding officer? Ramlow, wasn't it? He was taken on board a different ship, uh... I don't know what happened to him. I knew him slightly at Lorient. Is he a party member? I, I don't know. Well, he won't come here if he is. This is what the British call a white camp for non-national socialists. Oh, I see. The borderline cases go to the grey camps and the uh, dedicated ones are sent to the black camps. That's why none of our guards are Poles. They're all the black camps knocking hell out of the inmates. <laughs> so they're not supposed to know that. I see. I, I read about your capture in the papers... They said you were sunk by overwhelming forces after you'd, you'd fired all your torpedoes. Propaganda. I was rammed at night by a destroyer. I've been here since March, five months. The loss of your boat was a sad blow. Do you know the latest tonnage sunk figures? Well, May and June was around 600,000 tonnes. Uh, July was very low, only 100,000 tonnes. What about your boat? Well? Nothing. Nothing? It was our first patrol. <laughs> we'll never win the war at this rate. The papers were saying that the British wouldn't be able to hold out for more than six or seven months at the most. Maybe. Here's your form. You'd better report to Lieutenant Falk. There is one thing, sir. Yes? Is there a Lieutenant Richard Stein here? Stein. Richard. Several Steins, but no Richard. Friend of yours? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Well, that's all I've been able to pick up from the guards. With luck, they might come with us. Otto, over here. Good evening, you two. Good evening. Do you suppose the British are celebrating something? Mm. This stew actually looks and smells edible. <laughs> At least three extra grams of meat. We've decided that your U-boat comrades aren't sinking so many ships these days. According to Ben, one of the new arrivals, they're not. Did you give them a medical? Well, Shulker's okay. Ben seems to be suffering from depression. Mm. He's also got a weak heart. You know, it beats me why you let these cripples into the Navy. In the look, <laughs> which this place is crawling with, they have to be A1. Mm. Anything for tonight's bulletin? Well, it looks as if we'll have to reopen the escape program. Aren't we going to Canada? It's still only a rumour. But if we are being sent there, it doesn't look as if we'll be able to rely on American neutrality for much longer. An American destroyer has deliberately attacked a U-boat. One incident doesn't necessarily lead to war. It did in 1914. Mm. Oh, God, if only we could get hold of some British newspapers. When does Parsons come back from leave? Mm. Saturday. Was there any mention of U-570? No. no. So what do we do? Do we reopen the escape program or do we continue squashing every scheme for free? I think we'd better carry on vetoing all plans for the time being and review the situation when we've had a chance to look at the papers. Comrade, 
May I, may I call you, Conrad? You might may have just asked me that. Do you suppose the others will find out about... about how you were shot down? What are you talking about? What others? Well, Kruger. Falk. The whole camp. I don't understand. I've told them everything. No, I mean the exact details. Your position, the time, that sort of thing. Do you think they could ever find out? Well, I suppose so. Does it matter? Is something wrong? Bernard? Yes? Do you want to tell me? No, it's all right. Sorry I woke you. Good night. Good night. Come in. Ah, good morning, Paul. Papers. Ah, excellent. Express time sketch the lot. Even John Bullen picked a post. <laughs> Poor bastard's terrified about that copper wire. Don't put any more pressure on him for a bit. Uh-huh. He's the sort to suddenly decide the confession might be good for his soul. Anything about that Greer business? Ah, yeah. Last night, in a broadcast to the American people, President Roosevelt, referring to U.S. attacks on German U-boats, said... When you see a rattlesnake poised, you don't wait until it strikes before you crush it. Ah, the man's a warm under the worst. Listen to this. Squadron leader J.H. Thompson of 269 Squadron, the pilot of the Hudson which captured U-570, said the white surrender flag weighing from the conning tower was the biggest surprise of his life. What? An admiralty spokesman refused to comment on U-570's future, but said the capture of an intact... Intact! What? U-boat was of major importance, and the possibility of it being commissioned as one of His Majesty's submarines could not be ruled out. Get him in here! What was the exact damage caused by the bomb? I don't know. How close did it fall? I wasn't on the bridge. You don't have to be on the bridge to know how close a bomb was. I'm sorry, I I don't know. It wasn't me who surrendered, it was Lieutenant Commander Ramlow. Where were you when it fell? In the control room. But I didn't surrender. Did you make any water out of the explosion? I, I, I don't, don't know. Why didn't you die? Well, I, well the hy- hydroplane wheels were, were jammed. More of them? No, no, just, just one. Which one? Come on. But I don't know. The, the stern, I think. If the bomb exploded forward, how come the stern wheel was jammed? I'm not sure where it exploded. First you say forward, now you're not certain. Well, I wasn't certain at the time. Can you read English? A little. Read that. Go on. Read it. Uh, an Admiralty spokesman refused to comment on you... 570's future, but said the capture of an, uh, an... Intact, an intact U-boat. Do you know what the word means? Yes. The Telegraph, the Times, the Mirror, they all refer to an intact <laughs> U-boat. And it's probably in every American newspaper. You, you snivelling little coward, you know what you've done? You've made the German U-boat arm the laughing stock of the entire world. It was damaged. There was nothing I could do. We were, we were helpless. Well, I wanted to scuttle. I pleaded with the captain to scuttle. It wasn't my fault. I, I said we must destroy the boat, but we refused. It was damaged. I know it was damaged. He could be right, Otto. I wouldn't put it past the British to issue a false statement <laughs> deliberately. It's up to you. I'd rather take the word of a German officer than the British press. It was damaged. I know it was damaged. You'll take the word of this. Oh, so. And so. pull yourself together. Yes, sir. We're giving you the benefit of the doubt. Thank you, sir. We'll tell the camp that the British salvage your boat. I dare say that'll be nearer the truth than these papers. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. We'll say no more about it. All right, you may go. Just one thing. If these newspaper reports do turn out to be telling the truth, you will most likely be hanged for cowardice.
Where on earth is Paul? We're missing it all. You know, Bern fits my theory about people who have mastered a social musical instrument. What the hell is a social musical instrument? Harmonica, concertinas, flutes, anything portable like that. Have you heard my theory? No, but I have a feeling I'm going to. Is it anything like that theory you advanced three months ago, which explained why the war couldn't last another two months? Bern interests me. He's had a lonely childhood, comes from a well-off family, and was sent to a boarding school from the age of seven. Consequently, he's been starved for fiction. He's emotionally insecure, finds it difficult to make friends, and yet he needs friendship. That's why he's mastered the harmonica. It ensures he's always in demand for parties and so forth. That way, his introvert personality is no barrier to his popularity. Is he married? Yes, it was arranged by his parents. Have you been talking to him? Truka has. The army major arrived with him. Apparently, he's worried about Bernd. Says he's been sleeping badly, having nightmares. Maybe you should have a look at him. After what Shulka said, I did. On the pretext it was a routine check after four weeks in prison. He's lost weight. So have we all. Not as much as him. He was 77 kilos when he came. Now he's down to 61. That's a lot to lose in four weeks. Well, whatever his problems are, he's a useful addition to the camp. That's what's so odd about him. He enjoys being popular and yet... People he... are too complex to fit your simple theories. Ah, here's Paul. Ah. Well, Come on, you're late. We've got a new arrival. Huh? Oh, the British do choose some times to wheel them in. Who is it? Not another Luftwaffe type. I don't think I could stand anymore. He's one of your lot, you boats. Oh. Oh. Made himself unpopular at his last camp and then he got himself lynched. Mm -hmm. Stein. Lieutenant Richard Stein. Right, Paul, let's have him in. Yeah. Stein. Hello, Bernd. I'm surprised you're not in British uniform. I... I d d didn't d expect to see me so soon, of course not. Well, I didn't expect to see you so soon either. I've been busy making a nuisance of myself at every camp so they'd keep transferring me. Third time lucky. You better shut the door, Paul. Lieutenant Stein has made some serious allegations, Ben, regarding your part in the loss of U-570. She wasn't lost. She was handed over by this traitorous coward. Oh, we're not interested in personal comments at the moment. We just want to find out if what you say is true. Oh, it's true, all right. Look at him. He's terrified. I... I was not U-570's commanding officer and therefore not responsible for her surrender. According to Lieutenant Stein, you were a party to it. I wasn't even on the bridge when the Hudson dropped its bomb. But Stein was. Is that true? I left the bridge because I wanted to have nothing to do with the surrender. I went below and circulated a petition in which every member of the crew pledged support for Bernd if he were to arrest Ramlow and countermand the surrender. It was a license for mutiny. It was a license to prevent a U-boat falling into enemy hands. It was our opinion that Ramlow was no longer fit to command. Our opinion? My opinion. It's quite clearly stated in battle orders that if a yes, commander... Yes, yes, I know what's in the battle orders. After you shot Ramlow, did you... I never shot Ramlow. He's lying. He paddled across to the destroyer in the inflatable dinghy. Well, you know that. I told you at the time. So Ramlow left you in command? No, sir. No, Ramlow transferred command to the captain of the destroyer, and I carried out the orders the destroyer signaled to me. He's twisting the facts to save his own miserable skin. Bernd was a senior officer. When Ramlow was shot, he would automatically... Ramlow be... was not shot! All right. Bernd, after Ramlow left the U-boat, did Lieutenant Stein request permission to scuttle the boat? Yes, but it was not up to me to grant such permission. You refused? Yes. Because you no longer had the authority? Yes. If you felt that you do not have the authority to allow Stein to scuttle the boat, how is it you felt you had the authority to order him not to? Uh, well, I, I don't know. It, but it wasn't me that surrendered. It wasn't me. All right, you two. You may go. Thank you, sir. Stein was telling the truth. And the British newspapers. Mm. It puts me in a difficult position. From what I've seen of Stein, the story will be all over the camp in a matter of hours. If I do nothing, the Luftwaffe and army types will accuse me of favoritism to a fellow U-boat officer. Yeah. They might even take the law into their own hands. Requests Ben's transfer to another camp. Then they'd say I was trying to protect him from justice. Besides, what do you suppose would happen to him if he ended up at a grey or black camp? 
when the prisoners learned about his part in U-570 surrender. I don't see that they would. Ben's hardly likely to tell them. A U-boat has a crew of 48. After screening, they'd be sufficiently scattered for there to be a good chance of one or two being in any camp that Bent was sent to. Supposing we get rid of him and they do find out. It won't be our problem, will it? You do realise what would happen to him? I've got a pretty good idea. it would be no more than he deserves. He deserves a fair trial. If we would get rid of Bent, we'd be shirking our responsibilities, just as Bent did on the U-boat. More so, in fact. At least Bent was probably trying to save lives. His own skin, more like. Possibly. But as long as I'm senior officer here, it's up to me to see that civilized standards are maintained. Under these conditions, it's all too easy for men to forget them. Do you think that won't happen? We saw how bitter Stein is. He'll be shooting his mouth off to everyone and urging them on to deal with Bernd in their own way. If he were to team up with people like Schumann and Kirk and a few of the others... I know that. We'll have to forestall them until I think of something. How? Why not ask Beach to put Bernd in solitary? Well, what reason do we give? Tell him Bent's in danger. And admit I can't control the man under me. Anyway, you know what a highly developed sense of justice Beach has. It's one of the more worthwhile British trays. I believe the British may have the answer. Mm -hmm. An old custom of theirs. It's rather nasty, but it might suit our purpose. What's that, then? Tell Kurt that before he reads the after-dinner news bulletin, I wish to make a statement to the entire camp. Gentlemen, gentlemen, before Kurt reads the evening news, I have a brief statement to make. Bernd, will you stand up, please? As you know, Lieutenant Bernd is here because his submarine was captured by the RAF after it had been bombed. We have just learned that the newspaper reports about the capture, which we disregarded at the time, are in fact true. In view of this, it has been decided that from now until further notice, no prisoner will speak to, communicate, or attempt to communicate with Lieutenant Bernd in any way whatsoever. A serious view will be taken if anyone breaks this rule. The British have an expression for Bernd's punishment. He is being sent to Coventry. Oh, hello, Paul. Uh, order. Um, you know, Bent seems to have disappeared. Really? I saw him at roll call. Well, he turns up for morning and evening roll call and lights out, but vanishes for the rest of the day. I never did pretend it was anything but an interim solution. The idea was for us to act before anyone else did. Yes, it seems he sent us to Coventry. We'll have to think of something else. I already have. I want to send a message to U-Boat Command. Can you arrange it? But I thought you U-Boat types already had a system. It may have been revealed by Ramlow by now. He handed over a U-boat, so I don't suppose he had any qualms about our letter code. Who is it to be sent to? Dieter Frank. He's a staff officer, cipher expert. Mm -hmm. That's his private address, and that's the message. Dear, dear Dieter, British press reports about U-570 are correct. First officer... No, it's You're not serious. I'm perfectly serious. But don't you think it's better than what we're doing now? It violates a Geneva Convention. We can't... We can if we call it something else. Think you can bury that message in a letter? I think so. I'll try a date code. It may work. It won't have to be anything elaborate to slip past Jenkins. A date code will do. I want it to go today. Right. I'll get to work on a draft letter for you to copy out. <laughs> oh. Someone tell that worm to shut up. I'm going to get some sleep. You say one more word, Stein, and I'll smash your oily face down your throat. Ooh, brave words, Major. Not the sort that Bernd would understand. <laughs> Just leave him alone. You've done enough damage. That is a matter of opinion, Major. Stop, Layman, before we kill him. Look, I'm as worried as you, Major, but what can I do? Kruger won't take any notice of me. Well, you could at least examine Bant. If he is ill, I'd have to say it's because he refuses to eat, not because he's been sent to Coventry. And if you do nothing, I'll place the matter in the hands of the British by reporting the whole affair to Major Veach. Where is he? In the attic above the laundry. He spends every day alone there, reading and playing the harmonica. Hmm. I'll tell you what I'll do. Give Bant another two days. If he hasn't come down and had some food by Sunday, then I'll examine him. 
His condition is serious. I'll urge Kruger to call off this Coventry business. Hello? Is someone there? Evening roll calls in five minutes. Now he's usually down ten minutes before it starts so that he can have his name cleared by the guards and disappear before the others arrive. Well, maybe he's decided to... I want you to come now, please. Very well. Bernard! Roll call in three minutes. Bernard! Bernard! Good God! Help me turn him over. <coughs> What's the matter with... <sighs> Face. No, please, no more. It's all right, Bernard. No more. It's all right, old man. Who did it? Uh, Bernd, can you hear me? Don't hit me anymore. Listen, Bernd, it's only a few minutes to roll call. We've got to get you down to the laundry to clean you up. What the hell does it matter about roll call? I'm going to tell Veach. No. No, no, we'll keep the British out of this. If you want to help Bernd, you'll keep quiet. I haven't kept quiet before. This wouldn't have happened. Help me up with him. Oh. Oh. Uh, that's it. We'll have to hold him between us during roll call. Dear Otto, your recent letter was eagerly read by everyone. Jan has at long last proposed to Alice. Our youngest has seen a great deal of action in our new swimming pool this summer. She has even learned to swim underwater. Paul can't swim yet, but enjoys playing with a toy boat we managed to buy. Only 570 marks. He then goes on about people I've never heard of. Here, you better decode it. Mm. It's so simple, it hardly deserves to be called a code. First word is your. Three, four, five, six, propose. Seven, eight, nine, action. Well, the other word's obvious. Underwater boat, 570. Mm. The last sentence doesn't seem to fit. Your old friend in UB-68 sends his regards. UB-68 was the Admiral's boat when he was a commander during the last war. Ah, yes. Well, the complete message reads, Dear Otto, your proposed action of U-570 is approved. You will hear... You will hear all the evidence while it is still fresh in everyone's mind and recommends suitable sentence to be carried out after war. Preserve transcript if possible... Admiral Dönitz. May I see it, please? That's the original letter, and that's the transcribed message. The date and time on the letter indicate... Yes, I know how the date code works. Thank you. Well, I presume there'll also be an inquiry to find out who assaulted Bant. That was a most unfortunate incident which we all deplore. With respect, Lieutenant Commander, that was not the answer to my question. If Bant cares to reveal who it was, then we shall see that whoever it was is punished. You know damn well he's too scared to say anything. It's not our fault if he chooses to remain silent, Major. It could have been any one of several men. We all know who it was. No, we do not know. If you have evidence, then we'll be glad to hear it. Now... On the question of this Council of Honour, Falk, you will be the Council's president. I know nothing about court procedure. Captain Lehman does. He'll brief us. My experience is limited to giving evidence on medical matters for the police. Nevertheless, you know more about it than any of us. I wondered why you were asking me all those questions last week. I've written out four copies of the charges against Bent. One for me, one for you, Paul, as Council president. Thanks. Captain Lehman, you will be prosecuting. Thank you. And a copy for you, Shulker. You will be defending. And where shall we hold this charade? We'll use the stage in the main hall and organise a proper lookout system. If the British walk in, we're merely rehearsing a reenactment of a famous German trial for the concert. <laughs> I shall want a large German flag to go on the wall behind the President's chair. And what will you be doing? I shall be an expert witness. 
for the prosecution. Lieutenant Stein, you said that the RAF do not possess an airborne depth charge, but their coastal command aircraft are fitted with one anti-submarine bomb, which, and I quote from your evidence, is useless unless it scores a direct hit. Yes. If Romlo had died, there would have been little danger. Did you see this bomb fall? No. Really? Why not? I ducked. It's customary when a bomb falls. It helps you live longer. <laughs> Did Romlo duck? No. So you don't know if the Hudson dropped a small bomb or a more lethal depth charge? I've already told you. The RAF do not have an airborne depth charge. Well, I shall be producing a witness who will testify that they do. A new arrival. His U-boat was depth charged by a Sunderland. So, you ducked while Ramlo bravely watched the Hudson all the time? He did not watch it out of bravery. He was hypnotized with fear. How did he surrender? He waved his shirt. Did he have a jacket on? Yes. Which he had to remove first before he could take his shirt off? Yes. Now, did he wave the shirt after the Hudson released the depth charge? Yes. Immediately after? Uh, before the Hudson had time to turn? Yes. Oh, he was quick. But he tore his jacket and shirt off in panic. But just now, you said he was hypnotised with fear. Did you help him off with his jacket? Well? You must answer the question. Yes. Well, he, he asked me to. But I didn't know why he wanted it off at the time. Did you also help him remove his shirt? Yes, but I didn't know why he wanted it off. No, of course not. It was late summer, and I suppose the Hudson was making it rather hot for you. Major Shulker is including a great deal of unnecessary comment, Mr. President. No more than we've had from Captain Lehman. That is not true. I have it. no more questions. Thank you. Do you wish to re-examine, Captain Lehman? Sir. When you went below after the surrender, Lieutenant Stein, you said you posted a signalman on the sky periscope to watch the Hudson. Yes. Can you remember the exact wording of the Hudson signals? Yes. The first one said, have you surrendered? And the second one was, remain on surface or we will bomb you. It definitely said bomb, not depth charge. Yes. It was bluffing, of course. It only carried the one bomb. There is no doubt about the action I would have taken. As soon as the aircraft appeared, I would have given the order to dive and continued diving despite the air attack. My chance of escaping would be very good if there were no anti-submarine ships less than 12 hours steaming away. If the bomb had damaged me, I would have surfaced and fought it out with the aircraft. My anti-aircraft gun crews were well trained and there would be a good chance of destroying the Hudson. Were you ever attacked by aircraft when you were in command of a U-boat? Mr. President, I've failed to see what Lieutenant Commander Kruger's experiences have got to do with this case. I merely wish to establish that his experience qualifies him to speak with authority on the correct course of action U-570 should have taken when it was attacked. Would the first officer of a U-boat be justified in assuming command if his commanding officer had surrendered when still capable of fighting and possibly escaping. Yes. Excuse my ignorance of court procedure, but is the prosecution allowed to put leading questions to his own witness? That is true. Uh, Major Shulker is quite correct, unless the questions deal with a complex matter. I'm sure he would be the first to agree that this is indeed a complex matter. Mm. Continue, Captain Newman. And if the commander is faced with overwhelming odds... Then he must scuttle his boat. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander. <coughs> Major Shulker. Hey, commander Kruger, before you would scuttle your boat, you would give the order to abandon ship? Of course. Now, supposing you were under the guns of an armed trawler and a destroyer which had ordered you to allow no one from below, would you still scuttle your boat? I would never allow myself to get into such a situation in the first place. You've never been unfortunate enough to find yourself in such a situation. It's not a question of being unfortunate. It's a question of skill and courage. But you've never been in such a situation. No, when I was... Uh, Mr. Captain... President, Lieutenant Commander Kruger has been allowed to give evidence for the prosecution because of his experience in U-boat matters. We now learn, on his own admission, 
that he has no experience of the circumstances under examination. Therefore, it is my submission that his evidence is invalid. Are you familiar with Lieutenant Commander Kruger's record? 260,000 tons of enemy shipping sunk. He holds numerous decorations, including the Knight's Cross with oak leaves. I suggest you apologise. Why should I apologise for making what I consider to be a valid point? In that case, the Council will apologise on your behalf. You should remember, Major Shulker, that none of us has experience of surrendering to the enemy without a fight. Only Bernard Barrett can speak with authority on that subject. Why didn't you relieve Ramlow of command? It, it would be mutiny. You went to training college? Yes. Weren't you taught the difference between mutiny and the justified relieving of command? Yes. Tell the council those differences. I, I, I don't remember the exact wording. Um, mutiny is the refusal by an individual or, or group uh, to obey the lawful commands of their senior officers. Um, justified... Justified by... relieving of command is when the senior officer has demonstrated, either by his action or inaction, that he is no longer mentally or physically capable of issuing lawful orders. Is that right? Yes. Immediately after the attack by the Hudson, you joined Ramlow on the bridge. You said in your statement, and I quote, Ramlow appeared to be in a state of shock. He said, they'll kill us, they'll kill us. Is that correct? Yes. Your own words, a state of shock. Why didn't you take command there and then? I don't know. Didn't Lieutenant Stein suggest you take command? Yes, but I, I, I didn't trust him. Didn't he promise you his full support of that of the crew if you did? Yes. Didn't he assure you of his complete loyalty to you? Yes. And still you refused to act. Why didn't you do so after Rondo abandoned the U-boat? Surely you realised there was no question of mutiny then. Well, I, I, I thought the commanding officer of the British destroyer was technically in command of the U-boat, as we had already surrendered. You worried about legal niceties when there was a danger of your boat falling into enemy hands? Yes. Why didn't you tell the crew to abandon ship so you could follow battle orders? Well, I, I was concerned for their safety. And the destroyer had threatened to open fire if anybody appeared from, from below. Did it occur to you that the British wanted to stop you scuttling? Well, I thought perhaps they were worried in, in case we tried to use the gun. In, in, in the heat of the moment, I felt that the lives of the crew were more important than the, the capture of the boat. Surely you realised that the secrets revealed to the enemy through the capture of your boat could well lead to the deaths of countless sailors in the future? I... I didn't think... You didn't think! You didn't think that the presenting the enemy with a complete U-boat, with its equipment and weapons intact, could endanger the entire U-boat offensive? You valued your life and the lives of your crew above the lives of crews yet to sail? Yes. Speak up! Yes. Oh, Tommy, is quiet, everyone. <coughs> Yes, that's fine, Willie, but I want you to put more pressure on. Remember, this is the bit where you reach the main part of your cross-examination. You must be much harder. Surely you realise, do you admit? Bernard, you're just right. You're looking frightened because you know you're guilty. We'll just do that bit again. Take it from... All right, Willie, carry on. <coughs> Lieutenant Bent, do you understand what your last reply means? Yes. Would you like to reconsider your answer? I don't care what happens to me. I just want all this finished. Do you admit to being a coward? Yes. Yes. It's always been the same. At school I was frightened of the war bars. I can't help myself. Everybody said it, it didn't matter if you were scared. It would all disappear, they said. You'd be too busy to be scared, and, and I believed them. I believe my father. Fight for the fatherland, he said. But I had nothing to go on. I had no means of judging myself. I was scared the first time I was on a boat when it died, and I've been scared ever since. I didn't want to die. Now I don't want to live. My own definition of a coward is someone who has the courage to show he's not a hero. <clears throat> Lieutenant Bernard Berndt, you will please stand. 
You have been found guilty of failing to scuttle your U-boat to prevent its falling into enemy hands and guilty of displaying cowardice in the face of the enemy. Lieutenant Stein, who through no fault of his own, will have to live with the stigma of being associated with the most cowardly act in the history of the German Navy, has expressed a desire to read out the recommended sentence of this council. Lieutenant Stein. Thank you, Mr. President. Bernard Belt, the recommended sentence of the council is that you be executed. Supposing he wants to appeal. That's a matter for the Naval High Command. Our instructions were to hear the evidence and recommend sentence. Do you think we went too far? No. Do you think our sentence will be upheld? I don't see why not. Look, is something worrying you? I can't help thinking that what we did was wrong. I mean, to sit in judgment on a man is bad enough, but to destroy him as well in front of him... Listen, I'm a submariner. Just one of thousands. It's a filthy, dirty job. You're stuck in a tiny, almost defenceless craft for days, weeks, months at a time. You learn to live with the permanent smell of urine and vomit. You sleep in soaking wet clothes, not just when the weather's bad, but all the time, because everything you touch is dripping with condensation. When you're on the surface, you can't allow more than a few men at a time into the fresh air, because you've less than three minutes to dive if an aircraft is spotted. I had nearly 50 submariners under me, and not one of them ever complained. They're the men, and the hundreds of youngsters training in the Baltic, whose lives have been threatened by one cowardly officer who cared so much for his own skin he preferred to hand the British an intact U-boat. Baird may have forgotten them, but I never shall. We know how you feel, Otto, but what will the British learn from U-570? Its exact length, how quickly it can dive, how long it can remain submerged. Will it tell them anything they don't know already? The Type 7C is the most advanced U-boat in the world. It can dive to over 200 metres. Yes, that's what you told the Council, but is it? Yes, of now, course. I've learned one or two surprising things about British submarines from some of your fellow U-boat officers here. What is the maximum surface speed of the 7C? 18 knots, but I don't In see... In the last war, the British K-class submarines could do 24 knots. Well, they were steam-driven freaks. But nearly all the evidence you gave to the Council was based on the superiority of the German U-boat. Do you think I would list its faults in front of the Army and the Luftwaffe? Mm. In any case, Schulke could have found out what you found out. He made the mistake of attacking you. Bernd's defence was a shambles. Maybe it was, but that makes no difference to what Bernd did. It might make a difference when the High Command review the evidence. They might decide that Bernd's case was mishandled. I think we should reconsider the sentence. Are you siding with Bernd? Of course not. I don't want to see him get away with what he did. I'm just saying we should reconsider... Uh, yes? May I? Well, come in, Lehman. Do you believe in Providence? <laughs> not since I've been here. Why? The guard, Parsons, has been boasting again. On his last 24-hour leave, he took his girlfriend to Barrow for the day. They went on a boat trip to view the captured German submarine. U-570? The same. She's just been brought back from Iceland by Lieutenant George Colvin. She's been renamed Graf. Now, I've managed to scrounge a map. Uh -huh. She's lying at the submarine works in this narrow channel here. She's to be refitted. How far is Barrow from here? Less than 30 kilometres. Mm -hmm. Now do you see why I asked if you believed in Providence? Gentlemen... I think it's time we reconvene the escape committee. The plan is for someone to break out and sabotage U-570 at her moorings. The exact details have yet to be worked out, but are we all agreed in principle that it should be done? Yes, yes indeed. Good. I've considered the various methods which could be used to destroy a submarine. The easiest would be to open the main vents and sea valves. How much damage would a hand grenade do if it exploded inside a U-boat? One hand grenade wouldn't do much structural harm. How about four exploding simultaneously? If the watertight doors were shut, they could possibly blow it in half. Good. You uh, have an idea? Oh, yes. And I have some hand grenades. Hmm? Five of them. Unfortunately, I don't have an alarm clock. Lemon, what are you talking about? Hand grenades. These things. Good. They're British, of course. No throwing handle, which means they'd make a smaller packet, but just as big a bang. Where on earth did you get these? From the armory. A prisoner the British trust has been stealing from it regularly. Another prisoner they don't trust then returns whatever has been taken in exchange for tobacco. They keep replacing the locks, but he's sawn through the hinge pins. All he has to do is lift the door and it drops off. 
Doesn't matter how many locks they fit. How long has he been doing this? Some weeks now. He's kept quiet about it because he thought he was onto a good thing. I didn't know about it until he came to me with these. He feels he's bitten off a little too much. He wasn't sure whether to return them or use them as a lever. Well, you're responsible for men in your section. It's up to you to know what they're doing. You must admit it does have its funny side. <laughs> All we need is an alarm clock. Why? As you can see, they're nothing like our stick grenades. They don't have a friction igniter. This lever is spring-loaded and it's held against the grenade body by this pin. Mm -hmm. Now, to use the grenade, the pin is pulled out and the lever is held in place by the hand. Once the grenade is thrown, the lever flies up and starts an eight-second fuse. So, we take four of the grenades, remove the pins and pack them into a small box crammed with plenty of clay to hold the levers in place. Mm -hmm. Now, the fifth grenade is also packed into the box, but with its pin in place which is attached by a piece of string to the alarm key on the back of the clock. When the alarm goes off, the key turns, winds the string around its spindle and pulls the pin out of the fifth grenade. It explodes, shatters the clay around the other grenades, which all explode together eight seconds later. Well, it seems we have a bomb. All we need is a volunteer to plant it and a method of getting him out. There is one person who ought to be given the chance to volunteer first. You've got to do it. Kruger hasn't made any promises, but I'm certain he'll allow an appeal if you agree. I couldn't do it, Conrad. I'd do something wrong, I know I would. Are you scared? No. Yes. I'd be terrified. Do you want to be hanged for cowardice? No, but supposing something went wrong? Well, supposing I was caught? The British would shoot me anyway. Listen, I'm reaching the point where I don't care what happens to you. I've done my best for you and I'm damned if I'll do any more. I never did think of you as a coward, but I will if you refuse to do this. I'm sorry, Conrad. I've, I've caused you a lot of trouble. It's nothing to the trouble I'll cause you if you don't agree to this. Well? Yes. I'll do it. <laughs> Looks as though Shulker is having trouble with Bent. Hmm. Would you consider an appeal if he agrees? We'll have to see if he agrees first. The immediate problem is how we're going to get whoever does it out of here. Hoffman's made some excellent wire cutters out of two leaf springs. Something seems to be interesting, Lehman. Hmm? Where? Over there, by that watchtower. Lehman! If we do reopen the official escape program, I'm taking Lehman's name off the list. He's much too useful to us in here. Mm -hmm. That bomb is a brilliant piece of improvisation. I think I have it. Have what? The answer to the escape problem. I'll show you. Let's stroll casually over to the West Tower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course, it will only work on a fine afternoon like this. Of course. Now, watch the guards in the East Tower as we near the West Tower. No, no, don't do it too obviously. Watch them out of the corner of your eye. Yes, one of them is shading his eyes with his hand. Now the other one's doing the same. Now, if we stand in the shadow of this tower, like this. You see? I believe you've got something. The men in the tower above can't see us because we're virtually underneath mm. them. And the guards over there can't see us because they're looking straight into the sun. Yeah. They know we are here, but only because they saw us walk over. Yes, but you're not suggesting a daylight break, surely. The escaper will be seen long before he reached the trees. Of course not. What's always been against cutting the wire at night? That 30-second interval between each searchlight sweep is too short to cut the wire and make for the trees. But if the wire is already cut... Yes, of course. 30 seconds should be plenty of time. How long will it be before all the papers are read? Another two weeks. Well, then, if we have choir practice out here every fine afternoon mm -hmm. to get the British used to the idea, we'd be able to cut the wire on the first sunny afternoon when everything is ready and the escaper could make his break that night. Yeah, yeah. The British are not likely to notice a few cut strands of barbed wire right under the watchtower, especially as there'll only be a few hours of daylight between cutting the wire and the breakout. It's a 30-kilometre walk to Barrow, which you should do easily in six hours. The first few kilometres across country will be the worst, but if you stick to the compass route, you'll reach the road after one hour. Your papers are nearly ready. You're a Dutch seaman returning to Barrow after some shore leave. You'll have a paybook, identity card, travel warrants, used Liverpool bus tickets, and some letters from an English girlfriend. And this is the bomb. We'll be sealing it in a piece of inner tube, but before we do, I want you to go over the priming procedure. Uh, once aboard the U-boat, I cut open the rubber and remove the box. Uh, I open the lid, 
I wind up the mainspring. Uh, this key here. That's it. The one without the string attached. Mm -hmm. Five turns should be sufficient. The alarm key, which will pull the pin out of the hand grenade, is already wound, but it won't operate until the main spring is wound. Yes. The clock hands are set at three minutes to four, and it will go off at four o'clock. We've removed the bell. If you jump into the water immediately you've placed the bomb in position, you should be all right. I make sure the clock is ticking, and then I replace the lid and position the box in the forward battery compartment against the pressure hull. Excellent. Um, supposing someone's aboard the boat? Then you place the box under a grating on the outside. It won't do so much damage, so try and place it below if possible. You'd better have this just in case of trouble. It looks quite realistic at a glance. Don't pull the trigger. It's liable to break off. Right. Unfortunately, we know nothing about the security and layout of the submarine works. All we've got is this rough sketch map. The boat is moored in this narrow channel here. We suggest you enter the water at this quay here alongside the road. That means you'll have a 400 meter swim. Think you could manage that? Yes. We're making your kit bag fairly buoyant, so you'll be able to rest now and then. These are the wire cutters. You'll be cutting the wire in daylight, so... In daylight? Don't worry. We've worked everything out. Try a practice cut on this piece of wire. Right. <coughs> Good. Any questions? Will there be a moon on the night? We're not even certain what night it will be. We hope it will be early next week, in which case there won't. You'll be cutting the wire on the first sunny afternoon and breaking out the same evening. Okay, Bent. Now. must be Parsons with that searchlight. It always sweeps slower than anyone else. Yeah, rub this boot polish on your face, Bernard. It smells a bit, but you can wipe it off once you're through the wire. Thank you. Last foot patrol just finishing their circuit round the wire. Remember, when you reach the ground, hold onto the sheets until you feel two hard pulls. Yes. You then run behind the searchlight beam, keeping it a few metres in front of you. Don't get too close in case it stops. I understand. You've got everything? Yes. All right, onto the windowsill. <laughs> hold it. Yes. Right. Down you go. Oh, we might as well turn in now. He's had two hours, so he should be well clear of the camp by now. I forgot to wish him good luck. Yes, we all forgot. You know, there's something I wanted to ask, but Bernard stopped me. What happens to him after he blows up the U-boat? He's got 25 pounds and a merchant seaman's paybook. If he can get to Liverpool, he should be able to make it to Ireland. But he'll be missed at morning roll call. Do you really think he stands a chance? No, but he does stand a chance of blowing up the U-boat. And that's all that matters. <laughs> what the hell's going on? Major Leach is calling one of his snap searches tonight. All night. What are they doing? A bed count? The works. The guards are turning out every dormitory. We'll have to get someone into Ben's room to double up. Not a chance. They're sealing all the corridors. Hmm? What the? Well, it was the best I could do. I ordered the men to fight among themselves if there should be a check. It may delay them a bit. Oh, well, there's nothing we can do. We'd better go to bed. That's all we need. Roll call in this weather, too. I'm not taking orders from him, are you? Help me tie the shirt to the periscope. I would never allow myself to get into such a position in the first place. Why didn't you relieve Ramlow of command? He's twisting the facts to save his own miserable skin. You value the lives of your crew above the lives of crews yet to sail? Yes. No. Do you admit to being a coward? No, no, no. The recommended sentence of the council is that you be executed. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
Stop, stop a minute. What's the matter, lad? Well, look, down there in that field, all Jim's sheep. Whenever there's bad weather, they always crowd round that old shepherd's shelter. Well, look at them. It's as if they're keeping clear of it. Oh, someone's frightened them, I reckon. Thunder scared them, stupid creatures, sheep. Oh, no, they aren't. It's only people that think them stupid. Um, better take a look, then. OK. Oh. Get in soap just to look at sheep. You best bring that rifle. Hey. Hey, supposing it's the Nazi in there? He wouldn't come this way. He'd head out to Windermere to get the train. Best be on a night like this. It's a tramp, more like. Well, what do we do? I'll go around the back and you go in through the door. Right. I'll catch him if he tries to escape. Oh, but, but Captain... Cover him with a rifle. Well, you, you know about their eyes. My uncle says they, they can hypnotise you. All right, we know you're in there. Come on out with your hands up. Maybe you don't understand English. Well, fire a shot in the air, he'll understand that. It'll frighten the sheep. I'll frighten you in a minute. Do as I say. Yes, there, Captain. Shall I go and get help? Come out with your hands above your head. Don't try anything. Out you come. Well, well, well. What have we here? He, he doesn't look like a Nazi. That's near enough. Turn round. Shoot him if he tries anything, Corporal. Uh, I'm, I'm not armed. Well, just making sure. Now, who are you? I, I'm a Dutch seaman. I was on my way to Barrow when the storm started, so I hid in the hut. Hid? I, I hid from the storm. My English is not good. Have you got any papers? Yes. Here, my... My, my pay book and, and my identity card. Ah. There. Ah. Okay. They look all right. There, we can't be too careful. You better put them away before they get soaked. Thank you. I thought you merchant seamen always carried a kit bag. It, it's in the hut. I did not want to get it wet. <laughs> ah, it's a filthy night to be out. Would you like a lift? No. No, thank you. You are very kind, but I, I must get to Barrow. Got a ship waiting for you? Yes. You won't make it tonight. Last bus is gone. Uh, why don't you come with us? We've got to report to Grisdale Hall. You could telephone from there. They'd probably fix you up for the night. No, no, thank you. I I'll be all right here. I I'm used to being out in rough weather. Don't be silly. You come along with us. Nobody's going to say we didn't look after a seaman. Besides, hear those dogs? They're out looking for an escape prisoner. It could be dangerous. I I'll be all right. Well, our truck's just over here. Hey, come back. It must be that jerry after all. Oh, oh, we shoot. Put one over his head, Corporal. He's not stopping, Captain. One in the legs. Wing him. He's dead. It could be someone poaching. No, it was a rifle, not a shotgun. That means home guard. Well, you know what they are. No. No, I don't know what they are. Why don't you tell me, hmm? Perhaps they're like Layman here. Now, he's a medical man. Did you take the oath, Lehman? Did it allow you to sit back and say nothing while a man was being destroyed? <sighs> and Stein, with all his fine talk of courage and duty, how much courage did he need to burst in on a lonely man and to beat him senseless? And you, they all listen to you because you hold the Knight's Cross and oak leaves. When it comes to defining courage or the authority, you and your comrades in the U-boat service, brave men, all of them, not a bit like Bert. After all, it wasn't Bert who crept up on the Athenia and all those children. All right, Shulker, you've said enough. <laughs> We know how you feel about Bert, but we don't know if he's come to any harm, and there's nothing any of us can do now. We'll know what's happened in the morning. Where is Otto? It'll be too late for breakfast. 
It's most inconsiderate of him to disappear like this when the whole camp's buzzing with rumours. All I know is that the Commandant sent for him at seven this morning. Any news of Bert? Oh, it's no good asking me, and as much as you. Someone even asked me if it was true that Bernd had blown up the Queen Mary. I don't think he's come to any harm. Bernd's not the type to resist. Well, we'll just have to wait and see. Good morning. Ah, oh, right, about time. As you must all know by now, one of our comrades escaped last night. What you may not know is that he escaped so that he could destroy our submarine, U-570, which has fallen into enemy hands. I have a statement issued to me this morning by Major Veach. It is with deep regret that I have to inform you that your comrade and fellow officer, Lieutenant Bernard Bent, was killed last night whilst evading arrest. Mm. Lieutenant Bent broke away after being detained by a home guard unit. He was ordered to halt several times but took no notice. A shot was fired over his head but he kept running. The home guard were forced to shoot with the intention of wounding him. Unfortunately, the shot went high and hit Bent between the shoulders. He died before the doctor arrived. The Commandant said the escape was a gallant attempt by a brave officer. He deeply regrets that it should end so tragically, and he has agreed that Bent should have a funeral with full military honours. He has also agreed that we may provide a guard of honour and pallbearers. The funeral will take place at the village of Hawkshead. Those of you who wish to attend will be placed on parole and issued with British Navy greatcoats. It is most important that the villagers do not suspect that the funeral is that of a German naval officer. For that reason, the coffin will be covered with the British flag, but under that will be the German Navy battle ensign. mercy the souls of the faithful find rest, bless your servant Bernard Ben, and place this grave under the care of thy holy angel, and loose from the bonds of sin the soul What are you of going to say? I don't know. That united with thy Surely faith, you've prepared something. Look, Beach is pulling the Union Jack off the copy. Shh. Amen. Amen. Of, the, of the captured German submarine made by the BBC during the war. The reconvening of the Council of Honour never in fact took place because British intelligence informed the authorities of what was afoot and all the German officers concerned were transferred to Canada where they were split up until the end of the war. Columbia Broadcasting System presents Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. The next half hour has its baggage packed to take a trip with America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, he is just an expert. At making out his expense account, he is an absolute genius. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Oriental West, Cargo Bonding Company, San Francisco. 
The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my investigation of delayed cargo aboard the SS Shanghai Wayfair, or the case of the slow boat from China. Expense account, item one, $181.52. Plane fare from Hartford to San Francisco in answer to your urgent call. Expense account, item two, $3. Lunch on Fisherman's Wharf in answer to my stomach's urgent call. Item three, a dollar twenty. Cab fare to your office. Dollar, my name is Fundy. I haven't had the pleasure of meeting you before. I may I say it's a pleasure meeting you. It's a rough trip. I'm glad it's over. Over? Oh, it's just begun. Here, Dollar. This is your plane ticket to Singapore. Singapore? Hmm? You know, Fundy, I had a choice. Really? To come to San Francisco to see you or to take a case in Boston. A nice old lady on Beacon Hill clubbed her husband with an early American bed warmer. But no, rather than New England broiled lobster, I'd rather have San Francisco cracked crab. Now, all of a sudden, Singapore. May I ask why? Uh, yes, we've bonded against a delay, a $120,000 cargo of raw tin aboard the Shanghai Wayfarer. The ship was due to sail from Singapore three weeks ago. Still out there, tied up in the Tanjong Pagar dock. What's the delay? Mutinous, mechanical, or just plain mysterious? <laughs> I'm afraid it's little of each. We flew an expediter out there ten days ago to see what he could do. All the satisfaction we've had from this man, Harrison, is a report that since his arrival, the wayfarer's main shaft has burned out, her freshwater pumps have fouled up, and her steering machinery has gone on the fritz. You don't need an insurance investigator. You need a good plumber. <laughs> well, maybe you're right. But anyhow, you'll find our man Harrison, William Harrison, at the Crown Colony Hotel. He'll fill in the details. Dollar, you have only a matter of hours after you hit Singapore to get the Shanghai wayfarer started on its way. I, uh... I must impress upon you the fact that any delay after that will cost this company $2,500 a day. Well, all I can promise is the old college try. Times like this, I wish I'd gone to college. Well, anyway, I'm in the right town to make my last night in the States a good one. A few drinks with the right gal at the top of the mark. A few rare steaks at Alfred's. A few dances to Freddie Martin's music at the St. Francis. A few moments alone in the arms... A dollar. Huh? That sounds mighty good. But your plane leaves in two hours. Two hours? Well, I guess I'll have to do without the drinks, the dinner, and the dancing. Expense account item four, $120. Lost in the course of teaching fellow passenger how to play poker. My mother warned me not to, never to play cards with strangers on trains or steamships. I wish she'd included airplanes. You'd implied, Fundy, that the situation smelled. Well, you should have caught a whiff of the city, especially the native sections, through which I had to pass on my way to the Crown Colony Hotel. I found it on Anson Road. I found myself a room. I also found William Harrison's room. Harrison? Hey, Harrison! I didn't find Harrison. All I found was a calling card from my old friend Trouble. Wherever Harrison was, he didn't want to be, and he left a trail of broken furniture and blood to prove it. I searched the dresser. Shirt size, 14. Socks, 9. That meant Harrison was a small man. I went through the bathroom, shaving brush and toothbrush still wet, indicating that he'd been there not too many hours before I arrived. Then I tried the wastebasket. In addition to one large glob of used chewing gum, an empty cigarette package, and some old Kleenex, I found a swizzle stick with a name on it. The Collier Key Bar. Well, all that meant was that Harrison had a head cold and been trying to cure it with Singapore slings. But at least I knew where he'd been drinking them. The Collier Key Bar looked out on the harbor. It was dark enough inside to give a man a good excuse for drinking nightcaps at noon. Your pleasure, sir. Say, uh, how are you on mixed drinks? Mixed drinks? Governor, if I don't know how to make them, I look them up in the book. If they ain't in the book, I fake them. Now, what'll it be? <laughs> Straight bourbon. Right, yours, sir. Oh, hey, uh, bartender. Yes, sir. Are you by any chance acquainted with an American named Harrison? Harrison, sir? Yeah. He arrived in Singapore about ten days ago. Small man with a cold in his head. Oh, Harrison. Sure, I know him right mm -hmm. enough. He's been coming in every night with a chief engineer from one of the ships in port. 
Oh, yeah? What ship is that? Well, the Shanghai Wayfarer, I think. Oh, the Shanghai Wayfarer. What's this engineer's name? Yeah, you now, hold on. I, I ain't getting him into any trouble, am I? He's a nice chap, he is. A handsome tipper. This handsome? My governor, 20 American dollars. Why, compared to you, sir, Mr. Frank Moore is downright tight-fisted. Well, now, that's it. I, I done it. I let Mr. Frank Moore's name slip right out. My missus is right. For a little man, I've got a ruddy large mouth. Expense account, item five. Rickshaw fare to the Tanjung Pagar docks, ten cents. Tip to Pony Boy, one dollar. The ships moored fore and aft of the Shanghai Wayfarer were busy stuffing the pungent treasures of the East into their deep steel pockets. The only sign of life aboard the Shanghai Wayfarer was the right hand of the burly gangway watch. It was holding a knife with a six-inch blade and slicing thin slivers off a plug that looked more like tar than tobacco. As a gangway watch, he might have been fine. But as a reception committee, he was no Elsa Maxwell. That's far enough, mate. There's nobody aboard and there's nobody coming aboard. It's all right with me. All I want is a little information. Where can I find your chief engineer, Frank Moore? You come to the wrong place. By the icebox over at the Singapore police. They fished him out of the harbor this morning, stabbed to death. Oh? Uh, have you any idea who did it? They're holding some dame he's been playing around with. No, I don't know her name. Have they got anything else? Listen, mate, my job is to guard the ship, not answer questions. Okay, okay, have it your way. Well, watch out for pirates. <laughs> The British chief inspector, Singapore police, gave me everything except an invitation to tea. But unfortunately, he'd never even heard of Harrison. He took me into the morgue, and a look at Frank Moore's body told me nothing I didn't already know. He'd been stabbed, all right, and whoever had killed him had sunk him with a hole in one. As for his personal effects, his maritime union card confirmed the fact that he was indeed the chief engineer of the Shanghai Wayfarer. A stack of crisp American $20 bills in his wallet made me wonder whether he hadn't been picking up a little extra pin money for delaying the departure of his ship. And finally, a photograph that made me admire the late Mr. Moore's taste in women. Whoever it was that said, never the twain shall meet, should have met her. She was half caste and all woman. Her picture was inscribed to Frank Moore, yours forever, Chandra. From the inspector, I learned two more things. One, the fact that the police had already questioned and released her. And two, her business address, the Wardlow Bar on Melee Street. Hello, Mr. Young. You uh, like a midnight sing song, girl? No. The only girl I want to hear sing songs is Dinah Shaw. Go on, beat it, will you? Oh, hey, wait a minute. Yes, do I? Uh, where's Chandra? Oh, she go across to Penang tonight. You buy me a drink, mister? We sit right over here. Ranja, the gunner! Get it. Oh, Zamunda, hello. I pushed you away home to Shanghai one night huh? in your own coffee. Complete with stab wounds, no doubt. Why you say that? Why you ask for Chandra? I'm a stranger in town. I can't find the local chapter of the Lonely Hearts Club. So shall we find a quiet table? I don't know you. No, but you knew Frank Moore. That gives us something in common. Over there is one. Okay. <laughs> Doesn't sound like a very quiet table to me. In Singapore, you will learn whispers stand out in the quiet. They disappear in the noise. I'll bow to the wisdom of the native guide. But uh, who said I had any secrets? You talk about Frank Moore, so I know if you do not have secrets to give, there must be secrets you like to learn. But I tell the police everything I know, which is nothing. Oh, No, you are disappointed in me. No, no, not at all. You make good scenery. And I'll bet there's quite a story that goes with you. Oh, you find me interesting. I'm a man. Why do you come to me? Well, there were two places I could go for what I'm after. And you're much prettier than the SS Shanghai Wayfarer. I'm looking for a lead on a man named Harrison. Your murdered friend Frank Moore knew him, so... 
figures you know him. You are wrong. I do not know him. I do not even know you. Oh, well, that's soon fixed. My name is Johnny Dollar. Your name is nice. Especially the uh, dollar part, huh? You are very droll, but I see when you make this joke there is no smile on your face. You are worried about your friend, Mr. Harrison? Yeah, that's right. Maybe he was lonely tonight. Maybe he does not want you to find him. Ah, you certainly make me feel much better. How about a drink? I, I never drink before midnight. All right, then I'll wait. We'll have one then. All right, Johnny. But we don't have it here. We go to my house. There it is cool on the river. And there it is quiet. So we do not have to whisper. Midnight must have been invented for Singapore. And her house must have been invented for midnight. Only one thing looked out of place. Up on the wall was a souvenir of Chandra's war effort. A real American baseball bat. A Louisville slugger. And on it was written, Remember the U.S. Marines. Everything else in the place was soft. The lights, cushions, and Chandra. It is nicer to drink here, no? Yeah, may I say it's uh, a might intoxicating without a drink. I wish the boys back in my high school senior class could see me now. What do you mean? In the graduation annual, they predicted I'd be a bookkeeper. Oh, I do not understand you. And neither did the boys in my senior class. Johnny, please say things I can understand. I want to know you better. Maybe if I stop talking altogether, you'll get to know me better. So I stopped talking, but I didn't stop thinking. When I'd mentioned Harrison to Chandra earlier, she said maybe he was lonely tonight. If she didn't know him or anything about him, I wondered how she knew that he was missing tonight and not for a couple of days, or maybe even longer. Besides, the boyfriends of women like her don't keep secrets. I still assume that if Frank Moore had known Harrison, Chandra had known Harrison. I also assumed that she'd spidered me into her parlor for purposes other than social, and that notion was seconded soon after I had it, when somebody kicked the door open. The two boys in the door were not from Western Union. And ugly as they were, Chandra left my side to join them, which made me think that maybe my senior class had been right. Looking at that trio six eyes and two guns glaring at me, I wished I was a bookkeeper. In just a moment, we'll return to the second act of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. But first, here it is almost the end of February. All over the country, people are thinking about their new cars. All but one man. And he remains quite content with his old automobile and wearing apparel. An ancient Maxwell and a well-worn toupee. For these reasons, and for several others, named Mary, Dennis, Don, Phil, and Rochester, he now has the number one comedy show in America. All over the country, people think about him, too, every Sunday night. Hear the Jack Benny Show with Claude Rains as Jack's special guest next Sunday on all these same CBS network stations. And now, back to yours truly, Johnny Dollar. The men with the guns, described from left to right, were a fat man with three chins and a bald dome... And with him, a punk with a sneer and arms that were too long for the rest of them. They gun-muzzled me into a chair and started making anything but sense. Hmm. Well, well, Chandler, my dear. <clears throat> we are at last face to face with the mysterious stranger, Johnny Dollar. Oh, don't kill the suspense and tell me why. He knows why. He came to the Wardlow Bar. He knew about Frank Moore, and he was looking for the other one, Harrison. That is why I phoned you. Well, <clears throat> it would seem then that this unfortunate chain of events is... Nearing the final link. Yeah, this guy uses his head better than Harrison did. Well, Della? I'm using my head right now. Splendid, splendid. 
so doing, you may well prevent Harrison's death as well as your own. Oh, well, that's better than nothing. But uh, is that all you can offer? Skip the bargaining, Russ Line. Takes too much time. Quiet, Corgi. There are times when money is cheaper than the results of your kind of blind violence. Well, Dollar, you do have a price. Take a tip from my last name. Start bidding. I tell you, you're nuts, Rosalind. You aren't sure he knows where it is. He must know. He was looking for Harrison. They both know. You'll be quiet, both of you. 500 pounds English dollar. Where is it? At times like this, I keep my mouth shut and my ears open. 750. Surely, dollar, since you've entered the situation at such a late date, that is profit enough. Oh, well, I'm a man of expensive tastes. I've always aspired to such things as $200 cigarette lighters. Go ahead. Keep spitting out that wise talk and you'll be spitting out teeth. How'd you like to go swimming with your hands and feet tied? I could bite my tongue. <clears throat> no, not just yet, Corgi, my boy. <laughs> this man is worthless, dead. Uh, perhaps, Dolly, we can induce you to talk in much the same way as we could prepare a pat it by <clears throat> slitting the tongue. You know, Rosalind, your mother must have been scared by Sidney Greenstreet. Why, you... Either this guy is nuts or he doesn't know anything. What I know would fill a police blotter. Corgi, you know nothing of psychology, my boy. What this man is attempting to pass off as a show of bravery is based purely on the knowledge that he is, momentarily at least, of some considerable value to us alive. Now, Dollar, be careful. Before you make your final decision, bear in mind you've heard our final offer. No, sir. What should it be? I was a squirrel. A squirrel said to the little girl when she asked him what he wanted for Christmas, nuts. Very well, Nella. Corgi. Thanks. I finally came to in the dark, trussed up like a turkey, and lay there trying to figure it out. Obviously, the two rude dudes thought I knew something I didn't know. But what I did know was that finding Harrison had turned into a big, fat headache. Also, that I had accomplished exactly nothing towards speeding the SS Shanghai Wayfarer over the bounding main. While I was comforting myself by repeating over and over that old insurance company soother, never say die, I discovered I wasn't alone. Hello. Huh? You, who are you? Well, you were here first. You tell me. Well, my name is Harrison. Harrison? Yes. Who are you? I'm Johnny Dollar. I was sent out here by the Oriental West Cargo Bonding Company. Oriental West? Yes, I was supposed to do what you couldn't get done. And look at me now. Getting hit over the head and dumped in here must be par for the course. How long have you been here, and why? Well, I've been driving myself crazy trying to figure that out. Well, this little guest house, wherever we are, must only have one set of proprietors. I can tell you who they are, at least by the names they're using tonight. Rosalind and Corgi. They offered me 750 English pounds to tell them where something called it was. What is it? Well, it's a package. What's in it, I don't know. It belonged to the chief engineer of the Shanghai Wayfarer, Frank Moore. He was helping me try to get the ship on its way, and I, I owed him a favor. He asked me to drop this package at a bar. The, the, the Wardlow bar, yeah, go ahead. That's right. I was supposed to give it to a girl named Chandra. She wasn't there, so I got her address and went out to her place. You mean that package is at Chandra's house? Yes. When I got out there, the Chinese maid let me in. I, I waited as long as I could, and then rather than leave what might be a valuable package just lying around loose, I, I put it into the bottom drawer of a dresser and left. Oh, great. For such things, I go around laying down my life. Well, it's obvious that these men will stop at nothing to get their hands on that package. Well, when they asked you where it was, why didn't you tell them? Then neither one of us would be here. What's more, I'm beginning to think the sooner they get the package, the sooner our ship sails. Frank Moore had been a good friend to me. He wanted Chandra to have it, and I, I couldn't just turn it over to those two. Well, I've got some news for you. And this should make you really unhappy. Those two happen to be in business with Chandra. Huh? They're all on the same team. She's one of them. What an idiot I've been. Uh, well, here we are, all roped up. You know, for a pair of guys who came out here to speed a shipload of raw tin on its way, we're doing just dandy. We're lucky if we get out of this thing alive. Offhand, I'd say our host probably murdered Frank Moore trying to get that package. Maybe we're next. Uh-oh. Maybe right now. A beam from a powerful flashlight stabbed us in the eyes. The sudden change from too much dark to too much light kept us blinded. Well, look who's here. At least the voice behind the glare wasn't Rosalind's and it wasn't Corgi's. But it was a familiar voice, one I'd heard and heard lately. He walked in on us, the flash in one hand and in the other, a knife with a six-inch blade. 
At first, I wondered whether it was the one that had been buried in Frank Moore's back. And then I remembered where I'd seen it before. The man bending over us was the burly gangway watch from the Shanghai Wayfarer. And you told me to watch out for pirates. Well, this situation is getting a little overcrowded. I didn't think there was room for any more. What do you want? You know what I want, Dollar. The same thing Rosalind and Corgi are ripping your hotel room apart for right now. Now, don't tell me you're looking for it, too. Two things I know about that package, mister. The name is Rourke. Okay, Rourke. One thing I know is that it's dangerous company. The other is I want no part of it. The only thing I'm interested in is getting the Shanghai Wayfarer out of port. That won't be hard once I get that package. Where is it, Dollar? Uh, I'll trade the answer to that question for a little freedom. Okay, hold still. Thanks. Harrison's next. I want him with us in case he's lying. All right. Okay, Harrison, roll over. Hey, you! When Rourke bent over Harrison, I dropped kicked the flashlight out of his hand, ran across the darkened room, threw the open door, and kept on running. Sometimes the long way around is the shortest way home, so I headed for Chandra's house. I not only had some getting even to do, but I had some curiosity to satisfy. Somehow the Shanghai Wayfarer's failure to sail on schedule was tied up with a mysterious package. But how? Why? I decided I'd earned the right to see what was in that package. Johnny! I didn't want you to be lonely. I heard your playmates are over making themselves at home in my room. So I thought you and I could have a little chat. Maybe I've got a surprise for you. What, Johnny? I think I know where that package is. Johnny! You gave that package. We both don't worry for the rest of our lives. But we must hurry before Roslyn and Corgi come back. We go now. Okay, where's your bedroom? Johnny, what do you mean? Now, come on, where is it? Come, I'll show you. Oh, no. It's been oh. here all the time. Oh. And now while I open this thing, you can go and have yourself a nervous yeah. breakdown. <laughs> Say, this is more fun than unwrapping Christmas presents. And now I take off the cover. Wow. Now I know how the winner feels on Hit the Jackpot. The package was paper all the way through. Brown wrapping on the outside and green spending on the inside. Big bundles of fresh, clean American 20s. Thousands of the same kind of bills that the Singapore police had found in the late Frank Moore's wallet. It would have taken half a day to count it, and I'd wasted too much time already. They'll be no good to you without me, Johnny. You have to know how to get rid of them. Oh, counterfeit, huh? Yes. They are made in China. Frank Moore brought them from Shanghai to Roslyn to take to the States, but Roslyn was not here in Singapore. He was late, so Frank had to make some accidents happen to his ship to keep it from sailing. But then he changed his mind. He decided he would give the money himself. But Rosalind caught up with him. Oh, I see. He was sending them to you by way of Harrison, just before he was knifed by Rosalind, huh? Who talked him into that? You, by any chance? You and I could be very rich, Johnny. You never give up, do you? It's $500,000 there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it should buy about 50 years in jail. I'm taking this down to customs and you with it. No, I do not think you do. Uh-huh. Time to play another visiting team. Come on, beautiful. I don't want you in the way. Let go of me, Allison. I grabbed her, lashed her wrist with a cord from the package, and since she liked money so much, I stuffed her mouth with a fistful of those troublesome $20 bills. I locked her and the rest of the loot into a closet and dashed into the other room looking for a weapon. And then I remembered that Louisville slugger from the U.S. Marines. I was glad they'd landed. I grabbed it off the wall, got a toehold in the carpet on the left side of that door, wrapped my fingers around the bat, swung it on the back of my shoulder, and waited. Sandra. Sandra, my dear, we just came to... Oh! Oh. Two out and one to go. <laughs> Three outs, and the side is retired. What a ball game. First, I take your guns. And now we sit and wait for you to wake up. I'll take over from here on in, Dollar. Huh? Oh, I don't know about that, Rourke. I happen to be the guy who has the gun. Oh? Well, here. 
Take a look at this. What's in your wallet that I want to look at? More hot 20s? I'm not taking my eyes off you, Rourke. Okay, I'll turn around with my hands up and then you can look at it. Okay, fair enough. But if you so much as move, I'll start shooting. That's the deal. Oh, it's a fine time to learn this. Are you satisfied? John Joseph Rourke, U.S. Treasury Department. Come on in. I'm sorry I couldn't come out into the open before, Dollar, but I was too close to the payoff of this case to take any chances. Well, you know, I'm beginning to think that just being in this town is taking chances. That counterfeit's been funneling through this port on its way from China for months. We had more staked out for a long time, but this is the first shot we had at the top. That's him lying there on the floor, Rosalind. Now I've got him. Oh, your pal Harrison told me where I can find the only other thing I need, that package of hot money in the dresser drawer. Oh, it's now moved into the bedroom closet, along with a package of hot woman. Well, then, Dollar, it looks like my job out here is just about done. Yeah, I guess so. Hey, wait a minute. Hmm? You're from the Treasury Department. Yes? Well, then, after you get all these birds into their cages, how about helping me make out my income tax? <laughs> Expense account, item six. Hotel bill, one night in Singapore, five dollars. Item seven, one new outfit. Replacing mine, which was ruined in course of taking midnight dip in Singapore River, two hundred dollars. Item eight, twenty dollars. Bar checks for cheering up one William Harrison, your expediter, whose innocence had him running errands for the man who was holding up the departure of your ship. Item nine, three hundred and seventy-five dollars. Spent while killing time until the departure of my plane back to the States after the Shanghai Wayfarer finally sailed. You see, this time, I had four hours on my hands instead of the two you allowed me in San Francisco. Expense account total, $1,407. Signed, yours, uh, truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> In just a moment, we'll tell you about next week's Johnny Dollar Adventure. But first, for more exciting drama in the mystery and adventure line, remember CBS two thrill-packed Saturday night shows, The Adventures of Philip Marlowe and Gangbusters. Be sure to hear Philip Marlowe and Gangbusters tomorrow night on most of these same CBS network stations. Next week, CBS will take you adventuring with Johnny Dollar, hitting the hot spots in Palm Beach and New Orleans with the star of Hades, Diamond, on a trip all points south. Charles Russell plays the role of Johnny. Our music is composed and conducted by Mark Warno. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is written by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd and is produced and directed by Richard Sandville for CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Did you miss out on that big football game last week? Can't get rid of that head cold? Want to get away from it all? CBS offers you Escape. You are groping your way slowly through the dark hold of a ship at sea, moving carefully step by step, searching intently for something you dread to find because you know that this ship carries a cargo of death. The Columbia Broadcasting System and its affiliated stations presents Escape, produced and directed by William N. Robeson and carefully plotted to free you from the four walls of today for a half hour of high adventure. Tonight we escape to a harbor front in Venezuela and a grim voyage that started there, as told by Martin Storm in his gripping story, A Shipment of Mute Fate. A 
I stopped on the wharf at LaGuaira and looked up the gangplank toward the liner Chan K, standing quietly there at her moorings. The day was warm under a bright tropic sun, and the harbor beyond the ship lay drowsy and silent. But all at once in the midst of these peaceful surroundings, a cold chill gripped me, and I shivered with sudden dread. Dread of the thing I was doing and was about to do. But too much had happened to turn back now. I'd gone too far to stop. So I set the box down on the edge of the wharf, placed it carefully so as to be in plain sight and within gunshot of the captain's bridge. And then I turned and started up the gangplank. I knew what I was going to do, but I couldn't forget that a certain pair of beady eyes were watching every move I made. Eyes that never blinked and never closed. Just watched and waited. Oh, I beg your pardon. Why, it's Mr. Warner. Hello, Mother Willis. How's the best-looking stewardess on the seven seas? Well, I'm, I'm fine, Mr. Warner. I, I guess better run along now and get on with the chores. Now, wait a minute. That's a fine greeting after two months. Well, it's just that I'm so busy. I don't believe a word of it. Sailing days tomorrow. You're simply avoiding me, that's all. Oh, no, really, I'm not. And on the trip down from New York, you said I was your favorite passenger. But I'm only... Here, wait a minute. What's that you're carrying in your apron Oh, it's there? nothing. Uh, just supplies. Supplies? Well, let's have a look, huh? No, please. What do you know? It's a cat. It's Clara, Mr. Warner. Mm-hmm. Mr. Bowman said I had to leave her ashore, and I just couldn't. Well, who's Mr. Bowman? The new chief steward. Oh. Clara's been aboard with me for two years, and I just can't leave her here in a foreign country. Especially with her condition, so delicate and all. Yeah, I see what you mean. Well, I hope you get away with it. You, you won't tell anyone? Not a soul. As a matter of fact, if things don't work out right, we may both end up smuggling. I was happy to have you on board on the trip down two months ago, Christopher. I'm very glad you're coming along with us on the run back to New York. Thanks, Captain Wood. There is one thing, though. I'm having a little trouble with the customs men here, and I wondered if you might... I can't do it, Christopher. I just cabled your father this morning. Told him I'd done it for you if I possibly could. He sent a request from New York, you know. Yeah, I thought he would. I wired him from upriver last week. I hate to refuse, but it's absolutely out of the question. Well, Captain Wood, I'm afraid I don't follow you there. Responsibility to the passenger, son. We'll have women and children aboard. On a liner, the safety of the passengers comes ahead of anything. But with proper precautions. Something might happen. I don't know what, but something might. You've carried worse things. There isn't anything worse. And any skipper afloat will bear me out. Now, Christopher, I simply can't take the chance, and that's final. Final. Well, it wasn't final if I could do anything about it. I hadn't come down here to spend two months in that stinking backcountry and then be stopped on the edge of the wharf. Two months of it. Heat, rain, insects, malaria. I'd gone clear in past the headwaters of the Orinoco, traveled through country where every step along the jungle trail might be the last one. Oh, Sanchez. Si, sí, senor Warner. You better start looking for a place to camp. It'll be dark in a little while. Uh, si, sí, senor. Very soon we turn to river. Camp on rocks by water. This very bad country. This very bad country. You've been saying that for ten days now. Very bad country. Well, si, sí, senor Warner. This very bad country. Yeah, let's skip it. For all the luck we've had so far, it might as well be Central Park. Uh, Central Park? Uh, I don't understand. Well, never mind. If we don't find hey, some... Here, here, what's the matter? Quiet now. Sanchez, what's wrong? They're in the path. See? Bushmaster. Bushmaster. The deadliest snake in the world. Bushmaster. Its Latin name was Lachesis Muta. Mute fate. It lay there in the center of the path, a ten-foot length of silent death, coiled loosely in an undulant loop, ready to strike violently at the least movement. Here was the one snake that would go after any animal that walked or any man. It lay there and watched us, not moving, not afraid, ready for anything. The splotch of its colors stood out like some horrible, gaudy floor mat lying there on the brown background of the jungle, waiting for someone to step on it. Here was what I'd come 2,000 miles for, a Bushmaster. Sanchez! I didn't want that snake killed! He no kill, senor. He gone. Bushmaster very smart, very quick. 
Must always see bullet in time to dodge. Well, anyway, he's gone, and the only one we've seen in five weeks. Oh, we find other. This very bad country. Well, lay off that gun the next time. Don't shoot, you understand? Why are you say no shoot? You want Bushmaster? Sure, but I want it alive. Hombre, sa Cristo. Senor Warner, you tell me you want Bushmaster, but you no say alive. You're getting $200 for it. <laughs> for dead man, what is $200? Tomorrow we go back to Caracas. I'll make it 500, Sanchez. I catch water snake, rattlesnake, any other kind. But I no catch Bushmaster. Sanchez, I'll give you $1,000. We go back to Caracas. Well, it cost me 1500 American dollars. But three days later, Sanchez brought me the snake in a rubber bag. He was shaking so hard, I thought for a moment the thing had struck him. One thing you make sure, Senor Warner. No turn him loose in Venezuela. Because he know I the one who catch him. And he know where I live. All right, Sanchez, I'll keep an eye on him. También he know you pay me to catch him. All the time he watch and wait. You no forget that, Senor Warner, because he no forget. Not ever. Well, after going through all that trouble and danger and laying out 1,500 bucks... I wasn't going to let a pig-headed ship captain stop me at the last minute. At least not as long as the cables were still in operation between LaGuaira and New York. Morning, Captain Wood. The boy at the hotel said you wanted to see me. That's right, Christopher. Um, sit down. Thank you. It seems you weren't willing to let matters stand the way we left them yesterday. I'm sorry to go over your head, Captain Wood, but I had to. The museum sent me all the way down here for it. And I'm not going to be stopped by red tape. This will be the only live Bushmaster ever brought to the United States. Mm. Yes, and if I had my way, but... Uh, well, orders are orders. I got a cable from the head office this morning. All right. I suppose we talk about precautions. I'll handle it any way you say. Got to have a stronger box. That crate's too flimsy. Well, it's stronger than it looks. And that wire screen on top would hold a wildcat. But anyway, I bought a heavy sea chest this morning. I will put the crate inside of it. Sounds all right. You got a lock on it? Heavy padlock. It's fixed so that the lid can be propped open a crack without unlocking it. The snake's got to have air. But in dirty weather, that lid stays shut. I'll take no chances. Fair enough. I will keep the thing in my inside cabin where I sleep. I can't have it in the baggage room. And nobody on board's to know about it. Whatever you say, Captain. But we won't have any trouble. After all, it's only an animal. It doesn't have any magical powers. I saw a bushmaster in the zoo at Krakus once. Had it in a glass cage with double walls. It would never move. Just lay there. Look at you as long as you were in sight. Gave a man the creeps. I didn't know they had a bushmaster at the Caracas Zoo. They don't. Now. Found the glass broken one morning and the snake gone. Night watchman was dead. They never found out what happened. Well, the watchman must have broken the glass by accident some way. The way they figured it, the glass was broken from the inside. Well, we sail in four hours. We steamed north into the Caribbean with perfect weather and a sea as smooth as an inland lake. The barometer dropped a little on the third day, but cleared up overnight and left nothing worse than a heavy swell. But in spite of the calm seas and the pleasant weather, I found myself feeling more and more often an ominous foreboding. I was developing an almost unnatural fear of that snake. Well, I stayed clear of the passengers pretty much. Got the habit of dropping into Captain Wood's quarters several times a day. He kept the heavy box underneath his berth. I'd approach it quietly and shine my flashlight through the open crack. Never once could I catch that 12-foot devil asleep, or even excited. He'd be lying there, half-coiled, his head raised a little, staring out of those beady black eyes, waiting. He'd still be like that when I'd turn away to leave. Maybe that's what bothered me, that horrible and constant watchful waiting. What in the name of heaven was he waiting for? Well, hello there, Mr. Warner. Oh, how are you, Mother Willis? Aye, but you and the captain spend an awful lot of time around this cabin. I'm beginning to think the two of you must have some guilty secret. Oh, no, nothing like that, Mother Willis. I don't know about Captain Wood, but I... Well, I certainly don't have any guilty secret. Well, 
Oh, she's running quite a swell out there, Mr. Bowman. Yeah, it's a little heavy, all right, Mr. Warner. Just a storm passed through to the west of us yesterday when the glass dropped. Think it missed us then, huh? Yeah, that's that's what the mate figures. Sure stirred up some water, though. <laughs> This'll put half the passengers in their bunks. Makes it great for my department. Two-thirds of them will want a steward to hold their heads. They'll keep Mother Willis so busy she'll have... Wait, look at the size of that wave. Huh? But great Jehoshaphat, we're going to take it on the port bow. Hang on! Well, that was a freak if there ever was one. Not another wave in sight. You see them like that sometimes, even in a calm sea. Well, I got to get below, Mr. Warner. That water probably did some damage on the officer's deck. Yeah, I suppose it... What did you say? Uh, the wheel companionway was open on the port side. Bridge cabins must have taken a pretty bad smashing up. They're right below the, uh... Here, uh, Is something wrong, Mr. Warner? No. No, nothing at all, Mr. Bowman. At least I hope not. I looked first for Captain Wood and couldn't find him. Of course, I knew it was only one chance in a thousand, but the chances against that freak wave were one in a thousand, too. Well, I couldn't waste any more time, so I stumbled down the companionway and along the passage to the captain's cabin. Oh, oh, come on in, Mr. Warner. Mother Willis. Why, isn't this cabin a mess? Trying to get some of these things out to dry. Yeah, well, I just wanted to check. Where's that box that was under the captain's bunk? Threw it out on that. But where? We didn't know. It was nearly dark when we uh, met together again in the chart room. I don't get the thing at all. There's no other way around it. We've risked all the time we can. We've got to warn the passengers. Well, how we do it, Captain? Call them all together in the lounge? No, if we did anything like that, we'd be asking for a panic. We'll get one, whether we ask for it or not. Uh, pick a few men and go through the cabin decks. Tell them individually, inside their cabins. Watch for any act that looks as though it might cause trouble. And we'll keep an eye on them. Handle the crew the same way. All right, all right Captain. Okay. We'll take care. Now, as soon as you've finished, arm all the deck officers and start searching again. Our only chance of preventing a riot is to find that damnable snake. The slow nightmare that followed grew worse by the hour. None of us slept. All the ship's officers not on duty kept on with that endless search. Passengers locked themselves in their cabins or huddled together in the lounges, knowing all the time that no spot on board could be called safe. Fear was a heavy fog in the lungs of all of us, and every light on the vessel burned throughout the night. Morning came and brought no relief. Terror and tension mounted by the hour. There now, Mrs. Crane, stop getting yourself all worked up and go back to your cabin. The horrid thing's probably crawled overboard anyway. You're just saying that. You're paid to say it. You don't know. Nobody does. Now, now, everything's going to be all right. Oh, if you could only do something. If all of us could only get off the ship. They could fumigate it. Yes, that's what we've got to do. We've got to get off the ship. Now wait, We've Mr. Bowman. Mr. Bowman, she's going to jump. No, you don't, lady. Let me go. Let me go. Oh, nice no. Let me go. Nice work, Mr. Bowman. Let me go. Get her down to a cabin. Whatever you do, don't turn her loose. Well, you never know when it might strike you. You can't put on a coat or move a chair without risking your life. Now, something's got to be done. Yes, it yes, might sir. be right here in this flower. Yes, oh, all, all right, Mr. Steve. Yes, you better quiet down. Take it easy. Now. Take it easy, huh? Well, you're a great officer. Why don't you do something about it? That thing might be crawling around here right under our feet somewhere. Look, I said shut up. Are you trying to start a panic? Well, I got a right to talk. I don't want to die. Nobody's going to tell me. The second night passed and morning came around again. A gray and rainy day, just as grim and tense, dragged past, and the night came down again. Third night of the terror. Again, every light burned and the whole ship seethed in the throes of incipient panic. Faced by a horror they'd never met on the sea before, crew and officers alike were on the verge of revolt. Passengers sat huddled in a trance-like stupor, ready to scream at the slightest unknown sound. At seven bells, I made my way forward to the chart room and found Captain Wood bent over a desk. Oh, uh, hello, Christopher. Come on in, sit down. Well, it's got to be somewhere, Captain Wood. It's got to be. I don't know. You could search this ship for six months and never touch all the places aboard. 
can only hold out for two more days, we'll be in. What's the home office say? Oh, here's the latest wireless from them. Keep quiet and keep coming. <laughs> what else can we do? How is it on the decks? Pretty bad. Anything could happen. Yeah. That's why I took the guns away from the men. One pistol shot and we'd have a riot on our hands. Oh, the whole thing's my fault, Captain Wood. That's what I can't forget. Oh, take it easy, lad. There's take only some way I could pay for it myself, alone. No, I know how you feel, but it's no more your fault than mine or the man who asked you to bring the snake back alive. Nobody planned this. You'd better try and get a little sleep. Sleep? Mr. Bowman made some coffee down in the steward's galley a while ago. You better go down and get yourself a cup, and then rest up for a couple of hours. Rest? I can't rest. Christopher, it's no good going. What are you going to do? You... you... You can't help anything if you stumble through a hatch, half asleep, and break your neck. Go on and get some coffee. One way or another, we've got to hold out for two more days. The light was on in the steward's galley, and the coffee pot was standing on the stove. It was still warm, so I didn't bother to heat it. I poured out a cup carried it over and set it on the porcelain tabletop in the center of the room. I started to light a cigarette. The door of the pan cupboard beneath the sink was standing slightly ajar, and I happened to glance down toward it. Out from the dark interior of the cupboard shone two glittering points of light two inches apart. I dropped the cigarette and moved slowly backward. I'd found the Bushmaster. As I moved, the snake slid out of the cupboard in a single sinuous glide and drew back into a loose coil on the galley floor, never taking his eyes off me. I moved slowly back, waiting any moment for that deadly slithering strike. How had he known it was me? He'd stayed quiet when Bowman was here. How did he know to pick the first time in three days when I didn't have a gun? Well, my hands touched the wall behind me and I stopped. Only then I realized in terror what I'd done. The call button and the door were on the far side of the room. I'd backed into a dead end. I stared at the snake in fascination, expecting any moment the ripping slash of those poison fangs. The horrid coils tightened a little and then were still again. Ten million years of evolution to produce this moment. Homo sapiens versus Lachesis muta. Man against mute fate. And all the odds were on fate. I knew then that I was going to die. I could feel the sweat run down between the painted wall and the palms of my hands pressed against it. My skin crawled and twitched, and the pit of my stomach was as cold as ice. There was no sound but the rush of blood in my ears. The snake shifted again, drawing into a tighter coil, always tighter. Why the devil didn't he get it over with? And then, for just an instant, his head veered away. Something moved over by the stove. I didn't dare turn to look at it. Slowly, it moved out into my line of vision. There was a cat... That scrawny cat, Clara, that Mother Willis had sneaked aboard in LaGuaira. Its back was arched and every hair stood on end. It moved stiff-legged now, walking in a half circle around the snake. The Bushmaster shifted slowly and kept watching the cat. He tightened. He was going to strike at any second. He struck and missed. The cat was barely out of reach. Now she was walking back and forth again. She was asking to die. Missed again by a fraction of an inch. He was striking now without even going to a full coil. Missed again and again, always missing by the barest margin. Each time the cat danced barely out of reach, and each time she countered with one precise spat of a dainty paw, bracing her skinny frame on three stiff legs. And then suddenly I realized what she was doing. The Bushmaster was tiring. And one strike was just an instant slow. But in that split second, sharp claws raked across the evil head and ripped out both of the lidless eyes. That cat had deliberately blinded the snake. Well, he didn't bother to coil now, but slid after in a fury, striking wildly and rapidly, always missing. And every strike was a little slower than the last one. Until finally, as the snake's neck stretched out at the end of a strike, the cat made one leap and sank her razor-sharp teeth just back of the ugly head, sank them in until they crunched bone. With tooth and claw, she clung as the monster snake flailed and lashed on the floor, striving to get those hideous coils around her, trying to break her hold, to shake off the slow and certain paralyzing death that gradually crept over him and at last stilled his struggles forever. (laughs) 
I took a deep breath. The first in minutes. The cat lay on her side on the floor, panting, resting from the fight just over. And she had a right to rest. That mangy, brave, beautiful alley cat had just saved my life. And maybe others as well. But as I turned toward the stove, I suddenly became very humble. And I knew all at once what a small thing a human being really is. I and others aboard were still alive only by the merest accident. There were three reasons why that cat had fought and killed the world's deadliest snake. And those three reasons came tottering out from under the stove on shaky little legs. Three kittens with their eyes bright with wonder and their tails stiff as pokers. Up on the decks, hundreds of passengers were waiting for the news that the days and nights of terror were ended. And I could wait a little longer. I pulled open the doors of the cabinet, found a can of milk. And then I dropped down on my knees on the floor of the galley. Escape is produced and directed by William N. Robeson, and tonight brought you A Shipment of Mute Fate by Martin Storm, adapted for radio by Les Crutchfield, with Jack Webb as Chris Warner, Raymond Lawrence as Captain Wood, and D.J. Thompson as Mother Willis. The special musical score was conceived and conducted by Cy Fuhr. Next week... At this same time, when you're tired from a hard day at the office or leaning over a hot stove all day. When you want to get away from it all, CBS again offers you escape. Good night, then, until this same time next week when CBS again brings you Escape. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Brought to you by the makers of Cotton Tail. Good evening, friends. I'm Raymond your host. Remember? Won't you uh, come in to our inner sanctum? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's very gratifying that you have the courage to come back. I was afraid our story last week might have been too much for you. But, since it wasn't, suppose we see what you think of tonight's tale. The story of a strange, weird voyage that makes the ancient mariner look like one of the rover boys. <laughs> you know, thanks to Miss Reese, and I bring you the best ship. Featuring an all-star cast of radio favorites in an original radio drama by Robert Newman. Presented for your entertainment by the makers of Carter's Little Liverpool, the best friend in your sunny disposition. Now, wait. A question before we begin. Do you really know anything about the sea? The sea that covers two-thirds of the Earth's surface. The place of storms and sudden death. A place where anything can happen and usually does. Aboard the death ship. The Caribbean. That blue home of the Gulf Stream and the mysterious Agatha Wild. Somewhere near its center, heading north, an open boat. In it, their eyes red rimmed, their faces raw and cracked. Now, five men. One of them glances at the stern. 
Yes, trailing them is a menacing, triangular black skin. Captain, Captain Pike. Aye, what is it, Parker? He's back. He's following us again. Who is? That shark. The same one that picked us up right after the wreck. How do you know it's the same one? Because I do, and I don't like it. You know what it means. He smashed death. You keep on following us, and do. I'll hold the door, Captain. You can't get him. Ah, what's the thing? I tried three times already. Please, Captain. Well, give me your gun and let me try. Okay. Hold it, Dilla. Did you get it? Never even flinched. Maybe he'll go away when Josh dies. That's what he's waiting for. Yes, he's in green today. With all his ribs dove in? Okay. He's drinking drink it all the time. He says, look, he's opening his eyes. Water. Water. He's asking for water. I heard him. Uh, aren't you going to get him in? Don't be a fool, friend. You know he's dying. Water won't save him. There's hardly enough for the rest of us. He's entitled to his share, sir. He can have my rights and decide. Mine, too. Well, for my money, you're crazy, but... All right, talkie, force him out. All right, let's go. Okay, Captain. I think you're not too, Benson. Well, here you go. Thanks. There you are, Josh. There you are. Now drink this. Water. Water. Where? Where am I? What happened? Don't you remember, Josh? Uh, the Mary Kay, that storm last night. Uh, we ran into a reef off Skeleton Key. Uh, found it. All hands were lost except us. Some gear fell on you and you got kind of hurt. Skeleton Key? I remember. My ticket and we have to fight for me. We were clear of the reef. The same got caught. I did. And then we... You know, Captain Pike, you wanted to wreck your ship. What? You're crazy. You did. Piled it up for your insurance. The corporal was in it with you. You had the launch. Oh, no. Before we even struck. Well, if that's true, then what are we doing here in a whaleboat without any food and hardly any water? The ship sealed over after something. You couldn't get the launch clear. <laughs> You murdered all the whole ship company. And then uh, I'm dying soon. Well, I'm putting a, a curse on you. On both of you. Uh, a curse that will follow you and just... And then... Dodge. Dodge. Poor Dodge. He's dead. Okay. Keep him over the side. What? We can't do that, Captain. That's shot. Well, what do you want to do? Keep him here? I said heave him over. Listen, Captain. He was my pal. We shipped together for you. You bloody fool. Look over there. You see the black cloud? That's a squall coming. What chance do you think we'll have of living through it unless we light the ship? He's right, Captain. It is a squall, and it's... And look. Look, they're running ahead of it. A sail, a ship, a ship. Where? You're right. It is a ship. The ship's coming this way. We're saved. We're saved. Take us off, Edson. Wait for him. Ahoy, Edson. Ahoy. Wait a minute. Before they get here, let's get something straight. What Josh said about me wrecking the Mary Kay. He was out of his head, see? Out of his head? Delirious. If you don't think so, well, I just as soon they found three dead men here as one. You mean it? What do you say for that? Oh, that man. He was here safe and there was something funny about that ship. Funny? Funny how? Look at the way she's laughing, falling off. Right, that's so. But there was no one at the helm. But the least they can see him. But can you see anyone else? Any crew? Listen, getting aboard her is our one chance. Put out those doors and start rowing. Aye, aye. Come on, you're there, sir. Grab her, Calvin, hold on. Grab her on board. What about Josh, sir? In the whaleboat. Leave a minute to pass the river. I guess that's better than letting the sharks get him. Okay, sir. All right. 
so long, Judge. Uh, now, let's look around here. That man up there, hell for him. Well, maybe he's drunk. So blind drunk, you didn't see him. Maybe the rest of the crew's below and... Holy smoke. Drunk. Just jumped in. 
That's the first fire there. Or oh, something. What? It was too dark to be sure. But it looked to me like a whale boat with five men in it. And somehow, I get the feeling that those five men were us. What? No, yes, Tom. We don't think we're really here on board this ship at all. We only think we are. We're really still out there, tossing around in the whale boat. At least, our bodies are. I mean, we got a hunt that we'll all dead. My father's little liver pills. They do the work of calomel, but have no calomel in them. For they are simple pills made of vegetable drugs. They wake up the flow of one of our most vital digestive juices. When this vital juice flows at the rate of two pints a day, it helps to digest our food and bring back the glorious feeling that goes with regularity. Then most folks feel like happy days are here again. But be sure you get the genuine Potter's Little Liver Pills. Well, you want to go back to sea again on the death ship? Very well. But if our course from now on is one that's never been sailed before, don't blame me. It's just a moment later now. The three men are still standing in the stern of the death ship. It starts north through the darkness. Old train at the helm, Captain Pike, and Tom Benson staring at him. Yes. You think we're all dead? <laughs> Tom, you know what I would do if I could, Tom? 
He's going over the same. I'll pour the line, and when he comes up, we'll... Oh! 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 He isn't going to come up. He's dark, and it looks like he's been shot. I followed us all day yesterday. Yeah. Well, that was smart work, Sam. I thought I saw you move once or twice. I had a hunch you weren't dead. Well, he's dead. Aren't we both dead? Heck no. Does that slug through your shoulder feel as if you were? Well, no, but what you just said to Pike. That's right, so I could get his gun. Rick? Well, he's not Rick about the sun. He's rising in the west instead of the east. No, it's not, Sam. As soon as I saw it, the whole thing came to me. You remember that body we found last to the wheel? The mate? You know what killed him? Hmm? Lightning. Lightning? Yeah. Struck by lightning during the storm when the Mary Kay went down. Besides killing him, it polarized the compass. Reversed it so that the needle pointed south instead of north. That's why it looked like the sun was coming up on the wrong side. That's why we ended back here at Skeleton Key again. We were sailing south all the time, instead of north. Well, there, Bush. That's it, well, Bush. We could see a well, Bush in five minutes. Show you this. And you know who they were. The men Talbot and his mates set adrift, so they wouldn't have to share the treasure with us. You know what we're going to do? We're going to pick them up and get them to help us sail this ship home. And the treasure? You said you didn't want any part of it. Well, I don't either. They found it. Let them divvy it up. But, uh, we found this ship. Mm. It's great. Damn it. It's ours, now. Huh? Ours to do anything we like with. We're our own boss from here on in, then. And what more can a man want? Next in time, next in the world.
This is Ed Hurley reminding you, when you don't feel good, try Carter's Little Liver Pill. I present Monsignor Sheen. Friends, last Sunday we spoke of the first of the three philosophies of life involved in this war, the totalitarian. Today and next Sunday, we speak of the second, the secularist and materialist culture of the Western world. By the secularist ideology... We mean the attempt to preserve human and democratic values on a non-moral and non-religious foundation. The condemnation of secularism of the Western world is not a condemnation of the Western world. There is the same distinction to be made between the two as between a ship and its barnacles. The ship in its passage through the seas picks up barnacles which impede its free progress through the waters. Every now and then, that ship must be brought into dry dock to have the barnacles scraped away. The ship is good. The barnacles are bad. Now, Western civilization, or what we call democracy, may be likened to a ship America, in particular, is a good ship. It carries the precious cargo, a belief in inalienable rights and liberties. This ship of America is good. It carries the burden of the four freedoms of which our president spoke. Freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom from want, and freedom from fear. This ship of America is good, and it is freighted down with the cargo of the right of sanctuary, for America has been a sanctuary in the past, and is a sanctuary now to the oppressed peoples of the world. There's no other land on the face of God's earth has been a sanctuary. This ship of America is good, and it is freighted down with the precious cargo of all those fine and noble things which make you and me proud to call ourselves Americans. But in the course of sailing, this ship has acquired some barnacles. These barnacles or superstitions of which I shall speak (coughs) constitute what we call the passive or soft barbarism from within. They are a danger to Western civilization not quite as open as totalitarianism but just as insidious. Today we shall describe three of these barnacles. The superstition of progress, of scientism, and materialism. After we have described them, we hope that we will be able to scrape them off. First, the barnacle or the superstition of progress. It runs some such way as this. Man is naturally good and indefinitely perfectible. By the mere fact that he lives, and thanks to great cosmic floods of evolution, he will be swept onward and onward until he becomes a kind of a god, and this earth becomes a paradise. Goodness increases with time, while evil and error decline. Progress is automatic. Such is the superstition of progress. Now, why is it wrong? It is wrong because it confuses mechanical advancement with moral betterment. Progress in things is not necessarily progress in persons. 
Planes may go faster, but man does not necessarily become happier. Mastery over disease is not necessarily mastery over sin. Conquest of nature does not mean conquest of selfishness. Time does not always operate in favor of betterment. Because a man is sick, time does not make him better. Unless the evil is corrected, time may operate in favor of disease, decay, and death. True progress is morally and not mechanically conditioned. It depends not on vitamins, more playgrounds and better milk and duckless glands, but on the will, the will to goodness. There is, therefore, only one real, true progress in the world, and that consists in the diminution of the traces of original sin. History does not prove that we are making progress. Notice the intervals between wars in modern times. The interval between the Napoleonic Wars and the Franco-Prussian War was 55 years. The interval between the Franco-Prussian War and the First World War was 43. The interval between the First World War and this one 21, 55, 43, 21. And each war more destructive than the other, and at a time when man had all the material conditions essential for happiness. Is this real progress? The sad and tragic fact is that modern man, under sufficient stress, and even among comforts, will do deeds of evil as terrible as any that have ever been recorded in human history. Barbarism is not behind us. Barbarism is beneath us. And at any moment, it can emerge unless our wills, aided by God's grace, repress it. Our own mechanical ability to move quickly can go hand in hand with the power to do more evil. Let no one deny it. Our scientific progress has outstripped our moral progress. The myth of necessary progress has exploded. But because the evil in the world does not evolve right, does not mean, as they say, that there is no right. What it does mean is that we must put it right. And in order to do this, we may have to learn the lesson of the cross and the agony of Gethsemane. Maybe, maybe, we had all better get back again to God. Then there is the second barnacle or superstition, the superstition of scientism. I do not say science, I say scientism. And by scientism, I mean that particular abuse of science, which affirms that the scientific method is the only way of knowing anything. It is this particular superstition which makes people say, science tells us. But they never say, scriptures tell us, or the church tells us, or the commandments tell us. Science is supposed to be the very last word on any subject. Hence, there's no place for values, tradition, metaphysics, revelation, faith, authority, or theology. The only true knowledge is that which comes from counting. Such is the superstition of scientism which has gripped America. 
Now, science is, of course, a very valid way of knowing. But only of knowing those things which are subject to experimentation and the methods of the laboratory. The great values of life, such as justice and truth and charity, are beyond experimentation. No one has yet ever been able to put a mother's love into a test tube. But who will deny that it exists? We cannot put a man into a cauldron and boil him and stew him until he gives forth the unmistakable green fumes of envy. The great values of life are beyond the laboratory. And scientism of this kind is ruining higher education in the United States. It is doing it by assuming that anyone who has counted something that has never been counted before is a learned man. It makes no difference what you count in higher education. But in the name of heaven, count! A certain Western university awarded a Doctor of Philosophy degree to a student who wrote on the thesis the microbic content of cotton undershirts. A Midwestern university has counted the ways of washing dishes. Eastern universities have counted the infinitives in Augustine, the datives and the ablatives in Ovid, the four ways of cooking ham, and another to quote their own words, the psychological reactions of the post-rotational eye movement of squabs. Go into any Catholic school in the United States tomorrow and take out any child in the first or second grade and say to that child, Why are you here? Where are you going? What is the purpose of life? And the child will be able to answer your questions. But ask this Ph.D. student who can account at the microbes and cotton undershirts why he's here, where he's going, what is his destiny. He would not be able to tell you. He would not have a five-cent gadget in his house five minutes without knowing its goal or its purpose. And yet he will live ten, twenty, sixty years without knowing why he is here or where he is going. It is not true that modern youth is revolutionary because he lacks sufficient economic advantages. Never before has modern youth had so many. The modern youth is revolutionary because he has no purpose in life. And unless, as a nation, we restore purposes and values in education, we will end only by educating for chaos. Oh, we are paying a terrible penalty for divorcing our science from God. Nature which studies science belongs to God. When man turns against God, nature or science turns against man. As Francis Thompson rather beautifully put it, I tempted all his servitors, but to find my own betrayal in their constancy. In faith to him, in fickleness to me, their traitorous trueness and their loyal deceit. That is the true story. Nature will be false to anyone who is untrue to its maker. For years, science has been discovering the wonders of nature, but instead of glorifying God, has forgotten God. And scientists thought themselves the authors of the book of nature instead of only its proofreaders. And tearing nature away from God, nature now turns against them. And the result, that science, which was supposed to be our servant, is now our master. Why is it that millions today shrink in terror from a machine in the air? Why does man use his technique to destroy man? Why do children crouch in bed and mothers dig holes in the bowels of the earth 
As bombs fall from the skies and all hell is let loose. If it is not because science has gotten beyond our control. Maybe. Maybe we had all better get back again to God. And the third barnacle or superstition is materialism. And this superstition affirms that man has no soul, there is no future life, man is only an animal. As our modern psychologists tell us, he is a psychoanalytical bag filled with physiological libido. Or he is a stimulus response mechanism, the end of whose life is the acquisition of money, the enjoyment of pleasure. There are no standards outside of the material. Now, it simply is not true that peace follows material prosperity. There is more frustration among the rich than among the poor. Sin and evil do not disappear with the advent of prosperity. Society can become inhuman while preserving all the advantages of a material prosperity. And if there are no standards outside of the material, how shall we judge the new acquisitive society which is arising? Based on the acquisitiveness of power as against the old acquisitiveness of money, as fortunes dwindle, as taxes eat up inheritances, and as bureaucracies begin to administer vast sums of money formerly administered by capitalists and bankers, envious, greedy, and lustful men will seek to become dispensers of that social booty. And who shall say that these new financiers of power are wrong? Given no under other standard than that of materialism, wherein power is disjoined from conscience, and we lose the right to protest in the name of justice. Our world is sick of materialism. It is pathetic to hear people ask, what can I as an individual do in this crisis? These people who have been told that they are only animals... Many of them feel like cogs and machines. They want to get away from it all. Some of them would like to climb back into catacombs. Like Jews in exile, they hang their harps on the trees and ask how they can sing a song in a foreign land without a soul. There will be a change. The millions of boys on the battle fronts of the world who are fighting for their lives and for great moral issues will recover their souls. Midst wounds and death and fire and shell, they will get close to the meaning of life and do that something within them which really makes them human. And then they will look back and they will be angry at those who educated them. They will come to hate not only the enemy in battle, but they will hate still more the intelligentsia at home who told them that they were only animals. They will begin to realize that these so-called educators rob them of their greatest possession, faith. And for a while, they will wander around the battlefields like Mary Magdalene in the garden, saying, They have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they laid him. But when they do stumble on him, as Magdalene did when she saw the red livid marks of nails, they will enter once again into the possession of the soul. And when they come marching home, there will be a judgment on those intelligentsia who told them that they had no soul. They will begin to live like new men. There will be a rebirth of freedom under God. For maybe, and only are they right, maybe we had all better be right and get back again to God.
Why do I speak about these barnacles on the ship of democracy? Because they are endangering the American way of life. Because they are outmoded ways of thinking. Because we are called upon in this world war to be the moral leaders of the world. Never before was a greater task thrust into any nation's hands than into our own. We have a great vocation, and we must be worthy of it. And we do not want the ship of America to be held up in its mission by barnacles and false superstitions. And may I therefore ask you, Jews, Protestants, and Catholics, to spend an hour a day in prayer that America may be worthy of its calling. Catholics should include daily Mass and communion in this hour. And to anyone who wishes a prayer book for wartime entitled The Shield of Faith, we will send it with our compliments. For how else except by prayer? Realize the pledge of our President when he said, The United Nations seek to work for the restoration of the international order in which Christ guides the hearts of individuals and nations. That is a tremendous responsibility. America, awake! You have a high summons. Walk worthy of your vocation. Purge yourself. Repent. Your greatness is in your return to God. God love you. O Lord Jesus Christ, who in thy mercy hearest the prayers of sinners, pour forth we beseech thee all grace and blessing upon our country and its citizens. We pray in particular for the President, for our Congress, for all our soldiers, for all who defend us in ships, whether on the seas or in the skies, for all who are suffering the hardships of war. We pray for all who are in peril or in danger. Bring us all after the troubles of this life into the haven of peace and reunite us all together O oh, dear Lord, in thy glorious heavenly kingdom. The address you have just heard was entitled, Some Barnacles on the Sh Adventures by Morse. presents The Girl on Shipwreck Island featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. When Captain Bart Friday and his sidekick Skip Turner returned to Saigon, capital of French Indochina, following their experiences in the Cambodian jungles, they were taken immediately to Government House. They had accomplished such a satisfactory piece of work for the French territorial government, they were immediately asked to take on another mission, en route back across the Pacific to San Francisco and home. This mission had to do with flying a special French-type army plane from Saigon to Australia, where it was to be torn down and shipped by boat to France. Had you ever flown this type plane before, Captain Friday? Well, something pretty similar. It wasn't entirely familiar, but with Skip acting as mechanic and co-pilot, I was pretty confident. Is that right, Skip? Why, sure. Wasn't a plane that bothered me. I hated like the deuce to separate from the rest of the car party. <laughs> Business before pleasure. Oh, sure, I know. But I got pretty fond of Professor LeBron and Perry Mills. Mm. Now, how about Celia? <laughs> <laughs> Doggone right. And here, Perry and Patricia went and got married in Saigon, and we hardly had a chance to kiss the bride. Boy, we would go on another harebrained mission. 
Well, Perry and Patricia and Professor LeBrun and C are well out to sea by now on a luxury liner for San Francisco. Yeah, and look at where we are. Where Captain Friday and Skip Turner are is another matter entirely. Yesterday afternoon, they took off from the Saigon Airport, out over the China Sea and the Indian Ocean they flew, into the night, through oriental moonlight and white clouds, which stood up on end like mountains and skyscrapers and giant pillars. And when the dawn came, these massive towers of white clouds turned rose and pink and flame color and lit up the sky so that the flyers felt as though they were driving through a sky on fire. And then, as full day came, the vastness of the ocean expanse spread out below them. From horizon to horizon, nothing but the dirty blue of the ocean below and the haze blue of the heat-tinted atmosphere around them. And then it happened. Engine trouble. And when the motors conked out completely, the sound of wind in the struts and against the fuselage, and on the wings was all the sound there was, and the falling craft gathered steam. And it was then the skip turner caught sight of a tiny island, hardly bigger than a pocket handkerchief, looming ahead of them right into the wind. With every ounce of skill, Captain Friday kept the plane under control, heading it for the small place of refuge. further to the good portion of landing safely, there was a sandy beach, and the first waves took the plane and ran it up on the sand like a toy in a bathtub. Oh, wee! Man, oh man, did you see what happened to us? Oh, you can be glad you're not feeding the fishes at this very moment. Ooh. Amen, brother, amen. You didn't get hurt in bouncing around. Huh? Not a scratch. You? Nope. Well, Chief, let's get out and see the country. Get this strap unfastened. I don't think the plane's been hurt any. Well, uh, dog gone, man, the engines. What you suppose happened? Uh, there. Will the door open? Oh. Yeah. Hang jammed a bit. Good, get out, Skip. Yeah. Hey, are you coming? Yeah. Uh. Hey, listen to that bird. Sounds like San Diego on a bright June night. I don't see any ha- signs of habitation anywhere around. Mm-hmm. You can't tell what's up in that jungle stuff waiting in the beach. That's pretty rugged country. Volcanic. Yeah, probably caves and stuff up in there. You know, we was lucky to find a sandy beach. Well, let's have a look. Got your packet of special rations? <laughs> yes, sir. Including six bars of chocolate. Here we go, then. Hey, what about the plane, Captain? Shouldn't we ought to give it to once over and see whether we're stuck here for good? Well, that'll have to come later, Skip. First thing's to see if we're in any danger from the natives. Yeah, if there is any. Looks like a deserted hunk of volcano to me. Yeah, guess we'll have to wade through this grass for a little. Yeah. Hey, where are we aiming for? I thought if we could climb up on that high ground, we might get a survey of the whole place. We ain't mad at that. Whole place ain't two miles across in any direction, look like from the air. Okay, here's where we start the climb. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to get out of that grass. There's one thing I hate. It's the snakes and bugs and stuff down in this part of the world. Oh, a lot of sharp lava. Edges like a razor. <sighs> Gotta pull yourself up in some of these places. <sighs> you make it? Yeah. Come on up. Okay. <sighs> Phew, is that sun boring? If we can skirt the edge of that next pinnacle, it seems to be easier going to the left here. It looks like the minute we get up on the next level, we're going to be in a tangle of jungle. We'll worry about that when we get up there. Notice how the island seems to be built up in tiers. First the beach level, and this level we're on. Then up above the jungle level. Yeah. They ain't seen nothing that looks like human life yet. For any natives, it would be pretty shy of two white men. Especially coming down out of the sky as we just did. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, what do we do now? We run into a blank wall, all right. Oh, it's ten foot if it's an inch, and straight up. And no place to go except turn back. 
Skip, do you think you could boost me up? Maybe if I could get my fingers over the edge, I could scramble up. Sure, but how do I get up? Well, let's figure that when I make it up. Okay. Climb up on my shoulders. Hey, but for God's sake, keep them hobnails out of my rib. Here I go. Hey, you're taking my skin off. Oh, still, up. Huh? Oh, still, he says. Can you make it up? Yeah. There, I got my fingers over the edge. Now you can reach up and push my feet up when I heave. All right, and try. Here you go. You make it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. Okay, now what about me? Now, just a minute. Be with you in just a minute. And hey, what's up there, anyway? I haven't had much of a chance to look around. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you got your pants off. That's right. I'll brace myself up here and throw the legs of my pants over the edge. Grab a hold and scramble up. <laughs> and put up a fair leg off. <laughs> For your own good, you better not. <laughs> okay, let's go. Yeah, yeah, go. Yeah. Looks like I'm going to make it. Up with you. Yeah. There. Yeah. There. There. Excuse me while I put my trousers back on. Well, will you look around us? Hey, this ain't the kind of a jungle I thought we'd find up here. Yeah. There. It looks interesting, though. Hey, that's beautiful. Kind of rolling meadow with green grass and vines and a lot of palm trees. Okay. Let's go and investigate. Yeah. That's more like a park. And we'll keep heading for high ground, huh? Yeah. I'd like to get a picture of the whole island if I can. Hey, look, as soon as we get back from the rock ledge, the ground's as black and fertile as a California meadow. Oh, look there. Yeah, they're rabbits. <laughs> Looks like a cross between a rabbit and a kangaroo. And it's just the size of a rabbit. Hey, hey, there's some more of them. Hey, this place is alive with them. Well, we won't starve here, that's one thing. Hey, let's cut across to that high spot. Yeah. Hey, this is kind of interesting, you know. I didn't know there was any South Sea Islands right there. You want to stay here and homestead it? <laughs> the heck with that. Too far to the nearest drugstore. Okay, here we are. Yep. Yeah. And there's your whole island laying out before you. Hello. The island seems to be divided into two parts. Look at that ravine down below us. Yeah. Seems to have two humps like the back of a camel. Yeah. We're standing on one hump and across the ravine is the other. Hello. That water down there in that ravine? I mean, it looks like a creek, all right. Well, if there's a freshwater stream on the island, we're more than in luck. Hey, you talk as if you didn't think we was going to be able to get that airship off the beach. Well, that remains to be seen. Hey, Captain. Captain, look down yonder in the water. Where? Where that palm tree under the creek. It's a girl. Skip, I think you're right. Why, of course I'm right. A white girl using the old swimming hole as sure as I'm a foot high. She's a white girl, all right. How far away do you imagine she is? A couple of hundred yards on a straight line, I reckon. Probably half a mile away we'd have to travel to get out of where she is. Well, what are we waiting for? <laughs> yeah, man. Now, what in the blaze is it the white girl doing alone on this desert island? She might be a Polynesian. Oh, but their skins ain't pure white. They're kind of brownish. You can see for yourself, this girl's skin was white as milk. It actually gleamed in the sunshine. Hey, look, you can still see it. <laughs> You're not going poetic on me, are you, Skip? Oh, I know, but something like this don't happen to a man every day. <sighs> Yeah, we're going to have to skirt around the brow of the hill for a ways. Oh, but we'll lose sight of her. So we we'll lose sight of her. She can't keep out of our way for very long on an island no bigger than a pocket handkerchief. Uh, just a minute, Chief. Well? Uh, looky, um, maybe you should stay here and uh, kind of keep her in view while I... Hey, hey, in... hey, hey, what kind of double talk's that? Well, I was just thinking. Well, I know what you're thinking. Come on, we go down together. No, it was an idea. <laughs> I'll say it was. We get around the brow of this hill and... Hey! Get up there, Skip. Huh? Well, I'll be a son of a gun. Shipwreck. Do you see? It is a white girl. Shipwrecked and moon on this island. Probably for months and months. Yeah. That craft's been piled up on the beach there for six months anyway, looks like. Yeah, but where's the rest? The captain and crew and the rest. Probably weren't over five or six of the crew. Yeah? Uh-huh. Looks like a small luxury schooner. Millionaire's yacht, huh? Could be. Well, anyway, that explains the girl. Come on, let's get down to it. We don't want to rush in on her. Probably scared her to death. Don't be silly. She'll be so glad to see white folks again. She'll probably throw her arms around our necks and hug us to death. <laughs> Skip the romanticist. Well, why shouldn't she? After all, if I hadn't seen a white girl for six months, I'd know how I'd feel. Do you think she's going to feel the difference? Well, as to that, Skip. Hey, that was a last one. Oh, Skip. Hey, they were shooting at us. I could hear the bullets. <laughs> 
Why, that little white-skinned female shooting at her rescue us. That wasn't the girl, Skip. The shots came from behind us. Here are Captain Bart Friday and Skip Turner marooned on a desert island in the South Pacific when their army plane in which they were flying between Saigon, French Indochina, and Australia conked out on them. They landed the plane safely with hopes of repairing the motors, but at the moment are exploring their island refuge. At the foot of the hummock on which they have been standing, they see a freshwater stream, and in the stream, a white girl bathing. They are just making their way down to this amazing vision when two rifle bullets sing over their heads. The shots have come from behind them. And just now, the two are wriggling on elbows and stomachs through the long grass for safety in the ravine below. Keep down and keep coming, Skip. Honest to my grandma, I never felt so sorry for a snake in my life. Yeah, yeah. Imagine having to go around on your belly all your life. Hold it just a minute. Yeah. I need a breather. Here, we've eluded the guy with the nervous trigger finger, or else he's stalking us. Waiting to get a really good beat on us. Well, that's a comforting thought. Well, another ten feet and we can drop down behind those rocks in the ravine. You think that makes me mad? Them shots probably scared heck out of the gal we saw him bathing. Where will she be now? Probably jumped into her clothes and beat it for home. Home? Well, whatever she calls home these days. Yeah, and if she hides out on us, it'll take us maybe days to make contact. It's not the angle that bothers me. Yeah? We now know that there are other people on this island besides the girl. Hey, I hadn't thought of that. What I want to know is why one of them wanted to shoot at us. <laughs> well, maybe he and the gal are here all alone and wants to keep it that way. On the other hand, if he's been marooned on this island for six months, he'd welcome a rescue party with wide open arms. Even with a beautiful gal all to herself? Even with ten beautiful girls all to himself. I don't believe it. Well, come on. Let's get down to the rocks. Okay. Watch the way I wiggle my hips as I slither through the grass. Okay, hold it. Hey, Captain, you can hear the creek. Listen. Oh, don't that sound cool and refreshing. Yeah. Right over the edge. I'll drop down under the gravel. Then when I see everything is all clear, I'll give you the high sign. Okay. I'll have my gun all set to back you up if there's any trouble. Check. Here I go. There. Hey, Skip. Okay, Chief. All clear. Come on down. Yeah. Oh, man, oh, man, does that water look good. Yeah, how about us falling on our faces and having a drink, huh? Undoubtedly spring water. Go ahead. Yeah, man. Oh, man. I never tasted anything so good. Yeah. All right, isn't it? Yeah. Now then, what? Let's call it down this to where we saw the girl in bathing. Yeah, know. maybe we can pick up a trail again, even if she has disappeared. Come on, then. Hard walking on these rocks. Yeah, like walking on marbles and billiard balls. And we can't be very far from the babe's swimming hole. I've got it spotted right. It should be around the next turn of the ravine. Mm hmm. Water's getting a little deeper along here. Just hold it, Skip. What's the matter? Crouch down along the edge of the bank. Get down low. Hey, what's going on? Somebody's standing on the bank right above us. Oh, oh quiet. Listen. Oh, sorry. Is that you, Gracie? Gracie? Huh? Shh, quiet. It's all right, Gracie. I'm all alone. You don't need to be afraid of me, you know. You know that, Gracie. You know that I... Oh, <laughs> somebody's shouting. Quick, Skip. Let me put him out of the creek before he drowns. Yeah. Up with him. Easy. Yeah. Oh, wait. Oh. Wait, Skip. Hot gun. Never mind. Drop him back in the water. Hey. Drop him back. He's dead. Look at the back of his head. Oh. Oh, yeah. Listen. Somebody's coming along the bank. Kill him? 
Come on. Get back under the bank. Up low. Hold it. Hold it. I just man. Yeah. He's looking down at the body. <laughs> My fine young cousin. You have come to a very bad end. A very bad end. Just like I told you, you would. Hey, how about throwing a gun on that guy? Quiet, Skip. Oh, it is too hard to dig for you a girl this afternoon. But tonight you shall have one. See? The senorita must not see like this, no. But tonight you shall have a girl. But now, oh, I shall have my siesta. Mm. What is this, senor Captain? <laughs> Adios. Hasta la vista. Well, how do you like him, Apple? Oh, a very cheerful chair. <laughs> Doggone pirate. Pirate? Certainly a pirate. Didn't you see that bandana tied around his head when he peered over the bank? Uh, I suppose he was a member of that yacht's crew before it went aground. Why, oh, sure. 20th century pirate if I ever saw one. Well, what do you suppose he killed a sidekick for? I could give a good guess. Gracie? Oh, looks like it to me. Captain, he sneaked off to hold rendezvous with Gracie, and our pirate friend followed after him. When he made sure Cocker was trying to get the inside track on the girl's friend, he up and blew the back of his head off. Well, that's one way of getting rid of rival. So what does that make Gracie? I don't know. Shall we go and find out? Yeah, let's. Okay. Keep him close to the bank in case there are any more jealous Romeos in this place. Yeah. 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 Now we've got some sand to walk on. Yeah. And it's wet, so it won't make a sound. Uh huh. Uh-oh. This is the pool where Gracie was bathing. Hey, pretty, huh? Nice a pool. Keep it wide. You know, we should ought to pull Cotton out of the creek. Seems too bad to let him contaminate a pool like this. I didn't dare. Cockney's body disappears. The pirate's going to know something's wrong. Well, I just think Gracie buried it or somebody else. Besides, what hurt if it does get uneasy? Well, Skip, there are a couple of things that keep gnawing at my mind. Such as? Those two shots that were fired at us. Oh. Were they really meant for us? It was the pirate firing at Cockney. Not me. They were meant for Cockney, but it looks like nobody knows yet that we've landed on the island. Hey, how could they miss the airplane coming down? Well, the engines were dead. They just barely glided up to the beach. Unless somebody happened to be looking up, they'd never known we were even in the sky. Okay, so nobody knows we're on the island. What about it? In that case, nobody wants to kill us. Those shots were meant for Cockney. <laughs> well, I like it that way better. I never did hanker to have somebody itching to bump me... What you looking for? Look here, Skip. You find something? Oh. Bare foot prints of a girl's foot in the sand. Yeah, I'm pointing in that direction. Yeah. There's a sort of path away from the pool up through the palm trees. Yes, sir. Uh, as neat as though she'd put up a signboard. Well, lead on, Chief. No. Use these palm trees for shelter as much as possible. Mm. Just in case of the power, huh? Yeah. We're right up ahead. The jungle looks like a thick and up a bit. We're climbing up toward the brow of the second hump, if you notice. Yeah. Apparently, Gracie doesn't wear shoes anymore. Lots of tracks of a girl's bare feet. All the same girl? Seem to be. See, the jungle's beginning to close in around the path still, good. She must make a practice of bathing down at the pool. Yeah. Oh, boy, that shade feels good. I never did see such a sun as they have down in this part of the world. Well, that's a lot. Yeah. Don't go closed in over the top of us like a tin. Hey, hold it. Hmm? What happened? Listen. Listen. <laughs> well, I'll be a son of a gun. Hey, Captain, that's the craziest thing I ever heard. It's a parrot, Skip. A parrot? It looks like Gracie's got a parrot to keep her company over on this side of the island. Girl, help, please, please, go find him, Bobby. I'll say this for him. He's the loudest parrot I ever heard. Well, he's my parrot. Hey. You heard me. He's my parrot, so what about it? Oh, I don't see you. No, of course you don't see me. You see her, Captain? I oh. know. She's hidden somewhere off the path in the jungle. There's no use you looking for me. You'll never find me. Here, Gracie. Here, Gracie. 
Polly, shut up that noise. And uh, you must be Gracie. And if I am, so what? Come on out of hiding and let's talk. Oh, no, you don't. Don't what? What do you mean? I don't take no chances with men. Not on this desert island, I don't. But we've just arrived. I know that. I saw your airplane drop out of the sky. Well, then why weren't you down at the beach to meet us? Not me. I watch out for myself, I do. Besides, the way you were falling, I thought sure you'd be smashed to bits. Oh, no, not us. Well, it makes no matter. The same rule applies to you two gents, which applies to them that's on the other side of the island. And, um, what rules are those? This off of the island belongs to me. Oh? Yes. When you came to the ravine and waded across the creek, you came on my side of the island. Hey, you mean that hill over yonder belongs to the men, and this hill belongs just to you? That's just what I said, isn't it? I don't get it. I'm a good girl, I am, and I'm a fighter. And when that saving yard over yonder went on the rocks, I was the only girl left alive. I took things in my own hands. Yeah, and you sound like you were just the gal could do it, too. And so I am. How many were on the yacht before it was wrecked? The master and the missus and a crew of seven. What about you? I was the missus lady's mate. And a very good lady's mate I am, too. Mm. That makes ten on the yacht. How many landed safely on the beach? Four of them. You and Cockney and the pirate and one other, huh? The pirate? Sure, the Spanish baby with a turban. Oh, that would be Manuel. Hmm, Manuel the pirate. And who was the fourth? He was the captain of the yacht. He was killed two days after we landed. And I'll bet it was uh, Nicola was Manuel the pirate who done it, too. It was him and Cockney together. Why? It was over me. Hey, you must have some. Oh, you have me moments if I do say so myself. <laughs> well, come on, climb out of the bushes and let's have a look at it. Oh, no, you don't. Is that why you divided the island in two parts and why you keep to yourself over here? It is. When I see the way the men were killing each other with me to go to the winner, I just made up my own rules and got me a gun and a box of cartridges to back me up. Hey, you ain't poking a gun through the bushes at us right now, are you? Make a move in the wrong direction and see what happens. <laughs> you know something, Gracie? So you're getting mighty familiar with the use of a girl's name, if I may say so. Oh, no kidding, Gracie. You're what I'd call a woman with an iron willpower. You're Gracie! You're Gracie! What about that parrot we keep hearing? He's my pal, he is. My pal and my watchdog. Ain't now anybody able to come within a mile of us without Belshazzar letting me know. <laughs> Belshazzar, huh? Oh. So that's how you knew we were coming up the path, huh? That's it. Every time Manuel Cockney tries to come over here... Oh, uh, by the way, you're not going to have to worry about Cockney anymore. What are you talking about? Manuel just shot him. Oh, no. Yeah. We saw him do it. Then none of us is safe on this island. With nobody to stop Manuel, he'll have his old by the heel before morning. Marooned on a desert island with a cockney girl and Manuel the pirate, Captain Friday and Skip Turner face one of the most amazing adventures of their lives in the second episode of The Girl on Shipwreck Island, which is entitled The Pirate is a Fighting Man. Listen next week to another in this fascinating series of Adventures by Morse. Shipwreck Island, featuring Captain Friday. You like high adventure? Come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. Six months ago, when the ocean-going yacht Carlotta went ashore on a two-by-four South Sea island during a typhoon, only four persons got to the beach alive. They included the captain of the craft, two able seamen, Cockney and Manuel, and an English lady's maid named Gracie. My mistress had a neck broken when the master of the ship came down in the storm, and my master was washed overboard trying to save her body from the storm. It was a bloody mess, and how I came through it alive, I'll never know. 
But there I was, ashore on a desert island, along with three sailors. None of them I'd ever spoke a word to in my life before. That is, except the captain, to whom I'd said yes, sir, and no, sir. But the captain didn't last long. The second night ashore, Cockney and Manuel set on him and cut him to ribbons in a nice fight. That was enough for me. I took a gun and some cartridges and my poor pair of Belshazzar and set up housekeeping on the far end of the island in a bit of a cave. And for six months, Gracie protected herself against Cockney and Manuel living off the berries and fruit and small bird and animal life of the island. And then Captain Friday and Skip Turner, earlier this afternoon, came fluttering down out of the sky in a French army plane whose engines had conked out. Yeah, we were en route from French Indochina to Australia, flying over the Dutch East Indies and a lot of the China Sea. Well out over the South China Sea, something in the mechanical department went haywire and we had to make an emergency landing. Fortunately, we were in the vicinity of a minute atoll with a sandy beach. We landed without doing the ship any damage. Before beginning our repair job, we surveyed the tiny island, and that's when we discovered the setup here. Tell them about it, Skip. Yeah. Well, when we arrived, there was three people on the island besides ourselves. Cockney, Manuel the pirate, and the babe Gracie. It, oh, yeah, and uh, Belle Shazza the parrot. But uh, before we'd been here an hour, we saw Manuel the pirate stalk Cockney to the edge of the swimming hole and shoot him in the back. It was because Cockney was trying to get friendly with Gracie behind the pirate's back. So now there's only Manuel and Gracie on the island. That is, except for Captain Friday and me. And both Gracie and Manuel the pirate are very skittish specimens of the human species. With the exception of the moment when they saw Manuel kill Cockney... They have not laid eyes on the swarthy, pirate-looking figure with the turban about his head. They haven't seen Gracie at all. They've talked to her, but she's kept hidden back in the jungle. She's a girl all alone in this little isolated world, and she doesn't trust anything masculine. And now at 7 o'clock in the afternoon, Captain Friday and Skip are up to their ears in piston rings, spark plugs, and engine oil as they attempt to adjust their motors for the remainder of the trip to Australia. Boy, talk about rebuilding a motor the hard way. Yeah. That sun smacking me on the back of the neck like a baseball bat. Okay, I guess you can screw that head down again. Yeah. You think we found the trouble? Well, we found one of the troubles. <laughs> How a gas line on an airplane can get stopped up, I don't know. Uh, screw down hard? Yeah. Won't get any oil leak there. Well, I'd say we were all set to take off then. Okay. How about trying the motors? I'd like to, but I don't want to take the chance. Well, hey, we can't take off without tuning the motors. We'll have to tune them at the last minute. I don't get it. You heard what Gracie said. Oh, you mean about the pirate being a desperate character? Look, why did he and Cockney kill the captain? Fight over Gracie? Mm. Then why did he kill Cockney? Over Gracie. Okay. You think for one minute he's going to let you and me fly off with Gracie if he can help us? You, you mean we're taking Gracie with us? We're not leaving her here for that ape. Oh, I get it, and the pirate knows it. So the minute he thinks we got this airplane fixed to fly again, the real slaughter begins. Right. Not only does he want to keep Gracie, but he doesn't want us to get back to civilization and report him. Remember, he's a two-time killer, and he's stuck here until the authorities come and get him. Mm. So what are we going to do? Well, when it gets dark, we're going back in the jungles where we met Gracie before we're going to talk fast and get her to come down to the plane with us. Once we get her inside, we'll turn over the motors, adjust them if they need it, and get the heck out of here before Manuel the pirate knows what's going on. Uh, does Gracie know she's going on an airplane ride? Not yet. <laughs> well, she's awful skittish. I don't think she'll come. She's got to come. We have to hog tie her. Yeah, well, remember, she's got a gun, and she's been fighting off Cockney and the pirate for six months. We'll have to sneak up on her if she won't trust us. I don't intend to stay here forever, and I don't intend to leave her behind. <laughs> Kidnap her for her own good, huh? Well, she'll see reason when we explain what we're up to. Well, maybe. Uh, what time is it now? Well, after seven. <laughs> be as dark as the inside of your hat band in another three quarters of an hour. So what do we do until dark? Well, first climb up and close the cabin door and lock it. Yeah. <laughs> You've got everything you want out of the cabin? Yeah. Okay, here she goes, then. <laughs> and that's that. Hey, you think we can take off on this beach in the dark? How can I miss? Got a half-mile straight beach. Wind's been blowing in the right direction all afternoon. Uh, still, it's going to be awful dark. Well, maybe there'll be moon and stars. Well, that'll be your worry, Chief. 
I just shut my eyes and hope you don't run into the China Sea. <laughs> Come on. Hmm? Where are we going? Got to get back up on the plateau before dark. Find the path in the jungle where we talked with Gracie. And supposing a pirate's hiding along the path and lets us have both barrels. We've got to be too smart for it. <laughs> That's what Cockney said. Look at him. Fly bait. Okay, okay. You get killed, I'll see you get buried, won't I? You know, Chief, sometimes you're an awful comfort to me. And then sometimes you give me goose pimples up and down my spine. <laughs> suit anybody's taste now. Yeah, the sun skidded out of the sky like it had stepped on a banana peel. This seems to be the path. Come on. Hey, you think we'll ever be able to find our way back to the plane? Uh-huh. We know it's downhill in that direction. Yeah, and plenty of places to break your neck in between. Oh, quit worrying. Hey, you know something that's funny to me? What's that? Why we had that trouble with the pilot so far? He's probably laying low, watching to see what we intend to do. After all, we're two to his one. You know? Yeah, but he could have stood up here on the plateau and popped us off while we was working on a plane down on the beach this afternoon. Couldn't have been sure of hitting us at the distance. All he'd done was put us on the warpath. Oh, hey! Skip! Skip, where are you? Hey, down, Frank! I'm in the bottom of the well. Are you hurt? Well, I'm scared. And where till I turn a flashlight down on you? There. Hello. Hey, what kind of a dog going to set up is this, anyway? You've fallen into a trap. I'll well, say I have. A man trap. And I got a couple of skin shins that somebody's going to pay for, too. Apparently, this hole was covered up with grass and leaves and used to trap animals in. Maybe for food. And you mean animals are fool enough to fall down in a hole and break their silly neck? Well, you fell in, didn't you? Okay, okay. You're going to stand there talking, or you're going to reach down a hand and haul me out of here? Sure. I'll get down to my knees and reach down. Now then... Reach up as far as you can. Yeah. Just reach your hand. Yeah. Okay. Up you come. Uh, there, there. Now, who do you suppose set that trap? And why didn't you fall into it? You was ahead of me. Look, the trap's right on the edge of the path. I was walking right down the middle. Apparently, you got too close to the edge. Some of the pirates work. What do you bet? Uh, maybe. Well, come on. Next time, keep in the path. Yeah. Pardon me if I limp. Sure, go ahead. Limp. But keep close behind. We get ourselves in the doggone this mess. Hey, listen. Your hole, your hole, your hole. <laughs> Belshazzar. <laughs> doggone talking parrot. Gracie said the parrot always warned her when anyone came near. So we must be getting close. Here, Gracie. Here, Gracie. Here, Gracie. <laughs> Makes Gracie sound like a lost puppy dog. Hey, listen. Your hole, your hole, your hole. Fifteen men and that man dead. I never heard that version before. Get the fellow of Mike. Shut up. Huh? What's the matter? Somebody's in the jungle alongside the path. Just ahead of us. You sure? Either a person or an animal. Yeah. I'll just easy my gun around where it's handy. Don't do any shooting without knowing what you're shooting at. Yeah. Look at the fish. Look at the fish. Rock the soul bird. I don't hear anything up ahead. Something's there. Lying and waiting. Why don't you say something to it? I have the pirate open up at this range with his rifle. Oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Listen, kid. Yeah. Get down and lie flat. But keep your gun handy. Go try something? Yeah. Ooh. Okay, I'm down. I'm on my stomach right beside you. I'm going to try to open a conversation. If anyone fires now, it'll probably be over our head. Okay, shoot. Hello up there. I know you're up there, so there's no use pretending you're not. Then it's you, Captain Froggy. Huh. Oh. Oh, Gracie. I thought it was the pirate. Who? Manuel, the pirate. And I thought you were Manuel. You seen anything of him? Yes, he's on the prowl. I've had a bad time keeping out of his way all afternoon. You know where he is now? No. Now that night is set in, I've lost him. Is the other one with you, too? Are you talking about me? Keep your voice down, Skip. Oh, yeah. Uh, sure, Gracie, I'm here. I had a talk with Manuel once this afternoon. What kind of talk? He don't ask you people being on the island. I don't suppose he does. No. He says he went to the trouble of killing the captain of the yacht, and then this afternoon he killed Cockney. Hey, he come right out and admitted it? He did. He said just when he thought he had me all to himself, I propped you two. Yeah. And so now he has to kill you two. 
Well, why didn't he try it this afternoon while we were working on the plane? Because I didn't let him. Well, how did you stop him? I kept close to him. I kept making him think he just about had me cornered. I kept his mind away from you two. You must be a pretty tricky babe in the jungle to play hide-and-seek like that. I can take care of myself. Hey, look, Gracie. How would you like to get out of this? Meaning what? We got the plane so it'll run again. We can take off any time we like. So what? We want you to come with us. Oh, no, you don't. But look, Gracie. No, sir. Gracie, don't put herself in the hands of a couple of strangers like that. Not Gracie. But all we want to do is to get you off this island and away from Manuel. Fly her to Australia so you can get back home. How do I know that? You'll have to take us on faith. Ha! When I ever take a man on faith again, there'll be two moons in the sky. And I mean blue moons made of cheese. Hey, keep talking to her, Kathy. Skip, come back here. What did you say? I said you're acting like a little fool. We want to help you. Skip, you crazy fool. Come back. You want to get off this island, don't you? When the ship comes along and gets me, yes. Well, this is off the beaten lanes of ocean traffic, you know. It might be years. Oh, no! I got it, boss. Listen to me, you bitch. I got it. No, but she's all fighting like a tiger. Hey, you two guys, you want to get out of here? Yeah, let's go. 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 On the lonely little atoll in the China Sea, Manuel the pirate has killed two men so that he may have the girl Gracie all to himself. And then Captain Friday and Skip drop down on their disabled plane to complicate matters. Now the plane is mended, and Captain Friday wants to take Gracie off the island with them. But not if Manuel can prevent it. Also, not if Gracie can prevent it, because she doesn't trust any man. In the darkness on the jungle trail, Captain Friday kept Gracie's attention while Skip slipped into the jungle and grabbed the girl from behind. If she won't leave with them of her own free will, then they intend taking her by force. It's so if you don't give me a hand... Here I am. Gracie, stop it. Stop it, do you hear? You're the worst of the lot. We're not going to hurt you. Throwing a girl down in the dark and sitting on her. Hey, what are you doing? Tying your hands behind you. You can't do that. Hang on there, Skip. She's as strong as a box full of tigers. Uh, there. Shall I let her up? No. Keep sitting on her until I tie her feet. I've never been treated like this in all my born days. Well, it's what you get for being so skittish. If you trusted us and come out in the open, we wouldn't have had to do this. I suppose you wouldn't show a young lady no mercy. <laughs> okay. Uh, see, you're tied. Expect the worst, do you, Gracie? I know no reason to expect anything better. Hey, Chief, turn your flash on her. Let's see what we got, huh? Don't want too much light around here. Liable to attack the pirate. I hope he does come, too, and butchers the both of you. What, would you tie it up and help us where you are? Shame on you, Gracie. Now, what's the matter? Why don't you turn on a flash? I dropped it. Oh, here it is. Okay, click it on. There. Hey. Well, how do you do? If it isn't Miss Dorothy Lamour herself. Just because I'm reduced to wearing a sarong out here in the island, there's no reason for calling me Dorothy Lamour. Well, what's wrong with Dorothy Lamour, for guys? sake? Well, I ain't here is all I'm saying. You're a very good-looking young woman, Gracie. And supposing I am, it's only a danger and hindrance to me out here away from civilization. Don't put clothes on my back, no food in my mouth. You say you're reduced to wearing a sarong. Well, where are the clothes you were wearing when you came ashore? I was asleep in my nightgown. And the ship struck while I had my mom was to get on deck. Once up there, I was washed overboard. When I woke up, I was lying on the beach. And the birds were singing, and it was as nice a day as the body could hope for. So you made your nightgown into a sarong, huh? What else could a lady do? Well, you did yourself proud of the ask me. That also explains why you have no shoes or stockings. Well, that was the worst part of all, learning to walk barefoot. Well, you seem to be doing all right now. Oh, yes. Now my feet are either toughened up, I can up about the jungle with the best of them. Yeah. Hey, why'd you turn off the flashlight? You've seen enough. Besides, we're getting Gracie down the plane and getting out of here. You ain't fooling the poor girl. Is that why you sit on me like a pack of wolves and tie me up just to rescue me? Well, sure. You've got to learn to trust folks, Gracie. I come of age the hard way. All my life, a girl's had to watch out for herself. It was there against the world, and always it's been a man's world. Well, for once in your life, you've got somebody on your side. Well, maybe I have a deck. You do begin to act like a pair of gents. Well, we've stood here talking too much as it is. Skip, you want to scout the trail ahead while I carry Gracie? I do not. I want to carry Gracie while you scout the trail ahead. 
They've got some pretty rugged terrain to cross getting down to the beach. Well, with Dorothy Lamour in my arms, I'll just float down. But why shouldn't a deer walk on around two feet? Will you come willingly? <laughs> What's a deer got to lose? Now they don't begin to trust No, I, I don't go for that, Captain Friday. I think I ought to carry it, Grace. Cut it out, Skip. Now, look, Gracie, if I untie your feet, will you come along with us without any trouble? I will, and gladly. It's a deal. Untie your feet, Skip. <laughs> In moving pictures, the hero always gets a chance to carry the heroin. Skip. Uh, yeah, okay, okay, I'm untying, I ain't I? Well, hurry up and don't talk so much. Is his name Skip? Uh-huh. Skip Turner. And who are you, please? Bart Friday. Captain Bart Friday. Okay, Captain Bart Friday, then. Okay, Gracie, your feet are untied. But my hands. Your hands stay tied. But if we trust each other... When we get on the plane, we'll untie your hands. For the present, they stay tied behind you. Here, get up on your feet. Uh, oh, yeah. Hey, Captain, even with just the moonlight, she looks like something out of a South Sea moon picture. Hair down her back, just the right amount of sarong. All right, Romeo, let's go. You bring up the rear. Gracie, you walk between us. I'll keep an eye open ahead. Now that the moon has come up, be careful. Huh? Careful of what? You forgot man well is stalking this island. Hey, that's right. The pirate does want our scalps at that. All right. Here we go. Don't fall behind, Skip. <laughs> I'm right on Grace's heels. Honest to goodness, don't the sharp stones and briars and stuff hurt your bare feet? Oh, not at all. I don't know whether I'm ever going to be able to put shoes on again. Yeah, and I bet you're going to miss the old swimming hole down in the ravine, too. Oh, uh, you saw me down there? Yeah, I was our first peek at you. Of course, we were so far off, about all we could tell was that you was a white girl. Yes, I will, Mr. Swimming. As a matter of fact, I've got to like my island quite a bit. Except for Manuel, the pirate. Well, after all, it's just nice knowing there was a man on the island. I thought you'd been fighting him off for six months. And so I have. And I would have shot him down like a dog if he bothered me. But still and all, it was comforting, knowing that there was a man about. <laughs> you're a queer one, Gracie. Well, after all, when you're living in the wilderness, you just just about forget everything you learned in civilization. Nothing seems to apply, if you know what I mean. I think I do. Okay, now, we're coming out of the jungle. The path gets pretty rugged. You're going to have to keep low so as not to show up against the skyline. Skip, you're not going to have to help. You're going to have to help Gracie with her hands tied behind it. Skip, are you paying attention? Hey, Skip. That's queer. Did you know he wasn't right behind you? But I thought he was. Well, he's not. That's queer. It's not queer at all. He was bringing up the rear, and like as not, the pirate slipped up behind him and knocked him over the head. See, si. that is right, Capitan. What's that? It's my way. See, si. I did slip up behind the unwell Skip turn and tap him on the skull. <laughs> It was so simple. If you've killed Skip Turner... Oh, no, 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 no. That I have not done. Yet. What do you mean, yet? But just what it sounds like. This friend of yours is not dead because I need him as a hostage. Hostage? See, si. You have in your possession something which belongs to me. I, therefore, have in my possession something which belongs to you. I don't get it. Perhaps the senor do not wish to get it. What have I that belongs to you? <laughs> this so beautiful senorita. Hey. Hey, see, but of course. For six months I have been on this shipwreck island with Gracie. During this time I have killed two men because of her. If that does not give a man false rights to a woman, then please tell me, I'm what a, does? I'm a free girl and I belong to no man. <laughs> But naturally, that is what the senorita is supposed to say. I know you killed the ship's captain, and I know you killed Cockney, but if you think that entitled you to any special favor... Oh, senorita, how many men would you have me kill before I may win your favor? What's killing got to do with love? Yeah, it is always that way in nature. The strongest male kills the weaker males, and then he becomes the one whom the female loves. Well, nature can take that sort of business and go jump in the lake with it. You see, Manuel? See what, Capitan? Gracie doesn't agree that she belongs to you. Therefore, I don't have anything of yours. <laughs> so? Yes, so. You'd better turn over Skip to me and be glad we don't nail your skin to a tree before we leave this island. Oh, so you expect to leave this island? Any minute now. <laughs> well, I will tell you this, senor. Unless you turn over to me the senorita whom you have in your possession... Your friend Skip Turner will never leave here alive. And, uh, 
I think that goes for you also, Captain Friday. Look, Manuel. I'll make a deal with you. Uh, mm-hmm. Deal? Yeah. Why didn't I think of it before? You want to get off this lonely, out-of-the-way island, don't you? Oh, see, si. Naturally, I hope not to spend all my life here. Okay. Come on and join us. No, no. Uh, how do you mean, join with you? We were going to take Gracie out. We've got room for you, too. You you are speaking of the airship on the beach? That's it. We had engine trouble, but we've got that fixed up. So bring along Skip, and we'll all four be away from here in a half hour. <laughs> Senor, but that is the most handsome offer I have had the pleasure of receiving in my whole life. Can you accept? No. But Manuel... No. Doesn't make sense. Why not? Why not? I am two-time killer. Confess with my own lips. Besides, this Gracie saw me kill the captain. And Gracie told me that you and this key person, who is my prisoner, saw me kill Cockney. Well, what of it? Well, the minute you arrive in Australia, you tell the, the stories to the authorities. Uh, and what become of poor Manuel? Oh, nonsense. Why should he Hang by the neck until he is dead. That is what happened to poor Manuel. <sighs> Gracie, talk to him. Tell him you'll keep your mouth shut. But I will not. I yeah, see. The senorita is the truthful one. You mean you wouldn't give Manuel a break even to save your own honor? Perhaps your own life? If you take Manuel back to Australia with us, I'll point him out as a murderer to the very first policeman. You haven't got any more sense. So you see, Captain Friday, the, the best thing for you to do is to give the senorita to me. When you have done this, I will return Skip Turner to you. How does that appeal to you, Gracie? You wouldn't do that to a poor girl. Turn her over to a dirty, killing sea pirate. That's just what I ought to do. Now you are talking sense. Give Gracie and you two fly away about your own business. And what about after they fly away, Manuel? And uh, what about it, Senorita? That's something else you haven't thought about. Once they're away, what's to prevent them from reporting to the barbers that you're a killer and you're on this island? See, si. see, si, that could happen. Now they can come back and get you at their leisure, because how can you possibly get off? Ah, uh, see, si. They must not be allowed to leave. Say, what is this anyway? Who side are you on, Gracie? They must not be allowed to leave. Uh, they must be killed. See? And the airplane burns. Gracie! Ah, 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 one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. <laughs> here, Gracie. Here, Gracie. There's somebody prowling up near my cave. What's that? Impossible, Gracie. Yes, there is. That's the signal the parrot always gives when somebody comes near. It's my warning. But we three and Skip are the only ones on the island. Have you really got Skip there with you, Manuel? See, si, I have him tied to a tree. Besides, he's unconscious. Then there's somebody else on this island. Manuel, maybe you didn't kill Cockney after all. <laughs> Can a man walk about with the back of his head blown away? Perhaps it is ghost walking. Senorita, do not say such a thing. Ah, ah, one, two, three, hold. Ah, ah, one, two, three, hold. It's somebody. Somebody prowling around the mouth of my cave in the jungle. <laughs> to be only four living persons and a parrot on Shipwreck Island. Then who is the fifth shadow prowling near Gracie's cave? The third episode of The Girl on Shipwreck Island is entitled, There is More About Gracie Than Meets the Eye, and will come to you next week at the same hour. You are listening to another in the series of Adventures by Morse. by Morse. Cosmi Morse presents The Girl on Shipwreck Island featuring Captain Friday. If you like high adventure, come with me. If you like the stealth of intrigue, come with me. If you like blood and thunder, come with me. Captain Bart Friday and Skip Turner, flying from French Indochina to Australia, 
made a forced landing on a tiny island in the South China Sea when their engines conked out. They arrived on this tiny atoll just in time to witness murder. They saw a cockney sailor creeping through the undergrowth and softly called out the name of a girl, Gracie. Then they heard a rifle shot and saw a cockney fall, an ugly bullet hole in the back of his head. Then they saw a swaggering Spanish pirate, his head tied up in a bandana, come out of hiding and bend over his victim, quite pleased with himself. All this on an island which was supposedly uninhabited. And what of this girl Gracie, Captain Friday? Well, Gracie was one of four persons washed ashore in a hurricane when a private yacht wrecked itself on the outer reef of the island. She's an English cockney girl and was lady's maid aboard the yacht. Washed up on the beach with her was the captain and two sailors, Spanish Manuel, alias the pirate, and Cockney. The captain was murdered two days after the landing, and we saw Cockney finished off this afternoon. And now Manuel had Gracie all to himself, or so he thought. But that was before our engines went bad and we came down on the beach. It didn't take us no time to tune up the engines again once we set out on the sand. Yes, yeah, Skip, go ahead. Tell him. Well, matter of fact, if it wasn't that we insisted on getting Gracie out of the pirate's clutches and taking her along with us, we'd have been off Shipwreck Island and on our way to Australia by this time. But Gracie's afraid of men. All men. So she wouldn't trust us? <laughs> yeah. So we had to wait till it was dark and catch her unawares and tie her up. <laughs> Man, did she ever put up a fight. Yes, Gracie put up a fight. And then things got complicated all of a sudden. Captain Friday and Skip were taking Gracie from the plateau down to the plain where it rested on the sand. Captain Friday in front, Skip bringing up the rear. Then suddenly, Skip wasn't there anymore. Instead of Skip, there was Manuel, the pirate, lurking just out of range in the darkness. And he had Skip prisoner. He offered to make a deal. You will turn over to me the girl Gracie, and I will turn over to you your friend Skip Turner. No. But this is fair thing to ask. <laughs> You better do it, because if you do not, I will cut your friend Skip Turner's throat from ear to ear. And that will not be happy time for your friend Skip Turner. And it was while Captain Friday stood in the midst of this quandary, trying to make up his mind whether to sacrifice the girl Gracie or his sidekick Skip, or whether maybe there wasn't another way out, that Belshazzar, the parrot, began to squawk in the distance. Uh, uh, advance to be recognized. Uh, one, two, three, hop. Uh, uh, here, Gracie. Here, Gracie. You hear that? Gracie. You hear that? There's uh, uh, warning me. What do you mean, warning you? Someone's prowling in the dark about my cave up there in the jungle. Here, Gracie. Here, Gracie. Here, Gracie. You hear that? Uh, 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 Somebody's up there. Manuel. See, I am here. You still got Skip Turner? Oh, see, he is tied to three. I bang him on the head and he is unconscious. Uh, what is the matter with the parrot? Gracie says somebody's prowling in the dark near her cave. Oh, but that cannot be. We are all here. I don't care if we are all here. But Bill Shaw's a close to me like that. It means somebody's prowling. Yo-ho! 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 Fifteen men of a dead man's chest. Here, Gracie! Here, Gracie! You hear that? He's gone back into the cave to hide. He always hides when strangers come near. Doesn't make sense, Gracie. You and I and Skip and Manuel are the only living people on the island. I don't care nothing about that. I know what I know. And when Belshazzar warns me, it means something. It's crazy. Unless Manuel is lying to me about having Skip a prisoner. Hey, Manuel. Are you lying to me? But why should I lie to you? What I want to know is, if you have Skip Turner tied up, then who's up prowling around Gracie's cave? Mm, that is what I wonder also, senor. Well, there's somebody up there. If there is anyone prowling this night, then it must be the ghost of the captain or the sailor, Cockney. Your conscience bothering you? <laughs> Senor, that is something I pride myself on. I have no conscience. And there's something I pride myself on. I don't believe in ghosts. Senor, you do not know what you are saying. Well, ghosts or no ghosts, I'm in favor of getting off this island as fast as possible. And I'm making you a proposition, Manuel. See, si, I am listening. There's room in the plane for four of us. You throw in with Skip and Gracie and me. We'll take you off the island and get you out of this place. <laughs> oh, no, senor. And turn me over to the police for murder. I guarantee we won't. You release Skip and come along, and we'll make a special landing any place you say. On some other island or on the mainland, just as you choose. You, you guarantee this thing, Captain Friday? Word of honor. We'll give you every break. Mm -hmm. That is good enough for Manuel, senor. You better be careful. What do you mean? If you trust Manuel one inch, you're a bigger fool than I thought you were. Senor, 
I am waiting. I have got Skip Turner loose from the tree where I have tied him. If he tried the double cross, that's his hard luck. Come on. Ah, here you come. I thought perhaps you had thought better of your bargain. I don't make a deal I'm not prepared to keep. Oh, the senorita. Turn that flashlight out of my face. And I warn you, Manuel, one move out of you and I'll shoot you without blinking a blooming eyelash. Captain Friday let you carry a gun? I thought you was his prisoner. I am not his prisoner. As you can very well see, my hands are released and he has returned my gun. Ah, I see. I but, can't see that. But turn that blinking torch out of my face. Turn the flashlight over this way, Manuel, so I can get a better look at Skip. See? But I did not hit him too hard. He should not be unconscious all this time. Well, he still is. You're going to have to help me carry him down to the beach. Captain Friday, I don't trust Manuel. Oh, oh. What was that? Did you hit Gracie in the dark? Do not move, Captain Friday. Do not move a muscle because you are outlined in the moonlight. And I will kill you if you do. Me, you cannot see. <laughs> I am in the shadow. Then you did strike down Gracie. See, si. You should not have given back her gun. A senorita is a dangerous animal with a gun. What's the idea? What's this all about? <laughs> Senor... You did not think for one minute I would trust myself in your hands. If you don't know the truth when you hear it... No, no, I trust no man. There is no such thing as truth. Well, the worse for you, then. No, senor. The worse for you and for your friends, Skip Turner. Maybe. See, si. For now I have you where I want you. It is so simple to do what is necessary. We offer you rescue and freedom. In return, you offer us death. <laughs> See, si. It is so. Why? You take such pleasure in killing your fellow men? No, no, it is not that. Well, for the love of Pete, what is it? With you and Skip Turner gone, then Gracie and I will have this island all to ourselves. Yeah? See. Si. What about that somebody or something that's prowling up around Gracie's cave? Mm, that I do not believe. But you said yourself... See, si. when I am making big deal with you, I say one thing. When you are in my power... <laughs> I say something else. That's great. No, no. I do not think there is anyone on this island except the four of us. And in ten minutes, there will be only the two of us. <laughs> the senorita and I. Okay, Manuel. But Gracie swears the parrot always acts the way it did when there's prowlers. Oh, senor, a parrot can make a mistake. Human beings make the mistake. Why should not a parrot be allowed a mistake also? I think you're crazy. Uh, what difference does it make? Crazy or not crazy, you will be just as dead. Okay. Shoot and get it over with. Uh, senor, you prefer to be shot in the front or in the back? What difference does it make? Um, I, I do not know. Some people have... Oh, shoot it and get it over with. Si, senor. I do not wish to keep the senor in suspense. But don't worry... It will be over quickly. Right in the heart, senor. It will be over quickly. One. Two. Manuel. Manuel. Where's that flashlight? Here it is, Captain. Skip. You're conscious? Well, I think so. Here's the flashlight you was looking for. Huh. Dead as a mackerel. <sighs> that was a good shot from where you were lying, Skip. Hey, I didn't kill him. You didn't. Heck, fine, no. I thought you pulled a fast one. He was right on me. I couldn't move a muscle. Hey, where's Gracie? Hey, maybe she'd come to and crawl around. No. Oh, no, here she is. Still knocked out. Well, you didn't kill him. Gracie didn't kill him, and I didn't kill him. And who the heck did? Looks like Gracie was right. Huh? About what? There's somebody else on the island. Hey, she knew it all the time? Well, you were knocked out. The parrot bell shazzer began acting up. Gracie said he always did it when somebody was prowling around her cave. Yeah, but I thought there was only you and Gracie and the pirate and me. Well, it looks like reinforcements have landed. Reinforcements for who? Looks like our side. Hey, it does at that. Mowing down Van Well here just as he was about to make cat meat out of you. What do you think we ought to do now? Well, we can either pick up Gracie and hit for the beach, get the plane in the air, or we can go back up to Gracie's cave and try to thank our rescuer. Yeah, it'd be kind of a dirty trick to just run off and leave a guy behind who saved your life. You feel that way, do you? Why, sure. How about you? The same. Well, then, we're heading back up through the jungle to Gracie's cave, huh? We are. You want to carry Gracie? Or... Of course I want to carry Gracie. 
I ain't had a gal's head resting on my shoulder. And you ain't going to begin now. Hey, Gracie, are you all right? Oh, I've got a headache big enough for everybody. Well, then, naturally, I'll carry you. You'll do no such thing. I've got my two feet. As long as I have, I'll walk on them. Yeah, let me help you up. Ooh, 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 ooh what hit me? Manuel the pirate did. Oh, that double-crossing old... Here, pick her up, Skip. She's not able to walk. You bet you. Up you come. Here now. Now, just take it easy, Gracie. You don't feel like wrestling. Oh, I doubt it, Dad. Come on. Oh, I'm dizzy as a bumblebee. I told you not to trust Manuel. What did you escape? Escape my eye. He's dead. Dead? Manuel's dead? Just as a stinking fish. Yeah, where are you taking me? Back to your cave in the jungles. But I thought you were taking me on the airplane. That'll come later, when we discover who killed Manuel. Who killed... But didn't you do it? Nope. It skipped, didn't it? Not me. Hey, your hair smells good. Never mind my hair. What I want to know is who killed Manuel. Well, however it was prowling around your cave earlier. Now, Charles, the parrot warned me. Didn't I tell you? Yeah, but who is he? I don't know. Well, whoever he is, is a good shot. Got Manuel right through the heart. But why are you going back to my cave? To say thank you to the mystery man. And get a bullet through your own heart? Yeah? That's what you two are heading for. A bullet through your heart. This tiny, isolated atoll in the midst of the South China Sea should be called Dead Men's Island instead of Shipwreck Island. The captain of the yacht is dead, Cockney is dead, and now Manuel the pirate is dead. And somewhere abroad on this two-by-four coral strand is a phantom figure, moving in stealth and in darkness. Who is it? That's why Captain Friday and Skip insist on returning to Gracie's cave. They want to know, and they're returning against Gracie's vehement protests. You're doing yourself an arm coming back like this. You're doing yourself an arm and you'll get no thanks for it. Oh, don't you get it, Gracie? Somebody done us a good deed. Shot the pirate and saved our lives. Well, you can't just up and fly away from a deserted island and leave a friend behind. He ain't no friend of yours. What did you say, Gracie? I said he ain't no friend of yours and you'll save yourself a heap of trouble if you go away from this island. Now, just a minute. Now, let's get to the bottom of this. Bottom of what? Who isn't a friend of ours? Whoever shot Manuel. He'll do the same by you. You say that as though you know what you're talking about. Of course I know what I'm talking about. Of course I know. And this phantom person isn't a phantom at all. I mean, as far as you're concerned. I never said that. You the same, Miss Sutter. I never did. I show you Hold it, Skip. You. Now, look, Gracie. There is somebody on this island you know about, isn't there? There's been somebody on the island all the time. Somebody from the wrecked yacht. That's a lie. Is it? You heard me say so. But I don't believe you. I was washed ashore in the storm. The captain was washed ashore, and so was Cockney and Manuel. And that's all? And that's all. Well, except for Bill Shaza, my friend the parrot. Okay, come on. Yeah. Now, just a minute. Take her arm, Skip. Yeah, come on, Grace. Don't take hold of me. Don't drop me up. Hey, what you scared about? If you know what's good for you, don't lay your hand on me. I don't get this. Do you, Cap? No, but I'm beginning to get ideas. Look, I'm telling you for your own good. You treated me like a pair of gents, and I don't want to see you get hurt. What's that mean? The cave where I've been living for the last six months is just up ahead. I can't keep you from going there, but if you do, you won't leave this island alive. Hey, now you got my appetite all wetted up. Don't be a fool. Go away while you can. Go down to the beach and get in your plane before it's too late. Will you come with us? I can't. I can't. Don't you understand? Even if I wanted to, I wouldn't be allowed. What's to prevent you? How can you stand there arguing with a girl when your very lives are in danger? Hey, look, Gracie, you don't think we'd go off and leave a pretty gal in trouble? I'm in no trouble. I agree with you. No use arguing. Come on. Oh, you fools. You're a pair of fools. That's the mouth of the cave right up ahead, isn't it? Yes, that's it. You don't need to be so unhappy, Gracie. Captain Friday and I can take care of ourselves. Hey! Run for it. The mouth of the cave. Oh. Inside. That's it. Made it. Made it all right. Hey, that rifle bullet went by my ear like a bumblebee in a fruit jar. Well, now, maybe you believe me. About what? That you're dead men. Hey, I don't feel dead. There you are. Dead men. Both of you. Gracie. Well? Where's Belshazzar? The parrot? Yes, the parrot. 
Where is he? Well, how should I know? About somewhere, I suppose. You said he always squawked when strangers came near the cave. We're strangers. Why didn't he squawk? He's a temperamental parrot. And you also said he hid himself at the back of the cave here when strangers got too near. And so he does. Well, let's get him. I'd like to look at him. Well, maybe he ain't there. Maybe he's out the jungle. Why would he be out there? Well, Beth Charles has been making eyes at a cockatoo out in the jungle lately. He's probably out there sitting with her in the moonlight. In other words, Gracie, there is no parrot. Hey, Chief. You heard him with your own ears, didn't you? I heard something you say was a parrot. Sounded like a parrot to me, Cap. Maybe. Maybe it sounded like a human being trying to sound like a parrot. That's a lie. Okay. Get Belshazzar the parrot and prove it to me. If Manuel or Cockney or the captain was alive, they'd tell you there was two a parrot. Belshazzar belonged to the galley cook on the yacht. Everybody on the yacht knew about Belshazzar. He was the life of the party he was before the shipwreck. How did you happen to get him after the wreck? I found him washed ashore. His feather was wet and he was shivering like a leaf. I picked him up in my arms and dried him and brought him to my cave here. He was that grateful he wouldn't leave me afterwards. Why don't we go to the back of the cave and have a look? He might be there. Why so old fired interested in a parrot? Do you mind coming back with me? It's the only thing that'll make you happy. Skip, you stay here, watch the entrance. While you and Gracie look for Bell Shares, huh? Yeah, keep an eye open. I don't want anyone sneaking in behind us while we're back there. Sure. Shall we go, Gracie? I've given you all the warning I'm going to. From now on, you'll just have to do the best that you can. <laughs> just listen at her. As though me and Captain Friday could... Hey. Hey, out there, outside the cave. No use giving me that silent treatment. I've seen your shadow when you moved behind that tree yonder. Then you have seen the shadow of your own doom which is close upon you. Hey, a doggone oriental. Oriental is a general term which covers many races and creeds and facial and mental characteristics. You sound like a dad brain professor. I am a student by avocation. My profession is a culinary art practice aboard seagoing vessels. In other words, you're a sea cook by trade. If you wish. Hey, then you must be the cook aboard the yacht that Gracie was telling us about. The girl... Tell you about me? Yeah, that she was the owner of the parrot, Belshazzar, on the yacht. Oh, what else did she say? Well, that's all. Hey, look at what you hiding out on us for. We owe you a lot for shooting the parrot at a kind of a critical time in our lives. Come on out and shake hands with a man that wants to thank you. Do not be a fool. Huh? What's that mean? I did not kill Manuel to save you. I killed him because... He struck the girl. Oh, oh, yeah, I see what you mean. Oh, so that's what Gracie meant when she warned us not to grab a hold of her or rough her up. You was watching us, huh? I was watching. Well, what the heck you want to kill us for? If you've been watching, you know doggone well we don't mean Gracie no harm. You are trying to take her from this island. Well, sure, but we'll take you, too. We'll be glad to take you. No. What you mean, no? You don't want to stay here forever, do you? With the girl? Yes. Hey, look, do you mean you'd be willing to spend the rest of your life out here, isolated from the rest of the world, if we'll just go away and leave you and Gracie alone? It would be a pleasure. It would be something beyond words to express. <laughs> I'm afraid I'd get kind of tired of even Salome and the Queen of Sheba rolled into one after six months or a year. That is the Western mind. The poetic mind of the East knows how to make happiness last forever. And so you're going to kill Captain Friday and me so you and Gracie can have everlasting happiness, huh? It is so written. Well, somebody wrote wrong, brother, and he better dig himself up an eraser and rub it out. That is foolish, childish talk. And besides, what about Gracie? What does she say about all this? Woman is musical instrument ready to respond to those who know how to play upon her. A woman is happy anywhere if placed in the hands of one who is a master of such matters. Just that the violin plays as sweetly in the drawing room or in the darkness of a cold cellar, if it is in a master's hands. Well, that's quite a speech, Professor. But I'd still like to know what Gracie would say with her own lips. Where is she? She and Captain Friday are at the back of the cave looking for the parrot. Parrot? <laughs> there is no parrot. Huh? But Gracie said you had one on the ship. On the yacht, yes. But Bergerard was drowned. It was I who imitated the parrot. But what for? To protect Gracie from the Cockney and Manuel. I watched him in the jungle, and whenever they decided to try to catch Gracie, I would cry out like the parrot used to do on the yacht. Thus, she was able to hide in the jungle. 
Well, just the same, Captain Friday and Grace here in the back of the cave are looking for the parrot, Bill Shazza, and I wish they'd get back here. It's just as I told you, Bill Shaz is out in the moonlight with the cockatoo. Gracie, did anyone ever tell you you couldn't lie worth a plugged nickel? Is that any way to talk to a girl? Look here in the back of the cave. Where did these sea chests come from? Sea chests? Yes, you know what a sea chest is, don't you? Look, three, four, five of them. They came off the wrecked yacht. They were washed up on the beach at night. Hmm. And I suppose you put them on your back and lugged them up here to the cave. And supposing I did... I'm a strong girl. Baloney. What's in them? Food supplies. A hundred, hundred and fifty pounds apiece. I know that. And you know as well as I do that the phantom who killed Manuel carried these up here. You and whoever he is have been working some kind of deal together. That's and... not true. Not a blink of word of it is true. Ah! Oh, what was that? Gun battle. Skip's in trouble. Come on. I heard someone scream. I'll say you did. Skip! Skip, are you all right? Hi, Jeff. Let's see what I got. You hear that? Oh, what has he done? What has he done? Yeah, I am. Hey, did you hear that gun battle? Boy, it was hot and heavy for a minute. What have you done? What have you done? Come on out here and I'll show you. Here's your bell, Shaz of the parrot. Oh. Dead on a mackerel. Chad. Chad, what have they done? What happened, Skip? Who is he? This guy was a cook on the yard. He's the one who's been imitating the parrot. Oh. He told you that? Sure, told me all about it. And then he sneaked in and tried to kill me. Almost did, too, but I got a couple of shots in where they did a job. Come on, Gracie, get up on your feet. It's cruel. Cruel, that's what it is. Up you come. Were you in love with him? No. But he was the best friend a girl ever had. I found him washed up on the beach after the storm. I took care of him. He was in love with you. I don't believe it. He was just grateful for the way I saved him. Uh Uh-uh, he was in love. He wanted to keep just you and him on this island forever. He was devoted. He protected me from the other men. He never tried to take advantage of me because I was a girl. Sounds like a decent gent. And all because I nursed him back when he nearly drowned on the beach. Well, he was out to get Captain Friday and me. He said so. I told you that. That's why I wanted you to go away without me. Hey, you wanted to stay here forever with him? No, but I didn't want him killed either. And I didn't want either of you killed. Well, anyway, we can give him a decent burial. Yeah. Dig a grave and then let's get off this crazy place. You got your belt fastened, Gracie? It's fastened. Shut the door and lock it, Skip. Door secure. Turn him over, Captain. Okay, here goes. Chief. Purring like a tiger cat. Well then, let's go. Hang on, Gracie. I am with every bit of me. All aboard for Australia, Honolulu, and San Francisco. Give her the gun, Open your eyes now. <laughs> she held her breath and gritted her teeth and kept her eyes shut all during the takeoff. Well, a girl never knows what might happen to her up in an airplane. Hey, y'all, look at down there. There goes Shipwreck Island. Oh, it wasn't such a bad place. Not bad at all. It's just that men can't keep from killing each other when a girl's around. <laughs> what happened to the girl on Shipwreck Island. From Australia, Captain Friday and Skip returned to San Francisco, and when you next hear from them, they will undoubtedly be up to their necks in high adventure, intrigue, and more blood and thunder. You have been listening to Adventures by Morse.
This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com. Frank Sinatra, transcribed as Rocky Fortune. Friends ask me, Rocky, why can't you hold a job? That's a good question. And I don't know the answer. Maybe I just get restless or something. Anyway, whatever it is, me and steady employment don't get along. Now, you take the last job I had, steward on a big luxury liner from Bermuda to New York. I figured I'd like to see the ocean, you know? And a couple of guys were trying to help me, too. Only they wanted me to see it the hard way, from the bottom. Pardon me, Miss Nightingale. This is sick bay, isn't it? Yes. Something wrong? My heart is going pitter pat. I beg your pardon. Nothing, blue eyes. I'm the steward from A deck. I came for the pills. Pills? The German mean for Lady Droopsnoot. You know, the Duchess in A7. Oh, you mean Lady Harkness. Yeah. Anything you say. Oh, you'll have to wait a moment for Dr. Harper. He'll be back. Mm, that's too bad. Is something wrong, Mr. Uh... Fortune. Rocky Fortune. No, why? Oh, uh... You keep staring and winking. Oh, I, uh, I've got something in my eye. I'm just trying to wink it out. Well, you better let me take a look. Yeah. Oh, just sit down there in the light. How's this? Now, uh, lean closer. Hmm, like this? A little closer. Does this make it? That's too close. Now, which eye is bothering you? Right now, both. Try the left one. Open wide. Ah! Your eyes, I mean. Oh. Ah. Don't be fresh. Don't be so beautiful. Well, I don't see a thing. I do. Please, Mr. Fortune, you're not cooperating. I don't even know your name. My name is Helen Travers, R.N. For real nice? For registered nurse. Yeah. Now, about the eye, do you mind if I wash it out? Honey, you can do anything you want. Would you like to take out my tonsils or saw me in half? Anything, just name it. <laughs> You're impossible. Hold still. There. Ow! That's for being so fresh. Something wrong, Miss Travis? Oh, hello, Doctor. Uh, the steward would like some Dramamine. Oh, seasick? You don't look well. Hmm. I haven't looked well since I was nine. It's for a passenger in A7. A7? That's Lady Harkness, isn't it? That's right. I'm afraid I can't give you any more. Well, well, what's wrong, Doc? The chief steward was up less than an hour ago to get some Dramamine for Lady Harkness. Stuff isn't candy, you know. The chief? He just sent me up. There must be some confusion here. I think you'd better check. All right, Doc. Sorry. Not at all. It was a pleasure. I hope your eye improves. Yeah, the wash seemed to help it a little bit. Say, maybe I could come back later on for another eyeful, hmm? I'm afraid my boyfriend wouldn't approve. Anybody I know? Yes. Yes, the chief steward. Goodbye, Mr. Fortune. <laughs> I walk out on deck, still thinking about Helen Travis R.N., which stands for Registered Knockout, and leg it down to A deck. I get my hand on the doorknob of A7 when I hear something which ain't exactly music. <laughs> Lady Harkness! Lady Harkness! Open up! Open up! When nothing happens, I put my shoulder against the door and heave. When nothing happens, I try the knob. And it opens. I practically fall into the cabin, which is dark in the inside of a coal miner's boot. The reason I fall is quite simple. Lady Harkness is stretched out on the broad loom like a dead lizard. I take one look and reach for the phone. Give me the ship's doctor, honey. Hurry. Hello, Doc. This is Rocky Fortune. I'm in cabin A7, and the place looks like Act 2 of Arsenic and Old Lace. You better get down here before... Oop. has been hiding behind the door when I come in. I never know what hits me. The top of my head exploded and the floor kept coming up to meet me. Only it took a long time to fall and I must have had some crazy dreams on the way down. Rocky, 
Huh? What? Up here, on this cloud. Why, well, Helen, how'd you get away up there? I flew. Come on up. F- how? Fly. Are you kidding? Try it. You can fly. Spread your wings. Holy mackerel, I got wings. Flap harder. I can't make it. Maybe I've been grounded. Try again. That's it. Flap harder. I'm off the ground. Hey, hey, I'm falling. Helen. Helen, I'm falling. Helen. I'm falling. Helen. Take it easy, Rocky. My wing, I can't fly. Who can? Come on, snap out of it. I... Hey, where am I? In sick bay. What happened? My arm... Your arm is in a cast. How come? You must have fallen and sprained it. Dr. Harper told me to put a temporary cast on it, just in case it's badly hurt. Gee, it feels like lead. What hit me? I don't know. We found you stretched out on the floor of Lady Harkness' cabin. Well, how's the patient? I'll say, you look awful. We've been through that already. Oh. Uh, how do you feel? Uh, Arm hurt? Not bad. Yeah, let's have a look, huh? Well, it's a nice job, Miss Travis. Thank you, Doctor. Oh, Fortune, if you can make it, the captain would like to see you. What's on his mind? Well, I don't know for sure, Mr. Fortune, but I guess it's the $50,000 worth of jewelry that was stolen from Lady Harkness. I staggered down to the old man's cabin feeling like somebody left me in one of those fancy washing machines with the dial set on rinse dry. When I get there, the reception committee included Lady Harkness, who is about 60, wears a tweed suit, and talks like an English Tallulah. The chief steward, who looks like a clothing dummy, and the old man. 350 pounds of human meanness. Close the door, steward. Aye. I believe you know Lady Harkness. Aye, aye. And the chief steward. We've had the pleasure. Sit down. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Is this the man you saw, Lady Harkness? Young man, would you mind bending over? Me? You. Hop to it. Okay, but what for? Well, you see, it was dark and I'd been asleep. When I opened my eyes, I only saw this strange man leaning over me. I screamed and he put a pillow or something over my face before I could get a good look at him. Is this the man? Well, it might be, Captain. All right, Fortune. Straighten up. Do you mind if I sit down, Captain? I've had a hard tap on the skull. You will remain standing in the presence of a ship's officer. Thanks. No insolence. Excuse it. Now, would you mind telling me what this is all about? Fortune, there is $50,000 worth of jewelry missing from this cabin. I don't suppose you'd like to confess. Confess? Sure. I've been waiting all night to confess. You see, it was like this. Get this, Mr. Waters. Yes, sir. I crept in through the porthole, see? And Lady Harkness here was asleep. I scragged the ice. I beg your pardon. Heisted the jewels. She started to wake up, so I smothered her with kisses. (laughs) Then she screamed. I saw I couldn't escape, so I called the doc on the phone. Then I carefully swallowed the jewels, hit myself on the head with a piece of stale salami, broke my own arm, and passed out. And I'd be very happy to sign a statement. That's screamingly funny, old boy. How'd you like a punch in the jaw? Just try it, Hercules. That's enough from both of you. Mr. Waters. Sir. I want Mr. Fortune's belongings searched. If you don't turn up those jewels, you have my permission to comb the entire ship from stem to stern. Yes, sir. Mr. Fortune, you may consider yourself discharged. You are confined to cruise quarters. Just a minute, Captain Bly. Well? Don't you think this amateur gumshoe work ought to be left to the law? Mr. Fortune, in case you are not familiar with the maritime code, on this vessel, I am the law. I execute a very unflattering salute with my good wing and stagger back to my bunk where I fall into the sack like a dead man. Only trouble is I can't sleep. My head aches, my arm aches, and my heart aches. About 1 a.m. after three hours of whirling like a drunken dervish, I climb out of the hammock and head for sick bay, figuring I can pick up some sleeping pills. I get to the sick bay door just in time to hear voices inside. Don't try to give me that. I tell you it's true. Can I tell you you're a liar? Mary, please. Nobody's going to double-cross me, Helen, particularly not my own girl. Mary, you've got to believe me. I'll give you one more chance to tell me the truth. But I told you. All right, baby. You want to play rough? Mary. No? Okay. Mary. Good evening. 
Am I interrupting something? Fortune, get out of here. You know, Emily Post says it ain't polite to hit a young lady unless she belts you first. Get out. You all right, Miss Travers? Yes. Please, Rocky, do as he says. Sure. Anything you say. Only before I go, Chief. Yes. Here. Rocky. Yeah, I suppose they'll hang me for mutiny now. Oh, well, it was worth it. back to my pad and spend a few more restless hours trying to figure out what goes between Larry the steward and Helen Travis. In the morning, I wake up and head back to sick bay for a checkup on the arm. Ah, oh, how's it feel? Hurts. I think I'd better x-ray in case it's a green twig fracture instead of a sprain. Does that mean you take the cast off? No, no. We can x-ray right through the cast. I'd hate to spoil Miss Travis' beautiful work. Her beautiful work weighs about a ton. How long do I wear it, Doc? Uh, I'll let you know after the x-rays. Just step over here, please, now, place your arm right here. That's fine. You just hold that, huh? Now. Just hold steady. Ah, good, that's fine. Now, you wait here. I'll go into the dark room and develop it. Huh? Say, uh, Doc, is Miss Travers in this morning? No, no. She said she didn't feel well. Had a bad night, I expect. I expect she did. This will only take a minute or two. Just make yourself comfortable, huh? I sit down and slop my way through a couple of issues of National Geographic while the doc steps into the dark room. After a little while, I have a visitor. Oh, it's you. Come on in, Chief. Looking for a little medical aid? I'm looking for Helen. Oh, that's a lovely mouse you got under your eye. Did you bump into a door? Very funny. Have a seat. The doc's in the closet developing some x-rays. Is she here? Haven't seen her. Say, they find the missing jewels yet? You know darn well they haven't found them. Did you look in the captain's cabin? You know, I don't trust him. He's a sneaky character. Fortune, when we get into New York tomorrow, the police are going to have a little talk with you. And frankly, I wouldn't want to be in your shoes. Chief, I'm going to level with you. If you were in my shoes, I'd throw him away. <coughs> What's that? It came from the dark room. Try that door there. Uh, locked. There's another door that leads to the office. <coughs> Come on. Here. <coughs> Helen. Doctor. Doctor. Holy smokes. <coughs> Is he... Stone dead. Dr. Harper. Take it easy, baby. You can't do him any good now. What happened? I don't know. I came in late. I wasn't feeling too good. I remember that he wanted me to change the developing solution because, because he was going to x-ray Rocky's arm. So I went right into the dark room. First I thought I was alone. It was so dark. And then I saw him. I saw him on the floor with his scissors and his back. Eric. Larry, he's been murdered. Now, take it easy, honey. Come on, Chief. You better notify the skipper. You also better radio the New York Harbor Police to meet us. While the chief steward goes over to phone the old man, it suddenly occurs to me that I'd better have a couple of ready answers. So I go back in the little dark room to take another look at Dr. Harper and snoop a little. Just when I think I've struck oil, the skipper barges in. Fortune! Yeah? I don't want anything touched. Just window shopping, skipper. You are under arrest. What's the charge? Or don't you need one? The charge is murder. Now look, Captain. You will be placed under guard in the forward lazaret until the police board ship. Just what makes you think I slipped it to Dr. Harper? You were alone with him when the chief steward arrived. He was in the dark room. You had plenty of time to kill him and go back to the examining room. And you'll have plenty of time to pay for it, too. The rest of your life, I predict, Mr. Fortune. I got news for you, Skipper. As a fortune teller, you got a crack in your crystal ball. Lazarette is a small iron box down in the hold of the ship, just big enough for me, a couple of mice, and a few hundred feet of anchor chain. A couple of deckhands take turns guarding me, which consists of sleeping on a little cot just outside the bulkhead door. I get three square glasses of water a day and all the bread that me and the mice can eat. I am not happy. On your feet, Mr. Fortune. Well, well. And to what do I owe this pleasure? To the fact that I want to talk to you. 
Is that gun just a conversation piece, or do you always carry it? The captain authorized your guard to carry sidearms. I'm your guard for the next watch. Just the two of us? Just the two of us. How cozy. Get back against the wall and keep those hands above your head. Anything you say, Larry. I'm interested in what you say, Mr. Fortune. Concerning what? Concerning what happened to those jewels. How should I know? I say you've got them. You've been smoking Dramamine. I'll give you one more chance to start talking. And if I don't... I empty this gun at you. Wait a minute, Buster. That's homicide, remember? I can always say you tried to jump me. I don't get this. Is there a reward, or are you interested in those jewels for personal reasons? Just start talking. Okay, I'll talk. And make it good. I'll make it as good as I can. Is this good enough? <laughs> I had my hands up in the air, and I brought the arm with the cast down on the top of his skull as hard as I could. He went out like a wet candle, and I cracked the plastic cast right down the middle. I was still trying to figure out my next move when I discovered we were not alone. Put up your hand. Sure, it's getting to be a permanent position. Hand me that gun. Help yourself. Robbery, murder, assaulting a ship's officer. You know, Fortune, we can make trouble for you. I suspected as much. You could save yourself some heartache by confessing where you hid the jewels. Why don't you ask the guy who heisted them? I suppose you can identify him. Your chief steward, sir. <laughs> That's an interesting bit of information. Can you prove it? No. All right, Mr. Fortune. Back in the lazarette. Will you listen to what I have to say, at least? Save it for the homicide, boys. They'll be coming aboard when we reach quarantine in the morning. <laughs> So I am back in the Bastille with my rodent companions. I spend the rest of the night trying to imagine what it's going to feel like when they sit me down in a Sing Sing Chippendale with wiring by Con Edison. Trouble? You'll excuse the cliche, but it shouldn't happen to two dogs because one dog couldn't handle it all. Along about daybreak, I'm nervously peeling pieces of plaster off my arm when I get the shock of my life. But before I can recover, somebody arrives. All right, Fortune. On your feet. I've been on them all night. Let's go. The police cutter should be here in 15 minutes. Now, look, Captain, before the gendarmes start working me over, I think I can crack this case. Uh -huh. I'm serious. I can stop the doc's murder in just 10 minutes. Will you listen to me? No. Well, can I at least get some medical attention? What for? This cast is falling off. And I'd hate to appear in the police lineup with a crummy cast. Might look like you twisted my arm. Uh, I'm not an unduly cruel man, Fortune. We'll let the nurse take a look at it. Atta boy, Captain. I knew that underneath that rough exterior that beats a heart of solid stone. Ten minutes later, I am in the sick bay, feeling like an oyster which has just escaped from six months in an undersized shell and is about to be eaten alive. Rocky, I was so worried about you. Hi, baby. When the captain told me you'd broken the cast on Larry's head, I... How is he? He's sleeping it off in the captain's cabin. Let's get that new cast on your arm. How about a new arm while you're at it? Let's get the old one off. The arm or the cast? <laughs> hey, take it easy. This won't hurt. Here, I'll just tap it a few times with this mallet. Uh -huh. And there. What's the matter, honey? Matter? Oh, nothing. Don't kid me, baby. You look like you just shot six holes in the high 80s. There's nothing wrong. Suppose I tell you what's wrong. All right. The jewels are missing. What jewels? The Lady Harkness loot. The jewels you mixed into the plaster for this cast in my arm. You're crazy. I'm crazy like King Solomon. You and Larry boy heisted those jewels. Larry did the muscle work and conked me when I came into the cabin at the wrong moment. Then he got scared and passed the jewels to you. But... You knew that they'd searched the ship, so you put them into that plaster cast on my arm, figuring you'd get them back after the ship made port and we were all ashore. I... That's why you were so nice and sweet to me. I was worth plenty to you. You've got it all figured out, haven't you? All figured out. I even figured out why you knocked off the good doctor. Tell me. I'd be interested to know. You didn't plan on us taking any x-rays of my arm in the cast. And you knew the x-rays would show those jewels and they would fix your cute little wagon, but good. So you knocked him off and ruined the plates. I noticed the ruined plates in the dark room. Finished? I ran out of gas. You can save your breath and just put up your hands. <laughs> you too? I'm going to need a special game warden if this keeps up. Get over there against the wall. My favorite position. All right. Where are they? Where are which? The jewels you took out of the plaster cast. 
That's an interesting question. I'll give you just five seconds to provide an interesting answer. I don't hear you, baby. One, I can always say you tried to escape. Such a pretty girl, too. Two, I'm ready to pull this trigger, Rocky. Young and tender. Three, I mean it. Too young to have to die. Four. In the electric chair. All right, five. Hold it. Grab her. Go. Quiet down, miss. You okay, Fortune? Okay, Skipper. Except for a slight heart attack. You heard what she said? I was listening through the porthole. So, what kept you? Well, I just wanted to give her enough rope to hang herself. You nearly gave her enough to include me. Oh, sorry. You know, I, I must apologize, Fortune. Mm. Until you showed me how the jewels had been hidden in your cast, I really didn't believe a word you said. Yeah, forget it. I got a dishonest face. Well, naturally, if there's anything I can do to make up for it now... Just one thing, Skipper. About my job. You remember how you threatened to fire me? Yes. Well, fire one ready, Gridley, because if you don't, I quit. Tonight, NBC Radio has presented transcribed Frank Sinatra as that footloose and fancy-free young man known as Rocky Fortune. Others in the cast included Tony Barrett, Lynn Allen, Marvin Miller, Norma Varden, and Shep Mencken. Tonight's script was written by George Lefferts and Andrew C. Love directed. Eddie King speaking. Now to tell you about next week's adventure, here's Frank Sinatra as Rocky Fortune. Sometimes I don't know what this younger generation is coming to. Did I ever tell you about the 10-year-old cowboy who held up the stagecoach with a water pistol and got away with 50 grand? Of course, I thought the kid was only kidding. But as the man in the hot seat said, brother, was I in for a shock. I'll tell you about it next week. See you around. Next week, then, tune in again when Frank Sinatra returns as Rocky Fortune. One of the finest things anyone can say about you is that you're a good neighbor. That spirit has been a tradition in American life all through the years. Today, in hundreds of cities, this spirit of goodwill is expressed in a different way. It's expressed in our support of the local community chest or united fund. This support is the modern way of being a good neighbor. Through your community campaign, you can make just one yearly contribution that takes care of many needs you know that your money is collected and administered honestly and efficiently. So make sure that your campaign pledge is large enough to cover these needed services for an entire year. This is your chance to be a good neighbor. So give to your community chest or your local United Fund. Enjoy Fibber McGee and Molly tonight on the NBC Radio Network. Now, Frank Sinatra, transcribed as Rocky Fortune. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. Living Fiction. Northwestern University, in cooperation with the National Broadcasting Company, brings you a radio dramatization of a timeless story, The Man Without a Country, by Edward Everett Hale. Another in a series of Living Fiction. Breathe there the man with soul so dead, who never to himself hath said, This is my own, my native land whose heart hath ne'er within him burned as home, his footsteps he hath turned. <laughs> there were few who noticed a brief announcement in the New York Herald in the summer of 1863 
For one thing, there was other news. News of General Grant's victorious siege at Vicksburg. News that the armies of the North and South were marching over the dusty Pennsylvania roads leading to Gettysburg. Besides, it was an announcement of only a few lines which said, Nolan died on board the U.S. Corvette Levant. Latitude 2 degrees, 11 minutes south. Longitude 131 degrees west on the 11th of May. Philip Nolan. But I noticed the announcement that Philip Nolan was dead, that he died at sea on a ship of his nation's navy. I, Fred Ingham, noticed, because I'd served in the navy. And I'd met Philip Nolan now and again over the years, and I'd heard talk of him ever since I boarded my first ship. Sure, I remember Nolan. The Iron Mask, we used to call him. Old Plain Buttons. He was aboard my first ship. That's more than 30 years ago. 30 years? He's been at sea half a century, they tell me. He looks it all right. He's 80 years old if he's a day, I guess. Philip Nolan was 80 years old and more when he died. And he had been at sea for more than half a century. In all those lonely years, he never once stepped foot on his homeland, nor sighted her shores, nor heard her name spoken. Now at last, this strange voyage was over. This strange lifetime was ended, leaving only a ripple in the calm waters where he was buried, and leaving only his story to be told. They called him the Iron Mask because of his expressionless face. They called him Old Plain Buttons because of the uniform stripped of insignia. And they called him the Man Without a Country because... Does Lieutenant Nolan care to make any statement regarding his loyalty to the United States? Oh, damn the United States. I wish I may never hear of the United States again. Back in the early years of the New Republic, in the early 1800s, when young Philip Nolan rode southward from his father's Kentucky plantation in search of adventure and a career. Well, he found adventure along the Natchez Trace that followed the Mississippi River to the southwest frontier. And he found a career in the United States Army, a dashing young lieutenant who cut a handsome figure on horseback and in the ballroom. He was in New Orleans, the gay city of sunshine and laughter, when a shadow fell across the Mississippi, the shadow of Aaron Burr, who dreamed of an empire of his own. Young Philip Nolan felt honored to be asked to a party given by the very best people, and was thrilled when Aaron Burr himself took an interest in him, led him away from the others so that they might talk in private. They tell me, Lieutenant Nolan, sir, that you're one of the most brilliant officers in the West. Well, that's very kind, Mr. Burr. From what I've heard of your ability, I'm surprised to find that it's still Lieutenant Nolan. <laughs> well, you know how the Army is, sir. Advancements are slow in coming. Yes, even to the most worthy. <laughs> and back in Washington, I dare say, they don't even know you exist out here. Indeed. They scarcely know this region exists for all they do about it. In fact, I sometimes wonder if these people here in the Mississippi Valley don't deserve a government of their own, a government more responsible to the people. Well, I've never thought about it, sir. Of course, there's always talk, but I've never been interested in uh, politics. If I should find my services useful in helping these good people to secure their rights, I should need the help of men as intelligent and daring as yourself. Well, I, uh, I hardly know what to say. There's no need to say anything. Only remember... There is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at its flood, leads on to fortune. We must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. My friends will be in touch with you, young man. Oh, Lieutenant, wasn't it thrilling meeting Mary and Burr? I think he's just about the most distinguished man I've ever seen. He has ideas. He seems like a man who wouldn't be afraid of action. <laughs> You'd like that about him, wouldn't you? <laughs> I told him you were, well, a little impulsive. <laughs> impulsive? 
Aileen, just because I asked you to show me the rose garden. But you asked before our introduction was even completed. Well, you accepted the suggestion, didn't you? <laughs> well, yes. <laughs> Um, Mr. Burr said he liked a man who wasn't afraid to take chances. I agree with him. Besides, my father asked me to be nice to you. Your father? The governor? I didn't think he knew I existed. After all, he's a governor of the territory, and I'm only an ordinary army lieutenant. Perhaps there are those who can judge ability and not just rank. You see, he, too, was interested in Aaron Burr's ideas to help the region. Just what are those ideas, I wonder? <laughs> I'm sure I wouldn't know. But Father said I might ask you to call sometime. He'd like to talk with you. Say, maybe I could explain some of my ideas about the conduct of the Army here. Perhaps so. I wouldn't be surprised if General Wilkinson were there, too. The General? Is he interested in Burr's plan? Oh, everyone's interested in Aaron Burr. They say he's the kind of man who rewards those who help him. Say, you get mighty high, mighty lieutenant. What's all this talk about your seeing General Wilkinson? I think that may be my affair. Oh, just wondered. General sending for lieutenants? Doesn't seem much like this man's army. <laughs> Well, maybe there are going to be some changes made in this man's yeah, army. Yeah, I've heard about those changes. And not just in the army, either. Well, then maybe you know more than I do. Ah, oh, come off of it, Nolan. Everybody knows this talk. But, of course, I don't have any influential friends to give me the straight information. Oh, well, maybe that's too bad. Or maybe you like the idea of being a lieutenant all your life. Well, maybe I do. At least better than some other ideas. Well, maybe I don't. I didn't join up to sit around the barracks year in and year out. Nothing ever happens here. The government doesn't even know we exist. Well, maybe they'll find out someday. Learn to pay a little more attention to us. Well, son, when you get things reorganized, remember I knew you when you were a lieutenant just like myself. <laughs> well, you'll see when the time comes. But the time never came. For Aaron Burr was seized and accused of treason, of plotting to establish a government of his own in the Mississippi Valley. However, there were only rumors, whispers, and suspicions. Those in high places were slowly exonerated. But Philip Nolan was so unimportant that his trial was long postponed. When the court finally came to his case, he was treated with almost contemptuous kindness. Since there was no actual evidence, his trial might have been a mere formality, except... It seems to me that the defendant knew so little about what was going on that his testimony has scant interest. Unfortunately, perhaps, there is no law against being stupid, foolish, and impressionable. However, the defendant was also a soldier. Do you think you wore that uniform with honor, sir, the uniform of the United States? Colonel Morgan, you can look up my record as a soldier. I used to be told that it was a brilliant one. Hmm. As far as I can see, it shows that you cut a handsome figure on a horse supplied by the United States and that you look... Deuced attractive dancing the quadrille in a uniform supplied by the United States. I tried to do my duty, sir. Sometimes I wondered if our time wasn't being wasted. Do you feel that at all times you did fulfill your duty as a soldier and a citizen of the United States? Well, I... I thought so. It's hard to tell now. I don't... Do you think you disgraced the uniform of the United States? At the time, I may not have been aware. I may have misunderstood. As an officer of the Army of the United States, do you care to make any statement regarding your loyalty to the United States? Oh, damn the United States. I wish I may never hear of the United States again. What did he say? What was that? He said, damn the United States. I wish I may never hear of the United States again. The traitor. Treason. Order, order, order. I declare this court temporarily adjourned. Prisoner, hear the sentence of the court. The court decides, subject to the approval of the president, that you shall have your wish fulfilled, that you shall never hear the name of the United States again. <laughs> Philip Nolan, former lieutenant in the United States Army, was stripped of the insignia on his uniform and placed aboard a ship, for it was decided that his wish and his sentence might be best fulfilled at sea. The 
captain of the ship received instructions from the office of the Secretary of Navy, which he passed on to his officer. You will take the prisoner aboard your ship. He is to be exposed to no indignity of any kind. But under no circumstances is he ever to hear of his country or to see any information regarding it. You will especially caution all the officers under your command to take care that in the various indulgences which may be granted, this rule in which his punishment is involved shall not be broken. And so Philip Nolan stepped on shipboard for the first time. It was in 1807. He was still less than 30 years old. A tall, erect figure dressed in a regulation army uniform from which all insignia had been stripped. Now, he was present, pleasant, and friendly enough, taking his strange sentence lightly, and he got along well with the men. They were cautioned not to speak of the United States in his presence, and the books, magazines, and newspapers which he read had all references to his native country cut from their pages before they were passed into his hands. It was a long, tiresome voyage with little to do, and sometimes the men off duty gathered to take turns reading aloud from whatever books were available. At the Cape of Good Hope, someone had the good fortune to borrow a number of new English books, one of them The Lay of the Last Minstrel by Sir Walter Scott. Now, Philip Nolan, who read aloud very well, took his turn at reading one day, and those stirring rhymes of the Scotch border held us all spellbound. Say, that's not bad for poetry. That's as good as a story any day. Go ahead, Nolan, give us some more. Well, just as soon as I wet my tongue, gentlemen. There. All right. Let's see. This is the way it goes on. Breathes there the man with soul so dead, never to himself hath said, This is my own, my native land. My own. My native land. Whose heart hath ne'er within him burned, as home his footsteps he hath turned from wandering on a foreign strand. If such there breathe, go mark him well, for him no minstrel raptures well. I, <coughs> though his titles, proud his name. Despite these titles, power and pelf, the wretch, consent with all in... I... Here, someone else take this book, I... Well, then the devil take it. For the sea. There. I... Excuse me, gentlemen. Good day. Philip Nolan disappeared into his stateroom, and we didn't see him again for two months, for no one was allowed to visit his quarters. When we saw him again, he was older, expressionless, and he kept more to himself. But even he couldn't escape the excitement on shipboard when we found we were heading for home. Matey, it'll be good to see the farm again. When I was a lad, I never thought I'd be a coaxing to bring in firewood. But I'll chop down the whole woodlot for some fried chicken and an apple pie. The wood will just be turning red and yellow when I get home. There'll be frost in the mornings. Just right for squirrel hunting. A fellow don't think of it very often. But the more you see of the world, the better you like those good old United States. Quiet. Here comes Nolan. Yeah, right down on the talk of home. Why can't he stay in his stateroom where he belongs? Whenever Philip Nolan appeared, conversation ceased, for all talk was about the land of which he was not to hear. More lonely than ever, he stood on deck often in the night, staring at the dark horizon beyond which lay all the things the men talked about. Beyond the horizon, smoke curled upward from the piles of burning leaves along the streets of the little New England towns. The red barns of Pennsylvania seemed almost to bulge outward as the harvest was stored. Hunters rode after the foxes along the ridges of Virginia. The rows of corn shocks stood sentinel over the golden pumpkins in the fields along the Wabash, and the baying of the hounds filled the moonlit night with music over the Kentucky hills. 
Even the wind seemed a whisper of home as we drew nearer. And though he walked alone, Philip Nolan stood at the rail hour after hour, listening to the wind. But then, whatever thoughts he had behind that expressionless face were interrupted by the captain's orders. Mr. Nolan, you'll gather your belongings and personal effects and prepare to quit this ship. Tomorrow we'll meet and you'll board another vessel. An outbound vessel which you will join in her cruise. That's all, except to thank you for your conduct while you were with us. So the wind changed for Philip Nolan. Became again only salt spray, bitter to the taste. Before we came within sight of shore, he watched us sail off homeward, while once again he was outward bound. Twenty times or more they transferred Nolan from one ship to another. His stateroom changed, but one day was like another. One deck like another. One sea like another. But he did remember the blue Mediterranean and the Bay of Naples, for a strange thing happened there. A dance was being held on board his ship with a company of lovely ladies and the friends of local government officials and English and American visitors. Even Nolan was invited to attend. Scarcely was the dancing become when his shipmates were startled to see him approach the most beautiful lady at the ball and to see her smile as he spoke. Laura? Laura? I mean, I mean Miss Rutledge. Is it really you? Of course, Mr. Nolan. I haven't changed so much as to frighten you, have I? No, you haven't changed. You haven't changed at all. It seems I must be dreaming to meet you here. <laughs> We've been traveling this winter and we're visiting Naples at present. Oh. They told me you'd be here. I, I wondered if you'd still recognize me. Seems like a miracle. Hey. May I have the honor of a dance, Miss Rutledge? Of course, Mr. Nolan. It's not Miss Rutledge now, Philip. It's Mrs. Grant. Oh, I didn't know. Of course, I... Yes. It's been some years now since I've married. It wasn't long after... <laughs> it seems forever, doesn't it? Yes, forever. But you're just the same. The music. So much the same. I didn't know whether I should come here or not. Whether I should see you. I'm glad you did. I can't tell you how glad, even though things have changed so much. But how is everything? Tell me everything about home. Home? Home, Mr. Nolan? I thought you were the man who never wanted to hear of home again. The plantation houses of the South, the Delta Moon, and the happy laughter of the long ago faded away. There was only a ship in a strange port, a pause in a voyage to nowhere, an empty stateroom looking over waters that reflected no friendly light, and the whisper of the winds that could not be stilled. Damn the United States. I wish I may never hear of the United States again. Philip Nolan seemed even older after that. But once... When a ship on which he was sailing, one more of the many ships, ran into a fight with a foreign vessel, he suddenly appeared with a shoulder straight, his voice firm and a different look in his eyes. It was after a round shot had struck the gun crew station, killing the officers and wounding the men. Then there was a ramrod in his hand. Come on, lads. Look alive now. Hold your post. Yes, sir. Let the surgeon men clear away the wounded. We've got to man this gun, you hear me? Yes, sir. You there. You're badly hurt. I, I don't think so, sir. Well, lend a hand with loading, then. All right, I've got her aim. Now, set her off. That's it, lads. Step lively now. We'll fire her till she melts. What's going on here? They told me this gun was out of action. Aye, sir, that's right, Captain. Well, the gun's been firing, hasn't it? Where's Mr. Harlow? He's below, sir, and badly wounded. Then who's been firing this gun? You, Nolan. What are you doing here? Just showing them how we used to handle cannon in the artillery, sir. All ready there? Touch her off. That was a hit, Nolan. Let the artillery proceed. They 
say the captain recommended that Nolan be pardoned because of his heroic action that day. Well, perhaps he did. But by this time, the man without a country had been forgotten. Those who had ordered his punishment were either dead or had retired from public life. And those who came into authority simply carried out the orders that had been given. The men who sailed with Nolan in later years scarcely knew his story. He became a legend and a myth rather than a living man. This tall, spare, white-haired figure, weathered by the winds of the seven seas, by the suns of every clime. His eyes had the far-off look of one who'd gazed at many a distant horizon. The look, the sad look of one who never glimpsed what his eyes sought for. There were those who came to know him and to love him well though there was always a barrier between them. It was just one of those, an old shipmate of mine by the name of Danforth, who wrote me when at last Philip Nolan's long voyage to nowhere drew to a close. It was written from the U.S. Corvette Levant. I tried to find the heart to tell you that it is all over with poor old Nolan. The other day the doctor called me to his stateroom, and I entered with him. This was the first time, as far as I knew, that anyone had ever been there. Nolan was lying in his bunk, and the doctor's glance confirmed what I could see. The end was not far off. Hello. Hello there. Glad you could come. You're tired. Perhaps you should rest and I'll come oh, back. No, I haven't had much company here. See, you're surprised to see my cabin. Yes. I had no idea. Why? Why, it's like a shrine. The flag on the wall, the stars and stripes, a picture of George Washington, and a map of the United States. Yes. I do it myself. Do it from memory. You see, here I have a country country of my own. Country few have loved, perhaps, as much as I. For I've had time to think of what it means. I'm sure if they'd known, Mr. Nolan, if they'd only realized you'd have gone free long uh, ago. No, that's not important now. Indeed, it never was. My punishment was just enough. It was only to have my wish fulfilled. But loving a soul... You might have served your country better, been so much more useful. Well, perhaps I have served her well, better than if I had been easily pardoned. If, because of me, others realize what it means to be without a country, there's no bitterness in my heart. Each year has taught me to love my country all the more. Oh, tell me, Tell me what's happened to her. Surely there's no harm in telling me now. No. There's no harm now. Your map's a little out of date, Mr. Nolan. And there are new stars in the flag with more to come. New stars? New states. Will you... Will you draw them in my map for me? Very well, Mr. Nolan. As best I can. The settlers pushed on westward, found homesteads on the prairies and the plains. They told him of the riverboats linking the New England city, of the Overland Trail and the Pony Express, of the gleaming rails burrowing through mountains and leaping across canyons to span a continent. They told him of the mines following the seams of coal deep underground, of the smoke of the iron forges promising great cities, of the cattle herds roaming the grasslands of the West, of the 49ers rushing to the gold fields of California, and of immigrants from every land finding new homes and new hope in America. They told him of the strife between the North and the South, of the war between brothers, of a man named Grant who promised victory to the Union, and of Abraham Lincoln who longed to bind the nation's wounds with charity for all 
and malice towards none. Look. Look in the book for me. You mean this one? That's right. The book of prayer. Read where it's marked. For ourselves and our country. For ourselves and our country. O oh, gracious God, we thank thee. O oh, gracious God, we thank thee. That notwithstanding our manifold transgressions of thy holy love. That notwithstanding our manifold transgressions of thy holy love. Thou hast continued to use thy marvelous kindness. Doctor. I guess there's no need to go on. At last, he had found a home and a country. They took his Bible and they found a slip of paper slip of paper on which he had written, Bury me in the sea. It has been my home, and I love it. But will not someone set up a stone for my memory, that my disgrace may not be more than I ought to bear? Say on it, in memory of Philip Nolan, lieutenant in the army of the United States, he loved his country as no other man has loved her. But no man deserved less at her hands. So lived and died Philip Nolan, the man without a country. There is no stone for his memorial, only his story, a memorial more lasting than a monument. Whenever it is heard, let each of us remember that any man is without a country who, by his sneers, or by looking backward, or by revealing his country's secrets to her enemy, checks for one hour the movements which lead to peace among the nations of the world, or weakens the arm of that nation in her determination to secure justice between man and man, and in general to secure the larger life of her people. The Man Without a Country by Edward Everett Hale is another in a series of living fiction presented each week by Northwestern University in cooperation with the National Broadcasting Company. The Man Without a Country was adapted for radio by Jack C. Wilson. The cast and directors were students of Northwestern University. Philip Nolan was played by Bob Reitz, Aaron Burr by Richard Swift, and Danforth by Norman Larson. Others were Al Cohn, Faith Kellogg, Ike Lacefield, Claire Nelson, Earl Bark, Robert Pitt. A narration by Lowell Harris. The assistant director was Bob Feller and the director, Stuart Mackey. The entire production was under the supervision of John Cowan. This is Hugh Downs speaking. This is the NBC Radio Network. This is Chesterton Radio, your home for podcasts of works by G.K. Chesterton, plus drama, comedy, mystery, science fiction, big bands, and much more. The soundtrack to your Chesterton day at chestertonradio.com. This is Don Hollenbeck for CBS News in Washington. It will soon be dawn this morning of March 9, 1862, off the Atlantic coast at Hampton Roads, Virginia, 150 miles southeast of the capital. The next few moments we'll see the return of daylight to that pivotal point in the North's naval blockade of the South. And according to all experienced federal observers here in Washington, the coming moments may also see the return to Hampton Roads of the Confederate ironclad Merrimack. If the Merrimack can break out into the open sea, round Old Point at the southernmost tip of Maryland, proceed northward to attack the northern ports on the Atlantic seaboard, the most important struck 1862, Washington, D.C. You are there. Washington, on the dawn of the day that will see the decisive naval battle between the North and the South, between the Federals and the Confederates. CBS takes you back 86 years to the surprise engagement that ushered in a new era of sea warfare. All things are as they were then, except for one thing. When CBS is there, you are there.
You Are There, produced and directed by Robert Louis Cheon, is based on authentic historical fact and quotation. And now... CBS News in Washington and John Hollenbeck. So heavy with foreboding and impending calamities. Here in Washington, there are grim faces at the White House, tight-lipped comment from officers at the Northern Department of the Navy. When reports first reached the Navy Department, stating that the Merrimack was venturing forth out of Norfolk to challenge the Federal fleet, there were expressions of amusement and cynicism. Northern Navy officers laughingly imagined the ironclad as a humpbacked turtle, grotesquely waddling her ineffective way through the rough waters. But then the Merrimack struck. Within a matter of hours, the northern sloop Cumberland was rammed and sunk. The 50-gun sailing frigate Congress was abandoned and on fire. And the 40-gun steam auxiliary frigate Minnesota was aground and helpless. At twilight, the Confederate ironclad retired toward Norfolk, leaving behind the question, what can be done to prevent the Merrimack from returning and destroying the entire northern fleet? That's the situation as we see it here in Washington this morning. However, CBS correspondent John Daly is now at Hampton Roads aboard the frigate Roanoke, the flagship of the Northern Naval Squadron. So for a report from the actual scene of the expected naval battle, we switch you to John Daly aboard the Roanoke. The Merrimack has not been sighted as yet. And here aboard the Roanoke, daylight, daylight rather, is beginning to streak the eastern sky, but the sea is still shrouded in a heavy, swirling mist. Somewhere out in that mist, about a mile to my right on the rip raps, federal tugs are desperately trying to release the battered Minnesota from the shoals on which she grounded yesterday. Perhaps you can hear the tug whistles in the distance. Also to my right, hidden by the mists and the angry water of the roads, lie the hulks of the federal warships Congress and Cumberland, both of them sunk in yesterday's action. Right now, here on the Roanoke, every man jack is searching the curtain of mist that hangs over the sea, waiting and watching for the first sight of the Confederacy's juggernaut of destruction. The air is tense. The men seem calm and determined. There's no false optimism. The nearness of new fighting has produced a, a solemn, a quiet, well, almost a prayerful attitude among the officers and the crew. With me at our CBS microphone is Commander Prescott Singleton, one of the senior officers of the Roanoke. Commander Singleton... Do you think that the Merrimack is on her way to attack the fleet again, sir? Foregone conclusion. Well, what did you think of yesterday's engagement? Well fought, I should say. Well fought indeed. Well, do you happen to know who is in command of the Merrimack, sir? Yes. Uh, Captain is Franklin Buchanan. I'm told he holds the rank of Commodore in the Southern Navy. Oh. A good man. Knew him before the war. Knew him well. Uh, shipped together, the two of us. I see, sir. I, uh, I'm rather disappointed in him, I might say. Disappointed? In what way, sir? Well... It's difficult to put into words, but in the Navy, we have traditions, very high and proud traditions, I might say. I just cannot conceive of a good Navy man skulking behind iron plates. But don't you consider the Merrimack to be a very ingenious ship of war, sir? Well, yes, but uh, it's, uh, it's not the way to fight upon the sea. It, uh, it, it's unethical. Well, might I ask... Um... What you would think if you were given command of an ironclad? Oh, I'd resign my commission first. Well, then you feel, Commander Singleton, that the Merrimack is not a legitimate weapon of naval warfare. Absolutely not. The introduction of new and novel methods of warfare I must treat with repugnance. Men have been fighting on the high seas for centuries, according to certain basic laws of strategy. Uh, Nelson, John Paul Jones, Drake. Uh, in short, sir, the sea is no place for experimentation. But, sir, can anything prevent the Merrimack from further ravaging the northern fleet? We will stand against her. We will fight her bravely and gallantly. Count on that. Our hopes, sir, shall rest upon the good lord, good marksmanship, and good, solid New England oak. Thank you, Commander Singleton. The mist is still very heavy hanging over the water here, and there's still no sign of the Merrimack. So this is John Daly aboard the Roanoke. Now back to CBS Washington. This is Don Hollenbeck. A moment ago, you heard Commander Singleton, one of the senior officers aboard the northern flagship Roanoke, say that he knew the name of the Confederate captain of the Merrimack, and that raises an interesting question. How much advance information did the northern Department of the Navy have on the Merrimack? Quincy Howe has just come from the Department of the Navy, where he talked with northern officers. Quincy, was the north aware of the fact that the south was building an ironclad? 
Uh, yes, Don, they were. Uh, the Navy Department in Washington, through various secret agents, has known all along that the Merrimack, uh, the South now calls her the Virginia, was being rebuilt uh, as an ironclad. You say rebuilt. The Merrimack then isn't an original construction. No, it seems not, Don. The Merrimack uh, was a wooden ship in the American Navy undergoing repairs at Norfolk Harbor uh, when the fighting began. Uh, because the federal forces couldn't uh, tore off anywhere to safety, they scuttled her before they evacuated uh, the city of Roanoke. Then southern engineers came along, uh, raised up the burnt-out hulk, and converted uh, what used to be a graceful frigate into this present ugly, iron clouded monster of, of destruction. Well, then the North knew about the Merrimack in advance and didn't do anything to counter her because they discounted her power. Is that it? Yeah, that, that's about the size of it, uh, Don. Uh, now, now, in the considered opinion of every northern naval officer uh, whom I've talked to, there's only just one thing that can stop the Merrimack, and well, that's a miracle. There's no defense against the ironclad. The way she could withstand the concentrated fire of even the most powerful batteries that the North has to offer on land or sea, well, that's, that's shown that she can defy every weapon that the Federal forces now have at their command. Uh, then the Merrimack's iron plating permits her to get close enough to any opposing ship to drive home that ram of hers with deadly effect. Well, then, as it looks now, Quincy, nothing can stop the Merrimack. What then? Uh, the answer now just seems all too clear. Uh, the Confederacy will simply have broken the northern blockade. And just think what that means. Uh, up to now, the northern blockade of the southern ports, well, that's been the Union's most effective economic weapon against the Confederacy. The Merrimack, though, now threatens to destroy that weapon. And the result will be that cotton, cotton, the money crop of the South, will again start flowing across the sea. And in exchange, of course, the South will get cargo open cargo of badly needed guns, ammunition, food, all the essentials of war. A victory by the Merrimack uh, would be likely to increase the war-making power of the Confederacy, oh, I guess maybe ten times over. Then there's this angle. England may decide to recognize the Confederate States of America as a sovereign nation and therefore entitled to all the international privileges of the belligerent. Another point, Quincy. What do you think this effect will be, the effect of the Merrimack? Now, what will it have on naval strategy in this country and around the world? Well, all I can say, Don, is everywhere I went, I heard people saying things like this. The era of the wooden ship is over. Every wooden war vessel now afloat, all the way from England's great ships of the line to the lowliest little corvette of the smallest nation. They've all become obsolete. Just in one day, we've witnessed a complete revolution in maritime warfare. And no one Excuse is... Excuse me, Quincy, I'm sorry. A message... Uh, we've just got a message from Douglas Edwards at Fortress Monroe, overlooking Hampton Roads. He has with him the wife of a federal officer who's just come through the southern lines. So we take you now to Fortress Monroe and Douglas Edwards. I'm in the correspondence room at Fortress Monroe. The young woman with me is Mrs. Lucy Creighton. Where is your home, Mrs. Creighton? Providence. Will you speak a little louder, please? Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, Mrs. Creighton, I know you must be very tired. You've had a long and hard journey, haven't you? Yes, I have. I've just come through the lines on a safe conduct path. I understand. But will you tell us, please, what you were doing in the South? My husband was wounded and taken prisoner at Fort Donaldson in February. It was only a month after we were married. They arranged to let me go see him. Mrs. Creighton, you were in Norfolk, Virginia last night. Uh, that's southern territory. Can you tell us, please, how the people there received the news of the Merrimack's victory yesterday? Well, they were very happy. They were shouting, dancing in the street. They had a torchlight parade. I guess it must have been like that in every city of the South. Now, Mrs. Creighton, would you say, then, that the people of the South feel that the Merrimack is going to bring them victory in the war? Oh, yes. They were all saying that after the Merrimack thinks our fleet is going to go north and bombard Philadelphia and New York. They were sure it would do that. And they were yelling and shouting that the war would soon be over. Go on, please. When the Confederate officer who accompanied me last night took me back to the northern line. It was like riding through a carnival. When I reached the exchange point, the southern officer tipped his hat. He was very kind to me all the time, very nice. He tipped his hat and said that he was so glad the war would be over soon and we would be at peace again. There's no doubt, then, that the morale of the people of the Confederacy has been lifted tremendously by the events of the last 24 hours. Oh, I would say so, yes. 
Oh, all the time I was traveling in the South, I never saw anyone laugh or act like they were happy. Until last night in Norfolk, when the news of the Merrimack came. This is Don Hollenbeck at CBS Washington. We've interrupted Doug Edwards at Fortress Monroe because the Merrimack has been sighted. The immediate target seems to be the frigate Minnesota. Ken Roberts is aboard that ship, so now to the Minnesota and Ken Roberts. The Merrimack is in sight. We can see the Merrimack. Just a few moments ago, the sun began to break through the overcast, and like a curtain rising on a stage, the mist lifted to reveal the squat and ugly form of the Merrimack, not more than a mile or two away, breasting the foam-capped water. She looks like a slanting black roof afloat in a flood. The officers here aboard the Minnesota estimate the top speed of the Merrimack to be only five knots, so it will be some time yet before the Confederate ironclad comes into cannon range. I've also learned that the Merrimack carries four guns on each slanting side and one pivot gun four and another half, making a total of ten guns in all. The sides are sheathed in four inches of iron plate. All the Minnesota guns here are primed. The crew has been supplemented by many survivors of the Cumberland and the Congress and... Directly above us, we can see the big land-based guns of Fortress Monroe, also waiting for the Merrimack to come into range. The uh, tugs are still pulling at the Minnesota, trying to get her free. The officers of the Minnesota and the tugs calling to one another as they cast lines, tighten and pull, then recast, tighten and pull again. Up on the bridge of the Minnesota, I can see the officers clustered together, watching the approach of the Merrimack. They're a grim, silent group. Now, as I look across the water, I can see Old Glory flying from the protruding mast of the Cumberland. Standing beside me is one of the survivors of that ill-fated ship, a young seaman taken aboard during the night after spending 14 hours clinging to a piece of wreckage. The Minnesota's commanding officer has given us permission to talk to him. What's your name, sailor? Charles Horman, seaman second class. What was it like yesterday, Charles? What was the feeling aboard the Cumberland when the Merrimack came up for the attack? Well, first off... We didn't think it was going to attack. We had our wash out on deck, and some of the boys were swabbing deck like as if nothing were going to happen. We didn't know. When, when did you clear for action? Well, it wasn't until almost she got into range. Then what happened, Charles? Well, first, I don't know, but first I think the Congress started firing, and, and then we saw she was coming our way, so we began. Who was coming our way? The Merrimack. So we began firing. Did the Merrimack answer with her gun? No, sir, she didn't. It, it was the craziest thing. Listen. It was crazy. She, she didn't fire, not until she was so close we could almost reach out and touch her. That's how close I think. And, and then she let go with her bow gun. The shot went right through us, right to fore and aft. Killed some of the boys, and those who were hurt started yelling and cussing. What happened then, Charles? Well, we fired everything we had at her then, everything, all the guns we had. And we could see our shells bouncing off the side, bouncing into the water. It was crazy, honest. And the Merrimack kept right on, coming closer and closer, and... We couldn't even figure out what was happening. She just kept coming at it. And then it was like somebody or something had, had got under our ship and heaved us into the air. Into the air? Yeah. You couldn't see nothing, only hear wood breaking and, and the other guys yelling, and we filled it over until the decks were awash. Go on, Charles. Well, when we righted, the Cumberland began to lift fast because our whole underbelly had been ripped by the ram of the Merrimack. Just a, a chunk chewed out, and the water poured in. That was on the starboard side below deck. After that, there wasn't anything to do but jump, so I jumped. Believe me, I, I didn't even think about it. When Lieutenant Morris, who was, who was deck officer, yelled for us to jump, I just jumped and prayed. When I got in the water, there was a bunch of spar floating nearby, and I got a hold of it, and that was how I managed to save my life. Well, there wasn't the gun to the Merrimack that did the big damage then. It was the ram. The ram. It, it was the ram. Thank you for talking with us, Charles Harmon. Now, here's another sailor from the Cumberland, but one whose experience is even more incredible, more dramatic. Your name, sailor? Cavanaugh, Jimmy Cavanaugh, Bedford Mass. Well, every man who witnessed yesterday's engagement, Jimmy, is talking about your heroic effort to board the Merrimack. Tell us about it. Well, look, I don't know. It wasn't anything. You were aboard the Cumberland. Uh, yes, sir. Both the same. That's right. Go ahead, Jimmy. Well, uh, after we caught the broadside of the Merrimack, she came in so close that an officer on the Merrimack opened a porthole and yelled out, Surrender, Morris, or I'll sink you. That's Lieutenant Morris, deck officer of the Cumberland. Uh, yes, sir. That's right. And, and you know something? Here's something awful funny. It turns out that the officer on the Merrimack was a Lieutenant Jones who went to Annapolis with our Lieutenant Morris. Is that so? Yes, sir. Well, what did your Lieutenant Morris reply? Morris? <laughs> Morris yells back, never, never, I'll think first. But by this time, the Merrimack was under our deck. Actually, under the deck. So I jumped on it. 
I had two pistols stuck in my belt. I jumped up. They killed so many of us, you see. My boys, they were. A hundred were dead, you see, and the others screaming and yelling. Well, I, I guess I lost my head, I guess. All I could think was that I wanted to get to that man that could get even, see? For my boys to get even. Yeah, go on, Jimmy. So, I didn't even think, I don't know. It happened like that, see? I don't know. I jumped over on the man that could try to climb her side. Get to the gun port. Uh, somewhere where I could see inside and let him have it with my gun. That's what I wanted to do, but it was so slippery. Like our greased forest. The iron was so slippery I couldn't get a foothold or nothing. Every time I climbed up a little, I'd fall back in the water. Then I'd try again and fall back again. All the time, the guns over my head were shooting, and the bang was making me dead, so so I, I saw it was no use, see. And then, well, by then, the Cumberland was rammed and sinking, so I dived back in the water and held on to some wreckage, and later they picked me up. That was a very brave thing you did, Jimmy. A hundred of my kids they killed I, I, I wanted to do something. That's all I wanted to do, you see. I know your action will be well rewarded. If I could have gotten a toe hold. You see, it was like grease. The, the sides were so slippery. I see. Thank you, Boston Sage, Jimmy Cavanaugh. But now I have another sailor, a man who was aboard the Congress, who can give us a first-hand account of what happened there. His name is Pete Finley from New York City. Yeah, and I sure wish I was there again. What's your rating, Pete? Ah, rating? Me? Uh, no rating for me. I'm just a member of the Naval Brigade. Well, that's kind of like the militia, isn't it? Not regular Navy. Yeah, not regular Navy, that's right. Well, what were you doing aboard the Congress? You better ask that of Father Abraham. You mean President Lincoln? That's what I mean. It was him who put us aboard that leaky old tub. Were there many Naval Brigade men aboard your ship? Three companies. What about the regular crew? They've been discharged four or five days ago. Their enlistment was up. We were put aboard to make it look like the ship was manned, I suppose. There wasn't even a single trained gunner aboard. Can you imagine that? So when a man match, she lets go at us, and we see the Cumberland going, so we run up the white flag. And you couldn't you... expect any different, now, could you? I know. We've not been trained for fighting, if you know what I mean. Well, when it comes time, the white flag has gone up the mast, and I says to myself, I says, Petey boy, send the tank for you, and over the side I go. Over the side? Yeah, you couldn't expect no different, now, could you expect different? Well, tell me, Pete, do you know when you'll get another ship? Me? Another ship? With that thing, that, that iron boiler out there still wide and wild, oh, no, sir, no part of the water for me, not for Petey Finley. The land for me, and I'll kiss it, so help me if I ever get these big feet to feel the land again, I'll... I'll... Yes, I'm sure you will, and thanks, Pete. Yeah, I'm glad you're sure, mister. Wish I was. Now, looking out to sea again, the Merrimack looms near us, smoke belching from her chimney, an ugly, misshapen monster. The car has face to face between the The command has just given a clear ship for action. This is CBS Washington. We take you now to Jackson Beck, somewhere in Hampton Roads. Come in, Jackson Beck. the young commander of this unique naval vessel, Lieutenant John L. Worden. Lieutenant Worden, suppose you answer that question for us. Just what is the monitor? Well, sir, we hope the monitor is the answer to the Northern Pearls. The craft of unique design, the idea of John Erickson, the famous Swedish-American inventor. It's iron hulled, surmounted by an armored circular turret, nine feet high, 20 feet diameter, covered with eight folded layers of one-inch iron. Turret and a little pilot house that lays forward are the only deck structures, except for smokestacks and exhaust grates, which we remove before going into action. I see. Uh, what about your armament, Lieutenant Worden, or is that restricted information? No, sir, it's no secret. We carry two 11 inch dogs. Well, the reports we have of the Merrimack say she carries 10 guns. Oh, yeah, that's true, but her guns are smaller and stationary. I see. Ours are fitted into a revolving turret. 
We can shoot in any direction without having to maneuver into a firing position. Well, then you think the monitor is an even match for the Merrimack, Lieutenant Worthy? Well, I think we're more than an even match, and we stand ready to prove it. Uh, can you tell us just how the monitor came to be here in Hampton Roads right at this crucial moment? <laughs> I guess, guess a good part of that is luck. Uh-huh. Uh, we set out from Brooklyn three days ago. Our orders were for us to head for Hampton Roads at full steam. Last night, we anchored in the darkness off the Roanoke, and one of our officers, my second in command, Lieutenant Sam Green, went aboard the Roanoke for orders. No one knew him, and he received his orders from the Admiral in secret. Now, these orders were clear and simple. We were to take up a position near the Minnesota and defend her from attack by the Merrimack. Well, we anchored in close under the Minnesota's lee side so that we were hidden from sight. Now that the Merrimack is coming in range, we're sailing out to carry out our orders to defend the Minnesota, and we're going to do just that. How many men? What's that? Merrimack is open fire. You missed. Merrimack is right, sir. Take over the firing turret, Green. I'm going forward to the pilot house. The Merrimack has opened fire. The first salvo missed us by some 20 yards, but the concussion of the shell is tossing the monitor around like a cork. Here in the turret, the gun crew is stripped to the waist. There isn't enough room for a man to stretch out his arms. It's hot in here, and it's going to get much hotter. The crew is getting ready to fire. I can see the Merrimack fire through a tiny slit in the metal turret. It is about 1,000 yards away. The snouts of her cannon are smoking from that first broadside, and the second one should be coming in. Where is it? The monitor has opened fire. We have opened fire. Fast is stepping. CBS in Washington. The noise of the firing aboard the monitor makes it impossible to hear Jackson Beck, but John Daly aboard the northern flagship Roanoke has an excellent view of the action in Hampton Roads, so we switch now to him. Come in, John Daly, aboard the flagship Roanoke. The battle between the monitor and the Merrimack has begun. The Merrimack towering high above the water, and the tiny monitor, David and Goliath, the two ironclad are not more than a few hundred yards apart now, flinging tons of iron at each other's side. It's a fantastic sight to those of us who've covered other naval engagements. No printed spars, no ripped wooden hulls. The Merrimack guns are firing at will, and they keep up a steady hammering barrage. The monitor fires one gun at a time at intervals. The very first blow that the Federal monitor struck sent the Merrimack reeling backwards, but just for a moment. She came right back in again, and now she's letting go with every piece that she has, and incredibly, that shot is just glancing off the rounded turret of the monitor without doing any perceptible damage, not a bit of it as far as we can see from here. The gallant little ship takes the full force of the shot without a tremor, without a sign of distress, and then she returns every salvo with a blast of her own. Her turret spins around as soon as one of her cannon is fired, and the second cannon is all loaded and ready to go. Right now, this fight has gotten so hot, the smoke is so thick, it's kind of hard to make out exactly what is going on, except that the two of them, the, the Monitor and the Merrimack, are actually standing toe-to-toe -to -toe and slugging it out just like two bare-handed prisoners in the middle of a ring. Great blast of sound. They're just firing their guns as fast as they can load them. The Merrimack is has just pulled out from the cloud of smoke, and she's leaving the monitor. The Confederate ironclad is coming in to try something, and she's, she's going to try to attack the Minnesota, one of the hit federal ships. And here comes the monitor. The federal ironclad is sweeping in between the two of them, intercepting. She's forcing her ironclad in between the Confederate Merrimack and that wooden Minnesota. She's challenging the Merrimack. She's challenging her to come back and get combat once again. The Merrimack is forced to turn. She's forced to turn and is turning on the monitor, making full steam. The Confederate Merrimack looks like she's going to try to ram the Northern Champion if she can. The two of them are almost deck to deck. But the monitor is sweeping aside. She's turning out of the path of the Merrimack. She's avoiding that ram, and as she turns, she keeps blasting away at the Southern Ironclad. That monitor is still in that fight. She's still in between the Merrimack 
and that federal wooden ship to Minnesota went for, though, that Confederate ironclad has been turned away from her objective. She's been turned away from the hidden sides of the Minnesota. And this time, the little old monitor seems determined to fight it out to the very finish. It's a terrific struggle, a battle of iron and steel. It's just blazing away. And the Merrimack is swinging around. Oh, she's slow and she's clumsy, but there's no question about it. She's turning. She seems to be heading back towards Norfolk. And there goes the monitor after her, just like a puppy chasing after a bill or a barking frantically. Yes, the engagement is all but over. The battle is over, and the northern fleet here in Hampton Roads is saved. The blockade of the south remains intact. There goes the Roanoke stand, and just listen to that band. It's playing the brand new Battle Hymn of the Republic, written only a month ago. And to be fair, neither the Merrimack nor the Federal Monitor was defeated, and neither one of them can really claim a clear victory. This great naval battle, which has just been fought so gallantly by the North and the South, is a draw. However, it's an unhappy day for the South, for as long as the Monitor stands here in Hampton Roads, Southern hopes of breaking the Federal blockade with the Merrimack are doomed. And the monitor is going to stay here. This day, the door... Day, 1862. The monitor stops the Merrimack, and the Union fleet is saved. You have been listening to The Monitor and the Merrimack, another broadcast in the series, You Are There, produced and directed by Robert Louis Cheon. The Monitor and the Merrimack was written by Irv Tunick and Mr. Cheon. The cast included Anthony Kemble Cooper, Cliff Carpenter, Joseph Boland, Bill Quinn, Patsy Campbell, Court Benson, Jim Davidson, Bert Cowlin, and others. Next week... July 21st, 1881, the surrender of Sitting Bull. You are there. CBS Christmas Weekend draws to its end tonight with two fine comedy shows, one of them drawing laughs from a schoolroom and the other from a general store. At 9.30 Eastern Standard Time, our Miss Brooks finds Eve Arden starring as America's most unusual, at least unusually madcap, schoolmistress. And at 10, it's no secret, Lum and Abner, those famous storekeepers, relax with you in the laughter that comes from their famous store, the Jot and Down Store, located out in Pine Ridge, Arkansas. Climax your Christmas holiday with comedy in Our Miss Brooks and Lum and Abner tonight over most of these same CBS network stations. This is CBS, where 99 million people gather every week, the Columbia Broadcasting System. This is Chesterton Radio, the true, good, and beautiful at ChestertonRadio.com. Less than 3% of the population were in towns of more than 10,000. Most immigrants lived on the land. But cities were beginning to flourish. Revolutionary Philadelphia, with its 40,000 inhabitants, was the first colonial city in size. New York was second, with 25,000. Boston, with 16,000, third. Charleston, the largest city of the South, numbered 12,000. America was growing. And in spite of all adversity, America was destined to continue its growth. Why? Possibly because America was a dream for freedom-loving people, then as it is today. This is ChestertonRadio.com. And now, Mystery Theater. <laughs> Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. She is an incredibly imposing figure, Queen Liliolani, last of a pure line of Polynesian royalty, save for the handsome son she faces, nearly eye level to eye level, although Danny Makihini is well over six feet. Always a woman of Amazonian proportions, middle age has blown her to gargantuan size and girth. And her anger and emotion is as monumental as the rest of her. Marry a haole? 
I'd as soon see you dead. Oh, come on, Mother. It's the 20th century, and Hawaii is a state, not a monarchy. The Polynesian and the American Indian are two of a kind. Two civilizations pirated, their lands raped and stolen, their countries plundered, and their people sold into virtual slavery. You should be running for the Senate. I should be making powder and cleaning my gun. For of all the Haolis on this island, the most repressive, imperialist, surrogate king is Carter Bradley. And my son will marry his daughter only over my dead body. Mother, I've never seen you like this. You're always so reasonable. You are betrothed to Taormina. We haven't really seen each other for over seven years. She's more like a little sister to me. I know more than you do, my son. For all your doctor's knowledge, I beg you not to tempt fate. The gods have been angry enough for years, and my inner senses tell me what you plan will bring a great Auai down upon us. I see a raging disaster already set in being that no human being can stop. Our mystery drama, Wave of Terror was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Paul Hecht and Carmen Matthews. When she mentioned disaster, Queen Liliolani could not have sensed the extent of the Holocaust, which was to change so many lives. For at the moment she spoke, out of some alluvial fault in the great Alaskan ridge, The earth boiled from its guts like a volcano, throwing up great mountains of lava, displacing trillions of tons of water that formed a great tidal wave, traveling unnoticed beneath the surface, rushing southward at a speed of up to 500 miles an hour towards the first land mass in its way, the islands of Hawaii. Two days earlier, Danny Makahini and Liz Bradley had gotten off the plane from the States at Hilo Airport. Danny, tall, nut brown. Liz, a blue-eyed, sun-bronzed, typical California girl. God and goddess with a special shine. The shine of love. But despite the message of their eyes and their faith and assurance... Their homeland has brought them a cloud of uncertainty. I'll manage somehow, Danny. Dad's tough, but I can usually break him down. And so is Mother. I wish I felt as sure of her. She has a genius for getting her own way. It's a habit of royalty. And we're both children of royalty. Only yours is for real. So is yours. Mine is just tradition, but yours is force majeure. Mother is a queen by birth. Your father wears his crown by owning half of Hawaii. What makes me unhappy is that I can't bring you the kind of world you're used to, which is only one of the strikes against me as far as your father is concerned. Now, don't start that bit again. So you're a Kanaka. I'm a Haole. So what in this day and age? (laughs) Nothing stateside. Here in Hawaii... What's the difference? We're the ones getting married. Supposing they don't give us their blessing. It's up to you and me, isn't it? Oh, honey, of course, except... Uh, maybe I'm still part heathen after all. Without my mother and your father's blessing, I have a... <laughs> now, for all my liberal arts education and medical school, I still can't explain it with anything but a Hawaiian Polynesian word. I have a... a mea mea. That's just plain superstition. No, it's, it's an uneasy feeling. But if it has an explanation, it goes away. Big difference. <laughs> Welcome home. Darling, we're borrowing trouble. Let's just go home and face up to our parents, and maybe there won't be anything. I only want to make it as easy for them as it is for us. I love you. And I love you. It's as simple as that. So just kiss me a short goodbye, you big worry word. <laughs> when did I have to be asked? Mm. What is it? First rift in the loot. Your ex-rival, Dr. Peter Hughes, is heading straight for us. How'd he get through customs? The Bradley name. The key that opens all doors. Funny Dad isn't willing. He's probably too busy reigning. What? Isn't that what a king does all day? Oh, uh, Elizabeth. Danny. 
Hello, Pete. What's the matter with Dad? Uh, not a thing. Then why isn't he here to meet me? Uh, he got tied up in some business. <laughs> Am I such a bad substitute? Of course not. I had a feeling I was something of a letdown. By the way, Danny, Queen Liliolani and that exquisite intended of yours, Taormina, are waiting for you outside. Oh, I'd uh, better make tracks. Mother doesn't like to be kept waiting. And I'd better get Elizabeth into the helicopter. Mr. Bradley is a little impatient himself. Uh, will I be hearing from you tomorrow, Liz? I hope tonight. I didn't particularly know you knew Danny Macahini. Only since I went to college on the mainland. You seem to have made up for lost time. What does that mean? I'm not blind. I saw that... <laughs> I was going to say farewell kiss, but I don't think that quite characterizes it. However... Pete, I don't want to talk about Danny right now. I want to talk about what you're avoiding. What is it about Dan? You're quite right. It's a subject I wish I could avoid. He's sick. What's the matter? Is it his heart? No, it isn't anything necessarily fatal for a long time, but... But what? Well, I would give anything not to be a doctor. Or have been one these past few months. Because I have known that that magnificent body was letting him down. It's only a shell now. What do you mean? Don't let him know I told you, but it can't be hidden much longer. Your father has Parkinson's disease. Oh, my God. Does that mean he's going to die? With care. What medication we know has some results. Under normal conditions, no. But there are plenty of symptoms, none of which your father is going to be able to bear. What symptoms? In your father's case, mostly muscular. Trembling of the hands, dropping things unconsciously. A rigidity which will inevitably cut down on his normally superactive lifestyle... A marked decrease in his muscular control? Oh, no. Oh, that can't happen to Dad. What can we do to help? Some drugs. A fortunate remission in the disease sometimes. Most of all, trying to avoid emotional excitement and fatigue. Welcome home. I had to tell you. Especially since... Why stop now? I love you, Elizabeth. I'm too old for you, but just the same, I know you're in love with Danny Makihini, that you want to tell your father so. I'm trying very hard to be as objective as a doctor ought to be. I don't know what any of our futures are destined to be, but I do know that your father's life, not necessarily death, but his life, is probably in your hands at this moment and from here on in. What's the matter? You don't like me anymore? I love you, Tal. Oh, As a little sister. I always have, and I always will. But you know meaning of blue out tonight. Yes, Taormina, and I am ashamed. Please. I know you you want to marry our only girl. I I can't help myself, little sister. I love her. The Queen will never allow you. I need Carter Bradley's consent more than I do my own mother's. And if you do not get it? And to hell with the past. We will buy our own future. And nothing and no one can stop us. Elizabeth! Daddy! Oh, 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 oh. You can't know how good it is to see you. By damn, you're more beautiful than ever. And you look just like your mother. <gasps> Dad, what are you doing? I'm stealing a page from Pete's book, but I think I deserve it because you look so like Beth did when I married her. I'm going to carry you over the threshold back home again. Dad, you shouldn't. Why not? Well, I'm not such a little girl anymore. Oh, nonsense. Light as a feather, which is just what you are. The proudest feather I wear in my cap. Damn, I'm sorry, Elizabeth. Did I spill? No, Dad. I, uh, I came a cropper off a new story and I've been breaking in. My arm's a bit stiff. You all right? Oh, now you're home. <laughs> oh, I have a few bruises here and there, but I can shake them off the moment I see you and Pete happily married. Now you're graduated 
Let's make it soon. Oh, now give the girl a chance to catch her breath, C.B. If I were you, I wouldn't grab her while you can. Only when Liz wants me. Now don't tell me I said something out of line. Typical of me trying to rush things. And this damn hand is bothering me tonight. We can talk it all out tomorrow. Oh, I can't tell you how good it is to have you home in Wailua again, sweetheart. I've been waiting to get back myself. It's a cold old house without your mother. You're my one hope for Wilder's future and her boys. A lot of responsibility to put on a daughter's shoulders. But since I have no son left, I know you won't fail me. <laughs> So this is where you've been hiding out, young lovers. <laughs> Danny, you should not have stolen Taormina away from the feast. I was the one to need to speak to Danny alone. Uh, thanks, Tal, but I can't speak for myself. There are too many words in the world. Let us just thank the gods for what little we have. We are a dying race, my son, but still a proud one. You and Tal can keep us alive. And I thank all of you. And Tane and Taora, that the moment is almost here. Almost here? You are a doctor now. Now, the wedding ceremony need wait no longer. I have set it for the full moon, the night after tomorrow. Uh, mother, I... Mother, Taormina and I will not be wed. Tao, is this your wish? I... No, but I... Don't stammer, girl. Answer me. I will answer you, Mother. I love Tao as a little sister. But I will marry Elizabeth Bradley. The daughter of Carter Bradley, the Howley? Yes, Mother. Never. I'm sorry, I must. We are in love. He won't let you. How can he stop us? Then I will. If I have to call on all the ancient gods... Oh, please, Mother, I no longer believe in magic, alui, or any superstitious curse that could harm me or Liz. No curse or any magic to harm the girl. I have no power for that or second sight. But I tell you this. If you marry this holy girl, if you tie your life to Carter Bradley's daughter, you end my life. My death will be on your head and hers. I can smell it in the wind. If you insist, in the words of the missionary, you will reap the whirlwind. Queen Liliolani could have had no specific foreknowledge of the Holocaust in store. Carter Bradley, absolute monarch, whose magnificent physique is betraying him, and whose weakness will lead him back to old sins. None of our characters can yet know the cataclysm of nature which is to affect their lives. I shall return shortly with Act Two. The great shelf of sub-ocean land that lies off the Aleutian chain of islands is still intact. It is some 48 hours still before the titanic undersea explosion will rend it asunder and create a wave that will rise towering to 90 feet, 20 to 30 feet above the great mansion at Wailua, which spreads along the coral cliffs looking northward to the vast Pacific and the coming terror. On the lanai, facing away from the ocean, Carter is just finishing breakfast as Liz joins him. Well, now it seems more like home again. Morning, Elizabeth, dear. Morning, Dad. You know, I've been sitting here snorting as impatient as the old war horse I am. But I couldn't wait. I've finished breakfast. Mm -hmm. I'll ring for yours. No, no, Dad, please. Well, what's the matter, Princess? You don't feel well? I wish you wouldn't call me that. What? Princess. Well, it's my old name for you, and I always called you. Uh, you, you don't feel well. I'm tired, Dad. Long trip, change in time. Well, you should have slept longer. How about some coffee? No, no thanks. Juice? Nothing for the moment. We, 
We have things to talk about. Well, of course we have, but I sort of thought we'd keep that for lunch, huh? I mean, Pete will be here, and don't you think he ought to be part of it? No, Dad, I don't. Oh, I don't think that's so fair, Princess. No. All right, if you prefer it, Lisbeth. So why I can't use the old name? It doesn't I... fit me, Dad. It's not what I am. <laughs> On these islands, and particularly this one, it's what you are, at the very least. If we were to ride to Mauna Kea, way up to the top, you could turn and look north, east, west, and south, and every bit of land you saw would be yours. Or will be someday. Are you so sure, Dad? I own it. It's mine. Along with a few other things. When I'm gone, whose else would it be except yours? And uh, Pete's? I don't really know. I'm not sure it's that important to me. What would happen if I didn't marry Pete? Didn't? What are you talking about? Would the Bradley Ranch still be mine? And all that goes with it, if I didn't? I... I... Who, who, who else would you marry? I didn't expect you up so early, my son. After the long trip and the lure. Uh, it was a perfect morning for surfing. When the sun rose, I saw those easy rolling four-footers, uh -huh. and I grabbed my board and took off. <laughs> Happy to be home again, in your own land. Yes, in a sense... Cutting across those waves out there gave me back not only my sense of balance, but you know, just my own plain good sense. I'm happy to hear that. Then today, we don't quarrel. <laughs> That's up to you. My doubts are all gone. I would hope that you tell me you are talking about Taormina. Yes, in part. Yes, you will marry her. Mother, listen to me. I know your pride in race, in bloodline, your... Your struggle to make sure that it won't die. But when I left Hawaii to go to UCLA, I was 18. I was 10, 11 years old. We made the promises, we took the vows, but Tao was too young to know what was involved. I believed then, as you do still, that our heritage and our race must be preserved, but I don't any longer. You are a Polynesian prince. No, I am a citizen of the world, Mother, a doctor. Race, creed, color, nationalism, nothing matters to me but that the human body is one and the same thing. The body made strong or weak by exercise and usage, the brain the same, by education or lack of it. So you will not marry Taormina? No. You think Carter Bradley will share your views, accept you as his son-in-law? I don't know. I'll find that out today. But if he doesn't... We are both of age, Mother. He can't stop us. I wouldn't be too sure of that. And what about me? I want you to meet Liz, Mother. I think you'll change your mind. I will meet her. But I shall not change my mind. And what will you do then? Meet her first before we come to that decision. When? Look, I'll take the jeep into town and call her. Then I'll drive to Waialua, get her, and bring her back. You're wasting your time. I hope not. Because I love you. And I want you to love her, too. I'll be back by mid-afternoon. Great Tommy. Help me. Help me make my son see that our race, shamed and despoiled and dying out, must have new life bred into it. Only Makahini and Taormina can do it. She's a princess in her own right. Help me, Tani. Help me. Or the smell of doom that comes to me on the wind from the north will come to pass. Hey, old boy. Stable King here and rub him down good. I rode him hard this morning. Ah, hey, Pete. Morning, CB. I'm hungry as a bull. Is lunch ready? <laughs> yes. There's a nice breeze off the water, so Chung Lee set the two of us up on the front lanai. Two of us? Oh, is Elizabeth still sick? Oh, come, let's go through the house. I have to wash up anyway. Where is she? Upstairs? No, she, uh... She left quite a bit before I got here. What do you mean, sick? 
Oh, she was feeling a little off her feet at breakfast. Left to go where? Oh, Danny Makahini came by and picked her up. Liz said she'd be back in the late afternoon. Danny Makahini? Queen Liliolani, son? Yes. Oh, I thought he was at medical school on the mainland. He was. He's graduated. He came back on the same plane with Liz yesterday. Didn't even know she knew him. But I, uh, I don't like this about Elizabeth. Is it serious? In its own way. I was going to let her tell you herself. But maybe as your doctor, it's better if I do it instead. Oh, come on, man. Come on, come on. Get it out. What is it? Well, let's sit down for a minute. I want to remind you of your condition and that flying off the handle and losing your temper is the worst thing you can do. Oh, you pill peddlers, you're all prophets of doom. Well, if you take the pills I provide, you might put yours off a good deal longer. Now sit down. All right, but don't try to change the subject. I want to know why Elizabeth went chasing off with Makahini. Did they go surfing? Not exactly. Damn my eyebrows, you're a common off lover, Pete. Your fiancé goes herring off with another man her first day back home, even if he is just a Kanaka beach boy, and you just let her go. First, she left before I got here. Second, he is not a Kanaka beach boy. He's a colleague of mine, a doctor of medicine. And lastly, Elizabeth is not my fiancé anymore. What? How do you know? Where did you find that out? Yesterday, when I brought her home. You you turned my daughter down? No, I should have, really, in the first place. I'm far too old for her. Oh, rubbish. Well, I'm not marrying her, C.B. And you're not fooling me one bit, Pete. You're still as much in love with Elizabeth as you've always been. I smell a rat and I'll bet it's Makahini. Is that it? Is that it? Where did they go? To see the queen. I imagine to ask her blessing. To get married? My daughter and a... Beach boy! Now, stop talking about Danny like that. And don't get all worked up. It's bad for you. Oh, I won't get worked up. First of all, because it's just not going to happen. There'll be no marriage between them. Because if she doesn't stop it, I will. By God, if he has much as dares. It's, it's, it's all right, C.B. Now, now, just take it easy. It's, it's, it's only a temporary attack, C.B. But this time you are going to take one of my pills. I'm sorry, my dear. You're a lovely girl. And I can hardly blame Danny. But marriage between you is quite impossible. Mother, I... I haven't finished. There are reasons beyond reasons why it can never be. Your blood is not our blood. Danny is already betrothed to Princess Tower Mina... The gods are already angered and cannot be angered anymore. For God's sakes, Mother, it's the 20th century. And you are as intelligent and well-read and educated as any woman I know. Stop acting like some old ignorant witch. I am acting as I must. Because within me are ancient chords which sing of death and certain doom for two people. Queen Liliolani, I respect your point of view. Do you respect your father's? Yes, But I will give you the same answer as I would give him. I love Danny. I'm over 20. Danny is 25. There is no way either of you can stop us. I'd rather it wouldn't be like that. But Danny and I have agreed. She's quite right, Mother. We'd give anything to have both you and Mr. Bradley with us, but if you are not... I cannot give my consent. I can only warn you, if you persist, it will end in death and disaster. I have nothing more to say. I am... Going to pray for all of us. Well, Liz, we're almost all the way home and we still haven't decided just how we're going to go about it. I know, Danny. It's just... I don't think we can rush it. Not right now, because of Dad. If you want to back out, I'm not holding you to anything. Oh, darling. Darling, don't do that. Honey, I hate to get long-winded or go chucking my medical knowledge around, but Parkinson's, I mean, it can and almost always is a long, long process. He's going to need me. I mean, really need me for the first time in his life. It's a life that could last another 20 years. Are you asking me to wait that long? No. No. Because there are other... Oh, Danny, I'm so tired, and I just can't think, and we're home. 
Kiss me till tomorrow, at least. Sure, sure. Of course, darling. It's only, well, I'm under some pressures of my own, and if I can't have you, well, I won't break my mother's heart or Tao's, and tomorrow night is their night. I'll talk to Dad tonight. If I can't convince him, we'll be on our own. Why not let me do it? I'm the one <laughs> seeking your hand, if not your fortune. I mean, it's up to me. All right. If you... What is it? Pete. He looks as if... Hello, Danny. Elizabeth. Uh-huh. Where's Dad? Inside. But, Danny, Liz, if either of you want to talk to him about... about you... As a doctor, I'd say now isn't the time. What happened? I made a judgment. I thought maybe I'd better tell him about you, too. Did Liz tell you about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Did anything serious happen? No, Danny. M.D. to M.D., you know how it can go. Yeah. He got a bit emotional and suffered some speech impairment. Mm-hmm. He's all right now, but I wouldn't advise any further. Yeah, yeah, quite right. I'd better duck out fast before he sees me. I'll be in touch tomorrow morning, Liz. Keep your chin up, eh? No real worries about your dad. Right, Doctor? Right. Just us. This, too, shall pass. <laughs> I love you. Till tomorrow. Me, too. And forever. That, too. <laughs> Aloha. You sure Dad's all right? If we can keep off a certain subject, sure. I don't want... I can't do any more talking about... <gasps> Oh, P, hold me quick. What is it? Just something that nobody but me knows about. Yet. I wonder if anyone else will. Ever. What new factor could enter a hoped-for marriage, which already appears to have everything against it? And what is the meaning of Liz's cryptic statement, expressing a knowledge that only she has and no one else may ever know? Is it the same knowledge that Queen Liligonani talks of as buried in the past? And if she too knows that ancient gods are to extract penance for buried sins, who are the two that are doomed? Or are more to die in the dreadful natural phenomenon that is at last about to be unleashed 3,000 miles away? I'll return shortly with Act Three. At exactly 8.42 the following morning on the island of Hawaii, Two final ultimatums were issued by two irate parents. One of them by Queen Liliolani to her son. The gods have been angry enough for years. My inner voices tell me what you plan will bring a great awe upon us. I see a raging disaster will be set in being that no human being can stop. And Carter Bradley to his daughter the next morning completely recovered through rest and medication for the moment. Let's get one thing straight, Princess, and don't interrupt me. I use the old name deliberately. On this island, you, we, are the royalty. And I'm warning you one thing right now. Go near that Makahini Kanaka again, or let him come near you and I'll shoot him down like a dog. I mean that, Princess, as God is my witness. No one or nothing can stop me from doing as I want on this island. Whether it was sheer coincidence or whether gods, ancient or contemporary, took offense, this was the moment the titanic explosion occurred, hurling trillions upon trillions of tons of water at breakneck speed above the ocean bed. Within six hours, it would hit the north shore of the island of Hawaii head on. Whether guided by sheer accident or supernatural design, the devastation it would leave in its wake would be, to say the least, supernatural. Dad, 
You can't be serious. Oh, but I am. You couldn't do this to I'm me. I'm doing it for you. But I love Danny. Childish romance. If you don't marry Pete, I'll leave everything to him. I don't need anything. Danny can support me. I can work. You'll never marry him. Why are you so set against him? It should be obvious enough. Nobody could be that prejudiced. That bigoted. And to make sure if he comes near here or you again, I will shoot him on sight. <laughs> Dr. Hughes? Pete, it's Dad. He's had some sort of attack or something. I... All right, Liz, just slow down. Now tell me what happened. And don't worry, there's no danger. Oh, I'm sorry, I, I don't mean to be incoherent, but it was just awful to see him and listen to him just spluttering and talking all sorts of nonsense. I gave him some medication. Did he take it? Yes. He's gone upstairs to take it. What is it, Pete? It's part of his illness. The speech impairment is one of the symptoms. Excitement aggravates them. I'll be right out. And let's see if we can figure what to do. I've given him a sedative that'll keep him quiet for a couple of hours. Problem one out of the way, temporarily. Now for problem two. You. There isn't any problem about me. I've got to tell Danny we're through. I can't marry Danny. And what about the child? John, you know. Yes. But how? When I'm not even sure myself. When I gave you the sedative yesterday, I took some blood. There's no doubt about it, Liz. You're pregnant. Oh, Lord. Now what am I going to do? You're going to get in the car with me and drive to Tupapahu. If anything can change Queen Liliolani's mind, it's the child. <laughs> So you are already carrying Danny's child? And you think that will alter things? I'm the one who hoped it would. I won't give up Danny's baby. That's one part of it no one can take from me. You have courage, little Laoli. More courage than I had. I wouldn't say that. You know what a difference there is. Danny would want his child. Call him. Get him here and ask him. I can't. Why not? He left an hour ago for Wailua. I'm surprised you didn't pass him. He must have taken the jeep over the back road. That's too rough for a car. For Wailua. Pete, we've got to stop him somehow. Catch up with him. It's too late for that. But if he's gone to Wailua and if father sees him, he'll kill him. What is all this? My father, Queen Liliolani. He's promised to shoot Danny on sight. Oh, please, please, can't you help us somehow? Why should I? It could be your son's life. And now... I am made responsible again for another life, another son. <laughs> How history repeats itself. But it won't again. It's past time for retribution, and the gods are coming to claim it. What do you mean? The Meha Meha is upon us. I can feel the ripples of it in my soul, the lift of it like a wave. I will call Brad. Brad? Your father. Once, he meant everything to me that Danny means to you. At the moment the Queen lifted the phone, a tanker plowing across the North Pacific lifted ever so slightly on a five-inch surface swell. That was the only sign of the gargantuan tsunami the dreadful tidal wave which swept by at the speed of sound hurtling toward the north shore of Hawaii. There, its monstrous energy would pile up the waters to a height of over 80 feet, driving inland till its force was spent to be sucked back with such diabolic speed that it would carry away everything in its path. Brad, it's Lil. Lil? For Pete's sake. Why, how many years? Twelve, thirteen. You sound just the same. Uh, I don't look it. How are you, Brad? Oh, I don't know, Lil. I'm not the man I once was. <laughs> You'll never change. 
certainly not for me. I, uh, I want to ask you one favor. A little, I... If it's about our children, well, I... Have I ever asked one from you before? Oh, Lord knows you haven't. It's a matter of life or death. Will you meet me at the grotto? If you ask me, how can I refuse? If we both leave this minute, we should arrive in about an hour and a half. All right, there. It... It'll be good to see you again. If you shut your eyes to what I have become, at least it's dark. I'll see you at the grotto. After your mother died, Elizabeth, we were lovers, your father and I. I carried a child of his in my womb. But we were ridden with pride of race, each for his own, and it drove us apart. We could never be married. And the child? Well, I thought it was not meant for me to bear a child of mixed race. I said goodbye to your father. And there, in that grotto, in our temple of love, I aborted and destroyed our child. I offended the gods. Listen to me, little Aoli princess. You will have your father's blessing as you have mine. Remember that. Love my boy. Take care of him. Bear his child. Then Ta-Aurora will be with us again. Say goodbye to Danny for me. I cannot urge any longer, Brad. I thought if I at last was willing to accept commingled blood in a child of our families... I... I can't help myself, little. I am as I am. I cannot accept any child of my daughter's with mixed blood. And so you want to kill my boy? Not if he stays away from Elizabeth. And the child? Well, that can be taken care of. He will stop the children. Make history repeat a terrible mistake. Us, all over again. Lil, I cannot change. You are changed already. Look at your hands. Shaking now like leaves in the wind. Ah, uh, it's a different matter. I have Parkinson's disease. I told you you'd find a different man. Not the difference I would have wanted. Wait a minute. Shh, quiet. Come out, Lil, quick. What, what is it, Brad? Kind. My God, look at it. It's a half a mile below Norrell. The fish left gasping on the rocks. A tidal bore is on the way, and a big one. I know. Ta Aurora has been telling me all morning. I could smell the anger of the gods. It's why I called you here. To die? Dead. We cannot stay in the children's way. Well, there's still king. And the horse we both might... Yes. Gross old woman. Even at your best, you couldn't hoist me on his back. Even with you alone on his back, it's too late. But I have no right. No, try, Brad. Try, if you can. Home, King. Home. <laughs> Run out of wind, boy. You're staying. <laughs> We've both been legends in our time, Lou. We wouldn't want to outlive our glory. I shouldn't have done this to you. No. I'm burned out, little. Thanks for making me realize that I hadn't much further to go. I only wish I'd been able to tell Princess. I mean, Elizabeth. But at the last, she had my blessing and my love. She knows she has both. Well, my love, yes, but the other, how could she ever know? I told her so before I left her. How could you? Because I knew what I was going to do. And I know you, Brad. Oh, I know you. If ever any woman knew a man. Oh, Liz, what a fool I was. We both were. <laughs> but how good to have you back at last. Tsunami, it's coming at last. Are you afraid, Lou? No. I'm going home. Back to where my roots are. In the sea, to the south. Tower The sea god will guide me safe. And you. I go with you as I should have gone those years ago. But you, you're 
all shaking. That's what the wave will free me from. The shame of being less than a man. It's all right, Lou. It's as it should be. We couldn't have each other in life. We'll stand together forever in death. The inexorable incoming march of the water did little damage compared to the outgoing surge, which sucked everything into and away with it, like some colossal, unimaginable vacuum cleaner. It left the beach and the inlet stripped clean and swept Wailua away like so many matchsticks. As far as the eye could see across that northern shore of Hawaii where the wave struck, and as far as the wave penetrated, not a living thing was left. I'll be back shortly. Danny and Liz were married very quietly. There was no formal funeral either for Queen Liliolani or Carter Bradley. Only a memorial service. Two dynasties were finished, ended, and melded in the two young people who never took their loving eyes from each other during the simple wedding service. The close was an exchange between bride and groom in Hawaiian. Aloha. Aloha means hello. Aloha means goodbye. But most of all, it means I love you. For this... After all, the terror and holocaust turns out to be just that, a love story. Our cast included Paul Hecht, Carmen Matthews, Suzanne Grossman, Gordon Gould, Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... Thank you.